Fury, Chapter 1, From the Battle of Actium to the Foundation of the Principate. Gaius Julius Caesar, the triumvir and the founder of the Roman Empire, was the grand-nephew of Gaius Julius Caesar, the dictator, his adoptive father. Originally named, like his true father, Gaius Octavius, he entered the Julian family after the dictator's death, and, according to the usual practice of adopted sons, called himself Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. But the name Octavianus soon fell into disuse, and by his contemporaries he was commonly spoken of as Caesar, just as Scipio Aemilianus was commonly called Scipio. The victory of Actium, September 2, 31 B.C., and the death of Marcus Antonius, August 1, 30 B.C., placed the supreme power in the hands of Caesar, for so we may best call him until he becomes Augustus. The Roman world lay at his feet, and he had no rival. He was not a man of genius, and his success had perhaps been chiefly due to his imperturbable self-control. He was no general, he was hardly a soldier, though not devoid of personal courage, as he had shown in his campaign in Illyricum. As a statesman he was able, but not creative or original, and he would never have succeeded in forming a permanent constitution but for the example of the great dictator. In temper he was cool, without ardor or enthusiasm. His mind was logical, and he aimed at precision in thought and expression. His culture was wide, if superficial. His knowledge of Greek, imperfect. In literary style, he affected simplicity and correctness, and he was an astute critic. Like many educated men of his time, he was not free from superstition. His habits were always simple, his food plain, and his surroundings modest. His family affections were strong and sometimes misled him into weakness. His presence was imposing, though he was not tall, and his features were marked by symmetrical beauty, but the pallor of his complexion showed that his health was naturally delicate. It was due to his self-control and his simple manner of life that he lived to be an old man. The successes of Caesar had not been achieved without the aid of others. Two remarkable men, devoted to his interests, stood by him faithfully throughout the civil wars, and helped him by their counsels and their labors. These were Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa and Gaius Kilnius Mycenaeus, As they helped him not only to win the empire, but also to wield it after he had won it, it is necessary to know what manner of men they were. Of Agrippa we know strangely little, considering the prominent position he occupied for a long and important period, and the part he played in the history of the world. From youth up he had been the companion of Caesar, and he was always content to take second place. His military ability stood Caesar in good stead, notably in the war with Sextus Pompeius and on the day of Actium. He had first distinguished himself at the siege of Perugia, 41 B.C., and subsequently his victories over the Germans beyond the Rhine established his military fame. His success was due to his own energy, for he had no interest, and belonging to an obscure gens, he was regarded by the nobility as an upstart. He was not, perhaps, a man of culture, but his tastes were liberal. His interest in architecture was signalized by many useful buildings, and Gaul owed him a great debt for the roads which he constructed in that country. In appearance he is said to have been stern and rugged. In temper he was reserved and proud. He was ambitious, but only for the second place. Yet he was the one man who might have been a successful rival of his master. Mycenaeus resembled Agrippa in his unselfish loyalty to Caesar, but his character was very different. Like Agrippa, he did not aspire to become the peer of their common master, but while the heart of Agrippa was set on being acknowledged as second, Mycenaeus preferred to have no recognized position. Agrippa's excellence was in the craft of war, while Mycenaeus cultivated the arts of peace. Agrippa had forwarded the cause of Caesar by his generalship. Mycenaeus aided him by diplomacy. 
It will be remembered how the latter negotiated the treaties of Brandusium and Mycenaeum. During the campaigns which demanded the presence of Caesar, Mycenaeus conducted the administration of affairs in Italy and watched over the interests of the absent triumvir. Until his death, 8 BC, he continued to be the trusted friend and advisor, in fact the alter ego of Caesar, and he had probably no small share in making the constitution of the empire. But he always kept himself in the background. He was content with the real power which he enjoyed by his immense influence with Caesar. He despised offices and honors. It is characteristic of the man that he refused to pass from the equestrian into the senatorial order. He could indeed afford to look down upon many of the nobles, for he came of an illustrious Etruscan race. In his tastes and manner of life, he was unlike both Agrippa and Caesar. He was neither rough nor simple. A refined voluptuary, he made an art of luxury, and it was quite consistent that ambition should have no place in his theory of life. When affairs called for energy and zeal, no one was more energetic and unresting than Mycenaeus. But in hours of ease, he almost went beyond the effeminacy of a woman. Saturated with the best culture of his day, he took an enlightened interest in literature. Of the circle of men of letters, which he formed around himself, there will be an occasion to speak in a future chapter. Such were the men who helped Caesar to win the first place in the state, and who, when he had become the ruler of the world, devoted themselves to his service without rivalry or jealousy. Agrippa became consul for the second time in 28 BC with the triumvir for his colleague, and his friendship with Caesar was soon cemented by a new tie. He married Marcella, the daughter of Octavia, Caesar's sister, by her first husband, Gaius Marcellus. The Battle of Actium decided between Antonius and Caesar but it also decided a still greater question. It decided between the East and the West. For the Roman world had been seriously threatened by the danger of Oriental despotism. The policy of Antonius in the East, his connection with Cleopatra, the idea of making Alexandria a second Rome, show that if things had turned out otherwise at Actium, Egypt would have obtained an undue preponderance in the Roman state, and the empire might have been founded in the form of an eastern monarchy. Caesar recognized the significance of Egypt and took measures to prevent future danger from that quarter. It was, of course, out of the question to allow the dynasty of Greek kings to continue. But instead of forming a new province, Caesar treated the land as if he were, by the right of conquest, the successor of Cleopatra, and of Ptolemy Caesarion, whom he had put to death. He did not, indeed, assume the title of king, but he appointed a prefect, who was responsible to himself alone, and was in every sense a viceroy. And, as the lord of the country, he enacted that no Roman senator should visit it without his special permission. The first prefect of Egypt was Gaius Cornelius Gallus, with whose help Caesar had captured Alexandria. The inhabitants of Egypt were disbarred from the prospect of becoming Roman citizens, and no local government was granted to the cities. The treasuries of Cleopatra enabled Caesar to discharge many pressing obligations. He was able to pay back the loans which he had incurred in the civil wars, he was able also to give large donatives to the soldiers and populace of Rome. The abundance of money, which the conquest of Egypt suddenly poured upon Western Europe, helped in no small measure to establish a new period of prosperity. After many dreary years of domestic war and financial difficulties, men now saw a prospect of peace and plenty. But above all, the booty of Egypt enabled Caesar to satisfy the demands of 120,000 veterans. Immediately after Actium, he had discharged all the soldiers who had served their time, but without giving them the rewards which they had been led to expect. These veterans belonged both to Caesar's own army and to that of Antonius, which had capitulated. Seeing that they would be of little importance after the conclusion of the civil wars, they made a stand as soon as they reached Italy, 
and demanded that their claims should be instantly satisfied. Agrippa, who had returned with the troops, and Mycenaeus, to whom Caesar had entrusted the administration of Italy, were unable to pacify the soldiers, and it was found necessary to send for Caesar himself, who was wintering in Samos. The voyage was dangerous at that time of year, but Caesar, after experiencing two severe storms, in which some of his ships were lost, reached Brindusium safely. He succeeded in satisfying the veterans, some with grants of land, others with money. But his funds were quite insufficient to meet the claims of all, and he had to put off many with promises. He thus gained time until the immense Egyptian booty gave him means to fulfill his obligations. The greater number of veterans were of Italian origin and wished to receive land in their native country. As most of the Italians had supported the cause of Caesar, it was impossible to do on a large scale what had been done ten years before and eject proprietors to make room for the soldiers. But the veterans of Antonius, who had on that occasion been settled in the districts of Ravenna, Bononia, Capua, etc., and sympathized with his cause, were now forcibly turned out of the holdings which they had forcibly acquired. They were, however, unlike the original proprietors, compensated by assignments of land in the provinces, especially in the east, where the civil war had depopulated many districts. But the land thus made available was not nearly enough, and Caesar was obliged to purchase the rest. In B.C. 30 and B.C. 14, he spent no less than 600 million sesterces, about 5 million pounds, in buying Italian farms for his veterans. We find traces of these settlements in various parts of Italy, especially in the neighborhood of Ateste, or Este. After the conquest of Egypt, the Antonian troops were transferred to the south of Gaul and settled there in colonies possessing Ius Latinum, for example, in Nemausus, or Neme. The wholesale discharge of veterans, as well as the losses sustained in the wars, rendered a reorganization of the legions necessary. The plan was adopted of uniting those legions, which had been greatly reduced in number with others which had been similarly diminished, and thus forming new double legions, as they were called by the distinguishing title of Gamina. Thus were formed the 13th Gamina, the 14th Gamina, etc. The greater part of the year following the death of Cleopatra, August B.C. 30, was occupied by Caesar in ordering the affairs of the Asiatic provinces and dependent kingdoms. Herod of Judea was rewarded for his valuable services by an extension of his territory, and several changes were made in regard to the petty principalities of Asia Minor. There was probably some expectation at Rome that Caesar, in the flush of his success, would attempt to try conclusions with the Parthian Empire and retrieve the defeat of Carrhae before he returned to Italy. Virgil addresses him at this time in high-flown language, as if he were the arbiter of peace and war in Asia as far as the Indies. But Caesar deferred the settlement of the Parthian question. In the summer of 29 BC, he returned to Italy, where he was greeted by the Senate and the people with an enthusiasm which was certainly not feigned. There was a great feeling of relief at the end of the civil wars, and men heartily welcomed Caesar as a deliverer and restorer of peace. The only note of opposition had come from a son of Marcus Aemilianus Lepidus the Triumvir. The father lived in peaceful retirement at Cercei, but the son was rash and ambitious and formed the plan of murdering Caesar on his return. He did not take his father into the secret, but his mother, Junia, a sister of Brutus, was privy to it. Mycenaeus discovered the conspiracy in good time and promptly arrested Junia and her son. Young Lepidus was immediately dispatched to Caesar in the east and was there executed. But this incident was of little consequence. Caesar's position was perfectly safe. The honors which were paid to him would have been accorded with an equal show of enthusiasm to Antonius if fortune had declared herself for him, but there is little doubt that Caesar was more acceptable. The Senate decreed that his birthday should be included among the public holidays, 
and it was afterwards regularly celebrated by races. His name was mentioned along with the gods in the Carmen Salieri, and it is probable that, had he really wished it, divine honors would have been decreed to him in Rome, such as were paid to him in Egypt, where he stepped into the place of the Ptolemies, and in Asia Minor, where he assumed the privileges of the Attalids. But though he had become a god in the East, Caesar wished to remain a man in Rome. He already possessed the tribunician power for life, but it was now granted again in an extended form. It was also decreed that every fourth anniversary of his victory should be commemorated by games, the Ludi Actiaci, and that the rostra and trophies of the captured ships should adorn the temple of the divine Julius. Triumphal arches were to be erected in the Roman Forum and at Brandusium to celebrate the victor's return to Italy, and a sacrifice of thanksgiving was offered to the gods by the Senate and the people, and by every private person. The triumph of Caesar lasted three days, August 13th, 14th, and 15th. The soldiers who had been disbanded returned to their standards in order to take part in it, and all the troops which shared in his victories were concentrated close to Rome. Each soldier received a thousand sesterces, about eight pounds, as a triumphal gift, and the Roman populace also received four hundred sesterces ahead. The triumph represented victories over the three known continents. The first days were devoted to the celebration of conquests in Europe, the subjugation of Pannonia and Dalmatia, and some successes won in Gaul over rebellious tribes by Gaius Carinus during Caesar's absence in the east. The triumph for Actium, which took place on the second day, represented a victory over the forces of Asia. The trophies were far more splendid than those won from the poor princes of Illyricum. The poet Propertius describes how he saw the necks of kings bound with golden chains, and the fleet of Actium sailing up the Via Sacra. Among the kings were Alexander of Emesa, whom Caesar had deposed after the battle, and Adiatorix, a Galatian prince, who before the battle had massacred all the Romans he could lay hands on. Both these captives were executed after the triumph. But the third day, which saw the triumph over Africa, was the most brilliant. Cleopatra had, by destroying herself, avoided the shame of adorning her conqueror's triumphal car, but a statue of her was carried in her stead, and her two young children, Alexander and Cleopatra, represented the fallen house of Egyptian royalty. Images of the Nile and Egypt were also carried in the triumphal procession, and the richest spoils, with quantities of gold and silver coins, were exhibited to the gaze of the people. The result of the great influx of money into Italy was that the rate of interest fell from 12 to 4 percent. In one respect, the order of Caesar's triumph departed from the traditional custom. His fellow consul, Marcus Valerius Messala Petitus, and the other senators who took part in the triumph, instead of heading the procession and guiding the triumphator into the city, according to usage, were placed last of all. This innovation was significant of the coming monarchy. On this occasion, the buildings which Julius Caesar had designed and begun and which had been completed since his death, were dedicated, and his own temple was consecrated by his son with special solemnity. The game of Troy was represented in the Circus Maximus by boys of noble family, divided into two parties, one of which was commanded by Caesar's stepson, Tiberius Nero, the future emperor. A statue of victory was set up in the Senate House. The occasion was further celebrated by games and gladiatorial combats, in which a Roman senator did not disdain to take part. But these festivities were less significant for the inauguration of a new period than the solemn closing of the Temple of Janus, which had been ordained by the Senate probably early in the same year, January 11th. The ceremonies instituted for such an occasion by King Numa had not been witnessed for more than two hundred years. For the last occasion on which the gates of Janus had been shut was at the conclusion of the First Punic War. Strictly speaking, peace was not yet established in every corner of the Roman realm, 
There were hostilities still going on against mountain tribes in northern Spain and on the German frontier, but these were small matters, mere child's play, which shrank to complete insignificance by the side of the civil war which had been distracting the Roman world for the last twenty years. Peace, the famous Pax Romana, had in every sense come at length, and it was fitting that the doors of war should be closed at the beginning of an empire, of which the saying that empire is peace was preeminently true. The powers which Caesar possessed as a triumvir were unconstitutional, and were by their nature intended to be only temporary. Besides the ordinary imperium domi of a consul, and extraordinary imperium militae in the provinces, the triumvir had the power of making laws and appointing magistrates, which constitutionally belonged to the Comitia of the people. When peace was restored to the world, it might be expected that Caesar would at once restore to the people the functions which had been made over to him for a time. It was quite out of the question to restore the state of things which had existed before the elevation of Caesar the dictator. The rule of the Senate had been proved to be corrupt and incompetent, and annual magistrates were powerless in the face of a body whose members held their seats for life. The only way out of the difficulty was to place the reins of government in the hands of one man. This had been done directly in the case of Caesar the father, and it had been the indirect result of the triumvirate in the case of Caesar the son. But the latter resolved to establish his supremacy on a constitutional basis, and harmonize his sovereignty with republican institutions. A dictatorship could be created only to meet some special crisis, and a triumvir to constitute the state was clearly absurd when the state had once been constituted. Neither the office of a dictator nor the powers of the triumvirate were theoretically suitable to form the foundation of a permanent government, and the logically-minded Caesar was not likely to leave the constitutional shape of his rule undefined or to be content with an inconsistent theory. He did not, however, at once lay down the triumphal powers which had been conferred on him by the Lex Titia in 43 B.C. For a year and a half after his triumph, he seems to have remained a triumvir, or at least in possession of the powers which belonged to him as triumvir, but it is not clear how far during that time he made use of those unconstitutional rights. He was consul for the fifth time in 29 B.C. and again in 28 B.C., and it is probable that he acted during these years by his rights as consul, as far as possible, and not by his rights as triumvir. There was, however, much to be done in Rome and in Italy that might truly come under the name of constituting the state. Two of the most important measures carried out in these years were the increase of the patriciate and the reform of the Senate. In 30 B.C., a law, Lexania, was passed enabling Caesar to replenish the exhausted patrician class by the admission of new families, and he carried out this measure in the following year. In 28 B.C., he exercised the functions of the censorship in conjunction with Agrippa, who was his colleague in the consulship. They not only held a census, but performed a purgation of the Senate, and introduced some reforms in its constitution. Caesar also caused all the measures which had been taken during the civil wars to be repealed, but the compass and the effect of this act are not quite clear. 28 B.C. In the same year, he marked his intention to return to the constitutional forms of the Republic by changing the consular fasces, according to custom, with his colleague Agrippa, and thus acknowledging his fellow consul to be his equal. He also began to restore the administration of the provinces to the Senate. In 27 BC, Caesar assumed the consulate for the seventh time, and Agrippa was again his colleague. It seems that he had already partly divested himself of his extraordinary powers, but the time had at length come to lay them down altogether, though only to receive equivalent power again in a different and more constitutional form. On January 13th, he resigned in the Senate 
his office as triumvir, and his proconsular imperium. And for a moment, the statement of a contemporary writer was literally true, that the ancient form of the Republic was recalled. And thus Caesar could be described on his coins as vindicator of the liberty of the Roman people, libertatis populus romanus windex. In the next chapter, we shall see in what shape Caesar and his counselors, while they nominally restored the Republic, really inaugurated an empire, which was destined to last well nigh fifteen hundred years. End of chapter 1by Philippa. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Beery. Chapter 2, The Principate. The task which devolved upon Caesar when he had resigned the triumvirate and the proconsular power, which had been conferred on him in 43 BC, was to restore the Republic, and yet place its administration in the hands of one man, to disguise the monarchy which he already possessed, under a constitutional form, to be a second Romulus, without being a king. He still held the tribunician power, which had been given him for life in 36 BC. On January the 16th, in the year of the city 727, three days after Caesar had laid down his extraordinary powers, the Roman Empire formally began. Munatius Plancus on that day proposed in the Senate that the surname Augustus should be conferred on Caesar in recognition of his services to the state. This name did not bestow any political power, but it became perhaps the most distinctive and significant name of the emperor. It suggested religious sanctity, and surrounded the son of the deified Julius with a halo of consecration. The actual power on which the empire rested, the Imperium Proconsulare, was conferred upon, or rather renewed for, Augustus, so we may now call him, for a period of ten years, but renewable after that period. This Imperium was of the same kind as that which had been given to Pompeius by the Gabinian and Manilian laws. The Imperator had an exclusive command over the armies and fleet of the Republic, and his province included all the most important frontier provinces. But this imperium was essentially military, and Rome and Italy were excluded from its sphere. It was therefore insufficient by itself to establish a sovereignty, which was to be practically a restoration of royalty, while it pretended to preserve the republican constitution. The idea of Augustus, from which his new constitution derived its special character, was to supplement and reinforce the imperium by one of the higher magistracies. His first plan was to combine the proconsular imperium with the consulship. He was consul in 27 BC, and he caused himself to be re-elected to that magistracy each year for the four following years. The consular imperium, which he thus possessed, gave him not only a locus standi in Rome and Italy, but also affected his position in the provinces. For if he only held the proconsular imperium, he was merely on a level legally with other proconsular governors, although his province was far larger than theirs. But as consul, his imperium ranked as superior, maius, over that of the proconsuls. He found, however, that there were drawbacks to this plan. As consul, he had a colleague, whose power was legally equal, and this position was clearly awkward for the head of the state. Moreover, if one consul was perpetual, the number of persons elected to the consulship must be smaller, and consequently there would be fewer men available for those offices which were only filled by men of consular rank. The consuls, too, were regarded as, in a certain way, representative of the Senate, and the Emperor, the child of the democracy, might prefer to be regarded as representative of the people. His thoughts, therefore, turned to the tribunate, which was specially the magistracy of the people. But it would have been more awkward to found supremacy in civil affairs on the authority of one of ten tribunes than on the powers of one of two consuls. 
Accordingly, Augustus fell back on the Tribunicia Potestas, which he had retained, but so far seems to have made little use of it. In 23 BC he gave up his first tentative plan, and made the Tribunicia Potestas, instead of the consulship, which he resigned on June 27th, the second pillar of his power. The Tribunician power was his for life, but he now made it annual as well as perpetual, and dated from this year the years of his reign. Thus, in a very narrow sense, the empire might be said to have begun in 23 BC. In that year, at least, the constitution of Augustus received its final form. After this year, his eleventh consulship, Augustus held that office only twice, 5 and 2 BC. Subsequent emperors generally assumed it more than once, but it was rather a distinction for the colleague than an advantage for the emperor. But the Tribunicia Potestas alone was not a sufficient substitute for the Consulare Imperium, which Augustus had surrendered by resigning the consulate. Accordingly, a series of privileges and rights were conferred upon him by special acts in 23 BC and the following years. He received the right of convening the Senate when he chose, and of proposing the first motion at its meetings, Ius Primae Relationis. His proconsular imperium was defined as superior, maius, to that of other proconsuls. He received the right of the twelve fasces in Rome, and of sitting between the consuls, and thus he was equalized with the consuls in external dignity, 19 BC. He probably received, too, the ius edicendi, that is, the power of issuing magisterial edicts. These rights, conferred upon Augustus by separate acts, were afterwards drawn up in a single form of law, by which the Senate and people conferred them on each succeeding emperor. Thus the constitutional position of the emperor rested on three bases, the proconsular imperium, the tribunician potestas, and a special law of investiture with certain other prerogatives. The title imperator expressed only the proconsular and military power of the emperor, the one word which could have expressed the sum of all his functions as head of the state, rex, was just the title which Augustus would on no account have assumed, for by doing so he would have thrown off the republican disguise which was essential to his position. The key to the empire, as Augustus constituted it, is that the emperor was a magistrate, not a monarch. But a word was wanted— which, without emphasizing any special side of the emperor's power, should indicate his supreme authority in the Republic. Augustus chose the name Princeps to do this informal duty. The name meant the first citizen in the state, Princeps Civitatis, and thus implied at once supremacy and equality, quite in accordance with the spirit of Augustus's constitution but it did not suggest any definite functions. It was purely a name of courtesy. It must be carefully distinguished from the title Princeps Senatus. The senator who was first on the list of the conscript fathers, and had the right to be asked his opinion first, was called Princeps Senatus, and that position had been assigned to Augustus in 28 BC. But when he or others spoke or wrote of the Princeps, they did not mean prince of the senate, but prince of the Roman citizens. The empire, as constituted by Augustus, is often called the Principate, as opposed to the absolute monarchy into which it developed at a later stage. The Principate is in fact a stage of the empire, and it might be said that while Augustus founded the Principate, Julius was the true founder of the empire. According to constitutional theory, the state was still governed under the Principate by the Senate and the people. The people delegated most of its functions to one man, so that the government was divided between the Senate and the man who represented the people. In the course of time, the republican forms of the constitution and the magisterial character of the emperor gradually disappeared, but at first they were clearly marked and strictly maintained. The Senate possessed some real power, assemblies of the people were held, 
Consuls, praetors, tribunes, and the other magistrates were elected as usual. The Principate was not formally a monarchy, but rather a diarchy, as German writers have called it. The princeps and the senate together ruled the state. But the fellowship was an unequal one, for the emperor, as supreme commander of the armies, had the actual power. The diarchy is a transparent fiction. The chief feature of the constitutional history of the first three centuries of the empire is the decline of the authority of the senate and the corresponding growth of the powers of the princeps until finally he becomes an absolute monarch. When this comes to pass, the empire can no longer be described as the principate. The princeps was a magistrate. His powers were entrusted to him by the people, and his position was based on the sovereignty of the people. Like any other citizen, he was bound by the laws, and if for any purpose he needed a dispensation from any law, he had to receive such dispensation from the Senate. He could not be the object of a criminal prosecution. This, however, was no special privilege, but merely an application of the general rule that no magistrate, while he is in office, can be called to account by anyone except a superior magistrate. Hence the princeps who held office for life, and had no superior, was necessarily exempted from criminal prosecution. If, however, he abdicated or were deposed, he might be tried in the criminal courts. And, as Roman law permitted processes against the dead, it often happened that a princeps was tried in the Senate after his death, and his memory condemned to dishonour, or his acts rescinded. The heavier sentence deprived him of the honour of a public funeral, and abolished the statues and monuments erected in his name, while the lighter sentence removed his name from those emperors to whose acts the magistrates swore when they entered on their office. When a princeps was not condemned, and when his acts were recognised as valid, he received the honour of consecration. The claim to consecration after death was a significant characteristic of the Principate, derived from Caesar the Dictator. He had permitted himself to be worshipped as a god during his lifetime, and though no building was set apart for his worship, his statue was set up in the temples of the gods, and he had a flamen of his own. After his death he was numbered, by a decree of the Senate and Roman people, among the gods of the Roman state, under the name of Divus Julius. His adopted son did not venture to accept divine worship at Rome during his lifetime. He was content to be the son of a god, Divi Filius, and to receive the name Augustus, which implied a certain consecration. But like Romulus, to whom he was fond of comparing himself, he was elevated to the rank of the gods after his death. It is worth observing how Augustus softened down the bolder designs of Caesar in this, as in other respects. Caesar would have restored royalty without disguise. Augustus substituted the princeps for the rex. In Rome, Caesar was a god during his lifetime. Augustus, the son of a god while he lived, a god only after death. In one important respect, the Principate differed from other magistracies. There was no such thing as designation. The successor to the post could not be appointed until the post was vacant. Hence it follows that on the death of an emperor, the empire ceased to exist until the election of his successor. The republic was in the hands of the senate and the people during the interim, and the initiative devolved upon the consuls. The principle, the king is dead, long live the king, had no application in the Roman Empire. As a magistracy, the principate was elective and not hereditary. It might be conferred on any citizen by the will of the sovereign people, and even women and children were not disqualified by their sex and age, as in the case of other magistracies. Two, or rather three, acts were necessary for the creation of the princeps, he first received the proconsular imperium, and along with it the name Augustus. Subsequently the tribunician power, and also other rights defined by the special law de imperio. 
but it must be clearly understood that his position as princeps really depended upon the proconsular imperium, which gave him exclusive command of all the soldiers of the state. Once he receives it, he is emperor. The acquisition of the tribunician power is a consequence of the acquisition of the supreme power, but is not the supreme power itself. The day on which the imperium is conferred, dies imperii, marks the beginning of a new reign. It is important to observe how the proconsular power was conferred on the princeps. It was, theoretically, delegated by the sovereign people, but was never bestowed or confirmed by the people meeting in the comitia. It was always conferred by the senate, which was supposed to act for the people. When the title imperator was first conferred by the soldiers, it required the formal confirmation of the senate, and until the confirmation took place, the candidate selected by the soldiers was a usurper. On the other hand, the imperator named by the senate, although legitimate, had no chance of maintaining his position unless he were also recognized by the soldiers. The position of the new princeps was fully established when he was acknowledged by both the senate and the army. After Augustus, the proconsular power of the princeps was perpetual, and it was free from annuity in any form. The tribunician power, on the other hand, was conferred by the people meeting in comitia. It properly required two separate legal acts, a special law defining the powers to be conferred, and an election of the person on whom they should be conferred. But these acts were combined in one, and a magistrate, probably one of the consuls, brought a rogation before the comitia, both defining the powers and nominating the person. The bill, of course, had to come before the senate first, and an interval known as the trinum nundinum elapsed between the decree of the senate and the comitia. Hence, under the earlier principate, when such forms were still observed, the assumption of the tribunician power takes place some time after the dies imperii. The tribunician power was conferred for perpetuity, but was formally assumed anew every year, so that the princeps used to count the years of his reign as the years of his tribunician power. But though the empire was thus elective, in reality the choice of the new princeps depended on the senate or the army only in the case of revolutions. In settled times the emperors chose their successors, and in their own lifetime caused the objects of their choice to be invested with some of the marks or functions of imperial dignity. It was but natural that each emperor should try to secure the continuance of the empire in his own family. If he had a son, he was sure to choose him as successor, if only a daughter, her husband or one of her children. If he had neither son nor daughter of his own, he usually adopted a near kinsman. Thus the empire, though always theoretically elective, practically tended to become hereditary, and it came to be recognized that near kinship to an emperor founded a reasonable claim to the succession. This feature was present from the very outset, for the founder of the empire himself had first assumed his place on the political stage as the son and heir of Julius, and no one was more determined or strove harder to found a dynasty than Augustus. Augustus assumed other functions and titles, as well as the proconsular imperium and the tribunician potestas, but they had no place in the theory of the imperial constitution. He was named by the Senate, the Knights and the People, Pater Patriae, 2 BC, and subsequent emperors regularly received this title. He was elected Pontifex Maximus by the people in 12 BC, March the 6th, after the death of Lepidus, who had been allowed to retain that office when he was deprived of his triumviral power. Henceforward the chief pontificate was always held by the emperors, and formed one of their standing titles. Augustus also belonged to other religious colleges. He was not only pontifex, he was also a septemvir, a quindecimvir, and an augur. He was enrolled among the fetiales, the avales, and the tissi. Augustus was not a censor, nor did he as emperor possess the powers of the censor's office, 
though he sometimes temporarily assumed them. The reason why he refrained from assuming these powers permanently is obvious. It was his aim to preserve the form of a republic, and to maintain the Senate as an independent body. One of the chief functions of the censors was to revise the list of senators. They had the power of expunging members from that body and electing new ones. It is clear that if the emperor possessed the rights of a censor, he would have direct control over the senate, and it would no longer be even nominally independent. In 28 BC, as we have seen, Augustus and Agrippa held a census as consuls, by virtue of the censorial power which originally belonged to the consular office. And on two subsequent occasions on which Augustus held a census, once by himself, 8 BC, and once in conjunction with Tiberius, 14 AD, he did not assume the title of censor, but caused consular power to be conferred on him temporarily by the Senate. In 22 BC, the people proposed to bestow on Augustus the censorship for life, but he refused the offer, and caused Paulus Aemilius Lepidus and Munatius Plancus to be appointed censors. This was the last occasion on which two private citizens were colleagues in that office. Three times it was proposed to Augustus to undertake as a perpetual office the regulation of laws and manners, morum legumque regimen, but he invariably refused. Such an institution would have been as openly subversive of republican government as royalty or the dictatorship. Nevertheless, some of the functions of the censor, and especially the Kensus Ecutum, seem from the very first to have fallen within the competence of the princeps. It should be specially observed that the princeps did not possess consular power, as is sometimes erroneously stated. Occasionally it was decreed to him temporarily for a special purpose, but it did not belong to him as princeps. While the emperor avoided the names Rex and Dictator, he distinguished himself from ordinary citizens by a peculiar arrangement of his personal name. 1. All the emperors from Augustus to Hadrian, with three exceptions, dropped the name of their gens. 2. They never designated the tribe to which they belonged. 3. Most of them adopted the title Imperator as a prinomen. This designation had been first used as a constant title by Caesar the Dictator, being placed immediately after his name and preceding all other titles. Thus it might have been regarded as a second cognomen, and the younger Caesar claimed it as part of his father's name, and, to make this clear, adopted it as a prinomen instead of his own prinomen, Gaius. All the agnate descendants of the dictator bore the name Caesar, which was a cognomen of the Julian gens. But when the house of the Julian Caesars came to an end on the death of the emperor Gaius, his successor Claudius assumed the cognomen Caesar, and this example was followed by subsequent dynasties. Thus Caesar came to be a conventional cognomen of the emperor and his house. Augustus was a title of honour. It did not, like imperator or consul, imply an office, and hence an emperor's wife could receive the title Augusta. But it was not, like Caesar, hereditary. It had to be conferred by the senate or people. At the same time it was distinctly a cognomen, and it has clung specially to him who first bore it as a personal name. It was always assumed by his successors along with the actual power, and it seemed to express that, while the various parts of the emperor's power were in their nature collegial, there could yet only be one emperor. In much later times, Augustus and Caesar were distinguished as greater and lesser titles. The emperor bore the name Augustus, while he whom the emperor chose to succeed to the throne was a Caesar. Moreover, there might be more than one Augustus, and more than one Caesar. We must carefully distinguish two different uses of imperator in the titulary style of the emperors. One, as a designation of the proconsular imperium, it was placed, as we have already seen, before the name as a prinomen. Two, imp, 
with a number standing among the titles after the name, meant that he had been greeted as imperator so many times by the soldiers in consequence of victories. Yet the two uses were regarded as closely connected, for the investiture with the proconsular imperium was regarded as the first acquisition of the name imperator, so that on the first victory after his accession the emperor designated himself as imperator II. The order of names in the imperial style is worthy of notice. In the case of the early emperors, Caesar comes after the name, for example, Imp Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus. With Vespasian begins a new style, in which Caesar generally precedes the proper cognomen, thus Imp Caesar Vespasianus Augustus. Augustus retained its place at the end. The Princeps had the right of appearing publicly at all seasons in the purple-edged toga of a magistrate. On the occasion of solemn festivals he used to wear the purple gold-broidered toga, which was worn by victorious generals in triumphal procession. And although in Italy he did not possess the imperium militiae, he had the right to wear the purple paludamentum, purpura, of the imperator even in Rome, but this was a privilege of which early emperors seldom availed themselves. The distinctive headdress of the princeps was a laurel wreath. As imperator he wore the sword, but the scepter only in triumphal processions. Both in the senate house and elsewhere he sat on a cella curulis, and he was attended by twelve lictors like the other chief magistrates. His safety was provided for by a bodyguard, generally consisting of German soldiers, and one cohort of the Praetorian Guards was constantly stationed at his palace. Under the Republic the formula of public oaths was couched in the name of Jupiter and the penates of the Roman people. Caesar the dictator added his own genius, and this fashion was followed under the Principate. The oath was framed in the name of Jupiter, those emperors who had become divine after death, the genius of the reigning emperor, and the penates. The princeps also had the privilege of being included in the vota, or prayers for the welfare of the state, which it was customary to offer up in the first month of every year, and it was regarded as treason to encroach on either of these privileges, to swear by the genius or offer public vows for the safety of any other than the emperor. After the Battle of Actium, the birthday of Augustus had been elevated to a public feast, and hence it became the custom to celebrate publicly the birthday of every reigning emperor, and also the day of his accession. Like other men of distinction, the princeps gave morning receptions, which however differed from those of private persons, in that every person who wished, provided he was of sufficiently high rank, was admitted. It was part of the policy of Augustus to treat men of his own rank as peers, and in social intercourse to behave merely as an aristocrat among fellow aristocrats. There was formerly no such thing as court etiquette, and the emperor's palatium was merely a private house. But the political difference which set the princeps above all his fellow citizens could not fail to have its social consequences, however much Augustus wished to seem a peer among peers. Those persons whom Augustus admitted to the honour of his friendship, and they belonged chiefly to the senatorial, in a few cases to the equestrian ranks, came to form a distinct, though not officially recognised, body under the name Amici Caesaris, friends of Caesar. From this circle he selected his comites, or companions, the retinue which accompanied him when he travelled in the provinces. The amici were expected to attend the morning receptions, and were greeted with a kiss. They wore a ring with the image of the emperor. They were received in some order of precedence, and gradually they came to be divided into classes according to their intimacy with the emperor, and admission into the circle of amici became a formal act. To lose the possession of a friend of Caesar entailed consequences equivalent to exile. Invitations to dine with the emperor were also probably limited to the amici. Thus, at the very beginning of the Principate, 
there were the elements of the elaborate system of court ceremonial which was developed in later centuries. The position of the comites was more definitely marked out. They received allowances and had special quarters in the camp. They had also precedence over provincial governors. The distinction of having been a comes of Caesar is often mentioned on inscriptions among official honours. It was not lawful under the free commonwealth to set up in any public place the image of a living man. The image of the princeps might be set up anywhere, and there were two cases in which it was obligatory that it should appear, namely in military shrines along with the eagle and the standards, and on coins. Sometimes it appeared on the standards themselves. In regard to coinage, Augustus held fast the royal privilege which had been accorded by the Senate to Caesar in 44 BC, and the right of being represented on the money of the realm was exclusively reserved for the emperor, or those members of the imperial house, on whom he might choose to confer it. End of chapter 2《The Student's Roman Empire Part I》by John Bagnell Bury Chapter 3 — The Joint Government of the Princeps and Senate Sections 1 and 2 Section 1 — Political Position of the Princeps, the People In the last chapter it was shown how Augustus established the Principate, and we became acquainted with the constitutional theory of this new phase of the Roman Republic, which was really a disguised monarchy. We also learned the titles and insignia, which were the outward marks of the ambiguous position of the monarch who affected to be a private citizen. It remains now to examine more closely his political powers, and see how the government of the state was divided between the princeps and the senate, according to the system of Augustus. The proconsular imperium of the emperor differed from that of the ordinary proconsul in three ways. Firstly, the entire army stood under the direct command of the emperor. Secondly, his imperium was not limited, except in the case of Augustus himself, to a special period. It was given for life. And thirdly, it not only extended directly over a far larger space, the emperor's province, including a multitude of important provinces, than that of an ordinary proconsul, but being maius or superior above that of all others, it could be applied in the senatorial provinces which they governed, and thus it really extended over the whole empire. As a consequence of his exclusive military command, it devolved upon the emperor exclusively to pay the troops, to appoint officers, to release soldiers from service. The soldiers took the military oath of obedience to him. He alone possessed the right of levying troops, and any one who levied troops without an imperial command committed an act of treason. He granted all military honors except triumphs and the triumphal ornaments. Moreover, while an ordinary proconsul lost his imperium on leaving his district, the emperor lived in Rome without surrendering the imperium although Rome and Italy were accepted from its operation. The emperor possessed also supreme command at sea, and had the Praetorian guards, formed of Italian volunteers, at his disposal as a stationary garrison in Rome. In connection with the proconsular power is the sovereign right which the emperor possessed for making war and peace. But this was probably conferred upon Augustus by a special enactment and was afterwards one of the prerogatives defined by the Lex de Imperial. The rights which the princeps derived from the Tribunician power as such were as follows. 1. He had the right to preside on the bench of the tribunes of the people. 2. He had the right of intercession, which he often practiced against decrees of the Senate. 3. He possessed the Tribunician coercitio, his person was inviolable, and not only an injury, but any indignity in act or speech offered to him was punishable. 4. He had also the right to interfere with the prevention of abuses, and to protect the oppressed. 5. 
it is possible that his power to initiate legislation may partly come under this head. Besides these powers springing from the tribunician potestas, the princeps possessed, as we have seen, other prerogatives defined by the lex de imperio. Although the sovereign people was now represented by a princeps, it had still some political duties to perform itself. The popular assemblies still met, elected magistrates, and made laws. The following points are to be observed. 1. Augustus formally deprived the people of the judicial powers which had belonged to it. 2. The Comitia Tributa continued to be a legislative assembly, and the right of making laws was never formally taken away from it. But by indirect means, as will presently be explained, legislation almost entirely passed into the hands of the emperor, and under the reign of Tiberius, laws were not made by the Comitia. For a long time, however, the form of conferring the tribunician power in an assembly of the people was maintained. The assembly for this purpose was called Comitia Tribunicix Potestatis. 3. The election of magistrates was the most important function of the popular assemblies under Augustus. Constitutionally, the councils and praetors were elected in the Comitia of the centuries, while the tribunes, aediles, and quaestors were chosen in the Comitia of the tribes. But after the foundation of the empire, the distinction between the Comitia Centuriata and the Comitia Tributa seems to have disappeared and it is only safe to speak generally of an assembly of the people. The chief function of the Comitia Curiata had been to pass Legis de Imperio, and there was room for it to exercise its powers on the five or six occasions on which the proconsular imperium was conferred on Augustus. But it is not clear whether on these occasions an assembly of the people was consulted at all, much less whether, if so, the assembly took the special form of a curiate assembly. But whatever may have been the theory, and however tenderly republican forms were preserved by Augustus, the people practically lost all its political power. And this was quite right. In ancient times, before the introduction of representative government, popular assemblies worked very well for governing a town and a small surrounding territory, but were quite unsuitable for directing or deciding the policy of a great empire. Moreover, with extended franchise, it was impossible that all those who were entitled to vote in the assemblies could avail themselves of the privilege. And as a matter of fact, the comitia in the later republic were chiefly attended by the worst and least responsible voters, and were often the scenes of riot and bloodshed. Section 2. The Princeps and Senate The government of the empire was divided between the emperor and the senate, and the position of the senate was a very important one. Augustus made some changes in its constitution. The number of the senate had been raised by Julius Caesar to 900. Augustus reduced it again to 600. He also fixed the property qualification for senators at one million sesterces, about eight thousand pounds. Those who had held the office of quaestor had, as under the Republic, the right of admission to the order, and the age was definitely fixed at twenty-five. The senatorial classes were still determined by official rank, councillors, praetorians, etc. Thus the constitution of the Senate formally depended on the people, as the people elected the magistrates. The influence of the emperor, however, was exerted in two ways. One, the emperor was able to influence the election of magistrates in the popular assembly, and two, he could assume the powers of censor and perform electio senatus. Augustus purified the senate on several occasions. The censor, or he who possessed the censorial power under the principate, Always after 22 B.C., though not necessarily, the princeps himself, with or without a colleague, could not only place by ad lectio a non-senator in the Senate, but could assign him a place in a rank higher than the lowest. In fact, ad lection among the quaestorians, the lowest class, was uncommon, 
election either into the tribunician or into the praetorian class was the rule. Election into the highest rank of all, the consulares, was practiced by Caesar the dictator, but not by Caesar the first princeps, or any of his successors up to the third century. When it became usual, as it did before the death of Augustus, to elect half-yearly instead of annual councils, the influence which the emperor could exert on the elections gave him much of the power which Caesar the dictator exerted by adlectio interconsulares. A list of the senate was made up every year. The emperor also exerted a great influence on the constitution of the senate in another way. Admission into the senate in the ordinary course depended on the quaestorship, and the quaestorship depended on the vigintivirate. The rule was that only those who belonged to the senatorial rank could be candidates for the vigintivirate. Here, adlection could not come in. But the emperor assumed the right of admitting as candidates for the vigintivirate persons outside the senatorial class by bestowing upon them the latus clavus. Thus a young knight, not born of a senatorial family, might, by the emperor's favor, enter on a senatorial career and become a member of the senate. The poet Ovid, who by birth belonged to the equestrian order, is a well-known example. The emperor seems to have had the power of granting a dispensation which allowed persons who had not been vigintivari to become quaestors. It should be observed that in the senatorial career, cursus honorium, military service, generally for a year in one legion, was necessary. The usual steps were, one, vigintivirate, two, military tribunate, three, quaestorship, four, aedileship or tribunate, five, praetorship, six, consulate. Hence the vigintivoral offices were called by Ovid the first offices of tender age. The princeps was himself not only a senator, but the prince of the senate. His name stood first on the list of senators, and he possessed the right of voting first. He did not, however, adopt princeps senatus as one of his titles, as it was his policy rather to distinguish himself from than to identify himself with the senate. Special clauses of the Lex de Imperio conferred upon him further rights in regard to the transactions of that body. He had the rights of summoning the Senate, a right which he might have claimed by virtue of the tribunician power itself, and of introducing bills, relatio, either orally, or in the case of his absence, by writing, the proposal being couched in the form of an oratio, or literae, ad senatum. His tribunician power gave him the right, as we have already seen, of cancelling senatus consulta. The reports of the transactions in the Curia were always laid before Augustus when he was not present himself, and he appointed a special officer as his representative to see that the reports were drawn up in full and nothing important omitted. This officer was called curator actorum, or ab actus senatus. Augustus introduced the practice of forming senatorial committees to consult beforehand, in conjunction with himself, on measures which were to come before the Senate. They consisted of one magistrate from each college, and fifteen senators chosen by lot every six months, and formed a sort of cabinet council. In the last year of his life, when, owing to his weakness and advanced age, he could no longer appear in the Curia, a small senate was empowered to meet in his house and pass resolutions in the name of the whole senate. This body consisted of his son, his two grandsons, the councils in office and the councils designate, twenty senators chosen for a year, and other senators whom the emperor himself selected for each sitting. This political concilium was no part of the constitution, and was in fact under the early principate, only adopted by Augustus himself and his successor Tiberius. It must be carefully distinguished from the judicial concilium, which will be mentioned below. It has been already mentioned that the joint rule of the empire by the emperor and the senate is sometimes called a diarchy. 
It was a diarchy that might at any moment become openly, as it was virtually, a monarchy. For the emperor possessed the actual power through his control of the army, and if he had chosen to exert force, he might have destroyed the political existence of the senate. But the change of the diarchy into a monarchy was wrought gradually, and was partly due to the incompetence of the senate, which invited the interference of the sovereigns. The Maius Imperium was changed by degrees into the direct rule of those provinces which were not part of the emperor's proconsular province. But Augustus was thoroughly in earnest in giving to the Senate a distinct political position and substantial powers. He carefully abstained from interfering in the provinces which were not within his imperium. He was a man of compromise, and the constitution which he framed was intended to be a compromise between the democratic monarchy, which as the son of Julius he really represented, and the aristocracy. He was anxious to wipe out the memory of the civil wars, and to have it forgotten that he had been the champion of the democracy. While he continued to bear the name of the divine Julius, he seems not to have cared to dwell on the acts of the great dictator, and it has often been noticed how rarely the poets of the Augustan age celebrate the praises of Julius Caesar. We may safely say that no statesman has ever surpassed Augustus in the art of withholding from political facts their right names. There are many points in the Augustan system which are not plain in their constitutional bearings, but the general lines are clear enough. The careful balancing between the rights and duties of the two political powers produced some artificial arrangements which could not last, and which were soon altered, either formally or tacitly, at the expense of the Senate. But the main principle of the system founded by Augustus, the fiction of the independent and coordinate government of the Senate, was not entirely abandoned for three centuries. The division of the labors and privileges of government between the Senate and the Emperor may be considered under five heads, administration, jurisdiction, election of magistrates, legislation, and finances. 1. Most of the administrative functions which the Senate discharged under the Republic, especially in its later period, did not belong to that body by constitutional right, but were acquired at the expense of the supreme magistrates, to whom they truly belonged. Many of these powers were confirmed to it under the empire. a. The powers which the Senate had exercised in the sphere of religion, such as the suppression of foreign or profane rites, it continued to exercise in the imperial period. b. The rights of making war and peace, and negotiating with foreign powers, were taken away from the Senate, but in unimportant cases, the emperor sometimes referred foreign embassies to that body. c. The authority of the Senate in the affairs of Italy continued unimpaired. d. The affairs of Rome were at first entirely under the management of the Senate, but the incompetent administration of that body soon demanded the intervention of the emperor. e. The provinces were divided into imperial and senatorial, and the administration of the latter was in the hands of the Senate. But the emperor had certain powers in the senatorial provinces, as will be explained in a later chapter. On the other hand, the Senate had a small hold on the imperial provinces, except Egypt, insofar as the emperor appointed only senators as his governors. 2. The Senate, as the council of the chief magistrates, sometimes exercised judicial functions under the Republic, as, for example, in the case of the Bacchic Orgies, 186 B.C. But such cases were only exceptional. Augustus made the Senate a permanent court of justice, in which the council acted as the presiding judge. This court could try all criminal cases, but in practice only important causes in which people of high rank were involved, or in which no specific law was applicable, came before it. The emperor could influence this court in two ways. One, he was himself a member of it, and two, by the right of intercession, which he possessed in virtue of his tribunician power. Besides the court of the council, in which the senate acted as jury, 
there was the court of the emperor. He could pass judgment without a jury, though he generally called in the aid of assessors, who were called his concilium, a distinct body from the political concilium mentioned above. Every case might come before his court as before that of the senate, but practically he only tried cases of political importance, or in which persons of high position were involved. It lay in the nature of things that in these two new courts only special and important cases were tried. Ordinary processes in Rome and Italy were decided, as in former days, by the ordinary courts of the praetors, questiones perpetuae, who still continued to exercise their judicial functions. But senators were now entirely excluded from the bench of Eudices, who appear to have been nominated by the emperor. In the provinces justice was administered by the governors, but they had no jurisdiction over Roman citizens, unless it was specially delegated to them by the emperor. Roman citizens could always appeal from the provincial courts to the higher courts at Rome. The appellatio of the princeps seems to have been made legal by a measure of 30 B.C. On the principle of the division of power between senate and princeps, appeals from the decrees of the governors of senatorial provinces should have been exclusively directed to the senate. But on the strength of his imperium maius, the emperor often received appeals from senatorial as well as from imperial provinces. Appeal could only be made against the sentence of an official to whom the judicial power had been delegated. It could not be made directly against a jury. But it could be made against the decree of the magistrate which appointed the jury. 3. Under Augustus the Senate had no voice in the election of magistrates. The emperor was himself able to control the elections of the comitia in two ways. One, he had the right to test the qualification of the candidates and conduct the proceedings of the election. This right regularly belonged to the councils. But when Augustus set aside the consulate for the Tribunician power in 23 BC, it seems that he reserved this right by some special clause. He was thus able to publish a list of candidates and so nominate those whom he wished to be elected. He used only to nominate as many as there were vacancies. 2. He had the right of commendation, commendatio or suffragatio, that is, he could name certain persons as suitable to fill certain offices, and these candidates recommended by the emperor, candidati principis, were returned as a matter of course. The highest office, however, the consulate, was accepted from the right of commendation. 4. In regard to legislation, the Senate was theoretically in a better position under the Empire than under the Republic. Originally and strictly, it had no power of legislation whatever. The decisions of the Senate, embodied in the Senatus Consulta, did not constitutionally become law until they were approved and passed by an assembly of the people. But practically, they came to have legal force. The confirmation of the people came to be a mere form, and sometimes the form was omitted. It is possible that it was omitted in the case of the decree which conferred the imperium on Augustus. Under Augustus, the Senate became a legislative body, and in this respect took the place of the assembly of the people. From it and in its name issued the laws, Senatus Consulta, which the emperors wished to enact just as the laws, leges, proposed by the republican magistrates were made by the people. The Senate alone had the power of passing laws to dispense from the operation of other laws, and the emperor himself, who was bound by the laws like any other citizen, had to resort to it for this purpose. For example, in 24 BC, a senatus consultum freed Augustus from the Cincian law which fixed a maximum for donations. The special exception of particular persons from the law which defined a least age for holding the magistracies was at first a prerogative of the Senate, but the princeps gradually usurped it. To the Senate also belonged exclusively the right of decreeing a triumph, of consecrating or condemning the princeps after death, and of licensing collegia. 
the princeps had no direct right to make laws, more than a council or a tribune. Like these magistrates, he had by virtue of his tribunician power the right to propose or introduce a law at the comitia for the people to pass. But this form of initiating legislation was little used, and was entirely given up by the successor of Augustus. It would seem that it did not harmonize with the monarchical essence of the principate. It placed the princeps on a level with the other magistrates, and perhaps it recognized too openly the sovereign right of the people, which, in point of fact, the emperor had usurped. But formally the princeps had no right to make laws himself, and thus Augustus as princeps was less powerful than Caesar as triumvir, but the restraint was evaded in several ways, and as a matter of fact the emperor was the lawgiver. By special enactments he was authorized to grant to both corporations and individuals rights which were properly only conferred by the comitia. It was the princeps who founded colonies and gave them Roman citizenship. It was he who bestowed upon a subject community the dignity of Ius Latinum, or a Latin community to full Roman citizenship. It was quite logical that these powers should be transferred to the princeps in his capacity of imperator, as sovereign over the provinces and dispenser of peace and war and maker of treaties. He also used to define the local statutes for a new colony. He had the right to grant Roman citizenship to soldiers at all events, perhaps also to others. Apart from these leges dete, which were properly comitial laws, the most important mode of imperial legislation was by constitutions, which did not require the assistance of either senate or comitia. These imperial measures took the form either of, one, edicts, which as a magistrate the princeps was specially empowered to issue, or of two, acta, decreta or epistole, decisions and regulations of the emperor which primarily applied only to special cases, but were generalized and adopted as universally binding laws. The validity of the imperial acta was recognized in a special clause of the Lex de Imperio, and the oath taken by senators and magistrates included a recognition of their validity. But their validity ceased on the death of the princeps, and this fact illustrates the important constitutional difference between the principate and monarchy. 5. The financial system of the state was modified by the division of the government between the emperor and the senate. There were now two treasuries instead of one. The old aerarium Saturni was retained by the senate. Under the republic, the aerarium was under the charge of the quaestors, but by Augustus the duty was transferred to two praetors, 23 B.C., praetores aerarii. The emperor's treasury was called the fiscus, and from it he had to defray the costs of the provincial administration, the maintenance of the army and fleets, the corn supply, etc. It is to be observed that provincial territory in the imperial provinces was now regarded as the property, not of the state, but of the emperor, and therefore the proceeds derived from the land taxes went into the fiscus. From a strictly legal point of view, the fiscus was as much the private property of the emperor as the personal property which he inherited, patrimonium, or acquired as a private citizen, res privata. But at first the latter was kept apart from the fiscus, which belonged to him in his political capacity. His personal property, however, soon became looked upon, not indeed as fiscal, but as in a certain sense imperial, crown property as we should say, and devolving by right on his successor. The expenses which the aerarium was called upon to defray under the principate were chiefly, 1. Public religious worship, 2. Public festivals, 3. Maintenance of public buildings, four, occasional erection of new buildings, and five, construction of public roads in Rome and Italy, to which, however, the fisc also contributed. Indeed, it is impossible to distinguish accurately the division between the two treasuries. In the senatorial provinces, the taxes were at first collected on the farming system, which had prevailed under the Republic, 
but this system was abandoned before long, and finally the collection of the taxes in the senatorial as well as the imperial provinces was conducted by imperial officers. But the tendency was to consign the duty of collecting the taxes to the communities themselves, and in later times this became the system universally. In the arrangements for minting money, also, a division was made by Augustus between the emperor and senate. At first, 27 BC, both senate and emperor could issue gold and silver coinage at the expense of the aerarium and the imperial treasury, respectively. Copper coinage ceased altogether for a time. But when copper was again issued about twelve years later, a new arrangement was made. The princeps reserved for himself exclusively the coining of gold and silver, and gave the coining of copper exclusively to the senate. This was an advantage for the senate, and a serious limit on the power of the princeps. For the exchange value of the copper always exceeded the value of the metal, and thus the senate had the power, which the princeps did not possess, of issuing an unlimited quantity of credit money. In later times we shall see that the emperors could not resist the temptation of depreciating the value of silver, and thus assuming the same privilege. One of the most important functions of the senate under the emperors was that it served as an organ of publication, and kept the public in communication with the government. The emperor could communicate to the senate important events at home or abroad, and though these communications were not formally public, they reached the public ear. It was usual for a new princeps on his accession to lay before the senate a program of his intended policy, and this was of course designed for the benefit of a much larger audience than that assembled in the Curia. End of chapter 3, sections 1 and 2. Recording by Tricia G. Org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 3, The Joint Government of the Princeps and the Senate, Sections 3 and 4. Section 3, The Princeps and the Magistrates. We have seen that the Republican magistrates continued to be elected under the Empire, and they were still supposed to exercise their functions independently. Under the dictatorship of Julius Caesar, they had been subject to the Maius Imperium of the dictator, but it was not so under the Principate. The Princeps has no Maius Imperium over them, as he has over the proconsul abroad. His power is only coordinate, but on the other hand it is quite independent. The dignity of the consulate was maintained, and it was still a coveted post. Indeed new, though reflected, luster seemed to be shed on the supreme magistracy, by the fact that it was the only magistracy which the princeps deigned occasionally to hold himself. To be the emperor's colleague was a great distinction indeed. The consuls still gave their name to the year of their office, and they retained the right of conducting and controlling the elections in the popular assemblies. It has already been mentioned that a new senatorial court was instituted, in which they were the presiding judges. Augustus also assigned the consuls some new duties in civil jurisdiction, but he introduced the fashion of replacing the consuls who entered upon office in January by a new pair of consuli suffecti at the end of six months. This custom, however, was not definitely legalized and was sometimes not observed. In later times, four monthly consulates were introduced, and later still two monthly. The number of praetors had been increased to sixteen by Julius Caesar. Augustus at first reduced the number to eight. He then added two praetoris arari. Afterwards he increased them again to sixteen, but finally fixed the number at twelve. The chief duties of the praetors were, as before, judicial. But Augustus assigned to them the obligation of celebrating public games, which formerly had devolved upon the consuls and the aediles. A college of ten tribunes were still elected every year, but the office became unimportant, and the chief duties of a tribune were municipal. The aediles also lost many of their functions. 
Augustus divided the city of Rome into fourteen regions, over each of which an overseer or prefect presided. These overseers were chosen from the praetors, aediles, and tribunes. The quaestorship was a more serious and laborious office. Sulla had fixed the number of quaestors at twenty. Julius Caesar raised it to forty. Augustus reduced it again to twenty. Quaestors were assigned to the governors of senatorial provinces. The proconsul of Sicily had two. Two quaestors were at the disposal of the emperor to bear communications between him and the senate. The consuls had four quaestors, and these were two quaestores urbani. This magistracy had an importance over and above its proper functions, in that it qualified for admission into the senate. Thus, as long as the quaestors were elected by the comitia, the people had a direct voice in the formation of the senate, and thus, too, the emperor, by his right of commendation already mentioned, exercised a great though indirect influence on the constitution of that body. The vigintivirate was held before the quaestorship. It comprised four distinct boards. The tresviri capitales, on whom it devolved to execute capital sentences, the tresviri monetales, who presided at the mint, the quatuor viri viis in urbe purgandis, officers who looked after the streets of Rome, and the disumveri slitibus uticandus, who were now appointed to preside in the centum viral courts. The republican magistrates formed a civil service and executive for the senate. The princeps had no such assistance at his disposal. As a magistrate he was supposed, like a consul or praetor, to do everything himself. The personal activity, which is presupposed on the part of the princeps, is one of the features which distinguish the principate from monarchy. It followed, as a consequence of this theory, that all the officials who carried out the details of administration for which the emperor was responsible were not public officers, but the private servants of the emperor. A freedman fulfilled duties which in a monarchy would devolve upon a secretary of state. The emperor had theoretically a perfect right to have appointed, if he chose, freedmen, or citizens of any rank, as governors in the provinces which he was supposed to govern himself. It was due to the sound policy of Augustus and his self-control that he made it a strict rule, which his successors maintained, only to appoint senators, and in certain cases knights, to those posts. He also voluntarily defined the qualification of equestrian rank for the financial officers, Procuratorius Augusti, who represented him in the provinces. But the position of the knights must be more fully explained. Section 4. The Equites The equestrian order was reorganized by Augustus, and altered both in its constitution and in its political position. 1. Constitution. In the early republic, the equites were the citizen cavalry, who were provided with horses for their military service at public cost, but in the later republic there had come to be three classes of equites, those who were provided with public horses, equus romanus equo publico, those who provided their own horses, and those who by estate or otherwise were qualified for cavalry service but did not serve. The two last classes were not in the strictest speech Roman knights, and they were abolished altogether by Augustus, who thus returned to the system of the early republic. Henceforward every knight is an equus romanu equo publico, and the whole ordo equester consists of such. 2. Admission. The emperor himself assumed the right of granting the public horse which secured entry into the equestrian order. The chief qualifications were the equestrian census, free birth, soundness of body, good character, but the qualification of free birth was not strictly insisted on under the empire, and freedmen were often raised to be knights. A senator's son necessarily became a knight by virtue of his birth, and thus for men born in senatorial rank, knighthood was a regular stage before entry into the senate. There was a special official department, ad census equitum Romanorum, 
for investigating the qualifications of those who were admitted into either of the two orders, ordo uterque, as the senate and the knights were called. 3. Life tenure. Another innovation of Augustus consisted in making the rank of knight tenable for life. Apart from degradation, as a punishment or a consequence of the reduction of his income below the equestrian rating, 400,000 sesterces, a knight does not cease to be a knight unless he becomes a senator or enters legionary service. Legionary service was so attractive under the empire that cases often occurred of knights surrendering their rank in order to become centurions. 4. Equitum probatio. It was an old custom that the equites Romanae equo publico should ride annually, on the Ides of July, in full military comparison from the Temple of Mars at the Porta Capena, first to the Forum to offer sacrifice there to their patron gods, Castor and Pollux, and then on to the capital. This procession, called the Transvectio Equitum, had fallen into disuse, and Augustus revived it and combined it with an equitum probatio, or review of the knights. Sitting on horseback and ordered according to their terme, the knights passed before the emperor, and the name of each was called aloud. The names of any whose behavior had given cause for censure were passed over, and they were thus expelled from the order. Here the emperor discharged duties, which before the time of Sulla had been discharged by the censors. He was assisted by three or ten senators appointed for the purpose. 5. Organization. The equestrian order was divided into terme, six in number, each of which was commanded by one of the Severi Equitum Romanorum. The Severi were nominated by the emperor and changed annually like the magistrates. They were obliged to exhibit games, ludi siverales, every year. It is to be observed that the knights were not organized or treated as a political body like the Senate. They had no machinery for action, no common political initiative, no common purse. 6. Privileges In dress, the Roman equus were distinguished by the military mantle called trebia, and the narrow purple stripe, angustus clavis, on the tunic. They also wore a gold ring and this was considered so distinctively a badge of knighthood that the bestowal of a gold ring by the emperor became the form of bestowing knighthood. The children of a knight, like those of a senator, were entitled to wear the gold bulla. In the theater, special seats, the fourteen rows, were reserved for the knights, and Augustus, 5 A.D., assigned them special seats also at races in the circus and at gladiatorial spectacles. 7. Service of the Knights as Officers The chief aim of Augustus in reorganizing the knights was military. He desired to procure competent officers in the army, from which posts he excluded senators entirely. Men of senatorial rank, however, who, as has been already mentioned, became knights before they were old enough to enter the Senate, regularly served a militia, as it was called. The officer posts here referred to are the subordinate commands, not the supreme commands of legions, and are of three kinds. a. Profectura cohortis, or command of an auxiliary cohort. b. Tribunatus militum, in a legion. c. Prefectura ale, command of an auxiliary cavalry squadron. The emperor, as the supreme military commander, made the appointments to these milite equestres. Service as officers seems to have been made obligatory on the knights by Augustus. As knights only could hold these posts, there was no system of regular promotion for soldiers into the officer class. But it often happened that soldiers who had distinguished themselves and had risen to the first rank of centurions, who corresponded somewhat to our non-commissioned officers, received the ecus publicus from the emperor, and thus were able to become tribunes and prefects. As a rule, the officers held their posts for several years, and it was considered a privilege to hold the tribunatus semestris, which could be laid down after six months. 8. Service of Knights as Jurymen In 122 B.C., 
C. Gracchus had assigned the right of serving as eudices exclusively to the knights. Forty years later, 81 B.C., Sulla restored it to the Senate. Then, in 70 B.C., a compromise between the two orders was made by the law of L. Aurelius Cata, whereby the list of jurymen was composed of three classes, called decuriae, the first consisting entirely of senators, the second of knights equo publico, the third of tribuni arari. As the last class possessed the equestrian census and belonged to the equestrian order in the wide sense in which the term was then used, although they had not the equus publicus, this law of Cata really gave the preponderance to the knights. The total number of eudices was nine hundred, each class contributing three hundred. This arrangement lasted till 46 B.C., when Caesar removed the tribuni arari from the third class and filled it with knights in the strict sense. Augustus excluded the senators altogether from service as eudices, and while he preserved the three decuriae, filled them with knights. But he added a fourth decuria for service in unimportant civil trials, consisting of men who possessed more than half the equestrian income, ducenarii. Only men of at least thirty years of age were placed on the list of eudices, and, in the time of Augustus, only citizens of Rome or Italy. 9. Employment of Knights in State Offices by reserving the posts of officers and eudices for the knights to the exclusion of the senators, Augustus was carrying out the design of C. Gracchus and giving the knights an important political position, so that they were in some measure coordinated with the senate as a factor in the state. But he went much further than this. He divided the offices of administration and the public posts between the senators and the knights. The general principle of division was that those spheres of administration, which are more closely connected with the emperor personally, were given to knights. The legateships of legions, however, were reserved for senators, as also the governorships of those provinces which had been annexed under the Republic. But new annexations, such as Egypt, Noricum, and Raetia, were entrusted to knights, and likewise the commands of new institutions, such as the fleet and the auxiliary troops. Financial offices, the collection of taxes, and those posts in Rome and Italy, to be mentioned in chapter 5, which the emperor took charge of, were also reserved for knights. The selection of the procuratores Augusti, or tax officers, in the provinces from the knights alone was some compensation to them for the loss of the remunerative field which they had occupied under the Republic as Publicani. As the taxes in the imperial provinces were no longer farmed, but directly levied from the provincials, the occupation of the knights as middlemen, by which they had been able to accumulate capital and so acquire political influence, was gone. Under the Principate they were an official class. Those knights who held high imperial offices were called equites illustres, 10. Elevation of Knights to the Senate Knights of senatorial rank, that is, sons of senators, who had not yet entered the Senate, formed a special class within the equestrian order, to which they, as a rule, only temporarily belonged, and wore the badges of their senatorial birth. They could ordinarily become senators on reaching the age of twenty-five. For knights who were not of senatorial rank, there was no regular system of advancement to the Senate. But the emperor, by assuming censorial functions, could exercise the right of adlectio and admit knights into the Senate. It seems to have been a regular usage to admit into the Senate the commander of the Praetorian Guards when he vacated that post. End of chapter 3, sections 3 and 4 Recording by Tricia G. The Students' Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 4. The Family of Augustus and His Plans to Found a Dynasty. While Augustus was constructing the new constitution, he had many tasks of other kinds, administrative, military, and diplomatic, to perform. 
He had to regulate the relations of the Roman state with neighbouring powers in the east. He had to secure the northern frontier of the empire on the Rhine and the Danube against the German barbarians, and to carry out there the work begun by Caesar his father. He had to improve the administration in Italy and Rome, and step in if the senate of the empire failed to perform its duties. He had to reform the provincial administration which had been so disgracefully managed by the senate of the republic. Besides this, he had to make his own position safe by keeping his fellow-citizens content. He had to see that the nobles and the people were provided with employment and amusement. Finally, he had to look forward into the future and take measures to ensure the permanence of the system which he had called into being. This last task of Augustus, his plans and his disappointments in the choice of a successor to his power, will form the subject of the present chapter. It is needful, first of all, to obtain a clear view of his family relationships. Augustus was married three times. 1. He had been betrothed to a daughter of Publius Servilius Isauricus, but political motives induced him to abandon this alliance and marry Clodia, daughter of Fulvia, in order to seal a reconciliation with her stepfather, Marcus Antonius. In consequence, however, of a quarrel with her mother, he put her away before the marriage was consummated. 2. His second wife was Scribonia, twice a widow, whom he also married for political reasons, namely in order to conciliate Sextus Pompeius, whose father-in-law, Scribonius Libo, was Scribonia's brother. By her one child was born to him in 39 BC, unluckily a daughter, for had it been a son, much anxiety and sorrow might have been spared him. Her name was Julia. He divorced Scribonia in order to marry, three, Livia, the widow of Tiberius Claudius Nero, 38 BC. Livia was herself a daughter of the Claudian house, for her father, Marcus Livius Drusus Claudianus, was, as his name shows, a Claudius adopted into the Livian gens. She was a beautiful and talented woman, whom he truly loved, and it was a sore disappointment to him that they had no children. Livia, however, brought her husband two stepsons, Tiberius Claudius Nero, born in 42 BC, and Nero Claudius Drusus, born in 38 BC, after her marriage with Augustus and suspected to be really his son. Besides his daughter Julia and his wife Livia, another woman possessed great influence with the emperor, and played an important part in the affairs of the time. This was his sister, Octavia. She was married twice, first to Caius Claudius Marcellus, and secondly, for political reasons, to Marcus Antonius. By her first marriage she had a son, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, born 43 BC, and a daughter, Marcella. It is necessary to say a word here about the political position of the emperor's kindred. The imperial house embraced the male and female descendants in male, agnatic line from the founder of the dynasty, the wife of the emperor, and the wives of the male descendants. Thus Livia and Julia belonged to the house of Augustus, but Octavia did not belong to it, nor Julia's children, until Augustus adopted them. The distinctive privilege possessed by members of the imperial house was that they were inviolable and sacrosanct, like the tribunes. This right dated from the triumviral period, and thus is explained how it was that Octavia, though not one of the imperial house, possessed tribunician sacrosanctity. She had acquired it not as the sister of Caesar, but as the wife of Antonius. Soon it became the custom for the soldiers to take an oath of fidelity to the whole house of the Caesars, but this custom hardly existed under Augustus himself. Under the first princeps, the members of his house enjoyed few honours and privileges compared with those which were acquired by them in later reigns. It has been already seen that, constitutionally, the emperor has no voice in appointing a successor to the principate, for neither designation nor heredity was recognised. 
Augustus had to find a practical way for escaping this constitutional principle, and securing that the system which he founded should not come to an end on his own death, and that he should have a capable successor. The plan which he adopted was an institution which had no official name, but which was equivalent to a co-regency. He appointed a consort in the imperial power. There was no constitutional difficulty in this. The institution of collegial power was familiar to Roman law and Roman practice, and the two elements of imperial authority, the imperium and the tribunician power, could be held by more than one. But at the same time the consort was not the peer of the emperor. He could only be subsidiary. There could be only one princeps, only one Augustus. In fact, the consort held in relation to the Augustus somewhat the same position as the praetor held to the consul. Thus, from the necessity for making practical provision for the succession, arose certain extraordinary magistracies, proconsular and tribunician offices which held a middle place between the princeps on the one hand and the ordinary magistrates on the other. On the death of the princeps, the consort would have a practical, though not a legal, claim to be elected princeps, and nothing short of revolution would, as a rule, hinder him from obtaining the highest position in the state. The proconsular command was first conferred on the consort, the tribunician power subsequently. Under Augustus, both powers were conferred for a limited number of years, but always for more than one year, which was the defined period for the ordinary magistracies. The consort had not command over the troops, like the emperor, but it was common to assign him some special command. He did not bear the title of imperator, and he did not wear the laurel wreath. Nor was he included in the yearly vows which were offered up for the emperor. But he had the right to set up his statues, and his image appeared on coins. Anyone might be selected as consort, but it was only natural that the emperor should select his son for that position, and thus it became ultimately the recognised custom that the emperor's son should become his consort. By this means the danger of elevating a subject so near the imperial throne was avoided, and the natural leaning of a sovereign towards the foundation of a dynasty was satisfied. When the emperor had no children, he used to adopt into his family whomsoever he chose as his successor, and the danger of such a course was mitigated by the paternal power which he possessed over his adopted son. It was some time, however, before this usage became a stereotyped part of the imperial system. The first consort of Augustus was Agrippa, who married his niece Marcella. The proconsular imperium was conferred on Agrippa, some time before 22 BC, but Augustus had certainly no intention that Agrippa should be his successor. He was compelled to assign a distinguished position to his invaluable and ambitious coadjutor, to take him into a sort of partnership, in order to secure his cheerful service. But circumstances brought it about that he came to be regarded, if not as the probable successor, yet as something very like it. As Livia proved unfruitful, Augustus had to look elsewhere for a successor. Within his own family three choices were open to him. Though he had no sons, he might at least have a grandson by the marriage of his daughter Julia, or he might select his sister's son as his heir and successor, or he might adopt his Claudian stepchildren. His first plan, the marriage of the young Marcellus with Julia, combined two of these courses. The empire might thus descend through a nephew to grandchildren. High hopes were formed of Marcellus, who was attractive and popular, and a great favourite of his uncle. The marriage was celebrated in 25 BC, during the absence of Augustus in Spain, where he suffered from a severe illness, and Agrippa, the brother-in-law of the bridegroom, was called upon to act as the father of the bride. In the following year Marcellus was elected curial aedile, and a decree of the Senate allowed him to stand as candidate for the consulship ten years before the legal age. 
At the same time, Augustus allowed his stepson Tiberius to be elected quaestor, though he was even younger than Marcellus. And this, perhaps, was a concession to Livia, who may have felt jealous of the son of Octavia and the daughter of Scribonia. But there was another who certainly felt jealous of the favour shown to Marcellus, and regarded him as an unwelcome rival. This was Agrippa. He had entered, as we have seen, into affinity with the imperial family by his marriage with Marcella. He had been consul, as the emperor's colleague, for two successive years. If Augustus was the princeps, men were inclined to look upon Agrippa as the second citizen. And in the East, where political facts were often misrepresented, he was actually thought to be an equal co-regent with the emperor. He was not popular like his young brother-in-law, but he was universally respected. His services were recognised, and his abilities were esteemed, and he had every reason to cherish ambitious aspirations. Augustus had left Rome in 27 BC in order to devote his attention to the administration of Gaul and Spain. During his absence, which lasted until 24 BC, there were no disturbances in Rome, although he left no formal representative to take his place. This tranquillity must have been partly due to the personal influence of Agrippa, who lived at Rome during these years, though not filling an official post. In 23 BC, the year of his eleventh consulate, Augustus was stricken down by another illness, and he seems to have entertained some idea of abdicating the imperial power. He summoned his colleague, the consul Piso, to his bedside, and gave him a document containing a list of the military forces and an account of the finances of the empire. This act of Augustus displays the constitutional principle that when the emperor died, the imperial power passed into the keeping of the senate and the chief magistrates. But Augustus, although he could not appoint, could at least recommend a successor and it is to his honour that he did not attempt to forward the interests of his family at the expense of the interests of the state. Marcellus was still very young, and his powers were unproved. Augustus gave his signet ring to Agrippa, thus making it clear whom he regarded as the one man in the empire capable of carrying on the work which he had begun. But Augustus was not to die yet, he was healed by the skill of the famous physician Antonius Musa. On his recovery he learnt that his illness had been the occasion of unfriendly collisions between Agrippa and Marcellus. While Marcellus naturally built hopes on his marriage with Julia, Agrippa was elated by the conspicuous mark of confidence which the emperor had shown in him at such a critical moment. Augustus therefore thought it wise to separate them, and he assigned to Agrippa an honourable mission to the eastern provinces of the empire, for the purpose of regulating important affairs in connection with Armenia. The proconsular imperium was probably conferred on him at this time. Agrippa went as far as Lesbos, but no further, and issued his orders from that island. His friends said that this course was due to his moderation. Others suspected that he was sulky, and it is clear that he understood the true meaning of his mission. But an unexpected and untoward event suddenly frustrated the plan which Augustus had made for succession, and removed the cause of the jealousy of Agrippa. Towards the end of the same year, Marcellus was attacked by malaria at Baiae, and the skill which cured his father-in-law did not avail for him. He was buried in the great mausoleum which Augustus had erected some years before in the Campus Martius, as a resting place for his family. The name of Marcellus was preserved in a splendid theatre, which his uncle dedicated to his memory, but the lines in Virgil's Aeneid proved a more lasting monument. The story is told that Octavia fainted when she heard them recited, and that the poet received ten thousand sesterces, about eighty pounds, for each line. Augustus had now to form another plan, and it might be thought that the influence of Livia would have fixed his choice on one of her sons. But his hopes were bound up in Julia, 
and he now selected Agrippa as husband for the widow of Marcellus. The fact that Agrippa was married to her sister-in-law, Marcella, and had children by this marriage, was no obstacle in the eyes of the man who had so lightly divorced Scribonia. Agrippa had put away his first wife, Pomponia, to marry the niece of Augustus, and he was not likely to grumble now at having to sacrifice the niece for the sake of the daughter. Augustus set forth in 22 BC to visit the eastern provinces. He stayed during the winter in Sicily, and while he was there a sedition broke out in Rome, owing to a struggle between Quintus Lepidus and Marcus Silanus in their candidature for consulship. This incident seems to have determined Augustus to carry out his project of uniting Agrippa and Julia without delay. He recalled Agrippa from the east, caused the marriage to be celebrated, and consigned to him the administration of Rome and the west during his own absence in the east, early in 21 BC. It is said that Mycenas advised his master that Agrippa had risen too high if he did not rise still higher, and that there were only two safe alternatives, his marriage with Julia or his death. In October 19 BC, Augustus returned to Rome, and in the following year received a new grant of the consular imperium for five years. At the same time, he caused the tribunician power to be conferred for five years on Agrippa, who was thus raised a step nearer the princeps. The marriage of Julia and Agrippa was fruitful. Two sons and two daughters were born in the lifetime of Agrippa, and another son after his death. In 17 BC, Augustus adopted Gaius and Lucius, his grandsons, into the family of Caesar, and it seems clear that he regarded Gaius and Lucius Caesar as his successors, and their father Agrippa as no more than their guardian. But if so, it was necessary to strengthen the guardian's hands, and when Agrippa's tribunician power lapsed, it was renewed for another five years. But Augustus was destined to survive his second son-in-law, as he had survived his first. Agrippa died in Campania, in 12 BC, at the age of 51, and was laid like Marcellus in the mausoleum of Augustus. The emperor's sister, Octavia, died in the following year. The death of the consort did not interfere with the plan for the succession, but he was a great loss to Augustus whose weak health rendered him unequal to bearing the burden of the empire alone. The tender age of Gaius and Lucius Caesar required a protector in case anything should happen to their grandfather before they had reached man's estate. Augustus accordingly united his elder stepson Tiberius with Julia, 11 BC, and thus constituted him the natural protector of the two young Caesars. For this purpose Tiberius was obliged, much against his will, to divorce his wife, Vipsania Agrippina, by whom he had a son named Drusus. This Agrippina was the daughter of Agrippa by his first wife Pomponia, daughter of Pomponius Atticus, the friend of Cicero. Thus Tiberius put away Agrippa's daughter in order to marry his widow. No statesman, perhaps, has ever gone further than Augustus in carrying out a cold-blooded method of uniting and divorcing for the sake of dynastic calculations. His younger stepson, Drusus, had been likewise drawn closer to the imperial family by a marriage with Antonia, daughter of Octavia, and niece of the emperor. Tiberius and Drusus had already performed important public services, and gained great military distinction by the subjugation of Raetia and Vindelicia, 15 BC. In 12 BC and the following years, they had again opportunity for displaying their unusual abilities, Tiberius in reducing rebellious tribes in Pannonia, and Drusus in warfare with the Germans beyond the Rhine. The death of Drusus in 9 BC was a great blow to Augustus, who had really paternal feelings for him, but never cared for Tiberius. But he could hardly have found a more capable helper in the administration than his elder stepson. Tiberius was grave and reserved in manner, cautious and discreet from his earliest years, 
indisposed to conciliate friendship, and compelled to dissemble by the circumstances in which he was placed. But he was an excellent man of business, and as a general he was trusted by the soldiers, and always led them to victory. He became consul in 13 BC at the age of twenty-nine. Augustus raised him to the same position to which he had raised Agrippa. He granted him the proconsular imperium first, about nine BC, and three years later the tribunician power. In this policy he was doubtless influenced not only by the merits of Tiberius, but by the influence of Livia, to whom he granted the Ius Trium Liberorum in 9 BC. On receiving the tribunician power, Tiberius was charged with a special commission to the east, to suppress a revolt which had broken out in Armenia. He had doubtless hoped that his stepfather would adopt him, but he saw that he was destined by Augustus to be the guardian of the future emperors, rather than a future emperor himself, that he was consort indeed of the princeps, but was not intended to be the successor. He was too proud to relish this postponement to his stepchildren, and instead of undertaking the commission, he retired into exile at Rhodes. In the following year, Gaius Caesar assumed the toga virilis. He also became a consul designate. Four years later he received the proconsular imperium and a special commission to Armenia. 1 AD was the year of his consulship. The succession now seemed safe. Lucius Caesar had assumed the gown of manhood in 2 BC, so that the Julian dynasty had two pillars. The Roman knights had proclaimed Gaius and Lucius Principes Juventutis, an honour which seemed to mark them out as destined to become princeps in a higher sense. From this time forward the title princeps juventutis came to be formally equivalent to a designation of a successor to the principate who was still too young to enter the senate. But fortune was adverse to the plans of Augustus. Lucius died at Massilia in 2 AD, and two years later Gaius received a wound at the siege of Artagira, and died in Lycia, 4 AD. Thus the hopes which Augustus had cherished during the past twenty years fell to the ground. But the death of his grandchildren was not the only misfortune which befell Augustus. The depravity of his daughter was an even more grievous blow. The licentious excesses of Julia were the talk of the city, and were known to all before they reached the ears of her father. She had long been unfaithful to her husband Tiberius, and his retirement to Rhodes, though mainly a manifestation of antagonism between the stepson and the grandsons of the emperor, may have been partly due to his estrangement from her. But at length her profligacy became so open that it could no longer be hidden from the emperor. She is even said to have traversed the streets by night in riotous company, and her orgies were performed in the forum or on the rostra. In short, to quote the words of a contemporary, in lust and luxury she omitted no deed of shame that a woman could do or suffer, and she measured the greatness of her fortune by the license it afforded for sin. The wrath of Augustus, when he learned the conduct of his daughter, knew no bounds. He formally communicated to the Senate an account of her acts. He banished her to the barren island of Pandateria, off the coast of Campania, 2 BC, whither her mother Scribonia voluntarily attended her, and no intercession on the part of the people induced him to forgive her. Her lovers, Claudii, Scipiones, Sempronia, and Quincti, were exiled. But one of them, Julius Antonius, son of Marcus Antonius and Fulvia, whom Augustus had spared after Actium and always treated with kindness, was put to death, on the charge that he had corrupted the daughter in order to conspire against the father. Rumour said that Livia, scheming in the interests of herself and Tiberius, had a hand in bringing about the misfortunes which fell upon the family of Augustus but there is no evidence whatever that such was the case. The other children of Julia and Agrippa could not replace Gaius and Lucius. 
Agrippa Posthumus showed such a bad and froward disposition that Augustus could build few hopes on him. The younger Julia proved a profligate, like her mother. There remained Agrippina, who had married within the imperial family, and did not disgrace it. Drusus, the brother of Tiberius, had wedded the younger Antonia, daughter of Octavia and Marcus Antonius. Of this marriage Germanicus was born, and Augustus selected him as a husband for Agrippina. The emperor thus united his grand-nephew with his granddaughter, as he had before united his nephew with his daughter. In deciding the question of the succession, Augustus was obliged to have recourse to Tiberius, yet not so as to exclude Germanicus, or even to deprive the young Agrippa of all hopes. After the banishment of Julia, Tiberius had wished, but had not been permitted, to return to Rome. He is said to have spent his time at Rhodes in the study of astrology. In 2 AD he was at length permitted to leave his place of exile, and during the two following years he lived at Rome in retirement, until, in consequence of the death of Gaius, he was called upon to take part again in public life. On June the 27th, 4 AD, Augustus adopted both Tiberius and Agrippa Posthumus, and caused the tribunician power to be conferred for ten years on Tiberius, who was sent forthwith to conduct a campaign in Germany. At the same time, Tiberius was required to adopt his nephew Germanicus. As for Agrippa, he soon ceased to be a possible rival. His conduct was such that Augustus was obliged to banish him to the island of Planasia. Thus, after the frustration of many plans, Augustus was in the end compelled to recognise as his son and heir the aspirant whom he liked least, but who was perhaps fitter than any of the others to wield the power. When he adopted Tiberius, he expressed his feelings in the words, Hoc Republicae causa facio, I do this for the sake of the Republic. Nine years later, 13 AD, Tiberius was raised higher than any previous consort. It was enacted by a special law, Lex, introduced by the consuls, that he should have proconsular power in all the provinces and over all the armies, coordinate with the proconsular power of his father, and that he should hold a census in conjunction with Augustus. It is significant that the proconsular power was conferred by a law. In all previous cases, Augustus had bestowed it by virtue of his own proconsular imperium, but now the power of Tiberius in the provinces is no longer secondary, but is coordinate with and limits that of Augustus himself, and does not expire with the death of Augustus. It is therefore conferred by a lex. At the same time, Tiberius received a renewal of the tribunician power, no longer for a limited period, but for life, and the Senate selected him to hold the foremost place in the senatorial committee, which, at the request of Augustus, had been appointed to represent the whole Senate. End of chapter 4
it was harder to conciliate the aristocracy than to satisfy the lower classes, and notwithstanding his personal popularity, notwithstanding the promptness of the Senate to fall in with his wishes and accept his guidance, Augustus could not fail to perceive a feeling of regret for the Republic prevailing among the higher classes, and he probably felt that, if his own personal influence were removed by death, the survival of the Principate would be very uncertain. He could not mistake obsequiousness, or even personal friendship to himself, for cheerful acquiescence in the new system. His safety was occasionally threatened by conspiracies of which we have very little information, but they do not seem to have been really serious. We need only mention that of Fanius Sapio, 23 B.C., and that of C.N. Cornelius Cena, 4 A.D., Sapio's conspiracy is remarkable from the fact that A. Terentius Varro Marina, who was colleague of the emperor in the consulate, was concerned in it. Marina was the brother of Proselaus, an intimate friend of Augustus, and of Terentia, wife of Maecenas, and reputed to be the emperor's mistress. Augustus took the matter very seriously, but it seems that the people were not convinced of Marina's guilt. Both Marina and Sapio were executed. In the other case, Cena and his associates were pardoned by the advice of Livia, who perhaps had learned a lesson from the clement policy of Maecenas. It was a great triumph for Augustus when, in the year of Marina's conspiracy, the same year in which he was himself dangerously ill, and in which he gave the Principate its final shape, he won over two of the most distinguished men of Republican sentiments, C. N. Calpurnius Piso and L. Cestius Quirinius, and induced them, after his own abdication of the consulate in June, to fill that magistracy for the rest of the year. But there were still a certain number of irreconcilables, ready, if a favorable opportunity offered, to attempt to restore the Republic. The solid foundations of the general contentment which marked the Augustan period were the effects of a long peace, the restoration of credit, the revival of industry and commerce, the expenditure of the public money for the public use, the promotion of public comfort and the security of public safety. In describing the details of the home administration, it is fitting to begin with the cares which Augustus bestowed on the revival of religion and the maintenance of the worship of the gods. The priestly duties of maintaining religious worship in the temples of the gods devolved properly upon the patrician families of Rome. These families had been reduced in number and impoverished in the course of the civil wars. An irreligious spirit had crept in, and the shrines of the gods had fallen into decay. Horace, who saw the religious revival of Augustus, ascribes the disasters of the civil wars to the prevailing impiety. Delicta majorum emeritus lues, Romane, donec templa refaceris. We have already seen that after the conquest of Egypt, Augustus caused a law to be passed, the Lex Senea, for raising some plebeian families to the patrician rank. His care for the dignity and maintenance of the patriciate was closely connected with his concern for the restoration of the national worship. He set the example of renewing the old houses of the gods and building new ones. Apollo, whose shrine stood near Actium, was loved by Augustus above all other deities, and the emperor was pleased if his courtiers hinted that he was directly inspired by the god of light, or if they lowered their eyes in his presence, as if dazzled by some divine effulgence from his face. To this god he erected a splendid temple on the Palatine. The worship of the Lares engaged his particular attention, and he built numerous shrines for them in the various districts of Rome. Many religious games and popular feasts were also revived. The state religion, as reformed by Augustus, was connected in the closest way with the Principate, and intended to be one of its bulwarks. Divus Julius had been added to the number of the gods. The Arval brothers sacrificed for the welfare of the emperor and his family— the college of the Quindecimviri and Septimviri offered prayers for him, and there were added to the calendar new feasts whose motives depended on the new constitution. 
Moreover, the princeps was Pontifex Maximus, and belonged to the other religious colleges, in which members of his house were also usually enrolled. It has been remarked that the vitality of the old religion is clearly illustrated by the creation of new deities like Annona, the goddess who presided over the corn supply on which imperial Rome depended. The restoration of the worship of Juno was assigned to the care of Livia, as the representative of the matrons of Rome. Not only had the shrines of that goddess been neglected, but the social institution over which she specially presided had gone out of fashion. Along with the growth of luxury and immorality, there had grown up a disinclination to marriage. Celibacy was the order of the day, and the number of Roman citizens declined. Measures enforcing or encouraging wedlock had often been taken by censors, but they did not avail to check the evil. Augustus made the attempt to break the stubbornness of his fellow citizens at first by penalties, 18 B.C., and afterwards by rewards. A lex de meritandis ordinibus was passed, regulating marriages and divorces, and laying various penalties both on those who did not marry and on those who, married, had no children. An unmarried man was disqualified from receiving legacies, and the married man who was childless was fined half of every legacy. These unlucky ones were also placed at a disadvantage in competition for public offices. Nearly thirty years later, 9 A.D., Another law, the Lex Papia Popia, established a system of rewards. The father of three children at Rome was relieved of a certain portion of the public burdens, was not required to perform the duties of a judex or a guardian, and was given preference in standing for magistracies. These privileges were called the Ius Trium Liberorum. The same privileges were granted to fathers of four children in Italy, or of five in the provinces. Augustus also, 18 B.C., tried to enforce marriage indirectly by laying new penalties on licentiousness. The Lex Julia de Adulteris et de Pudicitia made adultery a public offense, whereas before it could only be dealt with as a private wrong. No part of the policy of Augustus was so unpopular as these laws concerning marriage. They were strenuously resisted by all classes, and evaded in every possible way. Yet perhaps they produced some effect. Certainly the population of Roman citizens increased considerably between 28 and 8 B.C., and still more strikingly between the latter date and 14 A.D. But this increase might be accounted for by the general well-being of the age, quite apart from artificial incentives. In the year 17 B.C., ten years after the foundation of the Principate, Augustus celebrated Ludi Seculares, which were supposed to be celebrated every hundred or hundred and ten years. It was thus a ceremony which no citizen had ever beheld before, and which none, according to rule, should ever behold again. As a matter of fact, however, many of those who saw the secular games of Augustus were destined to see the same ceremony repeated by one of his successors. Augustus probably intended the feast to have a certain political significance, both as lending a sort of consecration to the religious and social legislation of the preceding year, and as celebrating in an impressive manner the introduction of a new epoch, whose continuance now seemed assured by the adoption of the emperor's grandsons, which took place at the same time. The conduct of the ceremony devolved upon the Quindicemviri, who elected two of their members, Augustus and Agrippa, to preside over the celebration. It lasted three days. The ceremonies consisted of the distribution of lustral torches, brimstone and pitch, and of wheat, barley, and beans, at certain stations in the city. The usual invocations of Dispater and Prosperpine were replaced by those of Apollo and Diana. On the third day, a Carmen Seculare, an ode of thanksgiving, was performed in the atrium of Apollo's Palatine Temple by a choir of youths and maidens of noble birth, both of whose parents were alive. The Carmen Seculare was written by Horace, and is still preserved. 
Augustus also endeavored to restrain luxury by sumptuary laws, and to suppress the immorality which prevailed at the public games. He excluded women altogether from the exhibitions of athletic contests, and assigned them a special place apart from the men at the gladiatorial shows. At these public spectacles he separated the classes as well as the sexes. Senators, knights, soldiers, freedmen were all assigned their special places. Precedence was given to married men over bachelors. In connection with the social reforms of Augustus may be mentioned his policy in dealing with the Libertini, who formed a very large portion of the population of Rome. He endeavored to reduce their numbers in three ways. 1. He facilitated the marriage of freed folk with free folk, except senators, with a view to drawing them into the number of the free population. 2. The institution of the Augustales was an inducement to freedmen to remain in the Italian towns, instead of flocking to the capital. 3. Laws were passed limiting the manumission of slaves. The Lex Aelia Sentia, 4 A.D., decreed that a slave under thirty years of age or of bad character must not be manumitted except by the process of vindicta. Four years later the Lex Sufia Canania ordained that only a certain percentage of the slaves then existing could be set free by testament. The End of Chapter 5, Section 1 Recording by Mark Penfold dot org recording by mark penfold the students roman empire part 1 by john bagnell bury chapter 5 administration of augustus in rome and italy the organization of the army 27 bc to 14 ad sections 2 and 3 section 2 administration of rome and italy no part, perhaps, of the government of Augustus is more characteristic of his political method and of the general spirit of the Principate than the administration of Rome and Italy. At first he left this department entirely in the hands of the Senate, and he never overtly robbed the Senate of its rights. But he brought it about that a large number of important branches were by degrees transferred from the control of the Senate to that of the Princeps. The Senate and Consuls repeatedly declared themselves helpless, and called upon the Princeps to intervene, and so it came about that some offices were definitely taken in hand by him, and in other matters which were still left to the care of the Senate and the Republican magistrates, it became the habit, in case of a difficulty, to look to the Princeps for counsel and guidance. Thus the way in which the encroachments of monarchy were made was by keeping the republican institutions on trial and convicting them of incompetence. This was one of the secrets of empire which were discovered and deftly manipulated by Augustus. It was chiefly in the later part of his principate, when he had arranged the affairs of the provinces, that Augustus began to intervene seriously in administration and organization in Italy and Rome. In this connection it is important to observe that while the institution of the empire inaugurated a new epoch of good government and prosperity for the provinces, so that they gradually rose to the same level politically as Italy herself, Augustus was deeply concerned to preserve intact the dignity of Rome as the sovereign city and Italy as the dominant country, and the distinction between Italy and the provinces was not entirely effaced for three centuries. The supply of Rome with corn required a new organization, and the emperor's possession of Egypt enabled him to meet the need. In 22 BC there was a great scarcity in Rome, and the people demanded that the Senate should appoint Augustus dictator and censor for life. Augustus rejected this proposal, but accepted the cura annone, or administration of the corn market, and soon relieved the distress. This was the first department in Rome that he took into his own hands. In 6 AD there was a still more pressing scarcity of food, and some years later the emperor was driven to take measures for the permanent provision of the city with corn. He instituted a prefectus annonae of equestrian rank, and receiving his appointment from the emperor, 
His duty was to superintend the transport of corn from Egypt, and see that the Roman market was kept supplied at a cheap rate. The expenses were defrayed, chiefly at least, by the fiscus, though properly they should have devolved, as before, upon the aerarium, as Rome was within the sphere of the Senate's administration. The emperor had also to provide for the support of the poor. The number of those who were entitled to profit by the free distribution of corn was finally fixed at two hundred thousand. This included freedmen. Immense sums were also expended by Augustus in public donations to the plebes. Agrippa, whom the emperor during his absence in the east, twenty-one B.C. and following years, left in charge of Rome, set zealously to work to reform the water supply. He restored the old and laid down new aqueducts, the chief among them being the Aqua Virgo, 19 B.C., and he instituted a body of public servants whose duty was to keep the water pipes in repair. The administration of the aqueducts, cura aquarum, seems to have been regularly organized, after Agrippa's death, in 11 B.C. While Augustus adorned Rome with edifices, he had also to guard against their destruction. Conflagrations frequently broke out in the capital, and there were no proper arrangements for quenching them. Finding that the Aediles, to whom he assigned this care, were unequal to performing it, he was compelled, 6 A.D., to organize seven military cohorts of watchmen, vigiles, each cohort composed of 1,000 to 1,200 men, under the command of a prefect of equestrian rank, who was entitled Prefectus Vigilum, and was appointed by the emperor. These cohorts consisted chiefly of freedmen. They were quartered in seven stations in the city, so that each cohort did service for two of the fourteen regions into which Rome was divided. Other new charges were also instituted by Augustus for the well-being of Rome. The curatores operum publicorum, chosen from praetorian senators, watched over public ground and public buildings. Prefectus Urbi Originally, Roman consuls had the right of appointing a representative, called Prefectus Urbi, to take their place at Rome when they were obliged to be absent from the city. This right was taken from them by the institution of the praetorship, but immediately after the foundation of the Principate, while his position still rested on a combination of the consular with the proconsular power, Augustus, during his absence from Rome, 27 to 24 B.C., revived this old office and appointed a Prefectus Urbi to take his place. Massala Corvinus, a man who was much respected and had rendered great services to the emperor, was appointed to the post, 25 B.C., but laid it down within six days on the ground that he was unequal to fulfilling its duties, but he seems to have really regarded it as an unconstitutional innovation. During his visit to the East in 21 B.C. and following years, Rome was administered by his consort Agrippa, and therefore no other representative was required. But during his absence in Gaul in 16 to 13 B.C., when Agrippa was also absent in the East, Statilius Taurus was left as Prefectus Urbi and performed the duties well. It is to be observed that on this occasion Augustus was not consul, and the Principate no longer depended on the consular power, so that the appointment of Taurus as Prefectus Urbi was a constitutional novelty. But under Augustus the post was never anything but temporary, during the emperor's absence from Italy. It was not until the reign of his successor Tiberius that the Prefectura Urbis became a permanent institution. In Italy, as well as in Rome, the Senate proved itself unequal to discharging the duties of a government, and the emperor was obliged to step in. The cura viorum was instituted for the repair of the public roads, 20 B.C. A curator was set over each road. For the main roads leading from Rome to the frontiers of Italy, these officers were selected from the praetorian senators, for the lesser roads from the knights. Italy, like Rome, was divided into regions, eleven in number, Rome itself making the twelfth. The object of this division is uncertain, but may have been made for purposes of taxation. In any case, the regions were not administrative districts, for the independence of the political communities in managing their own affairs was not infringed on by Augustus or any of his successors till the time of Trajan. 
The imperial post, an institution which applied to the whole empire, may be mentioned here. It was a creation of Augustus, who established relays of vehicles at certain stations along the military roads, to convey himself or his messengers without delay, and secure rapid official communication between the capital and the various provinces. The use of these arrangements was strictly limited to imperial officers and messengers, or those to whom he gave a special passport, called diploma. The costs of the vehicles and horses, and other expenses, fell upon the communities in which the stations were established. This requisition led to abuses, and in later times the expenses were defrayed by the fiscus. It is to be observed that this institution had not assumed under Augustus anything like the proportions which it assumed a century or so later as the cursus publicus. THE Augustales. Freedmen were strictly excluded from holding magistracies and priestly offices, and from sitting in the municipal councils, or senates, throughout the empire. Caesar the dictator had indeed sometimes relaxed this rule in their favor beyond Italy, but Augustus strictly enforced and excluded libertini from government. Their exclusion was economically a public loss for one of the chief sources from which the town treasuries were supplied, was the contributions levied on new magistrates and priests, whether in the form of direct payments, or of undertaking the exhibition of public games. As the freedmen could not become magistrates or priests, they were not liable to these burdens, which they would have been glad to undertake. In order to open a field to their ambition, and at the same time to make their wealth available for the public service, Augustus created a new institution entitled the Augustales, probably in the early years of his principate. 1. This organization was first established in Italy and the Latin provinces of the West. In Africa it was not common, and it is not found at all in the eastern part of the empire. 2. It was not called into being by a law of Augustus, but at his suggestion the several communities decreed an institution which was in every way profitable to them. 3. The institution consisted in the creation every year of six men, sex viri Augustales, who were nominated by the decurions, the chief municipal magistrates. 4. These sex viri were magistrates, not priests, but their magistracy was only formal, as they had no magisterial functions to perform. 5. But like true magistrates, they had public burdens to sustain. They had to make a payment to the public treasury when they entered upon their office, and they had to defray the cost of games. 6. The sex viri were almost always chosen from the class of the libertini. This rule held good, without exception, in southern Italy. 7. After their year of office, the sex viri Augustales were called Augustales, just as consuls after their year of office were called consulares. Thus the Augustales formed a distinct rank, to which it was the ambition of every freedman to belong. 8. One of the most interesting points about the institution is that it seems to have been partly modeled upon the organization of the Roman knights. The designation of the sex viri of the order of the Augustales seems to have been borrowed from the order of the Equites, and perhaps was introduced about the same time. Moreover, the Augustales occupied the same position in Italy and the provinces as the knights occupied at Rome. They were the municipal image of the knights. They represented the capitalists and mercantile classes in contrast with the nobility and landed proprietors. They bore the same relation to the municipal senate as the knights to the Roman senate. Section 3. Organization of the Army and Fleet Augustus introduced some radical changes into the Roman military system. In the first place he established a standing army. It was quite logical that the permanent imperator should have a permanent army under his command. The legions distributed throughout those provinces, which required military protection, have now permanent camps. In the second place he organized the auxilia, and made them an essential part of the military forces of the empire. Thirdly, he separated the fleet from the army, and fourthly, he established the praetorian guards. 
Augustus spent great care on the organization of the army, but it is generally admitted that he acted unwisely in reducing the number of legions after the civil wars. This step was chiefly dictated by considerations of economy in order to diminish the public burdens. But the standing army which he maintained, of about 250,000 men, was inadequate for the defense of such a great empire against its foes on the Rhine, the Danube, and the Euphrates, not to speak of lesser dangers in other quarters. At the death of Augustus, the legions numbered twenty-five. Each legion consisted of not more than six thousand, not less than five thousand foot soldiers and one hundred twenty horse soldiers. The foot soldiers were divided into ten cohorts, and each cohort into six centuries. Each century had a standard, signum, of its own. The horse soldiers were divided into four turmae. Only those were admitted to legionary service who were freeborn and belonged to a city community. To the legions were attached auxiliary troops, auxilia, recruited from the provincials who did not belong to urban communities. They were divided into cohorts and consisted of footmen and horsemen, or both combined. Some foot cohorts were composed of about five hundred men, and were divided into six centuries. Such were called quingenariae. Others were larger and maintained one thousand men divided into ten centuries. These were miliariae. Mixed cohorts of both horse and foot soldiers were termed equitate. The allee consisted only of horse soldiers and also varied in size. The auxiliary troops, when attached to a legion, were under the control of the commander of the legion. But they could also act separately, and some provinces were garrisoned exclusively by auxilia. The legions were distinguished by numbers and by names. For example, Legio ten Gemina, twenty-one Rapax, or six Victrix. Besides these troops, there were cohorts of Italian volunteers, of whom we seldom hear, and there were in some provinces bodies of provincial militia. Moreover, Augustus had a bodyguard of German soldiers to protect his person, but he disbanded it in 9 AD. With the exception of the legions stationed in Egypt, and the auxiliary troops in some small provinces, the military forces of the empire were commanded by senators. This leads us to an important institution of Augustus, the Legatus Legionis, an officer of senatorial, generally praetorian, rank, who commanded both the legion and the auxilia associated with it. The military tribune thus became subordinate to the Legatus. He was merely a tribune of the legion, and on an equality with the prefect of an auxiliary cohort, while his position was rather inferior to that of a prefect of an auxiliary squadron. These three posts, tribunatus legionis, prefectura cohortis, prefectura ale, were the three equestrian offices open to the sons of senators who aspired to a public career. The prefect of the camp, prefectus castrorum, was not of senatorial rank, and was generally taken from the primipili, or first of the first class of centurions. He was subject to the governor of the province in which the camp was situated, but he was not subject to the legatus legionis. He had no power of capital punishment. In Egypt, from which senators were excluded, there was no legatus legionis, and the prefect of the camp took his place. The time of service for a legionary soldier was fixed, 5 A.D., at twenty years, for an auxiliary at twenty-five. The government was bound to provide for the discharged veterans, by giving them farms or sums of money. It became the custom, however, for some soldiers, after their regular term, to continue in the service of the state in special divisions and with special privileges. These divisions were known as the Vexilla Veteranorum, and were only employed in battle. The expenses of this military system were very large, and in 6 A.D., at the time of a rebellion in Dalmatia, Augustus was unable to meet the claims of the soldiers by ordinary means, and was driven to instituting an 
Aerarium Militare, with a capital of 170 million sesterces, about 1,360,000 pounds. It was administered by three prefecti, chosen by lot for three years from the praetorian senators. The sources of revenue on which the military treasury was to depend were a 5% tax on inheritances and a 1% impost on auctions. Rome and Italy were exempted from the military command of the imperator, and the army was distributed in the provinces and on the frontiers. But there were two exceptions, the praetorian guards, along with the city guards and the watchmen, and the fleet. The institution of a bodyguard, cohors praetoria, for the imperator, had existed under the republic, and had been further developed under the triumvirate. Augustus organized it anew. After his victory, both his own guards and those of his defeated rival Antonius were at his disposal, and out of these troops he formed a company of nine cohorts, each consisting of one thousand men. Thus the permanent praetorian guard under the empire stood in the same relation to the imperator, in which the temporary cohors praetoria stood to an imperator under the republic. The pay of the praetorian soldier was fixed at double that of the legionary. His time of service was fixed, 5 A.D., at sixteen years, and the command was ultimately placed in the hands of two praetorian prefects, 2 B.C., of equestrian rank. In later times this office became the most important in the state, but even at first a praetorian prefect had great influence. The emperor's personal safety depended on his loyalty, and the appointment of two prefects by Augustus was probably a device for lessening the chances of treachery. Only a small division of the praetorian troops were permitted to have their station within Rome. The rest were quartered in the neighborhood. The irregularity of a standing military force posted in Italy was to some extent rendered less unwelcome by the rule that only Italians, and Italians was at first interpreted in its old sense, so as to exclude dwellers in Gallia Cisalpina, could enter the service. Besides the Praetorian cohorts, there were three urban cohorts, cohortes urbane, stationed at Rome. During the absence of the emperor, they were under the command of the prefect of the city. The cohortes vigilum have already been mentioned. Augustus created an imperial fleet, which was called, though perhaps not in his own day, the classis praetoria. Under the republic, the command of the naval forces had always devolved upon the commander of the legions, and consequently no fleets could be stationed in Italian ports, as Italy was exempt from the imperium. Hence the Tuscan and Adriatic seas were infested by pirates. The war with Sextus Pompeius had turned the special attention of Augustus to the fleet, and he saw his way to separating the navy from the army. Two fleets were permanently stationed in Italy, one to guard over the eastern waters at Ravenna, and the second to control the southern seas at Misenum. They formed the guard of the emperor, and at first were manned by his slaves. The commanders under the early empire were prefecti, who were sometimes freedmen. Augustus also stationed a squadron of lesser magnitude at Forum Julium, but this was removed when the province of Nurbanensis was transferred to the Senate, 22 BC. These fleets were composed of the regular ships of war with three benches of oars, triremes, and of the lighter Liburnian beremes. But the heavier and larger kind afterwards fell into disuse, and Liburna came to be the general word for a warship. The end of chapter 5, sections 2 and 3. Recording by Mark Penfold. Recording by Julie von Mulligan. The Students' Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 6 Provincial Administration under Augustus, the Western Provinces. 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. Section 1. General Organization of the Provinces When Augustus founded the Empire, the dominion of Rome stretched from the Atlantic to the Euphrates, from the German Ocean to the borders of Ethiopia. 
The lands which made up this empire had by no means the same political status. Rome, the mother and mistress of the empire, stood by herself. She was a centre to which all the rest looked up. Next to her, sharing in many respects her privileged position, was Italy. Outside this inner circle came the directly subject lands and communities, which were strictly under the sway, in Dicioni, of the Roman people. Outside these, again, came the lands and communities, which, while really under the sovereignty of Rome, preserved their independence and were not called subjects, but federate states and allies. And in each of these circles there were various kinds and subdivisions, according to the mode of their administration, or the limits imposed on their self-government. Thus the subjects of the Roman Empire were almost as heterogeneous in their political relations to their mistress as in race and language. It is to be observed that by Roman Empire— we mean more than the Romans in strict speech meant by Imperium Romanum. We mean not only the provinces, but the independent allied states and client kingdoms, in which the people were not the subject of the Roman people, and the land was not the property of the Roman state. These federate and associated states were regarded legally as outside the Roman Phoenix, although the foides or alliance, really meant that they were under the sovereignty of Rome and the continuation of their autonomy depended solely on her will. There was no proper word in Latin to express the geographical circle which included both direct and the indirect subjects. Perhaps the nearest expression was orbis terrarum, the world, which often seems equivalent to the empire. For Roman law regarded all territory which was not either Roman or belonging to someone whose ownership Rome recognized as a property of no man outside the world. The chief mark of distinction between the autonomous and not autonomous communities was that the former taxed themselves, whereas the latter were taxed by Rome. In both cases there were exceptions, but this was the general rule. And the land of the provincial communities, which were not autonomous, belonged to Rome, whereas the land of the autonomous state was not Roman. Originally, after the conquest of her earliest provinces, Rome had not appropriated the land, but this was a theoretic mistake which she afterwards corrected when C. Gracchus organized Asia. Henceforward, all provincial territory was regarded as in the ownership of the Roman people. The Roman people might let the land anew to the former possessors at a fixed rent, and in most cases this was done. Thus the principle was that the provincial subjects occupied as tenants the land which they or their ancestors once owned, this rent was called tributum, or stipendium. A. The greater number of provincial communities in the time of Augustus were civitatis stipendiariae. The legal condition of these subjects was that of peregrini diridici, but they were not called by this name. They were under the control of the governor of the province to which they belonged. B. Throughout the provinces there was a multitude of cities which possessed full Roman citizenship, and their number was continually increasing. But also, as far as personal rights were concerned, these cities were on a level with the cities of Italy, they were worse off in two particulars. They were obliged to pay tribute. The reason of this anomaly was a theoretic principle that provincial territory could not be alienated by its owner, the Roman people. The Ager Publicus Populi Romani, beyond the sea, could not become Ager Privatus Exure Quiritium. In other words, a provincial of Nabo, although a Roman citizen, could not be a creditary possessor of land in the Narbonese territory. 
he could only hold land of the Roman people, and must therefore pay rent for it. In the case, however, of some favoured communities, this principle was departed from as early as the time of Augustus. The privilege took one of two forms, either a grant of immunity from tribute, or the bestowal of jus italicum. The latter form, which was the more common, placed the territory of the community which received it in the same position as the territory of Italy, and made it capable of curatory ownership. The provincial cities which possessed jus italicum marked their position by the external sign of a statue of a naked Salinus, with a wine skin on his shoulder, which was called Marcius. This custom was imitated from the Marcius, which stood in the Roman Forum, as a symbol of the capital city. Besides being tributary, the provincial communities of Roman citizens were, like the peregrine communities, subject to the interference of the Roman governor. It is to be observed that these communities were either coloniae or municipia. In the course of Italian history, the word municipium had completely changed its meaning. Originally, it was applied to a community possessing jus latinum, and also to the cividas sini suvragio, and thus it was a term of contrast to those communities which possessed full Roman citizenship. But when in the course of time the cividates sine suffragio received political rights, and the Roman states received full Roman citizenship, and thus the municipium proper disappeared from Italy, the word was still applied to those communities of Roman citizens, which had originally been either Latin municipia, or independent federate states. And it also, of course, continued to be applied to cities outside Italy, which possessed jus latinum. It is clear that originally municipium and colonia were not incompatible ideas, for a colony founded with jus latinum was both a municipium and a colonia. But a certain opposition arose between them, and became stronger when municipium came to be used in a new sense. Municipium is only used of communities which existed as independent states before they received Roman citizenship, whether by the deduction of a colony or not. Colonia is generally confined to those communities which were settled for the first time as Roman cities and were never states before. Thus, municipium involves a reference to previous autonomy. C. Besides Roman cities, there were also Latin cities in the provinces. Originally, there were two kinds of jus latinum, one better and the other inferior. The old Latin colonies possessed the better kind. The inferior kind was known as the use of Ariminum, and it alone was extended to provincial communities. When Italy received Roman citizenship after the social war, the better kind of use Latinum vanished forever, and the lesser kind only existed outside Italy. The most important privilege, which distinguished the Latin from peregrine communities, was that a member of a Latin city had the prospect of obtaining full Roman citizenship by holding magistracies in his own community. The Latin communities are, of course, autonomous, and are not controlled by the provincial governor. But like Roman communities, they have to pay tribute for their land, which is the property of the Roman people, unless they possess immunity, or jus italicum, as well as jus latinum. D. Outside Roman territory, and formerly independent allies of Rome, though really her subjects, are the free states, Cividates Liberae, whether single republics, like Athens, or a league of cities, like Lycia. Constitutionally, they fall into two classes. One, Cividates Liberae, at Foderatae, 
or simply foideradae, two, Givitatis sine foidere liberae et immunes. States of the first class were connected with Rome by a foidus, which guaranteed some perpetual autonomy. In the case of the second class, no such foidus existed, and their autonomy, which was granted by a lex or senatus consultum, could at any moment be recalled. Otherwise, the position of the two classes did not differ. The sovereign rights of these free states were limited in the following ways by their relation to Rome. They were not permitted to have subject allies standing to themselves in the same relation in which they stood to Rome. They could not declare war on their own account, whereas every declaration of war and every treaty of peace made by Rome was valid for them also, without even a formal expression of consent on their part. Some of the free states, such as Athens, Sparta, Massilia, seem to have been exempted by the treaty from the burden of furnishing military contingents, both under the Republic and under the Empire. Others, on the other hand, were bound by treaty to perform service of this kind. Thus Rhodes contributed a number of ships every year to the Roman fleet. It is probable that the communities which were established as Fadwet, or Latin state under the Principati, were subject to conscription. Theoretically, all the autonomous states should have been exempt from tribute, as the land was not Roman. They were exceptions to this rule, and some free cities, for example Byzantium, paid under the Principati a yearly tributum. E. The position of the client kingdoms was in some respects, like that of the free autonomous states, but in other respects different. Both were allied with Rome, but independent of Roman governors. Both the free peoples who managed their own affairs and the kings who ruled their kingdoms were Sokii of the Roman people, and the land of both was outside the boundaries of Roman territory. But whereas in the case of the Civitatis Foiduratae, the Roman people entered into a permanent relation with a permanent community, in the case of kingdoms, the relation was only a personal treaty with a king, and came to an end at his death. Thus, when a kind king died, Rome might either renew the same relation with his successor, or else, without any formal violation of a treaty, convert the kingdom into a province. This last policy was constantly adopted under the Principati, so that by degrees all the chief client principalities disappeared, and the provincial territory increased in corresponding measure. Even under the Republic, the dependent princes paid fixed annual tributes to Rome. F. The treatment of Egypt by Augustus formed a new departure in the organization of the subject land of Rome. It was, as we have seen, united with the Roman Empire by a sort of personal union, like that by which Luxembourg was still recently united with Holland. The sovereign of the Roman state was also sovereign of Egypt. He did not, indeed, designate himself as king of Egypt any more than as king of Rome, but practically he was the successor of the Ptolemies. This principle was applied to dependent kingdoms which were afterwards annexed to the empire, such as Noricum and Judea. Such provinces were governed by knights, instead of senators, as in the provinces proper, and these knights, who were entitled prefects or procurators, represented the emperor personally. It is clear that this form of government was not possible until the republic had become a monarchy, and there was one man to represent the state. G. To make the picture of the manifold modes in which Rome governed her subjects complete, there must still be mentioned the unimportant class of attributed places. This was a technical name for small peoples of places, which counted as neither states nor districts, pagi, and were placed under or attributed to a neighboring community. 
Only federate towns or towns possessing either Roman citizenship or use Latinum had attributed places. This attribution was especially employed in the Alpine districts, small mountain tribes being placed under the control of cities like Tergesti or Brixia. The inhabitants of the attributed places often possessed use Latinum, and as they had no magistrate of their own, they were permitted to be candidates for magistracies in the state to which they were attributed. They could thus become Roman citizens. It is to be carefully observed that while the subject of Rome fell into the two general classes of autonomous and not autonomous, the not autonomous communities possessed municipal self-government. The provinces, like Italy, were organized on the principle of local self-government. In those lands, where the town system was already developed, the Roman conqueror gladly left to the cities their constitutions, and allowed them to manage their local affairs, just as of old, only taking care that they should govern themselves on aristocratic principles. Rome even went further, and based her administration everywhere on the system of self-governing communities, introducing it in those provinces where it did not already exist, and founding towns on the Italian model. The local authorities in each provincial community had to levy the taxes and deliver them to the proper Roman officers. Representatives of each community met yearly in a provincial concilium. For judicial purposes, districts of communities existed in which the governor of the province dealt out justice. These districts were called conventus. It thus appears that the stipendary communities also enjoyed autonomy, a tolerated autonomy of a more limited kind than that of the free and the federate communities. The Roman governors did not interfere in the affairs of any community in their provinces, where merely municipal matters not affecting imperial interests were concerned. It also appears that those not anonymous communities which had obtained exemption from tribute practically approximated to the autonomous, whereas those nominally independent states in which tribute was nevertheless levied approximated to the dependent. Here we touch upon one of the great tendencies which marked the policy of Augustus in the administration of the empire. This was a gradual abolition of that variety which at the end of the Republic existed in the relations between Rome and her subjects. There was, one, the great distinction between Italy and the provinces, and there were, two, the various distinctions between the provincial communities themselves. From the time of the first Brincaps onward, we can trace the gradual wiping out of these distinctions, until the whole empire becomes uniform. 1. The provinces receive favours which raise them towards the level of Italy, while Italy's privileges are diminished, and she is depressed towards the level of the provinces. But this change takes place more gradually than, too, the working out of uniformity among the other parts of the empire, which can be traced even under Augustus, who promoted this end by a. limiting the autonomy of free and federate states, b. increasing the autonomy of the directly subject states, c. extending Roman citizenship, g. converting client principalities into provincial territory. But perhaps the act of Augustus which most effectually promoted this tenancy was his reorganization of the army, which has been described in the foregoing chapter. While hitherto the legions were recruited from Roman citizens only, and the provinces were exempt from ordinary military service, although they were liable to be called upon in cases of necessity, Augustus made all the subjects of the empire, whether Roman citizens or not, whether Italians or provincials, liable to regular military service. 
The legions were recruited not from Italy only, but from all the cities of the empire, whether Roman, Latin, or Peregrini. And the recruit, as soon as he entered the legion, became a Roman citizen. The auxilia were recruited from those subject communities which were not formed as cities, and no Roman citizens belonged to these corps. Such communities now occupied somewhat the same position as the Italic peoples had formerly occupied in relation to Roman citizens. It will be readily seen that a new organization of the legions, by largely increasing the number of Roman citizens, and by raising the importance of the provinces, tended in the direction of uniformity. It has already been stated that in the provincial administration, as in other matters, a division was made by Augustus between the Emperor and the Senate. Henceforward there are senatorial provinces and imperial provinces. The provinces which fell to the share of the Senate were chiefly those which were peaceable and settled, and were not likely to require the constant presence of military forces. The emperor took charge of those which were likely to be troublesome, and might often demand the intervention of the imperador and his soldiers. Thus, 27 B.C., Augustus received as his proconsular province Syria, Gaul, and hither Spain. With Syria was connected the defence of the eastern frontier. Gaul, which as yet was a single province, he had to protect against the Germans beyond the Rhine, and Hispania Giderior, or Tarragonensis, laid on him the conduct of the Cantabrian War. To the Senate were left Sicily, Africa, Crete, and Cyrene, Asia, Bithynia, Illyricum, Macedonia, Achaia, Sardinia, and further Spain, Baetica. In this division, there was an attempt to establish a balance between the dominion of the emperor, who had also Egypt, though not as a province, and the senate. But the balance soon wavered in favour of the emperor, and the imperial provinces soon outweighed the senatorial in number as well as importance. When new provinces were added to the empire, they were made imperial. After the division of 27 B.C., several changes took place during the reign of Augustus, but before we consider the provinces separately, it is necessary to speak of the general differences between the senatorial and the imperial government. The Roman provinces were at first governed by praetors, but Sala made a new arrangement by which the governors should be no longer praetors in office, but men who had been praetors, under the title of proprietors. This change introduced a new principle into the provincial government. Henceforward, the governors are proconsuls and proprietors. Under the empire of those governors who are not subordinate to a magistrate with higher authority than their own, are proconsuls. Those who have a higher magistrate above them are proprietors. The governors of the senatorial provinces were all proconsuls, as they were, under the control of no superior magistrate, whereas the governors of the imperial provinces were under the proconsul authority of the emperor, and were therefore only proprietors. The distinction between governors proconsuli and governors proprietori must not be confused with the distinction between consular praetorian provinces. A proprietor might be either of praetorian or of consular rank, and a proconsul might be either of consular or of praetorian rank. In the case of the senatorial provinces, a definite line was drawn between consular and praetorian provinces. It was finally arranged that only consulars were appointed to Asia and Africa, only Praetorians to the rest. In the imperial provinces, the line does not seem to have been so strict. As a rule, the Praetorian governor commanded only one legion, the consular more than one. The proconsuls or governors of the provinces which the Senate administered 
were elected as of old by lot, and only held office for a year. They were assisted in their duties by legati and quaestors, who possessed an independent proprietorian imperium. The proconsul of consular rank, attended by twelve lictors, had three legati appointed by himself, and one quaestor at his side. He of praetorian rank, attended by six lictors, had one legatus and one quaestor. The governors of the imperial provinces were entitled Legati Augusti Propradori. They were appointed by the emperor, and their constitutional position was that the emperor delegated to them his imperium. But only consulars or praetorians, and therefore only senators, could be appointed. Their term of governorship was not necessarily limited to a year, like that of the proconsuls, but depended on the will of the emperor. The financial affairs of the imperial provinces were managed by procuratores, generally of equestrian rank, but sometimes freed men. They were also for jurisdiction legati augusti juridici, of senatorial rank, but it is not certain whether they were instituted under Augustus. But while the Senate had no part in the administration of the imperial provinces, except in so far as the governors were chosen from among senators, the emperor had powers of interfering in the affairs of the senatorial provinces by virtue of the imperium maius, which he possessed over other proconsuls. Moreover, he could levy troops in the provinces of the senate and exercise control over taxation. Thus, the supply of corn from Africa, a senatorial province, went to the emperor, not to the senate. In both kinds of provinces alike, the governors combined supreme civil and military authority, but the proconsuls had rarely, except in the case of Africa, military forces of any importance at their disposition. Thus, there were two sets of provincial governors, those who represented the Senate, and those who represented the Emperor. It might be thought at first sight that the senatorial governors would be jealous of the Imperial, who had legions under them and the longer tenure of office. But this danger was obviated by the important circumstance that the legati were chosen from the same class as the proconsuls, and thus the same man who was one year proconsul of Asia might the next year be appointed to the legatus of Syria. In reviewing the provinces of the Roman Empire, we may begin with the western and proceed eastward. With the exception of Africa and Sardinia, there were no subject lands which Augustus did not visit as Caesar, if not as Augustus. In 27 BC he went to Gaul and thence to Spain, where he remained until 24 BC, conducting the Cantabrian War. Two years later he visited Sicily, whence he proceeded to the east, Samos, Asia, and Bithynia, settled the Parthian question, and returned to Rome in 19 BC. In 16 BC he made a second visit to Gaul, in the company of Tiberius, and stayed in the Gallic provinces for three years. In 10 BC he visited Gaul again, and in 8 BC for the fourth time. Henceforward he did not leave Italy, but deputed the work of provincial organization to those whom he marked out to be his successors. End of chapter 6, section 1《The Student's Roman Empire》Part 1 by John Bagnell Bury Chapter 6 Provincial Administration under Augustus, the Western Provinces, 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. Sections 2 through 4 Section 2 Gaul Augustus divided Gallia into four provinces, Narbonensis, Aquitania, Lugudinensis, and Belgica, in 22 B.C., he assigned Narbonensis to the Senate, while the others remained under imperial legati. 
Narbonensis had become a Roman province in 121 BC. United with the rest of Gaul after the conquests of Julius Caesar, it was now restored to its separate being. Through the civil wars it became far more than the territory of Narbo. For the federate Greek state of Massilia, which possessed most of the coastline, was reduced to the condition of a provincial town, and thereby Narbonensis extended from the Pyrenees to the Maritime Alps. The elder Caesar did much towards Romanizing this province. To him Narbo owed its strength and prosperity, and he founded new cities possessing Roman citizenship, chief among them Aralate, which as a commercial town soon took the place of her older Greek neighbor. The canton system of the Celts was gradually superseded in Narbonensis by the Italian system of city communities, and this development was zealously furthered by Augustus. In one interesting case we can see the process. The canton of the Volcae is first organized on the Italian principle under praetors, praetor volcarum. The next step is that the canton of the Volcae is replaced by the Latin city Nemausis, which is now Nimes. The disappearance of the canton system distinguishes the southern province from the rest of Gaul, and is part of its conspicuously Roman character. This different degree of Romanization had probably a good deal to do with the marked differences between the lands of the Languedoc and those of the Languedui. Yet the Celts of Narbonensis did not forget their national gods. The religion of the country survived long in the south as well as in the north. Tres Galliers. The three imperial provinces were often grouped together as the three Gauls. This threefold division corresponded in general outline to the ethnical division, which Caesar marks at the beginning of his Gallic War. But it does not correspond wholly. The province of the southwest contains Iberian Aquitania, but with a Celtic addition. The Celtic land between the Liger and the Garumna is taken from Celtica and annexed to Aquitania. The province Lugudinensis answers to Caesar's Celtica, but it no longer includes all the Celts. It has lost some on the south side to Aquitania, and others on the north to the third division, Belgica. Thus Belgica is no longer entirely Teutonic, but partly Teutonic and partly Celtic. These three districts seem at first to have been placed under the single control of a military governor, who commanded the legions stationed on the Rhine, and had a legatus in each province. Drusus held this position from 13 to 9 B.C., and Tiberius succeeded him 9 to 7 B.C. Again, from 13 to 17 A.D., we find Germanicus holding the same position. It is possible that in the intervening years this military control was suspended, and that the legati of the three provinces were independent of any superior but the emperor, as they certainly were after 17 A.D. In imperial Gaul, the Roman government allowed the cantons to remain, and ordered their administration accordingly. The city system was not introduced in these provinces as in Narbonensis, and the progress of Romanization was much slower. There was a strong national spirit. The religion of the Druids was firmly rooted, and it was long felt by Roman rulers that the presence of armies on the Rhine was as needful to prevent a rebellion in Gaul as to ward off a German invasion. But no serious attempt was made by the Celts to throw off the yoke of their Roman lords. An Iberian rebellion in Aquitania was easily suppressed by Massala Corvinus about 27 B.C., and perhaps belongs as much to the history of Spain as to that of Gaul. The Iberians north of the Pyrenees were probably in communication with their brethren of the south, the success of Massala was rewarded by a triumph. The four visits of Augustus to Gaul, which have been mentioned above, and that of Agrippa in 19 BC, show how much the thoughts of the emperor were filled with the task of organizing the country which his father had conquered and had not time to shape. On the occasion of his first visit he held a census of Gaul, the first Roman census ever held there, in order to regulate the taxes. 
it is remarkable that the policy adopted by Rome was not to obliterate, but to preserve a national spirit. Not only was the Canton organization preserved, but all the cantons of the three provinces were yoked together by a national constitution, quite distinct from the imperial administration, though under imperial patronage. It was in the consulship of M. Massala Barbatus and P. Quirinius, 12 B.C., on the first day of August, that Drusus dedicated an altar to Rome and the genius of Augustus beneath the hill of Lugudunum, where the priest of the three Gauls should henceforward sacrifice yearly, on the same day, to those deities. The priest was to be elected annually by those whom the cantons of the three provinces chose to represent them in a national concilium held at Lugudunum. Among the rights of this assembly were that of determining the distribution of the taxes and that of lodging complaints against the acts of imperial officials. The city which was thus chosen to be the meeting place of the Gallic peoples under Roman auspices, Lugudunum, stood above and apart from the other communities of imperial Gaul. She gave her name to one of the three provinces, and the governor of Lugudunensis dwelt within her walls but she was far more than a provincial residence. Singular by her privileged position as the one city in the three Gauls, which enjoyed the rights of Roman citizenship, she may be regarded as the capital of all three, yet not belonging to any. Her exalted position resembles that of Rome in Italy, rather than that of Alexandria in Egypt. It has also been compared with that of Washington in the United States. She and Carthage were the only cities in the western subject lands in which, as in Rome itself, a garrison was stationed. She had the right of coining imperial gold, and we cannot assert this of any other western city. Her position, rising at the meeting of the Rhone from the east, and the Arar sound from the north, was advantageous from the point of view either of a merchant or of a soldier. She was the center of the road system of Gaul, which was worked out by Agrippa, and whenever an emperor visited his Gallic provinces, Lugudunum was naturally his headquarters. The difference in development between the three Gauls and Narbonensis, the land of cantons and the land of cities, is well illustrated by the town names of France. In Narbonensis, the local names superseded forever the tribal names, Aralate, Vienna, Valentia, survive in Arles, Vienne, Valence. But in Imperial Gaul, the rule is that the local names fell into disuse, and the towns are called, at the present day, by the names of the old Gallic tribes. Lutetia, the city of the Parisi, is Paris. Durocatorum, the city of the Remi, is Reims. Avericum, the city of the Beturige, is Bourges. The conqueror of Gaul had shown the way to the conquest of Britain, but this work was reserved for another than his son. One of the objects of Augustus in visiting Gaul in 27 BC was to feel his way towards an invasion of the northern island, but the project was abandoned. The legions of Augustus, however, though they did not cross the channel, crossed the Rhine, but the story of the making of the true and original province of Germany beyond the Rhine and its brief duration, and of the forming of the spurious Germanies on the left bank of the river, will be told in another chapter. Section 3. Spain Spain, the land of the far west in the old world, was safe through its geographical position from the invasion of a foe. Almost enclosed by the sea, it had no frontier exposed to the menace of a foreign power, and it was the only province in such a situation that required the constant presence of a military force. For though the Romanizing of the southern and eastern parts had advanced with wonderful rapidity, the intractable peoples of the northwestern regions refused to accept the yoke of the conqueror, and held out in the mountain fastnesses from which they descended to plunder their southern neighbors. The Cantabrians and the Asturians were the most important of these warlike races, and, when Augustus founded the empire, their territories could hardly be considered as yet really under the sway of Rome. Since the death of Caesar, arms had never been laid down in Spain. 
commanders were ever winning triumphs there, and ever having to begin anew. Augustus found it needful to keep no less than three legions in the country, one in Cantabria, two in Asturia, and the memory of the Asturian army still abides in the name Leon, the place where the Legio Seven Gemina was stationed. Before Augustus, the province of Hispania Ulterior took in the land of the Tagus and the Durius, as well as the region of the Betis. This division was now altered. First of all, Galatia, the northwestern corner, was transferred from the further to the hither province, so that all the fighting in the disturbed districts of the north and northwest might devolve upon the same commander. The next step was the separation of Lusitania and its organization as a distinct imperial province, while the rest of further Spain, Vedica as it came to be called, was placed under the control of the Senate. Another change made by Augustus was the removal of the seat of government in hither Spain from New Carthage to more northern and more central Taraco, whence, from this time forth, the province was called Terraconensis. Taraco became in this province what Lagudinum was in Gaul, the chief seat of the worship of Rome and Augustus, and the meeting place of the provincial concilium. Thus, under the new order of things, Spain consists of three provinces, Vedica, Senatorial, Terraconensis, and Lusitania, Imperial. This arrangement was probably not completed until the end of the Cantabrian War, which lasted with few interruptions from 29 to 25 B.C., only, however, to break out again a year or two later. A rebellion of Cantabria and Asturia was suppressed by Statilius Taurus in 29 B.C., but in 27 B.C. disturbances were renewed and the emperor himself hastened from Gaul to quell the insurrection. But a serious illness at Taraco forced him to leave the conduct of the war to his legati, probably under the general direction of Agrippa. A fleet on the north coast supported the operations by land, and by degrees the fastnesses of the Cantabrians fell into the hands of the Romans. At the same time P. Carcisius subdued the Asturians. It was a more difficult task to secure a lasting pacification. Augustus endeavored to induce the mountain peoples to settle in the plains, where in the neighborhood of Roman colonies they might be tamed and civilized. Such centers of Roman life in the northwest were Augusta Asturica, Bracara Augusta, Lucas Augusti, memorials of the Spanish visit of Augustus, and still surviving under their old names as Astorga, Braga, and Lugo. The chief inland town of eastern Terraconensis was the work of the same statesman. Saragossa, on the Ebro, still preserves the name of the colony of Caesar Augustus. But the emperor had not left Spain long, 24 B.C., when new disturbances broke out. They were promptly put down, but in 22 B.C. another rebellion of the Cantabrians and Asturians called for the joint action of the governors of Taraconensis and Lusitania. The last war, and perhaps the most serious of all, was waged two years later, and demanded the leadership of Marcus Agrippa himself, 20 to 19 B.C. The difficulty was at first aggravated by the mutiny of the soldiers, who detested the weary and doubtful warfare in the mountains, and it required all the military experience of the general to restore their discipline and zeal. After many losses the war was successfully ended, 19 B.C., and the hitherto untamable Cantabrian people reduced to insignificance. A few disturbances occurred four years later, but were easily dealt with yet it was still felt to be needful to keep a strong military force in northern Spain. Roman civilization had soon taken a firm hold in the south of Spain. The contrast of Nero Benensis with the rest of Gaul is like the contrast of Baetica and the eastern side of the hither province with the rest of Spain. But Roman policy was very different in the two countries and this was due to the circumstance that Spain was conquered and organized at an earlier period. The Latinizing of Spain had been carried far under the Republic. The Latinizing of Gaul had practically begun under the Empire. 
In Gaul, the tribal canons were allowed to remain. This was the policy of the Caesars, father and son. In Spain, the tribal cantons were broken up in smaller divisions. This was the policy of the Republican Senate. In Gaul, excluding the southern province, there were no Roman cities except Lugudunum. In Spain, Roman colonies were laid here and there in all parts. The Gallic fellows of Baetic Gades, Corduba and Hispalis, of Lusitanian Emerita and Olispo, of Terracanese Carthage, Caesar Augusta and Bracara, must be sought altogether under the early empire in the smallest of the four provinces of Gaul. In Lusitania, Augustus founded Emerita Augusta, a colony of veterans, on the river Annas, Guadiana, and made it the capital of the province. The other chief Roman towns of Lusitania were Alispo, once promoted to be the capital, Lisbon, of a modern kingdom, and Pax Julia, now represented by Beja. Spain was not a network of the Roman roads like Gaul. The only imperial road was the Via Augusta, which went from the north of Italy along the coast to Narbo, then across the pass of Quiserda to Ilerda, and on by Tarraco and Valentia to the mouth of the Betis. The other road, communication necessary in a fertile and prosperous country, was provided by the local communities. The Spanish peninsula was rich not only in metals, but in wine, oil, and corn. Gades, Cadiz, which now received the name of Augusta Julia, was one of the richest and most luxurious towns in the empire. Section 4. Africa, Sardinia, Sicily. From Spain one naturally goes on to Africa. Augustus never visited either the African province or the African dependency, but, before he left Turaco, 25 B.C., he was called upon to deal with African affairs. In history, Spain and Africa have always been closely connected. Sometimes Spain has been the stepping stone to Africa. Oftener, as for the Phoenicians and the Arabs, Africa has been the stepping stone to Spain. The western half of Mauritania was really nearer to the European peninsula which faced it than to the rest of the African coast and under the later empire this region went with Spain and Gaul, not with Africa and Italy. There was no road between Tingis in western and Caesarea in eastern Mauritania. The communication was by sea. And so it was that the Moorish hordes, crossing to Baetica in their boats, were more dangerous to Roman subjects in Spain than to those in Africa. A poet of Nero's time describes Baetica as Trucibus obnoxia maris. For though Spain, as has been already said, had no frontier exposed to a foreign power, her southern province had as close neighbor a land which, first as a dependency and then as a province, was inhabited by a rude and untamed population. The commands which Augustus issued from the capital of his Spanish province especially regarded Mauritania but we must call to mind what had taken place in Africa since the dictator Caesar ordered it anew. He had increased the Roman province by the addition of the kingdom of Numidia, and the river Amsaga was fixed as the western boundary between New Africa, as Numidia was sometimes called, and Mauritania. This latter country was at that time under two kings. Over the eastern realm of Eol, soon to be called by Caesar's name, ruled King Bacchus. Over the western realm of Tingus ruled King Bogud. Both these potentates had taken Caesar's side in the first civil war, unlike King Juba, and they therefore kept their kingdoms after Caesar's victory. But in the next civil war they did not both take the same side. Bacchus held to Caesar the son, as he had held to Caesar the father. But Bogud supported Antonius, while his own capital Tingis, Tangier, embraced the other cause. In reward, Bacchus was promoted to kingship over the whole of Mauritania, and Tingis received the privilege of Roman citizenship. When Bacchus died, 33 BC, his kingdom was left kingless for a season, but the Roman government did not think that the time had yet come for a province of Mauritania. 
A son of the last king of Numidia, called Juba, like his father, had followed the dictator's triumph through the streets of Rome, and had been brought up under the care of Caesar and his successor. He served in the Roman army. He was an eager student of Greek and Roman literature, and wrote or compiled Greek books himself. On him Augustus fixed to take the place of King Bacchus. If it was out of the question to restore him to his paternal kingdom of Numidia, he should at least have the next thing to it, the kingdom of Mauritania. And as the descendant of King Massinissa, he would be welcome to the natives. At the same time, 25 B.C., Augustus gave Mauritania a queen. The daughter of Antonius and the Egyptian queen had followed his own triumph, as Juba had followed his father's. Named Cleopatra like her mother, she had been protected and educated by the noble kindness of Octavia, whom her parents had so deeply wronged. There had been a peculiar fitness, as has been well remarked, in the union of the Numidian prince and the Egyptian princess, whose fortunes were so like. This union brought about the strange circumstance that the last king of Mauritania, Juba's son, bore the name of Ptolemy. Thus Roman dominion in Africa, west of Egypt, consisted under Augustus of a province and a dependent kingdom, the river Amsaga, on which Sirta is built, forming the boundary. The southern boundaries of this dominion it would have been hard, perhaps, for Augustus himself to fix, inasmuch as there were no neighboring states. The real dominion passed insensibly into a sphere of influence among the native races, who were alternatively submissive and hostile, or, as the Romans would have said, rebellious. Against these dangerous neighbors of the interior, Garamantes and invincible Gaetulians, Transtagonenses and Musulami, it was necessary to keep a legion in Africa, which was thus distinguished as the only senatorial province whose proconsul commanded an army. Two expeditions were made in the reign of Augustus against these enemies, the first under the proconsul L. Cornelius Balbus, 19 B.C., against the Garamantes, and a second under P. Sulpicius Quirinius against the tribes of Marmarica further east. Barbus performed his task ably and received a triumph, remarkable as the last granted to any private Roman citizen. In the organization of Gaul and Spain, Rome had no older civilization to build upon. It was otherwise in Sicily and Africa. The civilization of Sicily, when it became Roman, was chiefly Greek, but partly Phoenician. That of Africa, on the contrary, was chiefly Phoenician, but partly Greek. Accordingly, Rome built on Phoenician foundations in the lands which she won from Carthage, and accepted the constitution of the Phoenician town communities, just as she accepted the cantons in Gaul. But there was a remarkable likeness and organization between these communities and those of Italy, so that the transition from the one form to the other was soon and easily accomplished. Carthage, whose existence was blotted out by the short-sighted policy of the Republican Senate, had been revived by the generous counsels of Caesar, to become soon the capital of Roman, as it had been of Punic, Africa. At first the Phoenician constitution was restored to her, but she soon received the form of a Roman colonia, and grew to be one of the greatest and most luxurious cities of Western Europe. Utica, jealous of the resurrection of her old rival, was made a Roman municipium. The growth of Roman life in Africa was also furthered by the settlement of colonies of veterans. In the original province may be mentioned Culpea and Hippodir Hydos, in Numidia, Sirta, Constantine, and Sicca. In Roman civilization, Mauritania was far behind her eastern neighbors, but Augustus did much in establishing colonies, chiefly on the coast. These Roman towns of Mauritania owed no allegiance to the native king, but depended directly on the governor of the neighboring province. Besides the Phoenician towns and the towns on Italian model, whether municipia or colonies, there were also native Libyan communities, but these stood directly under the control of the Roman governors, or sometimes were placed under special Roman prefects. The language of the native Berbers 
was still spoken chiefly in the regions which the Romans least frequented. It was treated by the conquerors like the Iberian in Spain and the Celtic in Gaul. The language of communication throughout northern Africa was Phoenician, but Rome refused to recognize this Asiatic tongue as an official language, as she had recognized Greek in her eastern provinces. In their local affairs the communities might use Phoenician, but once they entered into imperial relations, Latin was prescribed. It might have been thought that Greek, which was better known in Africa than Latin when the Romans came, would have been adopted there as the imperial language. But the government decreed that Africa, like Sicily, was to belong to the Latin West. It is instructive to observe that, while the name of the Greek queen of Mauritania appears on coins in Greek, that of her husband, who was regarded as an imperial official, is always in Latin. Africa was fertile in fruit, though her wine could not compete with the produce of Spain and Italy. In corn she was especially rich, and shared with Egypt and Sicily the privilege of supplying Rome. The purple industry was still active, chiefly in the little island of Gerba, not destined indeed to become as famous as the island of Tyre. Juba introduced this industry on the western coast of his kingdom. The general well-being of the land has ample witnesses in the remains of splendid structures which have been found there in all parts, such as theaters, baths, and triumphal arches. From Africa we pass to another province in which Rome was the heiress of Carthage. Sardinia had ceased to look to her African ruler in 238 B.C., and had become, seven years later, a Roman province, the earliest except Sicily. In the division of the provinces in 27 B.C., Sardinia and Corsica fell to the Senate and Roman people. But the descents of pirates forced Augustus to take the province into his own hands in 6 A.D. and commit it to the protection of soldiers. He did not place it, however, under a legatus of senatorial rank, but only under a procurator of equestrian rank. It was destined to pass again to the Senate under Nero, but returned to the emperor finally in the reign of Vespasian. These islands, though placed in the midst of civilization, were always barbarous and remote. The rugged nature of Corsica, the pestilential air of its southern fellow, did not invite settlements or visitors. They were more suited to be places of exile, and they were used as such. Augustus sent no colonies thither, and did not visit them himself. The chief value of Sardinia lay in its large production and export of grain. Very different was the other great island of the Mediterranean, the oldest of all the provinces of Rome, the land whose conquest led to the further conquests of Sardinia and of Africa itself. It was in Sicily that the younger Caesar established his position in the West. His recovery of the land, on which Rome depended for her grain, first set his influence and popularity on a sure foundation. As Augustus, he visited it again, B.C. 22, and although it was a senatorial province, ordered its affairs by virtue of his Maius Imperium at Syracuse. Perhaps it was in memory of this visit that he gave the name of Syracuse to a room in his house which he used as a retreat when he wished to suffer no interruption. Roman policy had decreed that Sicily was to belong to the Latin West, not to the Greek East, with which once she had been so constantly connected. And for centuries to come, embosomed in the center of the empire, she plays no part in history, such as she had played in the past, and was destined to play again in the distant future. End of chapter 6, sections 2 through 4. Org. The Students' Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 6, Provincial Administration under Augustus, the Western Provinces, 27 B.C. to 14 A.D., Sections 5 and 6. Section 5, Raetia, Noricum, and the Alpine Districts. From the province adjoining Italy on the south, we pass to the lands on its northern frontier, which it devolved upon Augustus to conquer and to shape. 
the towns of northern Italy were constantly exposed to the descents of unreclaimed Alpine tribes, who could not be fully quelled as long as they possessed a land of refuge beyond the mountains, among the kindred barbarians of Raetia. For the security of Italy, it was imperative to subdue these troublesome neighbors, and in order to do so effectively, it was necessary to occupy Raetia and Vindelicia. This task was accomplished without difficulty in 15 BC by the stepsons of the emperor. Drusus invaded Raetia from the south and vanquished the enemy in battle. Tiberius, who was then governor of Gaul, marched from the north to assist him, and the Vendelici were defeated in a naval action on the waters of the lake of Brigantium. The tribes of the restless Genuani and the swift Brueni appear to have played a prominent part in the Vindelician War. The decisive battle which gave Rhaetia to Rome was fought near the sources of the Danube, under the fortunate auspices of Tiberius, on the 1st of August. By these campaigns the countries which corresponded to Bavaria, Tyrol, and eastern Switzerland became Roman. A new military frontier was secured, and direct communications were established between northern Italy and the upper Danube and upper Rhine. The military province of Raetia was placed under an imperial prefect, and the troops which used to be stationed in Cisalpine Gaul could now be transferred to an advanced position. Augusta Vindelicium was founded as a military station near the frontier of the new province, and still continues under the name of Augsburg, the name of the ruler who did so much in Romanizing Western Europe. For Romanizing Raetia itself, indeed, neither he nor his successors did much. No Roman towns were founded there, as in the neighboring province of Noricum. The conquest of the dangerous Salassi, who inhabited the valley of the Duria, between the Graelin and the Pennine Alps, was successfully accomplished by Terentius Murena, brother-in-law of Masonus, in 25 BC. The people was exterminated, and a body of Praetorian soldiers was settled in the valley, through which roads ran over the Gralin Alps to Lugudunum, and over the Pianine into Raetia. The new city was called Augustus Praetoria, the emperor's name survives in the modern Aosta, where the old Roman walls and grates are still to be seen. The western Alps between Gaul and Italy were formed into two small districts, the Maritime Alps and the Cotian Alps, of which the former was governed by imperial prefects. At first the Cotian district formed a dependent state, not under a Roman commander, but under its own prince Cotius, from whom it derived its name, Reginum Coti. Owing to his ready submission, he was left in possession of his territory, with the title Profectus Civitatium. His capital Segusio survives as Susa, and the arch which he erected in honor of his overlord Augustus, 8 B.C., is still standing. Through this prefecture, as it seems to have been, ran the Via Cotia from Augusta Tarinorum, Turin, to Aralate, Arles. The pacification of the Alps, though it presented nothing brilliant to attract historians, conferred a solid and lasting benefit on Italy, and Italy gratefully recognized this by a monument which she set up in honor of the emperor on a hill on the Mediterranean coast near Monaco. The reduction of forty-six Alpine peoples is recorded in the inscription which has been preserved. Few relics of the Roman occupation have been found in Raetia. It is otherwise with the neighboring province of Noricum, which included the lands now called Styria and Carinthia, along with a part of Carniola and most of Austria. Here traffic had prepared the way for Roman subjugation. Roman customs and the Latin tongue were known beyond the Carnic Alps, and when the time came for the land to become directly dependent on Rome, no difficulty was experienced. An occasion presented itself in 16 BC, when some of the Noric tribes joined their neighbors, the Pannonians, in a plundering incursion into Istria. At first treated as a dependent kingdom, Noricum soon passed into the condition of an imperial province under a prefect or procurator, but continued to be called Regnum Noricum. 
No legions were stationed in either Raetia or Noricum, only auxiliary troops. But the former province was held in check by legions of the Rhine army at Vindonissa, and Noricum was likewise surveyed by legions of the Pannonian army, stationed at Petovio, on the Drava, Drave. The organization of Noricum on the model of Italy was carried out by the emperor Claudius. The land immediately beyond the Julian Alps, with the towns of Amona and Nauportis, belonged to Illyricum, not to Noricum, but it subsequently became a part of Italy. The occupation of Raetia and Noricum was of great and permanent importance for the military defense of the empire against the barbarians of central Europe. A line of communication was secured between the armies on the Danube and the armies on the Rhine. Section 6. Illyricum and the Hamus Lands Pannonia and Dalmatia The subjugation of Illyricum was the work of the first emperor. Istria and Dalmatia were counted as Roman lands under the Republic, but the tribes of the interior maintained their independence and plundered their civilized neighbors in Macedonia. Roman legions had been destroyed, and the eagles captured by these untamed peoples in 48 B.C. under Gabinius, and in 44 B.C. under Vatinius. To avenge these defeats was demanded by Roman honor, and to pacify the interior districts was demanded by Roman policy. The younger Caesar undertook this task when he had dealt with Sextus Pompeius and discharged it with energy and success. In 35 B.C. he subdued the smaller tribes all along the Hadriatic coast, beginning with Doclea, which is now Montenegro, near the borders of the Macedonian province, and ending with the Iapides, who lived in the Alpine district northeast of Istria. At the same time his fleet subdued the pirates who infested the coast islands, especially Cursola and Meleda. The Iapides, whose depredations extended to northern Italy, and who had ventured to attack places like Tergeste and Aquilia, offered a strenuous resistance. When the Roman army approached, most of the population assembled in their town Arupium, but as Caesar drew nearer, fled into the forests. The strong fortress of Matulum, built on two summits of a wooded hill, gave more trouble. It was defended by a garrison of three thousand chosen warriors, who foiled all the Roman plans of attack, until Caesar, with Agrippa by his side, led his soldiers against the walls. On this occasion Caesar received some bodily injuries. The energy of the Romans, inspirited by the example of their leader, induced the besieged to capitulate. But when the Romans on entering the town demanded the surrender of their arms, the Iapides, thinking that they were betrayed, made a desperate resistance in which most of them were slain, and the remainder, having slain the women and children, set fire to their town. Having thus subdued the Iapides, Caesar marched through their country down the river Colapis, Culpa, which flows into the Save, and laid siege to the Pannonian fortress of Sicia, whose name is preserved in Sisic situated at the junction of the two streams. It was not the first time that a Roman force had appeared before the walls of Sicia, but it was the first time that a Roman force did not appear in vain. Having thrown a bridge across the river, Caesar surrounded the stronghold with earthworks and ditches, and with the assistance of some tribes on the Danube, got together a small flotilla on the save, so that he could operate against the town by water as well as by land. The Pannonian friends of the besieged place made an attempt to relieve it, but were beaten back with loss, and having held out for thirty days, Sicia was taken by storm. A strong position was thus secured for further operations, whether against the Pannonians or against the Dacians. A Roman fortress was built and garrisoned with twenty-five cohorts under the command of Fufius Geminus. Caesar returned to Italy towards the end of the year, 35 B.C., but during the winter the conquered Pannonian tribe rebelled, and Fufius came into great straits. Dark rumors of his situation, for he was unable to send a sure message, reached Caesar, who was at that moment planning an expedition to Britain. 
he immediately hastened to the relief of Sicia, and let the Britannic enterprise fall through. Having delivered Fufius from the danger, he returned to Dalmatia, and spent the rest of the year 34 B.C. in reducing the inland tribes, which now, forgetting their tribal feuds, combined in a great federation to fight for their freedom. They mustered an army of 12,000 strong, and took up a position at Pomona, now Teplin, northeast of Sebenico, a place impregnable by nature and strengthened further by art. The name of their leader was Versus. By a skillful piece of strategy, Caesar forced the enemy to give up their advanced lines of defense and retreat into the fortress, which he prepared to reduce by starving the garrison out, and for this purpose built a wall five miles in circuit. Another large Dalmatian force under Testimus came to relieve the place, but was completely defeated. The defenders of Promona simultaneously made an excursion against the besiegers, but were driven back, and some of their pursuers penetrated into the fortress with them. A few days later it was surrendered. The fall of Promona put an end to the war, in so far as it was waged by the Dalmatians in common but warfare continued here and there. Various tribes and fortresses held out by themselves. It was necessary to besiege Setovia, and Caesar was wounded there in his knee. He returned after this to Rome to enter upon his second consulship, 33 B.C., leaving the completion of his work to Statilius Taurus, who for his services on this occasion received a large share of the Illyrian spoils, and laid the foundation of his great wealth. But Caesar laid down his consulate on the very day on which he assumed it, and returned to Dalmatia, in order to receive the submission of the conquered peoples. The eagles which had been captured from the army of Gabinius were restored, and seven hundred boys were given to the conqueror as hostages. The civilizing of these Illyrian lands was now begun in earnest. The chief towns on the coast were raised to the position of Italian communities, and a new epoch began in the history of Salone, Iader, Pola, Tergeste, and other places, which made their mark in the later history of Europe. It was now doubtless that colonies were settled at Salone, Pola, and Amona. Thus Salone became in full official language Colonia Martia Julia Salone, and Amona, which corresponds with Laybach, the capital of Carniola, became Colonia Julia Amona. Pola, called Colonia Pietas Julia Pola, may have become in some measure for Illyricum what Lugudinum was for the three Gauls, insofar as a temple of Rome and Augustus was built there during the lifetime of the first emperor. A change was also made in the administration of Illyricum, Hitherto it had been joined to the government of Cisalpine Gaul, with the exception of a small strip of land in the south of Domitia, which was annexed to Macedonia. But after Caesar's campaigns, Illyricum was promoted to the dignity of a separate province, bounded by the Savus in the north and the Drillo in the south. At the division of provinces in 27 BC, it was assigned to the Senate but in the nature of things it could not long remain senatorial. The presence of legions on the northern frontier could not be dispensed with, and it devolved upon the governor to watch over Noricum on the one hand and Moesia on the other. Such powers and responsibilities were not likely to be left to a proconsul, and accordingly soon after the conquest of Raetia, when hostilities in Pannonia seemed likely to break out, we find Agrippa sent thither, 13 B.C., invested, quote, with greater powers than all the governors out of Italy, end quote. The terror of Agrippa's name held the Pannonians in check, but on his death in the following year they took up arms, and Tiberius was appointed to succeed Agrippa. He brought the rebellious tribes to submission, but in the next year, 11 B.C., was again compelled to take the field against them, and also to suppress a revolt of the Dalmatians. These events led to the transference of Illyricum from the Senate to the Emperor. Both the Dalmatian subjects and the Pannonian neighbors required the constant presence of military forces. 
At the same time, the northern frontier of the province advanced from the Savus to the Dravus, in consequence of the successes of Tiberius in his three campaigns, 12 to 10 B.C. Potovio, on the borders of Noricum, now became the advanced station of the legions, instead of Sicia. This extension of territory soon led to a division of Illyricum into two provinces, Pannonia and Dalmatia, both imperial. The government of Pannonia was especially important, because the intervention of the legatus might be called for either in Noricum or in Moesia. It is well to notice that the name Illyricum was used in two ways. In its stricter sense, it included Pannonia and Dalmatia. In a wider sense, and specially for financial purposes, it took in Noricum and Moesia, as coming within the sphere of the governors of Illyricum proper. Moesia and Thrace The governors of Macedonia under the Republic were constantly troubled by the hostilities of the rude Illyric and Thracian peoples on the north and east. The Dardanians of the Upper Margus, the Denthalate of the Strymon, the Tribali between the Timicus and the Oascus, and the Bessi beyond the Rhodo were troublesome neighbors. The lands between the Danube and Mount Hamus, which now form the Principality of Bulgaria, were inhabited by the Moesians, and beyond the Danube was the dominion of the Dacians, whom the Romans had reason to regard as a most formidable enemy. The Thracians in the south, the Moesians in the center, and the Dacians in the north were people of the same race, speaking the same tongue. It was evidently a very important matter for the Roman government to break this line, and to bring Moesia and Thrace directly or indirectly under Roman sway, so as to make the Eister the frontier of the empire. The occasion of the conquest of Moesia was an invasion of the Bastarnae, a powerful people, perhaps of German race, who lived between the Danube and the Dniester in 29 BC. As long as they confined their hostilities to the Moesians, Dardanians, and Triballi, the matter did not concern the governor of Macedonia, Marcus Licinius Crassus, grandson of the rival of Pompey and Caesar. But when they attacked the Denthalate, allies of Rome, he was called on to interfere. The Bastarnae retired at his command, but he followed them as they retreated and defeated them where the river Cybris flows into the Danube. But at the same time he turned his arms against Boeasia, and reduced, not without considerable toil and hardships, almost all the tribes of that country. He had also to deal with the Serdi, who dwelt in the center of the peninsula under Mount Scomius, in the direct way between Macedonia and Moesia. These he conquered, and took their chief place, Serdica, which is now Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. He was also compelled to reduce the unfriendly tribes of Thrace. In that country the worship of Dionysus was cultivated with wild enthusiasm, and the possession of one specially venerable grove, consecrated to that god, perhaps the very grove in which Alexander the Great had once sacrificed, was a subject of discord between two powerful rival tribes, the Odrysae and the Bessi. The Bessi were then in possession, but Crassus took the sacred place from them and gave it to the friendly Odrysae, and constituted their prince the representative of Roman power in Thrace, with lordship over the other peoples, and protector of the Greek towns on the coast. Thus Thrace became a dependent kingdom. That Moesia also became, at first, a dependency of the same kind, before she became a regular province, seems likely. The Greek cities on the coast were probably placed under the protection of the Thracian kingdom, while the rest of Moesia and Tribalia may have been united under one of the native princes. After 27 BC, it would doubtless have devolved upon the governor of Illyricum, no longer upon the governor of Macedonia, to intervene in case of need. The submission of the Thracians was not permanent, and the Odrysians were not equal to the task imposed upon them. The Bessi longed to recover the sanctuary of Dionysus, and a sacred war broke out in 13 B.C., which resulted in the overthrow of the princes of Odrysae. 
the suppression of this insurrection ought perhaps to have devolved upon the governor of Illyricum, but he had his hands full in his own province. The proconsul of Macedonia had no army at his disposal. Accordingly, recourse was had to the troops stationed at Galatia, and Lucius Piso, the empirical legatus in that province, was summoned to cross into Europe and quell the insurgents who were threatening to invade Asia, having established themselves in the Thracian Chersonese, 11 B.C. Piso put down the revolt successfully, and it was probably soon after this that Moesia was converted into a regular Roman province, though Thrace still remained under the rule of the dependent Odrysian prince, Romatalces, who, with his son Cotis, was devotedly attached to Rome and unpopular in Thrace. Thrace, though not yet Greek, must even now be reckoned to the Greek half of the Roman world. But its close connection with Moesia naturally led us to consider it in this place rather than in the following chapter. Moesia itself belonged partly to the Latin and partly to the Greek division. The cities which grew under Roman influence in western Moesia were Latin, the cities on the coast of Pontus were Greek, and formed a distinct world of their own. But most of the inhabitants of these cities were not Greeks, but Grete and Sarmatians, and even the true Greeks were to some extent barbarized by intercourse with the natives. The poet Ovid, who was banished to Tomi, gives a lively description of the wild life there, the plowmen plowing armed, the arrows of ferocious marauders flying over the walls of the town, natives clad in skins, and equipped with bow and quiver, riding through the streets. Gedic continued to be spoken in Moesia, long after the Roman conquest, like a lyric in Illyricum, and Ovid says that it was quite needful for any one resident in Tomi to know it. He wrote himself a poem in the Gedic tongue, and we should be glad to barter some of his Latin elegiacs for his exercise in that lost language. The subjugation of the vast extent of territory, reaching from the sources of the Rhine to the mouths of the Danube, was a military necessity. The conquest of each province, while it served some immediate purpose at the time, was also part of an immense scheme for the defense of the empire from the northern ocean to the Euxine. It was designed that the armies in Pannonia should be in constant touch with the armies on the Rhine, and that operations in both quarters should be carried out in connection. Central Europe and the Germans who inhabited it presented a hard and urgent problem to the Roman government, but before telling how they attempted to solve it, it will be well to complete our survey of the subject and dependent lands. End of chapter 6, sections 5 and 6「or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org The Student's Roman Empire Part 1 by John Bagnell Burry Chapter 7 The Provincial Administration under Augustus The Eastern Provinces 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. Sections 1 and 2 Chapter 7 Provincial Administration Continued the Eastern Provinces and Egypt. Function of Roman Rule in the East. Macedonia, Achaia, and the Free Greek States. Nicopolis and the Actian Games. The Delphic and Fictiani. Asia and Bithynia. The Provincial Diets. Asiarchs and Bithyniarchs. Galatia and Pamphylia the dependent states in Asia Minor, the Lycian Confederacy, Cappadocia, Pontus, Paphlagonia, Little Armenia, the states of the Tauric Peninsula, Bosphorus and Chersonesus, the insular provinces, Cyprus and Crete with Cyrene, Syria and the neighboring dependent states, Nabatea, Judea, Comagene, Chalcis, Abila, Emesa, Palmyra, King Herod and his Hellenism, Egypt. The Romans, who were the teachers of the peoples whom they conquered in the West, 
were themselves pupils in the East. In Gaul, in Spain, in northern Italy, in Illyricum, they broke new ground and appeared as the pioneers of civilization. But in the eastern countries, which came under their dominion, they entered upon an inheritance, which they were called upon, indeed, to preserve and improve, but where there was no room for them to originate new ideas of development. Rome merely carried on the work of Alexander the Great and his successors, and she was proud to be entrusted with the task. She not only left Greek what was already Greek, but she endeavored to spread Greek civilization in those parts of her eastern lands where it had not taken root. The sole exception to this policy was Sicily, and this was due to its geographical position. The subject lands of the east naturally fall into four groups. 1. Macedonia and Greece. 2. Asia Minor, in connection with which may be considered the Tariq Peninsula. 3. Syria and the neighboring vassal kingdoms. 4. Egypt, which stands by itself, both geographically and because, strictly speaking, it was not a province. Section 1. Macedonia, Achaia, and the Free Greek States. The institution of the empire was attended by a change in the administration of Macedonia and Greece, which, under the Republic, had formed one large province. Augustus divided it into two smaller provinces, Macedonia and Achaia, both of which he assigned to the Senate. This division, however, did not altogether coincide with the boundary between Greece and Macedonia. The province of Achaia was smaller than Hellas, and the new province of Macedonia larger than Macedonia proper. For Thessaly, Aetolia, Acarnia, and Epirus were placed under the rule of the northern proconsul. Thus, Mount Etna, instead of Mount Olympus, was the boundary between Greece and Macedonia. Imperial Macedonia was thus smaller in extent and importance than Republican Macedonia. It also lost its military significance as a frontier district through the extension of Roman rule over the neighboring lands north and east. Greek civilization, though it had flourished for centuries in the old cities on both the seas, which wash the coasts of Macedonia, never penetrated far into the highlands. Eastward of Apollonia and Dyrrachium, northward of Thessalonica and the Chalcidic Peninsula, there were few Greek cities to form centers of culture. Augustus settled colonies of Roman citizens in many of the old Greek towns, in Dyrrachium, the old Epidamnos, and in Bilus, on the Adriatic coast, in Thracian Philippi, in Pella, in Dium, on the Thermea Gulf, in Cassandra, on the Bay of Pagasai. But his purpose was merely to provide for veteran soldiers, not to Romanize the province. In general, the towns retained their Macedonian constitutions and politarchs, and they formed a federation with a diet, the capital of the province was Thessalonica, and this alone stamped it as Greek. Thessaly, although placed under the government of the proconsul of Macedonia, held a position quite apart from the lands north of Mount Olympus. It was a purely Greek district, and its cities formed a federation of its own, distinct from that of Macedonia. The Diet used to meet at Larissa, whose fertile plain was so famous. Julius Caesar had accorded the right of free self-government to all the Thessalians, but for some act of misconduct, Augustus withdrew the privilege, and the Thessalians, with the single exception of Pharsalus, were degraded from the position of allies to that of subjects. The Roman government, whether republican or imperial, always treated the venerable cities of Greece with a consideration and tenderness, which they show to no other conquered lands. The reverence which was inspired in the Romans by the city of the Virgin Palace, by patient Lacedaemon, and by oracular Delphi, is displayed not only in their literature, but in their government. Athens preserved a part of her dominion, as well as her independence. She can still regard herself as a sovereign city. Thus Greek fell politically into two parts, Federate Greece and Subject Greece. First of the free federate states comes Athens, 
with the whole of Attica and various other dependencies. On the mainland she possessed Haliartos in Boeotia and the surrounding district, but, as in old days, most of her dominion was insular. Among the Cyclades she had Chaos and Delos. In the northern Aegean, Lemnos, Imbros, and Skyros. The island of Salamis was also recovered for her in the reign of Augustus, by the private liberality of a rich man, Julius Nicanor, whom the grateful Athenians named the new Themistocles. In spite of her privileged position, perhaps in consequence of it, Athens often gave the Roman government trouble. A revolt in the reign of Augustus is recorded. Next to Athens in northern Greece came three famous Boeotian towns, Thespiae, Tanagra, and Plataea. In Phocis, likewise three, Delphi, Elatea, and Abe. In Locris, Amphissa. In the Peloponnesus, Sparta was permitted to retain her dominion over northern Laconia, while the inhabitants of the southern half of that country were formed into eighteen communities of free Laconians, Eleuthero Lacones. Dime in Achaea was also a free city, and it is highly probable, though not certain, that Elis and Olympia belonged to the free communities. The Roman government interfered as little as possible with the affairs of these free states. Athens coined her own drachmae and ovals, and the head of Caesar never appeared on her coins. But she and her fellows knew that their privileges might at any moment be withdrawn, as the example of the Thessalians taught them. Patri and Corinth, as Roman colonies, held a somewhat different position. Corinth, like Carthage, rose again under the auspices of Julius Caesar, as Colonia Iulia, or Laus Iulia, and rapidly recovered her prosperity, thanks to her geographical position. Patrae in Achaea was founded by Augustus, who settled there a large number of Italian veterans, and granted to the new town dominion over the Locrian haven Naupactus, which lay over against it on the opposite coast. The rest of Greece, with the exception of the less developed districts in the west, Aetolia, Acarnia, Epirus, constituted the province of Achaia. The residence of the proconsul was at Corinth. The sense of national unity in these subject states was encouraged by Augustus. He received the Achaean League in an extended form as the League of Boeotians, Aeobians, Locrians, Phocians, and Dorians or briefly, the League of the Achaeans. In later times, it assumed the more pretentious title of the League of the Panhellenes. The assemblies of this association used to meet in Argos, which was thus, in some measure, recompensed for her exclusion from the list of free communities. One important and singular state still has to be mentioned. On the northern lip of the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf, near the scene of the great battle, in which he won the lordship of the Roman world, Augustus founded a new city. Nicopolis, the city of victory, rose on the very spot where the main body of his army had been encamped. This foundation was not to be a Roman colony. It was to be a Greek city, like Thessalonica, and it was founded in the same way, by synchronizing the small communities of the neighborhood. Nicopolis, like Athens and Sparta, was a free and sovereign state. Acarnia, the island of Leucus, the neighborhood districts of Epirus, a part of Aetolia, were placed under her control. On the opposite promontory, a new temple of Apollo was built at Actium, and quinquennial games were instituted in honor of that god, on the model of the Olympian, and actually called Olympian, as well as Actian. The cycle of four years was in Actiad. Nicopolis and its dependents belonged politically neither to Macedonia nor to Achaia, but they were more in touch with the southern than with the northern province. The great bond of union among the European Greeks under Roman rule was the Delphic and Fictiani, and in this assembly, as reorganized by Augustus, Nicopolis had a prominent place. The chief reform introduced by that emperor 
was the extension of the institution to Macedonia and Nicopolis. But as many votes were assigned to the new city as to the whole of the Macedonian province. The functions of the Amphictyani were purely religious. It ordered the sacred festivals and administered the large income of the temple of Delphi. From a political point of view, it served the same purpose as the assembly of the three Gallic provinces which met at Lyon round the altar of Augustus. It helped to maintain a feeling of unity and a sense of common nationality. Section 2. Asia Minor. Kingdoms of the Euxine. Islands. Asia and Bithynia. From the Greeks of the motherland we pass to the Greeks of Lesser Asia. Here Rome had never to struggle for dominion as in the other parts of the empire of Alexander the Great and his successors. The provinces of Asia and Bithynia dropped, as it were, into her arms. Asia was the kingdom of the Attalids of Pergamum, and was bequeathed to the Roman people by Attalus III. Bithynia became Roman in the same way by the testament of King Nicomedes. Both these provinces were assigned to the Senate and governed by proconsuls. Asia extended from the shores of the Propontis to the borders of Lycia. Eastward, it included Phrygia, and on the west took in the islands along the coast. Bithynia was no longer confined to the original kingdom of Nicomedes. It had been increased on the east side by Pontus, after the overthrow of the empire of Mithridates by Pompey, and it stretched along the Bosphorus into Europe, so as to take in Byzantium. In the kingdom of the Attalids, little was left for the Romans to do in the way of Hellenization. In the interior of the country, there were many Hellenistic cities, and the growth of city life required no fostering from the new mistress. The colonies of Parium and Alexandria in the Troas, founded by Augustus, were for the purpose of settling veteran soldiers. It was otherwise in the kingdom of Nicomedes. Here Greek culture had not taken root so deeply or so widely. Bithynia was far less developed than Asia. Here, accordingly, there was room for Rome to step in and carry on the work of Hellenization, and she gladly undertook the task. Pontus, which was under the governor of Bithynia, was more backward still. There were no Greek centers there, like Prusa and Nicaea and Bithynia, so that the Hellenization of that country practically began under the empire. The two most important towns on the coast of Pontus were Sinope, where a Roman colony had been planted, and Trapezus, which was the station of the Pontic fleet. In Asia Minor, as in other parts of the empire, Augustus promoted the institution of provincial councils. The deputies of various cities met yearly in a center, and the assembly could make known to the Roman governor the wishes of the province. But this institution took a special shape and color by its association with the worship of the emperor. In 29 B.C., Caesar, not yet Augustus, authorized the diets of Asia and Bithynia to build temples to himself in Pergamum and Nicomedia. Hence the custom of paying divine honors to the emperor during his lifetime spread throughout the provinces. In Italy and Rome, such worship was not yielded to him till he was deified after his death. This worship involved the existence of high priests, who, in the Asiatic provinces, became very important persons and gave their names to the year. Whereas in European Greece, the ancient public festivals, Olympian, Pythian, Isthmian, and Nemean, still lived, and the new Actian feast was celebrated in honor of Apollo. In Asia, the public feasts were connected with the cult of the emperor. The president of the provincial diet, the Asiarch in Asia, and the Bithyniarch in Bithynia, conducted the celebration of these festivals and defrayed the costs, so that those offices could only be held by rich men. There was no lack of wealthy folk in Asia, the province of five hundred cities. It had suffered a good deal from piracy and from the Mithridatic War, and Augustus, in order to restore prosperity, resorted to the measure of cancelling old debts. Rhodes was the only state that did not take advantage of this permission. But Asia soon recovered, and her bright cities enjoyed under the empire tranquility and prosperity. 
4. Galatia and Pamphylia. When the provinces were divided in 27 BC between the Senate and the Emperor, Asia Minor was only in small part provincial. Besides Asia and Bithynia, only eastern Cilicia was subject to a Roman governor. The rest of the country consisted of dependent states, holding the same relation to Rome as Mauritania in the west. Chief among these vassal states was the kingdom of Galatia, then ruled by Amintus. Celtic civilization held its own for a long time against Hellenism in this miniature Gaul, which was set down in the land of Hellenistic states, somewhat like Massilia, that miniature Greece set down in the land of Celtic cantons. The visitor who came from western Galatia, the Greek name of Gaul, to eastern Galatia, might hear spoken in the streets of Pessinus and Ancyra, the language with which he was familiar in the streets of Lugudunum. Here, too, in the new Gaul, were the same double names of towns as in the old Gaul, the name of the place and the name of the tribe, as Gallic Mediolanum is Santes, saints, as Lutetia is Parisi, so Ancyra is called by the name of the Tectosages, Pisinius by that of the Tolistobogii. But in Asia, the Celts did not long maintain the purity of their race. Gallic and Greek blood were mingled, and the people were called Gallo-Greeks, just as in Gaul they came to be Gallo-Romans. The princes of Galatia were ambitious of empire, and were rivals of Mithridates. In the Mithridatic War, they stood fast by Rome. King Diotarus, who had played a prominent part then, died in 40 B.C., and his kingdom passed to one of his officers, Amintus, in 36 B.C., through the favor of Marcus Antonius, who charged the new sovereign with the subjugation of Pisidia. The dominion of Amintus extended over these mountainous countries, south of Galatia, which have always been so hard to civilize, Pisidia, Lycaonia, Isauria, and western Cilicia. The fall of his patron Antonius made no difference in the position of Amintus. Caesar allowed him to remain where he was. But when he died in 25 BC, Galatia was transformed into a Roman province, and, like all new provinces after 27 BC, was administered by an imperial governor. Pamphylia, over which the authority of Amintus stretched, was now separated from Galatia and made a distinct province. But Pisidia and Lycaonia still went with Galatia. In the mountainous regions of these districts, the Hellenistic kings had done little for civilization, and there was a great field for the plantation of new cities. Antioch, Seleucia, Apollonia, and northern Pisidia, Iconium, and Laodicea Catechecomene in Lycaonia were indeed something, but they were only a beginning. Augustus founded the Roman colonies of Lystra and Pilaris in Lycaonia, and Cremna in Pisidia, and his successors carried on the work. Many remains of theaters and aqueducts in these lands tell of prosperity under the early empire. But even at the best of times, Mount Taurus was the home of wild mountaineers, always ready, under a weak government, to pursue the trade of brigandage. 5. The dependent states in Asia Minor and on the Euxine. The rest of Asia Minor did not become provincial until after the death of Augustus. During his reign, the Lycian Confederacy, once subject to Rhodes but independent after the Third Macedonian War, was permitted to retain its autonomy. The kingdom of Cappadocia was ruled by King Archelaus. Polemon ruled over a Pontic kingdom, consisting of the territory between Caressus and Trapezus, and also the land of Colchis. There were three distinct vassal states in Cilicia. In Paphlagonia there were some small principalities held by the descendants of King Deotarus, but these came to an end in 7 BC and were joined to Galatia. East of Galatia, north of Cappadocia, was the kingdom of Little Armenia, of which more will be said in the next chapter, where the position of Great Armenia will also be described, a kingdom dependent by turns on the Roman and the Parthian empires.
One state, or rather two states, which up till very late times continued Roman dependencies, not incorporated in the provincial system, still call for notice. These are the two cities on the Tauric Peninsula, Bosphorus, or Panticipium, on the eastern promontory at the entrance of the Paulus Maiotis, and Chersonesus, or Heraclea, at the opposite western side. Bosporus was governed by kings. The original title was Archon, who also ruled over Phanagoria, on the opposite mainland, and Theodosia, a town on the peninsula. Chersonesus was a republic. Both states had been conquered by Mithridates and formed into a Bosporan realm. When he was overthrown, Bosphorus, after some struggles, came finally into the hands of Asandros, who held it unto his death, 16 BC, and left the kingdom to his wife, Dynamis. By marriage with her, and the permission of Augustus, Polemon, king of Pontus, then obtained the kingdom, and was succeeded by his children. But the republic of the western city was no longer subject to its eastern neighbor, though it might regard the basilis of Bosphorus as a protector in times of need. These cities on the distant border of Scythia played an important part in commerce. The Greek colonies on the northern shore of the Euxine, Tyrus, at the mouth of the river of like name, Olbia, near the mouth of the Hypanus, although they sometimes received Roman protection, never took a permanent place in the empire. Lonely and remote, they were left to hold their own, as best they could, in the midst of barbarous peoples. Cyprus, Crete, and Cyrene In the western Mediterranean there were two insular provinces, Cilicia and Sardinia. So likewise in the eastern parts of the same sea there were two insular provinces, Cyprus and Crete. Crete, however, was not an entire province. It had been joined by its conqueror Metellus with the Cyrenaic Pentapolis. The joint province of Crete and Cyrene was assigned to the Senate. The land of Cyrene, remarkable for its delightful, invigorating climate, was also blessed by freedom from political troubles throughout its history as a Roman province. Like Asia and Bithynia, it had been willed to the Roman Republic by Ptolemy Appian, its last Macedonian king, 96 B.C. Cyprus was at first imperial, but in 22 B.C. Augustus transferred it, along with Gallia Narbonensis, to the Senate. The early history of this island had turned, like that of Sicily, on the struggle between the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Under Roman rule, it would have enjoined unbroken tranquility, but for the large population of Jews who sometimes rebelled. Even the peaceful Cyrenaica was at times disturbed by the agitations of the same race. Crete, once the home of piracy, was lucky enough to play no part in history as long as the Mediterranean was a holy Roman sea. End of chapter 7, sections 1 and 2or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Brewery, Chapter 7, Parts 3 and 4. Section 3, The Neighboring Dependent Kingdoms in Syria. Of the imperial provinces, Syria was the most important in the east, as Gaul in, in the west. The Legatus of Syria, on whom it devolved to defend the frontier of the Euphrates against the Parthians, had four legions under him, the same number that was stationed on the Rhine. But it was not only for frontier service that the Syrian troops were needed, they had also to protect the cities and the villages against marauding bands who infested the hills. Hence the legions were quartered in the cities, and not, like the Rhine army, in special military stations on the frontier and this circumstance was the source of the demoralization and the lack of discipline which marked the Syrian army. But notwithstanding the existence of the hill-robbers, Syria was a most prosperous province. In the way of Hellenization and the colonization, the Seleucid kings had left nothing for the Romans to do. Augustus founded Beirutus in order to provide for veteran soldiers, 
and it remained an isolated Italian town in the midst of the Greek Asiatics, like Corinth in Greece and Alexandria in the Troad. The Greek names of the towns in Syria recalled Macedonia, as towns in Sicily and Magna Graecia recalled Old Greece, or as names of places in the United States recall the mother country. But the older Aramaic names lived on side by side with the new Greek names, and in some cases have outlived them, as, for instance, Heliopolis, which is called Baalbek at the present day. People, too, had double names as well as places. Thomas, who was called Didymus, and Tabitha, also called Dorcas, in the New Testament, are familiar examples. The Aramaic tongue continued to be spoken beside Greek, like Celtic beside Latin and Gaul, especially in the remoter districts. From the mixture of Greek and Syrian life, a new mixed type of civilization arose, sometimes called Syrio-Hellenic, and characteristically expressed in the great mausoleum erected on a hill near the Euphrates by Antiochus, king of Comagne. In his epitaph, that monarch prays that upon his posterity may descend the blessings of the gods both of Persis and Maketus, Persia and Macedonia. In the busy factories of the great Syrian cities, Laodicea, Apamea, Tyre, Beirutus, Biblis, were carried on the manufactures, linen, silk, etc., for which the country was so famous. But Antioch, the capital, was a town of pleasure rather than of work. It was not well situated for commerce, like Alexandria, but it was rich and magnificent, splendidly supplied with water, brightly lit up at night, and full of superb buildings. It, with its suburbs, the gardens of Daphne, was probably the pleasantest town in the empire for the pleasure-seeker. Southern Syria, on its eastern side, bordered on the dependent kingdom of Nabat, which extended from Damascus, encircling Palestine on the east and south, and including the northern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. The regions, however, of Trachontis, between Damascus and Bostra, which had been committed to the charge of Zenodorus, prince of Abila, were subsequently transferred by Augustus to the king of Judea, because Zenodorus, instead of suppressing the robbers who infested Trachontis, made common cause with them. Damascus itself, however, was subject to the Nabataean kings, whose capital was the great commercial city of Petra, the midway station through which the caravans of Indian merchandise passed on their road from Luke Coma in Arabia to Gaza. These kings were Arabs, and Hellenism had only superficially touched their court. They had officers named Aparkoi and Strategoi. In the northern part of their realm, Damascus was Greek, in the close neighborhood of Syria brought those border regions on the edge of the desert into connection with Greek civilization. The kings of Petra were always at feud with their neighbors, the kings of Judea. Obadas nearly lost his crown for taking up arms against Herod instead of appealing to Augustus, their common lord. Civilization did not really begin for this Nabataean kingdom until, more than a century later, it was at length converted into a Roman province. The kingdom of Judea, restored and bestowed upon Antipater of Idumea by Julius Caesar, had been specially favored by that statesman, being exempted from tribute and military levies. After the death of Antipater, the kingdom was won by his son, Herod, after many struggles. At first the unwilling client of Antonius, and the queen of Egypt, he performed some services in the final contest for Caesar, who not only confirmed him in his kingdom, but enlarged its borders. Samaria was added to Judea, and also the line of coast from Gaza as far as the Tower of Straton, which, afterwards, under Herod's rule, was to become the city of Caesarea, the chief port of southern Syria. Herod, throughout his long reign, prosecuted the work of Hellenism, by no means acceptable to his Jewish subjects, with generous zeal. His policy was to keep religion and the government of the state quite apart, and do away altogether with the Jewish theocracy. 
There was thus a continuous rivalry between the king and the high priest. The Hellenism of Herod was shown by his building a theater at Jerusalem and instituting a festival to be celebrated at the end of every fourth year, in imitation of the Greek games. At this festival, musical, as well as gymnastic and equestrian contests were held, and people of every nation were invited. He also imitated the Romans by building an amphitheater in the plain beneath the city, and exhibiting there combats of wild beasts and condemned criminals. All this was a gross violation of Jewish traditions. Herod founded two new cities, both of which were named after the emperor. Caesarea, already mentioned, intended to be the seaport of Jerusalem, and Sebaste, on the site of Samaria. These cities were of Hellenistic and not Jewish character. The reign of Herod was stained by horrible tragedies which darkened his domestic life. Before his death, which occurred in 4 BC, his kingdom had been increased by the land beyond the Jordan. The whole realm he divided among his three sons. Archelaus was to receive Judea, with Samaria and Idumea. To Philip fell Batania and the adjacent regions with the title of Tetrarch, while Galilee and the land beyond the Jordan was assigned to Herod Antipas, also as Tetrarch. But the kingdom was not destined to be of long duration. The Jews preferred to be the direct subjects of the emperor, to being under the rule of a king of their own, and a deputation from Jerusalem waited upon Augustus in Rome to pray him to abolish the kingdom. The emperor at first compromised. He did not remove Archelaus from the government of Judea, but he refused him the royal title and deprived him of Samaria. A few years later, however, in consequence of the incapacity of Archelaus, the wishes of the Jews were accomplished, and Judea was made a Roman province, 6 AD, under an imperial procurator, over whom doubtless the legatus of Syria was empowered to exercise a certain supervision, in certain cases, somewhat as the governor of Pannonia might intervene in Noricum. Under the procurator, the city communities were allowed to manage their own affairs, as in Asia or Achaia. In Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, an institution which had been founded under the Seleucids, corresponded to the town council, and the high priest, appointed by the procurator to the chief magistrate. Everything possible was done, under the new system, to respect and deal tenderly with the customs and prejudices of the Jews. Out of consideration for their objection to images, the coins did not bear the emperor's head, and when Roman soldiers went to Jerusalem, they had to leave their standards behind them in Caesarea. The difference of treatment which the Occidental Jews experienced is striking. The same emperors who persecuted Jews in the West scrupulously respected their customs in their own land. But the Jews were not content. They grumbled against the tribute, not because it was oppressive, but on the ground that it was irreligious. This state of things resulted in the great Jewish war of Vespasian, to which we shall come hereafter. Some other small vassal states were allowed to survive for a considerable time. The kingdom of Comagene, in the north was not incorporated in the provincial system until 72 A.D. The principality of Calchas, northwest of Damascus, survived still longer, until 92 A.D. Abila, between Calchas and Damascus, was annexed about 49 A.D. Iamblichus of Amessa had been executed by Antonius shortly before the Battle of Actium and his territory was at first annexed by Augustus to the province of Syria, but in 20 B.C. restored to a member of the native dynasty of Sampagiramus. It finally became provincial before 81 A.D. At what time the Syrian state of Palmyra, called in the Syrian tongue Tadmor, came to be a Roman dependency, we cannot say for certain, but probably in the reign of Augustus. This flourishing city, situated in an oasis of desert, laid on the trade route from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea, and was governed under Roman supremacy by its own municipal officers, until its destruction by the Emperor Aurelian in the 3rd century. Section 4. Egypt 
The death of Cleopatra, the last queen of the royal house of the Legidae, was followed by the conversion of Egypt from the condition of a vassal kingdom into a directly subject land. But although it is never counted with the imperial provinces, it never stood in line with the other provinces. It was the subject to the emperor in his own right, not merely as representative of the populus Romanus. Augustus ruled over Egypt, not as proconsul, but as the successor of the Ptolemies, a king all but in name, and the country always remained a sort of imperial preserve. The emperor was worshipped as a god by the Egyptian priests, according to the same forms which had been used in the cult of the royal Ptolemies. It was a logical consequence of this legal status of Egypt, as the emperor's private domain, that it should stand apart from the imperial provinces in its administration. Thus senators were disqualified to fill the post of governor. Hence the governor of Egypt did not hold the rank of a legatus, but only of a praefectus. He was in command, however, of three legions, and this was the only case in which legions were commanded by men of the equestrian order. But not only were senators excluded from the governorship, they were even forbidden to set foot in the land without permission of the lord of the land. This regulation, which also extended to equites illustres, was made by Augustus in self-protection. For, if a prominent senator wished to excite a rebellion, Egypt, through its immense resources and its geographical position, would have made a most favorable field for such an enterprise. The military importance had been abundantly approved in the Civil War. Whoever controlled the Egyptian ports could stop the corn supply on which Rome and Italy depended, and thus force them to capitulate without leaving Alexandria. And besides, Egypt was a country difficult to attack and easy to defend, and had the advantage of an insular position without being an island. The jealousy with which the emperors watched Egypt is illustrated by the fate of the first prefect, Cornelius Gallus, the poet. He allowed his name and deeds to be inscribed on the pyramids, and these indiscretions were interpreted as treasonable. Tried by the Senate, he was removed from his command, and his disgrace drove him to commit suicide. Augustus is reported on this occasion to have complained that he was the only citizen who could not show anger against a friend without making him an enemy. Besides the prefect, there was a Eurydicus to administer justice, and an officer called Edilogos to manage the finances. In organization also, Egypt differed from the other provinces. The system of the Ptolemies was continued. No municipal self-government was granted. City life was not encouraged, as in the rest of the empire. The country was divided into districts, nomes, which were placed under officers appointed by the government. No diet was instituted to represent the political views of the people. Under the Ptolemies, the native Egyptians had formed an inferior class, possessing no political privileges, and under the Romans, their condition remained the same. Upper Egypt extended to Elephantine on the Nile, and to Troglodytic Berenice on the coast, in the same line of latitude. This Berenice must be distinguished from Golden Berenice, far away to the south, opposite Aden, which, like Zula and Ptolemaeus Theron, were not included in the Roman Empire. The fertility of the land of the Nile was proverbial, and it brought in an enormous revenue to the imperial purse. Augustus did not reduce the heavy taxes which had been levied by his Greek predecessors, but by judicious improvements, along which must be especially mentioned the reopening and clearing of the Nile canals, he enabled the country to bear them, and Egypt soon recovered from the financial distress in which the rule of Cleopatra had plunged it. The chief product was grain, in which it supplied Rome. In the production of linen, Egypt rivaled Syria. In glass manufacturers it stood first, and it supplied the world with papyrus. Excellently situated for traffic, Alexandria might claim to be the second city in the empire. As a center of commerce, she then stood at the head of all the cities in the world. The traffic of the east and the west met in her streets and on her quays. 
Greek philosophies and Oriental religions mingled in her schools. The buildings were magnificent, above all the temple of Serapis, the museum, and the royal palace. There were attractions for the scholar as well as for the merchant and the sightseer. The Greek library was the richest, and the Greek professors of the museums the most learned in the empire. Everything, a Greek writer says, was to be had in Egypt, wealth, quiet, Sights, philosophers, gold, a museum, wine, all one may desire. There was a very large Jewish population in Alexandria, composing a distinct community with its own chief, entitled the Ethnarch, and the city was too often the scene of riots and tumults, as was wont to be the case where there were large colonies of Jews. The capture of Alexandria by Caesar was commemorated by the building of a suburb called Nicopolis, which served as a sort of fortress to command the city, as a legion was stationed there. The temple of Antonius, incomplete when the city was taken, was finished and dedicated to Caesar. At a later period Augustus set up an obelisk in Alexandria, which survives to the present day, although no longer in its old station, under the name of Cleopatra's Needle. Egypt had been accustomed to reckon time by the regnal year of the Ptolemies, and the same system was continued under its new sovereign. The era of the first Roman ruler was counted, not from his day of victory, August 1st, 30 B.C., but from August 29th, corresponding to the first day of the month Thoth, which the Egyptians reckoned as the first day of the new year. Cleopatra survived during the greater part of August, and this circumstance may have determined the choice of the beginning of the new era. List of Provinces at the Death of Augustus 1. Senatorials a. Governed by consular proconsuls, Asia, Africa b. Governed by praetorian proconsuls, Sicily, Baetica, Norbonensis, Macedonia, Achaia, Bithynia and Pontus, Cyprus, Crete and Cyrene. 2. Imperial. a. Governed by Legati Augusti Praetori. 1. Governed by Consular Legati, Terraconensis, Pannonia, Dalmatica, Moesia, Syria. 2. Governed by Praetorian Legati, Lusitania, Aquitania, Lungundanesis, Belgica, Galatia. b. Governed by prefects or procurators. Egypt, prefect. Sardinia and Corsica. Raetia, prefect. Noricum. Alpes Maritimae, prefect. Alpes Cultae, prefect. Judea, Procurator. End of chapter 7, sections 3 and 4. Recording by Kalinda. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Burry. Chapter 8 Rome and Parthia Expeditions to Arabia and Ethiopia. The Arsacid dynasty, which after the fall of the Greek Seleucids ruled over the Iranian lands from the Euphrates to the borders of India, derived their origin from Parthia, a land situated between Medea and Bactria, southeast of the Caspian Sea. Their empire is called Parthia, in contrast to the earlier Persian empire of the Achaemenids and the later Persian empire of the Sassanids. But it must not be forgotten that these kings were of Iranian race, speaking an Iranian language, maintaining the religion of Zoroaster, and that the whole character of their court was Persian. Thus it is quite true to say that the Romans in their Parthian wars not only maintained the same cause, but fought against the same foes as Themistocles when he repulsed Xerxes, and as Alexander when he overthrew Darius. The Parthian kingdom was composed of a number of subordinate kingdoms or satrapies. 
the Greek cities in Mesopotamia formed an exception, to which we must add the flourishing mercantile city of Seleucia, which had taken the place of ancient Babylon. In this respect, the Parthian and Roman states have been sometimes contrasted. In the Parthian realm, dependent kingdoms were the rule, city communities the exception. In the Roman Empire, cities were the rule, dependent kingdoms the exception. Before the overthrow of their rival Mithridates, the Parthian kings regarded Rome as a friendly power. But after the victories of Pompeius, when the common enemy had fallen, Rome and Parthia stood face to face and became rivals themselves. Syria then became a Roman province, and the Euphrates was fixed by treaty as the boundary between the great European and the great Asiatic power. But there were many causes for discord. Armenia, like Cappadocia, became a Roman dependency, and this circumstance could not fail to lead to war. That country, very important to both states from a military point of view, was destined to be tossed continually backwards and forwards between Parthia and Rome. In language, society, and nationality, Armenia was far nearer to the eastern than to the western power, and the political bonds which united it to Rome were always somewhat artificial. Another source of discord lay in Atropatene, the land south of Armenia, for the vassal king of that country, desiring to free himself from Parthian supremacy, often sought to become the vassal of Rome. The actual violation of the treaty came from the Romans, who assumed overlordship over the Mesopotamian city of Edessa, and attempted to extend the borders of the dependent kingdom of Armenia into Parthian territory. How Parthia declared war against Armenia, how this led to the fatal expedition of Crassus and the field of Carhe, how in consequence of that defeat Armenia fell into the power of the Parthians, need not be repeated here. Elated by their success, the Parthians began to demand the cession of Syria, while on the side of Rome it was regarded as a matter of honor to revenge the defeat at Carhe and recover the standards of Crassus. The civil wars prevented the accomplishment of such designs. One great defeat indeed the enemy experienced when they invaded Syria in 38 B.C. at the hands of Ventidius Bassus. Pacorus, the son of the great king, fell on the field of Gindaros. Marcus Antonius at length seriously faced the Parthian question, in connection with his own ambitious design of founding a great eastern empire composed of dependent kingdoms. It will be remembered how his expedition came to naught. At that time the king of Parthia was Phraates, who was highly unpopular with his subjects, and Antonius supported the pretender Monesus. The king of Armenia was Artavastes, and he, wishing to increase his dominion by the addition of Atropatene, ardently supported Antonius. Another Artavastes was king of Atropatene. Antonius blamed the Armenian king for his failure, repaired to Armenia in 34 B.C., seized him, and carried him to Egypt, where he was put to death by Cleopatra. His son, Artaxes, fled to the Parthians. At the same time, Antonius became reconciled with Artavastes of Atropatene, obtained his daughter in marriage for a son of his own, whom he set up as king of Armenia. But at this moment Antonius was called upon to deal with Caesar, and Phraates, seizing the opportunity, deposed the two kings, and combined both Armenia and Atropatene under the rule of Artaxes, son of the Armenian Artavastes. Fortunately for Roman interests, Intestine struggles broke out in Persia, simultaneously with the final contest between the two Roman triumvirs. Phraates was deposed, and Tiridates was set up in his stead. Augustus has been blamed for not dealing resolutely with the Eastern question immediately after his victory over his rival. It has been said that he should have at once taken steps to plant his power in Armenia, and make that country securely and permanently Roman at the same time establishing a recognized authority over the Colchians, the Iberians, and the Albanians, who inhabited the regions between Armenia and the Caucasus, the Euxine and the Caspian. It seemed incumbent on him, too, to recover the standards captured at Carhe, 
and at the same time two exiles were imploring his help, Tiridates, who had been overthrown soon after his elevation, and Artavasdes, king of Atropatene. The desire which the Romans felt at this time to see the Parthians humbled is reflected in the earlier writings of Horace. Augustus is called Juvenis Parthis Horrendus, and will be regarded as a true god upon earth if he adds the Britons and the dangerous Persians to the empire. Men clearly looked forward to a Parthian war, but Augustus, after the conquest of Egypt, postponed the settlement of the eastern question. Perhaps he was influenced by the ill success of Antonius, and his army, doubtless eager for rewards and rest, would have been little disposed to undertake an arduous campaign in Armenia. And above all, Augustus himself was not a general. Observing the domestic discords in Parthia, he hoped to settle the eastern frontier advantageously for Rome by diplomacy and not by arms. He consoled Artavasdes with the kingdom of Lesser Armenia, and gave refuge in Syria to Tiridates. In 23 B.C. an opportunity came for recovering the standards and captives which had been taken at Carhe. Phraates sent an embassy demanding that Tiridates should be given up to him, and also an infant son of his own, whom Tiridates had carried off. The child was sent back, but it was stipulated that in return the captives and the standards should be restored. It was in connection with this affair that Agrippa was sent to the east with proconsular imperium. Phraates did not fulfill the conditions immediately, but in 20 B.C. Augustus appeared in the east himself, and the Parthian king yielded. The emperor was proud of his success, which in his account of his own deeds he records thus, I compelled the Parthians to restore to me the standards and spoils of three Roman armies, and suppliantly to beg the friendship of the Roman people. Those standards I deposited in the temple of Mars Ultor. Poets celebrated the event as if it ranked with the most brilliant achievements of Roman arms. Virgil sings of following Aurora and claiming the standards from the Parthians, and imagines the Euphrates as flowing with less haughty stream, and the ensigns, so peacefully recovered, are described by Horace as torn from the enemy. In the same year a more solid success was obtained, the recovery of Armenia. A conspiracy had been formed there against the king Artaxes, and a message was sent to the emperor requesting that Tigranes, the younger brother of Artaxes, who was educated at Rome, should be sent to reign in his stead. Tiberius, the emperor's stepson, was entrusted with the task of deposing Artaxes and installing Tigranes. Artaxes was murdered by the party which had conspired against him, and Tigranes was established in the kingdom, which thus became once more a dependency of Rome. Atropatene, however, was separated and given to Ario Barzanes, son of its former king Artavasdes, but it seemed to have remained under Parthian supremacy. Ario Barzanes, like Tigranes, had been educated at Rome. New troubles, however, soon arose in Armenia. Tigranes died, and the kingdom was agitated by struggles between the friends of Parthia and the friends of Rome. Augustus again entrusted to his stepson the office of restoring order in Armenia, but Tiberius, from motives of private resentment, declined the commission, 6 B.C. Nothing was done during the next four years, but then it was decided that the ordering of the East should be entrusted to the young grandson of the emperor, Gaius Caesar, and should form a brilliant beginning to the career of the destined imperator. The young prince started with high hopes, dreaming perhaps of oriental conquests and of rivaling the fame of Alexander. His enthusiasm seems to have been encouraged by, perhaps to have affected, his elders. A courtly poet cried, Now, far east, thou shalt be ours. And Juba, the literary king of Mauritania, wrote an account of Arabia for the special benefit of Gaius, whose vision was chiefly fixed on the conquest of that unconquerable land. The settlement of the Armenian question was, in the first instance, easily and peacefully accomplished. Gaius and Phratases, the son of Phrates, met on an island in the middle of the Euphrates, and the Parthian agreed to resign his claim to Armenia. 
but it was still necessary to enforce submission to this decision in Armenia itself, and accordingly Gaius proceeded thither to install Ariobarzanes, son of Artavasdes. Before the walls of the fortress of Artagira he was wounded by treachery, and some months later he died of the effects of the hurt at Limera in Lycia, 4 A.D. During the rest of the reign of Augustus no serious measures were adopted in regard to Armenia, and that state was Parthian and the Roman parties. The unfortunate death of the young Caesar put an end to the design of conquering Arabia. That enterprise had been seriously entertained by the Roman government and actually attempted at an earlier date. The possession of southern Arabia would have been an important advantage, not like that of Armenia or Mosia, for military purposes, but from a purely mercantile point of view. The chief route of trade from India to Europe was by the Red Sea. Adane, Aden, was then, as now, an important port, and the Arabians, with their born genius for commerce, had it in their hands. The Indian wares were disembarked either at Luce Come, on the west coast of Arabia, and thence transported overland to Petra and on to some Syrian port, or at Myos Hormos on the opposite Egyptian coast, whence they were carried by camels to Coptos near Thebes, and shipped for Alexandria. Once in possession of Egypt, the Roman government could not fail to see that it would be highly profitable to command the Red Sea route entirely, and get the trade into the hands of their own subjects. Not long after the establishment of his power, Augustus took up the question, and here for once he was aggressive. He planned an expedition, of which the object was to reduce under Roman sway the land of Yemen, the southwestern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. That land was known to the Romans as Arabia Felix, and its people, the Himyarites, as the Sabae. It was a rich country which in itself invited conquest, though in consequence of the remote situation the luxurious inhabitants had never been subdued, as Horace tells us, by a foreign master. They supplied the empire with spices and perfumes, cassia, aloes, myrrh, frankincense, while in return they received the precious metals which they kept in their land. The expedition started towards the end of 25 B.C., and was entrusted to the care of Elias Gallus, an officer holding a high post in Egypt. Ten thousand men, half the number of troops in Egypt, were placed under his command, in addition to auxiliaries supplied by the kings of Nabatea and Judea. The Nabataeans had constant intercourse with Arabia Felix, and Sileus, a minister of the Nabataean king Obodas, undertook to play the part of guide. The whole expedition was miserably mismanaged. It is hard to say how far Gallus was to blame, and how far his guide may have acted in bad faith. His friend, the geographer Strabo, from whom we learn the details of the enterprise, shifts the blame on Sileus, and it is quite conceivable that the Nabataeans may have secretly wished the expedition to fail thinking that its success might divert the traffic that had hitherto passed through their country. The army embarked at Arsinoe, on the Isthmus of Suez, in a fleet of war vessels. Such vessels were quite needless, as there was no question of hostilities by sea. They disembarked at Luce Come, which was perhaps at this time subject to Rome, and passed the winter there. In spring they marched southwards by circuitous and laborious routes, and at length reached the capital of the Sabaeans. But the army, though the natives gave little trouble, had suffered severely from disease and hunger, and when at last they came to the residence of the Sabaean kings, Mariba, on its woody hill, both the general and the men were too exhausted and despondent to set to the task of besieging it. Having spent six days there, Gallus abandoned the undertaking and the expedition returned home, but with more speed than it had gone thither. Something had been accomplished in the way of exploring the country, but the Sabae were still, as before, unconquered. Augustus, however, did not choose to consider the expedition a failure. He speaks of it complacently among his achievements, and he promoted Elias Gallus to the prefecture of Egypt. 
while half of the Egyptian army was absent on the Arabian enterprise, the other half was called upon to defend the southern frontier against the aggressions of a neighboring power. Upper Egypt extended as far as Elephantine on the Nile, and beyond that limit lay the land of the Ethiopians, at this time ruled by the one-eyed Queen Candace. She had invaded and plundered the extreme parts of Upper Egypt, Cyane and Elephantine, and after fruitless demands for satisfaction, C. Petronius, the prefect, was obliged to take the field, 24 B.C., at the head of ten thousand footmen and eight hundred horse. He routed the enemy, took the town of Selkis on the Nile, and advanced as far as Napata, where was the queen's palace, in the neighborhood of the Ethiopian capital Meroe. He raised Napata to the ground. He did not attempt to occupy all this country, but made a strong place, named Premnus or Premis, his advanced post. In the following years, Premnus was attacked by the Ethiopians, and Petronius had to return again to relieve it. He inflicted another defeat on the foe, 22 B.C., and Candace was compelled to sue for peace. Her ambassadors were sent to Augustus, who was then at Samos, and peace was granted, the prefect being directed to evacuate the territory which he had occupied. Augustus drew the line of frontier at Siene. End of chapter 8 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on March 4, 2009The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury, Chapter 9, The Winning and Losing of Germany, the Death of Augustus, Sections 1 and 2. Section 1. The Conquest of Germany. The subject of the present chapter is the story of the Roman Germany that might have been. Caesar's conquest of Gaul pointed beyond the limits of that country to further conquests. It pointed beyond the sea to the island of the north, and eastward beyond the Rhine to the forests of central Europe. Caesar had shown the way to the conquest of Britain, he had likewise crossed the Rhine. As far as Britain was concerned, Augustus did not follow out the suggestion of his father, that enterprise was reserved for one of his successors. But in regard to Germany, he was persuaded to act otherwise. The advance of the Roman frontier from the Rhine to the Albus, Alb, and the subjugation of the intervening peoples, must have seemed from a military point of view good policy. The line of frontier to be defended would thus be lessened. The defense of the upper Danube, from Vindenisa on the Rhine to Lariacum, would not be needed, and the Albus would take the place of the Rhine. This project of extending the empire to the Albus, into which perhaps the cautious emperor was persuaded by the ardor of his favorite stepson Drusus, was well begun and seemingly certain of success, when it was cut short by an untoward accident, if there is not some deeper cause in the hidden counsels of the Roman government. But the winning and losing of Germany is a most interesting episode, giving us our earliest glimpse of the rivers and forests of central Europe. Caesar, in his commentaries, has given a brief sketch of the political and social life of the Germans in general, and of the Suevians in particular. This sketch, though somewhat vague and doubtless derived chiefly from the information of Gauls, is valuable as the earliest picture of the life of our forefathers, and one written by a great statesman. He describes them as a hardy, laborious, and temperate people, dividing their life between hunting and warlike exercises. They practice agriculture but little, and subsist chiefly on flesh, milk, and cheese. No one possesses a permanent lot of land, but the chiefs assign a certain portion of land every year, and for only one year's occupancy, to the several communities which form a civitas. At the end of each year the allotments are given up, and each community moves elsewhere. For this custom several reasons were given, of which the most important were 
that the people might not by permanent settlement become agricultural and give up warfare, that the more powerful might not drive the weaker from their possessions, and that the mass of the people might be contented. The territory of each tribe is isolated from those of its neighbors by a surrounding strip of devastated, unpeopled land. This is a safeguard against sudden attack. In time of war, special commanders were chosen, but in time of peace, there is no central or supreme magistracy in the state, but the chiefs of the various districts, pagi, or tribal subdivisions, administer justice. The Suevi had a hundred pagi, of which each furnished a thousand men to the military host. The rest stayed at home and provided food for the warriors. The next year the warriors returned home and tilled the land, while those that stayed at home the previous year took their places. From this sketch it may be inferred that the tribes known by Caesar, quote, were in a state of transition from the nomadic life to that of settled civilization, end quote. Some tribes must have been in a more advanced stage of development than others, and this development must have been proceeding during the age of Augustus, but we have no means of tracing it. The first disturbance in Gaul after the Battle of Actium was the revolt of the Celtic Morini in the neighborhood of Gescoriacum, Bologna, and their rebellion, perhaps, was in some way connected with the invasion of the German Suevians from beyond the Rhine in the same year, 29 B.C. The Suevians were driven back, and the Morini subdued by Gaius Carinus, while Nonius Gallus, about the same time, suppressed a rising of the Treveri on the Mosella. The following years were marked by those measures of organization in Gaul, which have been mentioned already, chapter 6. There seems to have been a good deal of oppression in the taxation and dissatisfaction among the provincials. In 25 B.C., German invaders came from beyond the Rhine and were repulsed by M. Vinicius but we know not whether they came by the invitation of Roman subjects. More alarming was the invasion which took place nine years later. Sugambri, Usipedes, and Tencteri, tribes whose homes were on the right bank of the lower Rhine, crossed the river on an expedition of plunder and inflicted a defeat on the legatus, M. Lolius, carrying off the eagle of the fifth legion. This event was not a very serious loss, but it was a serious disgrace. Augustus hastened to Gaul himself, taking Tiberius with him. The question of the defense of the northern frontiers was becoming serious. Tiberius was appointed to the military command in Gaul, and offensive operations were begun by the annexation of Noricum and the conquest of Raetia and Vindelicia. In 12 B.C., Drusus succeeded his brother as commander of the Rhine army. He was a brilliant young man, hardly twenty-five years old, handsome, brave, and popular, of winning manners worshipped by the soldiers, ardent and bold, but a sagacious leader. He lost no time in setting about the accomplishment of his scheme of conquest beyond the Rhine, and the occasion was given to him by the hostilities of the Sugambri and their confederates. Having inaugurated the altar of Augustus at Lagudinum, and thus called forth a display of royal sentiment in Gaul, he proceeded to the lower Rhine, threw a bridge across the river, and entered the land of the Usipetes, who had already begun hostilities. This tribe dwelled on the northern bank of the Lupia, a tributary of the Rhine, which still bears the same name in the form Lipe. The land south of the Lupia belonged to the Sugambri, and southward still, as far as the Laugona, now shortened to Lan, dwelt the Tencteri. Having quelled the Eusipetes, the Roman general marched southward to chastise the Sugambri, who, under their chieftain Mello, had begun the hostilities. But at present his way did not lie further in that direction. His plan was to subdue the northern regions of Germany first, and he had decided that this must be done in connection with the navigation of the northern coast. There were three stages from the Rhine to the Albis. The conqueror must first advance to the Amicia, and then to the Visurgis, 
before he reached the Albus, his final limit. The names of these rivers, thus Latinized by Roman lips, are still the same, the Ems, the Weser, and the Elb. A canal connecting the Rhine with Lake Flevo, as the sheet of water corresponding to the Zoider Zee was then called, was constructed by the army under Drusus, from whom it was named the Fossa Drusiana, so that the Rhine fleet could sail straight through the lake into the German Ocean and coast along to the mouth of the Amicia. The Batavians acknowledged without resistance the lordship of Rome and helped the troops in cutting the canal, and the Frisians, who dwelled northeast of Lake Flevo, likewise submitted to Drusus without resistance. Having thus secured the coast from the Rhine to the Amicia, he occupied the island of Burcanus, which we may certainly identify with Brocum, at the mouth of that river, and, sailing up the stream, defeated the Bructeri in a naval encounter. Returning to the sea, he invaded the land of the Chauci, who inhabited the coast regions on either side of the mouth of the Visurgis but it does not appear whether the Roman fleet sailed as far as the Visurgis, or whether Drusus advanced into the territory of the Chancy from the Amicia. On the return voyage the ships ran some danger in the treacherous shallows, but were extirpated by the friendly Frisians, who had accompanied the expedition on foot. Thus the work of Drusus in the first year of his command was the reduction of the coast of Lower Germany as far as the Visurgis. In the next year, 11 B.C., he determined to follow this up by the reduction of the inland regions in the same direction. For this purpose he had to choose another way. The chief military station on the lower Rhine was at this time Castra Vetera, situated not far from the mouth of the Lupia. Starting from here in spring, the legions crossed the Rhine, subdued once more the unruly Usipetes, threw a bridge across the Lupia, and entered the land of the Sugambri. In order to advance eastward, it was necessary to secure the tranquility of these troublesome tribes in the rear. Then following the course of the Lupia, Drusus advanced into the land of the Cheruski, the modern Westphalia, as far as the banks of the Visurgis. It was thought that the Sugambri might have thrown obstacles in the way of this achievement, but they were fully occupied by a war with their southern neighbors, the Chadi, who dwelled about the Taunus Mountains. Want of supplies and the approach of winter prevented the Romans from crossing the Visurgis. In returning, they fell into a snare, which, but for the skill of the general and the discipline of the soldiers, would have proved fatal. At a place named Arbalo, which cannot be identified, they were surrounded in a narrow pass by an ambushed enemy. But the Germans, confident in their own position, and regarding the Romans as lost men, took no precautions in attacking, and the legions cut their way through and reached the Lupia in safety. On the banks of that river, at the point where it receives the waters of the Aliso, Drusus erected a fort as an advanced position in the country, which was yet to be thoroughly subdued. This fort, also named Aliso, perhaps corresponds to the modern Elson, the river being the Alm. About the same time another fort was established on Mount Taunus, in the territory of the Chatti, whom the Romans drove out of their own land into that of the Sugambri. The following year, 10 B.C., seems to have been occupied with the subjugation of the Chatti, who were fighting to recover their old homes between the Laugona and the Moenus, Maine. During this year, Drusus possessed the proconsular power, that is, the secondary imperium, as it is called, subordinate to that of the emperor, which had been conferred upon him by designation in the previous year. Soon afterwards, perhaps in the following year, along with his brother Tiberius, he received the title of imperiator. While Drusus was thus actively accomplishing his great design of a Roman Germany, he was not neglectful of the defense of the Rhine, which was secured by a line of fifty forts on the left bank, between the sea and Vindonissa. The chief station of the lower Rhine was Castra Vetera, of the upper, Moguntasium, Mainz, probably founded by Drusus. 
Among the most important stations, which were established either at this time or not much later, were Argentoratum, the southern Noviogamus, which corresponds to Speyer, Borbetum Magus, Bingium, Bona, the northern Noviogamus, which is still Nimiguen, and the northern Lugudinum on the Rhine, which was become Leyden, in contrast with its southern namesake on the Rhone, which has been transformed into the softer Lyon. In the following year, the victorious young general, who might now lay claim to the title of Subduer of Germany, entered upon his first consulship. Bad omens at Rome in the beginning of the year did not hinder the council from setting forth in spring to carry on his work beyond the Rhine. This time he was bent on a further progress than he had yet achieved. Hitherto he had not advanced beyond the Visurgis. It seemed now high time to press forward to the Albus itself. Starting probably from Moguntiacum, he passed through the subject land of the Chadi and entered the borders of the Suevi. Then taking a northerly direction, he reached the Cheruski and the banks of the Visurgis, and crossing that river marched to the Albus, hitting it perhaps somewhere in the neighborhood of the modern Magdeburg. Of his adventures on this march nothing is definitely recorded, except that the Romans wasted the land, and that there were some bloody conflicts. On the bank of the Albus he erected a trophy, marking the limit of Roman progress. A strange and striking story was told of something said to have befallen him there, and to have moved him to retreat. A woman of greater than human stature stood in his way and motioned him back. Quote, Whither so fast, insatiable Drusus? It is not given to thee to see all these things. Back, for the end of thy works and thy life is at hand. End quote. And so it fell out. The days of Drusus were numbered. Somewhere between the Sala, a tributary of the Albus, and the Visurgis, he fell from his horse and broke his leg. The injury resulted in death after thirty days' suffering. There seems to have been no competent surgeon in the army. The alarming news of the accident was soon carried to Augustus, who was then somewhere in Gaul. Tiberius, who was at Ticinum, was sent for with all haste, and with all haste he journeyed to the recesses of the German forest and reached the camp in time to be with his brother in the last moments. The grief at this misfortune was universal. Both the emperor and the soldiers had lost their favorite, and the state an excellent general. Drusus was not yet thirty years old. He had accomplished a great deal, and he looked forward to accomplishing far more. Perhaps nothing will enable us so well to realize his importance in history as the reflection that, if he had lived to fulfill his plan, his work could not have been easily undone, the events which are presently to be related could not have happened, and the history of Central Europe would have been changed. The corpse was carried to the winter quarters on the Rhine and thence to Rome, where it was burned. The ashes were bestowed in the mausoleum of Augustus. Two funeral speeches were pronounced, one in the Forum by Tiberius, the other by Augustus himself in the Flaminian Circus. Besides these solemnities, more lasting honors were decreed to the dead hero. The name Germanicus was given to the conqueror of Germany, and to his children after him. A cenotaph was built at Moguntiacum, and a triumphal arch erected to record the founder of the new province. It would seem that Moguntiacum was in some special way associated with Drusus. These monuments in stone have not come down to us, but there has survived a monument in verse, an elegy addressed to his mother, the Empress Livia. We could wish that the author of the Consolatio ad Livium had given a more distinct picture of the qualities of the young general whom he deplores. Section 2. Tiberius in Germany, the Pannonian Revolt. It now devolved upon Tiberius, who possessed the proconsular power and the title of imperator, to carry on his brother's work. He took the place of Drusus as governor of the three Gauls and commander of the armies on the Rhine, and maintained the Roman supremacy over the half-subdued German tribes between that river and the Albus. 
the pacification of the Sugambri was at length effected by strong measures, and they were assigned territory on the left bank of the Rhine. Each summer the Roman legions appeared in various parts of the new province, the Roman general dealt out justice, and Roman advocates appeared beyond the Rhine. There was still much to be done to place Germany on the level of other provinces. It would have been perhaps unsafe as yet to require the Germans to contribute auxilia, or to impose on them a regular tribute. Tiberius possessed the confidence of the army, but he did not, like Drusus, possess the affection of the emperor. In 7 BC, the year of his second consulship, he received triumphal honors, but he did not return to Germany, and in the following year he retired to Rhodes. Little is recorded of his successors, but it is not to be assumed that they were idle or incompetent. The courtly writers of the day had eyes only for the exploits of Drusus and Tiberius, the princes of the imperial house. The consolidation of the conquests of Drusus was doubtless carried on amid frequent local rebellions, such as that in 1 B.C., which was put down by M. Vinicius. Another legatus, L. Domitius of Henobarbus, built a road called the Pontes Longi, connecting the Amicia with the Rhine. These commanders, however, were not entrusted, like Drusus and Tiberius, with the government of the three Gauls. After the deaths of Gaius and Lucius Caesar, Tiberius was reconciled with his stepfather and undertook the command of the armies on the Rhine once more. The legions were delighted to be commanded by a general whom they knew and trusted, whose ability was proved, and who was now marked out as the successor to the empire. And there was a need of a strong hand, for there had been many tokens of an unruly spirit. In the first campaign, 4 A.D., Tiberius advanced beyond the Visurgis and reduced the Cherusci who had thrown off the Roman yoke. And for the first time the Roman army passed the winter beyond the Rhine in the fort of Alessio on the Lupia. In the following year, 5 A.D., the lower Albus was reached, and an insurrection of the Chauci was suppressed. The Langombardi, who dwelled in these parts, and of whom we hear now for the first time, a people destined in a later age to rule in Italy, and to become famous under the name of Lombards, were also reduced. This expedition was carried out by the joint operations of a fleet and a land army. Tiberius repeated on a larger scale what Drusus had done eighteen years before. But while on the earlier occasion the Roman fleet had not advanced beyond the mouth of the Visurgis, if so far, under the auspices of Tiberius it reached the Albus and even sailed to the northern promontory of the Cimbric Peninsula. Some peoples east of the Albus, such as the Semones, the Charides, and the Cimbri, in Denmark, sent envoys seeking the friendship of the emperor and the Roman people. The authority of Tiberius had thus pacified the trans Rhenane dominion of Rome, and in the following year, 6 A.D., a new enterprise of conquest was entrusted to his conduct. When Drusus in his last expedition marched up the Monus, he entered the land of the Marcomanni, and they, under the leadership of their chief Marobodus, retreated before him into that lozenge-shaped, mountain-girt country in central Europe, which has derived its name Boyohemum, Bohemia, from the Celtic boy who then inhabited it. The Marcomanni dispossessed the Celts, and Marobodus established a powerful and united state, which extended its sway eastward and northward over the neighboring German tribes. The ideas of this remarkable man were far in advance of his countrymen. He had a leaning to Roman civilization, and he was ready to learn from it the methods and uses of political organization. He formed and disciplined in Roman fashion an army of seventy thousand foot and four thousand horse. But his policy was essentially one of peace. He desired to avoid a war with Rome, and yet to make it plain that he was quite strong enough to hold his own. He was willing to be a friendly ally, but he was not disposed to be a vassal. Geography, however, rendered a collision unavoidable. For Rome, possessing Germany in the north, 
and Noricum and Pannonia in the south, it would have been impossible to allow the permanent presence of an independent German state wedged in between these provinces. The actual occupation of the territory between the Dravis and the Danube, if it had not already taken place, was merely a question of time, and it was obviously necessary to have a continuous line of frontier from the Albis to the Danube. Policy demanded that the empire should absorb the realm of Marobodus and advance to the river Maris, now the March, which flows into the Danube below Pressburg. The legions of the Rhine under an experienced commander, Sentius Saturninus, advanced from the valley of the Moenus, breaking their way through the unknown depths of the Hercynian forest to meet the legions of the Illyricum, which Tiberius led across the Danube at Carnuntum. Both armies together numbered twelve legions, nearly double of the troops mustered by Marobudus. And under the command of a cautious and experienced leader like Tiberius, the success of the enterprise seemed assured. But it was not to be. Before the armies met, sudden tidings of a most alarming kind imperatively recalled the general. A revolt caused by oppressive taxation had broken out in Dalmatia and Pannonia, and of so serious a nature that not only were the Illyric legions obliged to return, but the troops of Moesia and even forces from beyond the sea, probably from Syria, were required to assist in suppressing it. This would have been an excellent opportunity for Marobodus to take the offensive, but he clung to his policy of neutrality and accepted terms of peace which were proposed by Tiberius the army of Sentius Saturninus hastened back to the Rhine to prevent a simultaneous outbreak there. The Pannonian revolt lasted for three years, the Dalmatian for one year longer. In Dalmatia, the leader of the insurgents was one Bato. He made an attempt to secure Salone, but was obliged to retire severely wounded, and had to content himself with ravaging the coast of Macedonia as far south as Opolonia. The legatus of Illyricum, M. Valerius Messalinus, son of the orator Messala, contended against him with varying success. In Pannonia, another Bato, chief of the Baruchi, was the most prominent leader. As the Dalmatian Bato failed to take Salone, so the Pannonian Bato failed to take Sirmium, and was defeated before its walls by Aulus Cecina Severus, the legatus of Moesia, who had hurried to the scene of action. After this, the two Batos seemed to have joined forces and taken up a strong position on Mount Almas, close to Sirmium. Tiberius passed the winter in Sicia and made that place the basis of his operations in Pannonia. As many as fifteen legions were ultimately collected in the rebellious provinces under his command, and the royal princes of Thrace had also come to the rescue. An unusually large number of auxiliary troops, fully 90,000, were employed in this war. Terror was felt not only in Macedonia, but even in Italy and Rome. Augustus himself had hastened to Ariminum to be near the seat of war. Levies were raised in Italy and placed under Germanicus, the son of Drusus, a youth of 21 years. In 7 AD the course of the hostilities was desultory the rebels avoided engagements in the open field. Germanicus advanced from Sicia along the river Una into western Dalmatia, and conquered the tribe of the Meze, who dwelled in the extreme west of modern Bosnia. Subsequently, 7 to 8 AD, he captured three important strongholds, which seem to have been situated on the borders of Liburnia and Iepidia. The next serious event was the long siege of Arduba in southeastern Dalmatia, which was marked by the heroic obstinacy of the women, who, when the place was captured, threw themselves and their children into the fire. But in the following autumn, the Pannonian Bato was induced to betray his cause. He surrendered in a battle fought at the stream of Bathinus, August 3rd, and handed over his colleague and rival Pines to Tiberius, who in turn recognized him as Prince of the Brucey. But his treachery did not go unpunished. He was caught and put to death by his Dalmatian namesake. 
Germanicus hastened in person to carry the news of the Bathonists to Augustus at Ariminum, and the emperor returned to Rome, where he was received with thank-offerings. But although this victory practically determined the end of the war, Tiberius was obliged in the following year to bring his forces again into the field against the Dalmatians, and Bato, besieged in his last refuge, and a trium near Salone, at length gave up the desperate cause, and was sent as a prisoner to Ravenna, where he died. When he was led before Tiberius, and was asked why he had rebelled, he replied, quote, It is your doing, in that ye send not dogs or shepherds to guard your sheep, but wolves to prey on them. End quote. Germanicus, who had taken part in the suppression of this dangerous and tedious war, the hardest, it was said, since the war with Hannibal, showed high promise of future distinction, and, like his father, was a universal favorite. Triumphal ornaments were granted to him, and he was placed first in the rank of praetorians in the Senate. To Tiberius himself the Senate decreed a triumph, but it was not destined to be celebrated. The people had hardly time to realize the successes of the legions of the Danube when the news came of a terrible disaster which had befallen the legions of the Rhine. End of chapter 9, sections 1 and 2「The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury, Chapter 9, The Winning and Losing of Germany, The Death of Augustus, Sections 3 and 4. Section 3, The German Rebellion and Defeat of Varus. The Emperor seems to have entertained few fears of the possibility of a rising in his new German province, for he named as commander of the Rhine armies, a man distantly related to himself by marriage, who had no experience of active warfare, and was quite incompetent to meet any grave emergency. This was Publius Quinctilius Varus, who, as imperial legatus in Syria, had won wealth, if not fame. It was said that when he came to that province, he was poor and Syria was rich, but when he went, he was rich and Syria was poor. His experiences as governor of Syria proved unlucky for him as governor in Germany. He utterly misconceived the situation. He imagined that the policy which he had successfully pursued in Syria might be adopted equally well in Germany. He failed to perceive the differences between the two cases, and to mark the weak grasp with which Rome, as yet, held the lands between the Rhine and the Albus. He seems to have felt himself perfectly safe in the wild places of Germany under the shield of the Roman name. He imposed taxes on the natives, and dealt judgment without any fear of consequences. But a storm was brewing under his very eyes. It seemed to those German patriots, who could never brook with patience the rule of a foreign master, that the moment had come when a struggle for the liberty of their nation might be attempted with some chance of success. In this enterprise only four prominent German peoples were concerned, the Cheruski, the Chatti, the Marsi, and the Bructeri, the same who had before distinguished themselves by their opposition to Drusus. The Frisians, the Chausi, the Suevic peoples who acknowledged the overlordship of Marobodus, took no part in this insurrection. The plotter and leader of the rebellion was the Cheruscan prince Arminius, son of Sigemer, then in the twenty-sixth year of his age. He and his father Flavius had received the privilege of Roman citizenship from Augustus. He had been raised to the equestrian rank, and had seen military service under the Roman standard. He was not only physically brave, but it was thought that he possessed intellectual qualities unequal in a barbarian. The Romans naturally trusted his loyalty, and the insinuations of Segestes his countrymen, who knew him better, received no attention. Sigemer, the brother, and Segamund, the son of the Segestes, threw themselves into the enterprise of Arminius, and Thusnelda, the daughter of Segestes, married the young patriot against the wishes of her father. 
It was the policy of the contrivers of the insurrection to keep the design dark until the last moment, and in the meantime to lull Varus, already secure, into a security still more complete. Of the five Germanic legions, two had their winter quarters at Moguntiacum, the other three at Castra Vetera on the lower Rhine, or at the fortress of Aliso on the Lupia. In summer they used sometimes to visit the interior parts of the province, and in 9 AD, Varus, with three legions, occupied summer quarters on the Visurgis, probably not far from the modern town of Minden and the Porta West Felica. The camp was full of advocates and clients, and the chief conspirators were present, on intimate terms with the governor and constantly dining with him. Autumn came, and as the rainy season approached, Varus prepared to retrace his steps westward. There can be no doubt that a line of communication connected his summer station with Aliso, and, if the army had returned as it came, Arminius could hardly have been successful in his plans. But a message suddenly arrived that a distant tribe had revolted, and Varus decided to take a roundabout way homewards in order to suppress it. This news was suspiciously opportune for the rebels. The Romans had to make their way through a hilly district of pathless forests, and their difficulties were increased not only by the encumbrances of heavy baggage and camp followers, but by the heavy rains, which had already begun and made the ground slippery. The moment had come for the German patriots to strike a desperate blow for independence. Segestes warned Varus of the impending danger, but the infatuated governor trusted the asseverations of Arminius. As the legions were making their laborious way through the Saltus Teutoburgiensis, they were assailed by the confederate insurgents. This Teutoburg forest cannot be identified with any certainty, but it seems to have been somewhere between the Amicia and the Lupia, northeast of Aliso. It is impossible to determine how far the circumstances of the case and how far the incompetence of the general were to blame for the disaster which followed. For three days the Romans continued to advance, resisting as well as they could the attacks of the foe, and if Varus had possessed the confidence of his soldiers and known how to hold them together, it seems probable that he might have passed through the danger in safety. But both officers and soldiers were demoralized under his command. The prefect of the horse deserted his post, taking all the cavalry with him, and leaving the foot soldiers to their fate. Varus was the first to despair. He had received a wound, and he slew himself. Others followed his example, and the rest surrendered. The prisoners were slain, some buried alive, some crucified, some sacrificed on the altars. The forces of Varus consisted of three legions, 17th, 18th, 19th, six cohorts, and three squadrons of cavalry. The army had been weakened by the loss of detachments, which, at the request of the conspirators, had been sent to the territories of various tribes to preserve order. These detachments, taken chiefly from the auxiliary cohorts, were slaughtered when the insurrection broke out. Of the troops which were entrapped in the Teutoburg forest, numbering probably almost twenty thousand men, only the cavalry escaped and a few individual foot soldiers. The three eagles of the three legions fell into the hands of the victors. Such a disaster had not befallen since the day of Carhe. The peoples of central Germany, from the Rhine to the Visurgis, had thus thrown off the Roman yoke. The cause of freedom had been victorious. Two results, fraught with great danger to the Roman Empire, seemed likely to follow. It was to be feared that the triumphant Germans would push across to the left bank of the Rhine, arouse a revolt there, and perhaps shake the fidelity of Gaul. And seemingly it was to be feared that Maro Bodus, lord of the Marcomanni, and chief of the Suevic Confederacy, would declare himself on the side of the insurgents, now they were successful but neither of these dangers were realized. The first was foiled by the bravery of Lucius Sedicius, commander of the garrison in Aliso, and the promptness of Lucius Nonius Asprenas, 
who commanded the two legions stationed at Moguntiacum. The first movement of the rebels after their victory was to attack Aliso, but Sedisius defended it so bravely that they were obliged to blockade it. When provisions ran short and no relief came, the garrison stole out on a dark night and made their way, harassed by the attacks of the enemy, to Castra Vetera. Thither, Asprenas, when the news of the disaster reached him, had hastened with his two legions to hinder the Germans from crossing the Rhine. The other danger was frustrated by the peculiar temper of Marobodus himself. Arminius had triumphantly sent him the head of Varus as a token of his own amazing success, hoping to persuade him to join the confederacy against Rome. But the message was ineffectual. Marobodus refused to link himself with the insurgents or to depart from his policy of neutrality. When the news of the defeat reached Rome, Augustus met the emergency with spirit and energy. The citizens seemed indifferent to the crisis. Many of them refused to place their names on the military roll, and the emperor was obliged to resort to fines and threats of severer punishment. Troops hastily levied from the veterans and freedmen were sent with all speed to the Rhine, and the Germans, who served as an imperial bodyguard, were disarmed and driven forth from Rome. In the following year, 10 AD, Tiberius assumed the command of the Rhine army, which was increased to eight legions. Four of these were doubtless stationed at Moguntiacum and four at Vetera, and it was probably the emperor's intention that when the immediate crisis was passed, the command of the Germanic armies should be divided between two generals. During the first year, Tiberius seems to have been engaged in organizing the defense of the Rhine, restoring the confidence of the old legions, and establishing discipline among the new. In the next year, 11 AD, he crossed the river and spent the summer in Germany, but he does not seem to have ventured far into the country or to have attempted any hostile enterprise. He was accompanied by his nephew Germanicus, to whom proconsular powers had been granted. In the following year, the duties of his consulship retained Germanicus at Rome, but in 13 AD he succeeded Tiberius in the sole command on the Rhine. During these years nothing was done against the Germans, though the state of war still continued. But Germanicus was not long content with inactivity. Upon him seemed to devolve the duty of restoring his father's work, which had been so disastrously demolished, and he burned to do it. But his efforts to recover the lost dominion and reach the Albus once more must form the subject of another chapter. Section 4. The Death of Augustus The slaughter of the Varian legions in the wilds of Germany tarnished the luster of Roman arms and cast a certain gloom over the last days of the Augustan age. The emperor himself, now stricken in years, felt the blow painfully. He let his hair and beard grow long. It is said that he dashed his head against the walls of his chamber, crying, Varus, Varus, give me back my legions. Every year he went into mourning on the anniversary of the defeat. He knew that his end must soon come, and he began to set his house in order. In 12 AD he addressed a letter to the Senate, in which he commended Germanicus to its protection, and commended the Senate itself to the vigilance of Tiberius. In the following year, he assumed once more the proconsular power for a period of ten years. At the same time, as has been recorded in Chapter 4, Tiberius was raised to a position almost equal to that of the emperor himself, and his son Drusus received a privilege of standing for the consulship in three years, without the preliminary step of the praetorship. A census was held in 14 A.D., and after its completion, Tiberius set out for Illyricum, where he was to resume the supreme command. Augustus accompanied him as far as Beneventum, but in returning to the Campanian coast, was attacked by dysentery and died at Nola, August 19. Tiberius had been sent for without delay, and came, perhaps in time to hear the parting words of his stepfather. 
there is no good reason to believe the insinuation that the emperor's death was caused or hastened by poison administered by Livia. Her son's ascension was sure, and Augustus was old and weak, so that it would hardly have been worth while to commit this crime. Both contemporaries and posterity had good cause to regard Augustus as a benefactor. He had given them the gift of peace. They also esteemed him fortunate, Felix, and his good fortune became almost proverbial. Yet it has been truly remarked that luck was the one thing that failed him. Both points of view are true. He was unusually fortunate. When he entered upon his career as a competitor for power, his motives were probably as vulgar as those of his rivals. There is no reason to suppose that in the pursuit of ambition he had large views of political reform or an exalted ideal of statesmanship. His actions throughout the Civil War indicate the shrewd, cool, and collected mind. They give no token of wide views, no promise of the future greatness. Quote, but his intellect expanded with his fortunes, and his soul grew with his intellect. End quote. When he came to be supreme ruler, he rose to the position. He learned to take a large view of the functions of the Lord of the Roman world, and there was born in him a spirit of enthusiasm for the work which history set him to accomplish. He knew, too, how to bear his fortune with dignity. But he was unlucky when his fortune was most firmly established. It was not given to the founder of the empire to leave a successor of his own blood, and, as we have seen, his endeavors to settle the succession were doomed to one bitter disappointment after another and led to domestic unhappiness. And it was not given to him to establish a secure frontier for the northern provinces of the empire. The efforts in that direction, which were made under his auspices and seemed on the eve of being crowned with success, were undone by a stroke of bad luck. Yet, reviewing his whole career as a statesman and reflecting on all that he achieved, we may assuredly say that the divine Augustus was fortunate with a measure of good fortune that is rarely bestowed on men who live out their life. The written memorial of his own acts, which Augustus composed before his death, may be spoken of here. It has been incompletely preserved in a Latin inscription, which covers the walls of the pronaos of a temple of Augustus at Enchira. Owing to this accident, it is generally known as the Monumentum Enchiranum, but its proper title was Res Geste Dini Augusti. Fragments of the Greek text of the same work have also been found in Pisidia, and have helped scholars in restoring the sense where the Latin fails. In this document, the emperor briefly describes his acts from his nineteenth to his seventy-seventh year, with remarkable dignity, reserve, and moderation. The great historical value of this memorial, composed by the founder of the empire himself, need hardly be pointed out. An extract will give an idea of the way in which the great statesman wrote the brief chronicle of the history which he made. Quote, I extended the frontiers, he says, of all those provinces of the Roman people, on whose borders there were nations not subject to our empire. I pacified the provinces of the Gauls and the Spains and Germany, from Gades to the mouth of the Albus. I reduced to a state of peace the Alps, from the district which is nearest the Adriatic Sea to the Tuscan Sea, without wrongful aggressions on any nation. My fleet navigated the ocean from the mouth of the Rhine eastward, as far as the borders of the Cimbri, whither no Roman before ever passed either by land or sea, and the Cimbri, the Charides, and the Simones, and other German peoples of the same region, sought the friendship of me and the Roman people. By my command and under my auspices, two armies were sent, almost at the same time, to Ethiopia and to Arabia, called Eudemon Felix, and very large forces of the enemies in both countries were cut to pieces in battle, and many towns taken. The invaders of Ethiopia advanced as far as the town of Nabata, very near Moreau. The army which invaded Arabia marched into the territory of the Sabae, as far as the town of Mariba, 
End quote. Another work compiled by Augustus was the Breviarium Imperii, containing a short statement of all the resources of the Roman state, and including the number of the population of citizens, subjects, and allies. It was in fact a handbook to the statistics of the Roman Empire. At the end of this work, he recorded his solemn advice to succeeding sovereigns not to attempt to extend the boundaries of the empire. End of chapter 9, sections 3 and 4. Recording by Kalinda. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Beery. Chapter 10. Rome under Augustus, his buildings. The Augustan age marks a new period in the history of the city of Rome. Augustus boasted that he found it a city of brick and left it a city of marble. For the change consisted not only in the large number of new buildings which were erected under his auspices, but in the material which was used. The white marble quarries of Luna had been recently discovered, and this rich stone was employed in many of the public edifices, while the aristocrats, stimulated by the example of the emperor, used bright travertine to adorn the facades of their private houses. The most striking change that took place in the appearance of the city during the reign of Augustus was the transformation of the forum, and the opening up of the adjacent quarters. In this, as in so much else, Julius Caesar had suggested innovations which he did not live to carry out himself. The Roman Forum extends from the foot of the capital to the northwest corner of the Palatine. Adjoining it on the north side, but separated from it by the rostrum, was the Comitium, a small enclosed space in which the Curia stood. The first step to the transformation of the Forum was the removal of the rostrum, 42 B.C., so that the Forum and Comitium formed one place. The Curia had been burnt down ten years before, and Caesar began the building of a new one, which was finished by Augustus and dedicated under the name of Curia Julia. But this was only the beginning of the new splendor that was to come upon the great center of Roman life. A short description of the chief buildings which adorned it at the death of Augustus will show how much it was changed under the auspices of the first princeps. At the northwest corner, close under the Capitoline, where the ascent to the Arcs begins, stood the Temple of Concord, rebuilt by Tiberius in 10 A.D., and dedicated in the name of himself and his dead brother Drusus as Aedes Concordiae Augustae. Owing to the nature of the ground, this temple had a peculiar cramped shape, the pronaos being only half as broad as the cella. Adjacent on the south side was the temple of Saturn, between the Clivus Capitolinus and the Vicus Jugarius. It was built anew in 42 B.C. by the munificence of Munatius Plancus. The eight Ionic pillars which still mark the spot where it stood date from a later period. This temple served as the state treasury, which was therefore called the Serarium Saturni. Between the Vicus Jugarius and the Vicus Tuscus, occupying the greater part of the south side of the Forum, stood the Basilica Julia, which, like the Curia, the elder Caesar had left to his son to finish. Begun in 54 B.C., it was dedicated in 46, but after its completion, some years later, it was burnt down. Then it arose again on a larger and more splendid scale, and was finally dedicated by Augustus a few months before his death, in the name of his unfortunate grandsons Gaius and Lucius Caesar. East of the basilica, on the other side of the Vicus Tuscus, was situated the temple of Castor, of which three Corinthian columns and a splendid Greek entablature still stand. Founded originally in memory of the help which the great twin brethren were said to have given to the Romans at Lake Regillus, it was renewed for the second time by Tiberius, under the auspices of Augustus, and, like the Temple of Concord, dedicated in the name of the two sons of Livia. The Temple of the Divine Julius, built on the spot where his body had been burned by the piety of his son, stood at the eastern end of the Forum, 
facing the new rostra which had been erected at the western side in front of the temple of Concord. Behind the Aedes Divi Juli, and on the north side of the venerable round temple of Vesta, was the Regia, a foundation of high antiquity, ascribed to Numa, and used under the Republic as the office of the Pontifex Maximus. It had been often destroyed by fire, and in 36 B.C. it was rebuilt in splendid style by C. Domitius Calvinus, and there Lepidus transacted the duties of his pontifical office. But when Augustus himself became chief pontiff, 12 B.C., he resigned the regia to the use of the Vestal Virgins. On the north side, east of the Curia, stood a building originally designed in 179 B.C. by the censors Fulvius and Aemilius, but built anew by L. Aemilius Paulus in 54 B.C., and since then known as the Basilica Aemilia. Burnt down forty years later, it was rebuilt by Augustus, with pillars of Phrygian marble. The temple of Janus, which Augustus thrice closed, stood somewhere, the exact position is uncertain, near the point where the Argilatum entered the Forum, between the Curia and the Basilica Aemilia. The Argilatum, a street famous for booksellers, traversed the populous and busy region north of the Forum, which was densely packed with houses, and threaded only by narrow streets. Caesar formed the design of opening up this crowded quarter, and establishing a free communication on this side between the Forum and the great suburb of Rome, the Campus Martius. In order to effect this, he constructed a new marketplace. It was owing probably to this scheme that the Curia Julia, whose building began about the same time, 54 B.C., was built nearer to the Forum than the old Curia. The Forum Julium, as it was called, lay north of the Curia, and like it was dedicated 46 B.C., before completion, and finished after Caesar's death. The chief building which adorned it was the temple of Venus Genetrix, mother of the Julian race, which Caesar had vowed at the Battle of Pharsalia. As the elder Caesar had made a vow at Pharsalia, so the younger Caesar made a vow at Philippi. The vow was to Mars Ultor, and was duly fulfilled. The house of Mars the Avenger likewise became the center of a new forum. This temple, dedicated by its founder on the first of his own month in 2 B.C., served as the resting place of the standards which his diplomacy had recovered from the Parthians. The forum Augustum adjoined that of Caesar on the northeast side. It was rectangular in shape, but on the east and west sides there were semicircular spaces with porticos in which the statues of Roman generals in triumphal robes were set up. It became the practice that in this forum the members of the imperial family should assume the toga virilis, and when victorious generals were honored by statues of bronze they were set up here. These fora of the first Caesars, father and son, were the beginning of a rehabilitation of this quarter of the city which was resumed a century later by the emperors Nerva and Trajan, and they established an easy communication between the Forum and the Field of Mars. Hitherto the way from the campus to the Forum had been round by the west and south sides of the Capitoline, through the Porta Carmentalis. The campus Martius itself, whether taken in the wider or the narrower sense, put on a new aspect under the auspices of the Caesars. The campus, in the stricter sense, was bounded on the south by the Circus Flaminius, and on the east by the Via Lata. It was the great rival of Caesar who set the example of building on this ground. In 55 B.C. Pompey erected his marble theater. Caesar began the construction of a marble septa, an enclosure for the voting of the centuries, which was finished by Agrippa. The name of Agrippa has more claim to be associated with the field of Mars than either Caesar's or Pompey's. The construction of the Pantheon, which is preserved to the present day, was due to his enterprise. This edifice is of circular form and crowned with a dome, which was originally covered with tiles of gilt bronze. The dome is an instance of the extraordinarily skillful use of concrete by the Romans, it is cast in one solid mass, and is as free from lateral thrust as if it were cut out of one block of stone. Though having the arch form, it is in no way constructed on the principle of the arch. The building is lighted only from the top. The interior measures 132 feet in diameter, as well as in height. 
The walls are broken by seven niches, three semicircular, and alternating with them three rectangular, wherein, at a later period, splendid marble columns with entablatures were introduced. Above this rises an attica with pilasters, the original portion of which has undoubtedly been changed, since we know that Diogenes Caryatides once rose above the entablatures of the columns, and divided the apertures of the great niches. Above the attica rises in the form of a hemisphere the enormous dome, which has an opening in the top twenty-six feet in diameter, through which a flood of light pours into the space beneath. Its simple regularity, the beauty of its parts, the magnificence of the materials employed, the quiet harmony resulting from the method of illumination, give to the interior a solemnly sublime character, which has hardly been impaired even by the subsequent somewhat inharmonious alterations. These have especially affected the dome, the beautiful and effectively graded panels of which were formerly richly adorned with bronze ornaments. Only the splendid columns of yellow marble, giallo antico, with white marble capitals and bases, and the marble decorations of the lower walls, bear witness to the earlier magnificence of the building. The porch is adorned with sixteen Corinthian columns. Agrippa also built the adjacent baths called after him Thermae Agrippae, 27 and 25 B.C., and a basilica which he dedicated to Neptune in memory of his naval victories, and enclosed with a portico which from the pictures adorning it was called the Portico of the Argonauts. Another wealthy noble of the day, Statilius Taurus, constructed the first stone amphitheater in Rome, and its site, too, was somewhere in the field of Mars. The first princeps himself seemed content to leave the adornment of the campus chiefly to the munificence of his lesser fellow-citizens. But much further north than all the buildings which have been mentioned, where the campus becomes narrow by the approach of the Via Flaminia to the river, he built a great mausoleum for the Julian family, a round structure surmounted by a statue of himself. On the south side of the Flaminian Circus, in the Prata Flaminia, a region which might be included in the campus, in a wider sense of the name, Augustus erected the Porticus Octaviae in the name of his sister, and attached to it a library and a collection of works of art. It was close to the Templum Herculis Musarum, built by Fulvius Nobilior, the patron of the poet Ennius, and renewed under Augustus, and surrounded by a portico which was dedicated as the Porticus Philippi, in honor of L. Marcius Philippus, the stepfather of the emperor. Near the portico of Octavia were the theaters of Balbus and Marcellus, both dedicated in the same year, 11 B.C. The first was one of those works which the rich men of the day executed through the influence and example of Augustus. The second had been begun by Caesar, but was finished by Augustus, and dedicated in the name of his nephew Marcellus. The Porticus Octavi, close to the Flaminian Circus, which was dedicated by C. Octavius after the victory over Perseus, was burnt down and restored under Augustus. It was remarkable as the earliest example of Corinthian pillars at Rome. From the Forum, the Clivus Capitolinus, passing the Temple of Saturn, led up to the saddle of the Mons Capitolinus, the smallest of all the mountains of Rome. Thence it ascended to the southern height, called specially the Capitolium, the citadel of Servian Rome, where the treaties with foreign nations were kept, and triumphal spoils were dedicated. Another path led up to the northern height, the Arx, which underwent little change under the empire. But on the southern hill it was otherwise. There new buildings arose under the auspices of Augustus. The highest part of the hill was occupied by the great temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, in which the Senate used to meet on certain solemn occasions. This temple, burned down in 83 B.C., had been rebuilt, but it required and received costly repairs in the time of Augustus. Ranged around it on lower ground were many lesser temples, of which that of Jupiter Ferretrius, to whom Romulus dedicated his Spolia Opima, and that of Fides, founded by Numa, may be specially mentioned. Augustus increased their number. In 20 B.C. he dedicated the round temple of Mars Ultor, and in 22 B.C. that of Jupiter Tonans, in memory of an occasion during his Cantabrian expedition, on which he had narrowly escaped death by lightning. This temple, marvelous for its splendor, attracted multitudes of visitors and worshippers, 
and its position at the point where the clivus reached the area capitolina might suggest that jupiter tonans was a sort of gatekeeper for the greater jupiter on the summit but the palatine mount was the centre from which the development of rome went out it was the original rome the roma quadrata where were localized the legends of its foundation there were to be seen the Casa Romuli, the Lupercal where Romulus and Remus were fed by the wolf, the Cornell tree, and the Mundus, receptacle of those things which at the foundation of the city were buried to ensure its prosperity. Under the Republic, the Palatine was the quarter where the great nobles and public men lived. Augustus himself was born there, and there he built his house. So it came about, that the name which designated the city of Rome in its earliest shape, Palatium, became the name of the private residence of its first citizen. The palace of Augustus was a magnificent building in the new and costly style, which had only recently been introduced in Rome. Ovid, standing in imagination by the temple of Jupiter Stator, where the Palatine Hill slopes down to the Via Sacra, could see the splendid front of the palace worthy of a god. Singula dum miror, video fulgentibus armis, conspicuos postes, tectaque digna deo. The other great building by which Augustus transformed the appearance of the Palatine was the Temple of Apollo, begun in 36 B.C., after the end of the war with Sextus Pompeius, and dedicated eight years later. It was an eight-pillared peripteros, built of the white marble of Luna, and richly adorned with works of art. The chief site was the Colossus of Bronze, representing Augustus himself under the form of Apollo. Between the columns stood the statues of the fifty Danaids, and over against them their wooers, the sons of Egyptus, mounted on horseback. Under the statue of the god were deposited in a vault the Sibylline books. In the porticos were two libraries, one Latin and one Greek. On the northern slope of the Palatine, facing the capital, stood the temple of Augustus, which Tiberius and the Empress Livia erected in his honor after his death. On the south side, the Palatine looks down on the Circus Maximus, which was restored by Augustus. Opposite rises the Aventine, a hill long uninhabited, and afterwards chiefly a plebeian quarter, on which the chief shrine was the temple of Diana, whence the hill was sometimes called Collis Diana. This temple was rebuilt by L. Cornificius under Augustus, who himself restored the sanctuaries of Minerva, Juno Regina, and Jupiter Libertas on the same hill. Livy was hardly guilty of exaggeration when he called Augustus the founder and restorer of all the temples of Rome. A word must be said here about the triumphal arc, Arcus Triumphalis, which was a characteristic feature in the external appearance of Rome and other important cities of the empire. Under this name are included not only arches erected in honor of victories, but also those which celebrate other public achievements. A triumphal arch was built across a street. It consisted either of a single archway or of a large central and two side ones, or sometimes of two of the same height side by side. There were generally columns against the piers supporting an entablature, and each façade was ornamented with low reliefs. Above all rose an attica with the inscription, and upon it were placed the trophies in case the arch commemorated a victory. The arch of Augustus at Ariminum, erected in memory of the completion of the Via Flaminia, and his arches at Augusta Praetoria and Susa, still stand. The general appearance of the arch resembles that of the gate of a city, and it seems to have owed its origin to the triumphal gate through which a victorious general led his army into Rome to celebrate his triumph. End of chapter 10 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on March 21, 2009The Student's Roman Empire, Part One, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter Eleven, Section One. Literature of the Augustan Age. Latin poetry. 
Latin literature was affected seriously and in many ways by the fall of the Republic and the foundation of the Empire. The Augustan age itself was brilliant, but after the Augustan age literature rapidly declined. The most conspicuous figures in the world of letters under Augustus had outlived their youth under the Republic. Some of them had served on the losing side. But these soon became reconciled to the new order of things. The emperor drew men to himself by virtue of the peace and security which he had established, cunctos dulcedine oti pelexit and it was his special object to patronize men of literary talent and engage their services for the support of his policy. His efforts were successful. He won not only flattery, but sympathy for the new age which he had inaugurated. He enlisted in his cause not only time-servers, but the finest spirits of the day. Although the Augustan literature is certainly marked by a vein of flattery to the court, and by a lack of republican independence, Yet we cannot but recognize a genuine enthusiasm for the new age, for the peace which it had brought after the long civil wars, and for the greatness of the Roman Empire. And from a literary point of view, the Augustan age ranks among the most brilliant in the history of the world, below the Periclean, perhaps below the Elizabethan, but certainly far above that of Louis the Fourteenth. It is true that the cessation of the political life of the Republic necessarily meant the decline of oratory. It is true that historians could no longer treat contemporary events with free and independent criticism. It is true, likewise, that the severe style of old Latin prose begins to degenerate, and that poetry lays aside its popular elements and becomes more strictly artificial. In fact, the poets deprecate popularity and despise the public. Horace's cry, Odi profanum vulgus et arceo is characteristic of the age. But for literary excellence, and for the perfection of art, the best of the Augustan writers had a clear judgment and a delicate taste. The tendencies of the new age inevitably led to a decline, but as an ample compensation we have Virgil, Horace, Tibullus, Livy. Augustus, as we have said, concerned himself with the promotion of literary activity and the patronage of men of letters. He fostered in all ways the talents of his age. He founded two libraries, one in the portico of Octavia, the other at the temple of Apollo on the Palatine. He was an author himself, both in prose and verse. He wrote Exhortations to Philosophy and a poem in hexameters entitled Cecilia. The Monumentum Enseranum and the Breviarum Totius Imperi have been mentioned elsewhere. The two chief ministers of Augustus were authors likewise. Agrippa wrote memoirs of his own life, and edited an atlas of the world. Messenus composed occasional poems of a light nature, and also wrote some prose works. But he is more famous as a patron of poets than as a poet himself. His literary circle included Horace, Virgil, Varius, Tuca, Domitius Marsus, besides many lesser names. The orator, M. Valerius Messala, 64 B.C. to 9 A.D., also drew round him a group of men of letters, among whom the most distinguished were the poets Tibullus, Valgius Rufus, Aemilius Masser, and perhaps Ovid. This circle seems to have held quite aloof from politics. Masala's own literary work chiefly consisted in translations from the Greek, both prose and verse. C. Asinius Polio, 75 B.C. to 5 A.D., held a unique position. Having been on the side of Antonius, he withdrew after Actium from political life, and holding himself aloof from the court, devoted himself to literature with a certain independence and perhaps antagonism to the spirit of the age. He was very learned and a very severe critic. He wrote tragedies, which are praised by Virgil, and a history of the civil wars, Historiae, reaching from 60 to about 42 B.C. He was a friend of both Virgil and Horace. Publius Virgilius Maro was born in 70 B.C. at Andes, near Mantua. His rustic features bore testimony to his humble origin. His father was an artisan. 
he went to school at Cremona, afterwards he studied at Medellanum, and finally at Rome, where Octavius, afterwards to be Caesar and Augustus, was his fellow-student in rhetoric. He studied philosophy under the Epicurean Ciro. After his return home, he and his family experienced the calamities of the civil war. Octavius Musa, who was appointed to carry out the distribution of land to veteran soldiers in the district of Carmona, transgressed the limits of that district, and encroached upon the neighboring territory of Mantua, 41 B.C. Virgil's father was among the sufferers, but Asinius Pollio, who was then legatus in Gallia Transpadana, and the poet Cornelius Gallus, interested themselves in his behalf. At their suggestion, Virgil betook himself to Rome, and obtained from Caesar the restitution of his father's farm. The first eclogue is an expression of gratitude to Caesar for this protection. Deus nobis hec otia fecit. But Virgil and his father were not permitted to remain long in possession of their recovered homestead. The same injustice was repeated a year or two later, and the poet was even in danger of his life. Again he went to Rome, and the influence of Messenus, to whom he had probably become known by the publication of some of his bucolics, secured him not restitution, but compensation, perhaps by a farm in Campania, where he spent much of his later life. Virgil's first work, the Bucolics, consisting of ten eclogae, or idols, was composed in the years 41 to 39 B.C. Inspired by Theocritus, they are written in the same meter, and are in great part imitations from his idols. But most of them contain references to contemporary persons and events, especially to the hardships in Transpadane Gaul, from which Virgil himself had suffered so sorely. Caesar, Cornelius Gallus, Alphenus Varus, the successor of Polio as Legatus, and above all Polio himself, have their places in the woods of Titerus. The fourth eclogue, written for the year of Polio's consulship, 40 B.C., treats a theme which hardly belongs to bucolic poetry. Virgil feels that he has to make his woods worthy of a consul. Si canimus silvas, silvae sint consule digne. He salutes the return of the Saturnian kingdoms and the Golden Age. The salutation was premature by ten years, and when peace at length came to the Roman world, Polio, instead of being its inaugurator, was rather an opponent. But it is interesting to observe that the idea of some great change for the better was in the air. The bucolics were written in the north of Italy, not yet Italy at that time, his next work was written in the south, chiefly at Naples. It was Messenus who suggested the subject of the Georgics, a didactic poem in hexameters, dealing with the various parts of a farmer's work. The first book treats of agriculture, the second of the plantation of trees, the third of the care of livestock, the fourth of bees. No subject was more congenial to Virgil's muse, his rustic muse, as he says himself and from some points of view the Georgics may be regarded as his masterpiece. He has here achieved a task which is the hardest that a poet can undertake, to write true poetry in a didactic form. Rare artistic instinct and genuine love of his subject were happily joined to produce this unique poem, in which Virgil seems to be more truly himself than either in the Bucolics or the Aeneid. The composition and revision of this work occupied the years from 37 to 30 B.C., when it was read aloud to Caesar on his return from Actium. It is interesting to note that the latter part of the fourth book was originally devoted to the praises of the poet's friend Cornelius Gallus, but that after his execution, 27 B.C., this passage was cut out by the wish of the emperor and replaced by the story of Orpheus. In the Georgics, Virgil promises that he will soon gird himself to a greater task and sing the deeds of Caesar. But his poem took the form of an epic in which not Caesar, but Aeneas, the founder of the Julian Gens, was the hero. The work was begun about 29 B.C. and occupied the remaining ten years of the poet's life. He died at Brundusium in 19 B.C., leaving the Aeneid unfinished. 
His wishes were that the great manuscript should be burnt, but Augustus, that such a great work should not perish, committed its publication to Varius and Tuca, friends of Virgil, on the condition that they should make no alterations. Though Augustus was not the hero, there were opportunities, in a poem dealing with the origin of the Latin race and the Alban fathers and the walls of lofty Rome, to look forward over the ages of Roman history and celebrate the glories of him who was to found a golden age. The Aeneid has suffered from the premature death of its creator. It was neither finished nor revised. Yet it would hardly be an injustice to Virgil to say that its excellence and charm lie in particular episodes, in delicate and subtle details of language and rhythm, and not in the poem regarded as a whole. But it must always stand beside the Iliad and Odyssey as the third great epic of antiquity. The Roman dignity and magnitude of the subject, and the wonderful power of the narratives in the second, fourth, and sixth books, have exalted the Aeneid far above the Georgics in the estimation of posterity. Yet it might be argued that Virgil had more in common with Wordsworth than with Milton or with his worshipper Dante. The note of Virgil is natural piety. Perhaps he cannot be better described than by the happy expression which his friend Horace applied to him, anima candida. Virgil was buried close to Naples on the road to Puteoli, and the inscription on his tomb, said to have been dictated by himself before his death, ran thus, Mantua me genuit, calabri rapuere, tenet nunc parthenope, Cicini pasqua rura tutses. In connection with Virgil, it is natural to mention his elder contemporary and friend, L. Varius Rufus, B.C. 74-14, to celebrated for his epics on Caesar and Octavian, and more celebrated for his tragedy, The Thiestes. Another poet of about the same age was Aemilius Masser of Verona, also a friend of Virgil, and disguised in the bucolics under the name of Mopsus. He wrote poems on natural history, Ornithogonia and Theriaca, but they have been less lucky than his models, the Greek poems of Nicander, which survive to the present day. The unfortunate Cornelius Gallus, 69 B.C. to 27, must also be mentioned here, though his name has its place rather in the age of Catullus and Cinna. It was he who transplanted the erotic elegy of the Alexandrian Greeks to Roman soil, and founded the school of Euphorion, to which Catullus and Cinna belonged. He translated Euphorion into Latin, and wrote four books of original elegies on his own mistress Cytheris, under the name of Lycoris. His death has already been noticed. The great lyric, like the great epic poet, of Rome, was of humble birth, Q. Horatius Flaccus was the son of a freedman, and was born at Venusia, on the borders of Apulia and Lucania, in 65 B.C. After the death of Julius Caesar, 44 B.C., he joined the cause of Brutus, and served under him in Asia and Macedonia, until the Battle of Philippi, 42 B.C. On that occasion he took part in the general flight, as he tells us himself, and afterwards returning to Rome, obtained a post as a quasier's secretary. During the next ten years, he wrote his satires and epodes, which brought him fame, and secured him the friendship of Virgil and Varius, who introduced him to Messenus. In 37 B.C. we find him accompanying Messenus on the journey to Brundusium, of which he has left us a pleasant description. The intimacy with Messenus ripened, the Epicurean views of life which both held were a bond between the poet and his patron. Horace had a taste for country life, and in 33 B.C. Messenus bestowed upon him a farm in the Sabina territory, which he preferred to royal Rome. Independence was one of the chief characteristics of Horace, and he felt more independent in the country than in the immediate neighborhood of the court. The first book of the satires appeared about 35 B.C., the second book about five years later. In this style of composition the predecessor of Horace was Lucilius, but while Lucilius criticized persons and politics freely, 
Horace prudently confined himself to generalities on society and literature, owing to the altered circumstances of the time. Lucilius had imitated the Greek writers of old comedy, such as Cratinus and Aristophanes, and Horace stood in somewhat the same relation to his predecessor as the new comedy stood to the old. From these talks, sermones, as Horace calls them himself, written like those of Lucilius in hexameter verse and in colloquial style, we learn much about the personality of Horace and about his friends. In the Epodes, which were published about the same time as the second book of the Satires, Horace imitated Archilochus and attacked persons in coarse language. All these poems, except the last, are written in couplets consisting of a longer and a shorter line, generally an iambic trimeter, followed by an iambic dimeter. They are the least interesting work of Horace, but they were a good exercise in handling meters and in the imitation of the Greek models, and they led to the odes. The greatest monument of poetry that Horace has bequeathed to posterity is the collection of lyrical poems in our books known as the Odes. The first three books were published in 24 B.C., the fourth eleven years later. In lyric composition he does not claim originality. He only adapted Aeolian song to Italian measures. But he claims priority. He was the first, except Catullus, to make the attempt... Princeps Aeolium Carmen at Italos deduxis modus. For this he bids the muse crown him with Delphic laurel. But though the Greek lyric poets, especially Sappho and Alcaeus, were his models, it was an original idea on the part of Horace to turn away from the Alexandrian poets who were then in vogue, and go back to the older singers. It required true genius and wonderful artistic instinct to tune the borrowed lyre to the accents of another tongue. Horace was supremely successful. In the Odes, his poetic judgment is, with few exceptions, faultless. The happiest word comes almost inevitably. His felicity, curiosa felicitas, was praised by Roman critics. Some of these poems are probably free translations from the Greek, but many refer to contemporary people and events. Some deal with Roman history, and the victories won under the auspices of Augustus. The fourth book of the Odes is said to have been published at the instance of the emperor. But in the interval between his earlier and later lyric works, Horace wrote epistles. The first book appeared about 20 B.C. After the strict technical constraints to which he had subjected himself in the Odes, it was a relaxation for the poet to expand himself in the easy and familiar style of the sermones. But the urbane epistles, though written in the same colloquial language, are very different from the satires. They are more mature, less polemical, and they have a charm of serenity which is wanting in the earlier work. It might be said that if the genius of Virgil found its truest expression in the Georgics, so that of Horace was best expressed in his epistles and in this form of composition he has never been equaled. The second book of the Epistles, written in the later years of his life, includes a treatise on poetry, the Ars Poetica, in the form of a letter to his friends, the Pisos. Horace died in 8 B.C., surviving by a few months his benefactor Mycenes, beside whom he was buried. Though he had at first stood aloof, he became reconciled, as time went on, to the empire, was on good terms with Augustus, and did what was required of him as an Augustan poet. And independent though Horace was, he had a decided weakness for friendships with great people. The influence of Mecenas probably did much to stimulate his poetic activity, for Horace was by no means one of those who cannot help singing. He was not inspired— his poetry is marked by lucidity and judgment. Many poets whose works have not survived, but famous in their own day, are mentioned by Horace. His friend Valgius, who wrote epigrams and elegies, was actually compared to Homer. Aristius Fuscus and Fundanius composed dramas, Pupius doleful tragedies. Here may be mentioned also C. Melissus, who wrote a jest book and originated the Fabula Trabeata, and Domitius Marsus, famous chiefly for his epigrams, 
in which field he was the predecessor and master of Marshall. Of the elegiac poets of this period whose works have come down to us, the most charming is Albius Tibullus, 54 to 19 B.C. Adopting the form of Alexandrian elegy, he breathed into it a fresh spirit of Italian country life. In his love poems to Delia, whose true name was Plania, there is a certain tender melancholy which we do not find in the rest of classical literature. By his deft handling of the pentameter he made an important technical advance in the development of Latin elegy. Along with his works and under his name were published after his death some poems which were not by him, but by a certain Ligdamus, perhaps a fictitious name. Also included in the collection of his elegies are some which were written by Sulpicia, the niece of his patron Messala. The Umbrian poet Sextus Propertius, probably born at Assisium about 49 to 15 B.C., did not emancipate himself like Tibullus from the influence of his Alexandrian models, Callimachus and Philetus. On the contrary, he prides himself on his Alexandrianism, and calls himself the Roman Callimachus. He was very learned, and his elegies are full of obscure references to out-of-the-way myths. Nevertheless, no works of the age are so thoroughly impressed with the individuality of the writer as the passionate poems of Propertius. The passion which inspired his song was his love for Hostia, a beautiful and accomplished courtesan, whom he disguised under the name of Cynthia, as Catullus had disguised Clodia under Lesbia, and Tibullus Plania under Delia. His first book of elegies brought him fame, and probably secured him an admission into the circle of Mecenas. The imagination of Propertius was eccentric, his nature melancholic. He looked at things on their gloomy side, and perhaps his special charm is his skillfulness in suggesting vague possibilities of pain or terror. He loved the vague, both in thought and in expression. In his metaphors, the image and the thing imaged often pass into each other, and the meaning becomes indistinct. He seems to have been a man of weak will, and this is reflected in his poetry. It has been noticed by those who have studied his language that he prefers to express feelings as possible rather than real. His thoughts naturally ran in the potential mood. His connection with Cynthia lasted for about five years, and after it was broken off, Propertius wrote little. It was Cynthia who had made him a great poet. The third of the great Roman elegiac poets, P. Ovidius Naso, of equestrian family, was born at Solmo, in the Polygnian territory, 43 B.C. Trained in rhetoric and law, he entered upon an official career, and by the favor of Augustus received the Latus Clavus, and held some of the lower equestrian posts, such as Vigintiver and Decimver. But he gave his profession up for the sake of poetry. He is said himself, in a verse which probably suggested a familiar line of Pope, that verse-writing came to him by nature. Quid quid tentabum dicere versus erat. He is the only one of the great Augustan poets whose literary career belongs entirely to the Augustan age. His works may be classified in three periods. The extant works of the early period are all on amatory subjects and in elegiac verse. The amores in three books celebrate Corinna. The ars amatoria, likewise in three books, give advice to lovers of both sexes as to the conducting of their love affairs, while the Remedia Amoris prescribes cures for a troublesome passion. But the best work of this period is the Heroides, a collection of imaginary letters of legendary heroines such as Penelope, Dido, Phaedra, to their lovers. Here Ovid has shown his poetic power at its best. The two works of the second period, the Metamorphosis and the Fasti, are the most ambitious of Ovid's works. They deal respectively with Greek and Roman mythology. For the Metamorphosis, or Transformations, composed in hexameter verse, Ovid obtained his material chiefly from the Alexandrian poets Nicander and Parthenius. The Fasti, a sort of commentary on the Roman calendar, in elegiac meter, should have consisted of twelve books one for each month of the year, 
but only six, March to August, were completed. The third period begins with Ovid's banishment to Tomi in Scythia in 9 A.D. The cause of this banishment is one of those historical mysteries which can never be decided with certainty. The poet himself only ventures on dark hints. He mentions a poem and an error, Carmen et Error, as the two charges which led to his fate. He also said that his eyes were to blame, Cor noxia lumina feci? The poem probably refers to his licentious Ars Amatoria, which was so opposed in spirit to the attempts at social reform made by the framer of the Julian laws. But the true cause must have been the mysterious error. It has been conjectured with considerable probability that Ovid had witnessed some act of misconduct on the part of a member of the emperor's family, and was punished for not having prevented it. This may have been connected with the adultery of the younger Julia and de Silanus. The poet, perhaps, was made the scapegoat. In his exile on the shores of the Euxin, he composed the letters Ex Ponto, in four books, and the Tristia, in five books, in which he laments his fate and implores to be forgiven. The Ibis, a bitter attack on some anonymous enemy, on the model of a poem which Callimachus wrote against Apollonius of Rhodes, and an unfinished poem on fishing, Haliotica. He also wrote a Getic poem in honor of Augustus, but neither Augustus nor his successor Tiberius revoked the sentence of the unhappy poet, and Ovid died at Tomi in 17 A.D. In handling the elegiac meter, Ovid bound himself by stricter rules than his predecessors. He had wonderful facility in versification, but he was more of a rhetorician than a poet, and he is most successful where rhetoric tells, as in the Heroides. He lived in ease and luxury, and rejoiced that he lived in the age of Augustus, when life went smoothly. Hexetas moribus apta meis. His love poetry was distinguished by lubricity, and in this he contrasted unfavorably with Tibullus and Propertius. The tragedy of Medea, which he composed in his early period, is not extant, but it and Thyestes of Varius were the two illustrious tragedies of the day. Two poems, Nux, an elegy, and the Consolatio ad Liviam, were falsely ascribed to Ovid, but were probably written by some contemporary of inferior talent. Among the friends of Ovid, who were likewise poets, may be mentioned Sabinus, who wrote Answers to the Heroides, Ponticus, author of Thebaid, Cornelius Severus, who treated the Sicilian war with Sextus Pompeius in verse, the starry Albinovanus Pedo wrote a Theseid, and also an epic on contemporary history. The Georgics of Virgil and the Haliotics of Ovid belong to the kind of poetry known as didactic. Other works of this class are the Synegetica of Gratius on the art of hunting, and the Astronomica of Manilius in five books. Of the author of this astronomical poem we know nothing, even his name is uncertain, but he possessed poetical facility of no mean order and considerable originality. Most of the short occasional pieces, of a light and humorous nature, which were collected under the title of Priapea, belong to the Augustan age, and many of them to the best poets. End of chapter 11, section 1. Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 4th, 2009. Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 11 Literature of the Augustan Age Sections 2 and 3 Latin Prose Writers The History of Rome by Titus Livius, 59 B.C. to 17 A.D., stands out as the greatest prose work of the Augustan period. Livy was born at Patavium, 
and a certain patavinity has been remarked in his diction. But most of his life was spent at Rome, where he studied rhetoric, wrote philosophical dialogues, and enjoyed the friendship of Augustus. He began his history, Ab Urbe Condita Libri was the title, soon after the foundation of the empire, and carried it down as far as the death of Drusus, 9 B.C. The work consisted of 142 books in all, originally distributed in decades and half-decades, which appeared separately according as they were completed. But only thirty-five books have been preserved to us, namely books one to ten, and books twenty-one to forty-five. We have, however, short epitomes of the contents of almost all the lost books. Livy was a mild and amiable man, who held no extreme views, liked compromise and conciliation, hated violence and turbulence, and could be indulgent to men of all parties. This fair and equable temper can be traced in his history. The one thing which is unpardonable in his eyes is harsh fanaticism. Ancient Rome is his ideal, and he regards his own age as degenerate, destitute of the virtues, simplicity, and piety which made the old time so great. His heroes are Cincinnatus, Camillus, Fabius the Delayer. The general view of the course of Roman history he states in strong language in the general preface to his work. He invites his readers to learn by what men and by what policy at home and abroad the empire of Rome was won and increased, then to follow the gradual decline of discipline and morals, then witness that decline becoming more and more marked, and ending in a headlong downward rush, until his own times are reached, in which we cannot endure our vices nor submit to remedies. We cannot doubt his honesty as a historian, but his views of writing history were such that his statements must often be received with caution. For though he wished to tell the truth, he cared much more for style than for facts. He had little idea of historical method or of historical research. He gave himself no trouble to ascertain the truth in doubtful cases. For the early history he simply worked up into an artistic form the narratives of Polybius and of late Roman analysts, especially Valerius of Antium, and did not exert himself to consult all the available sources, or even the best. His knowledge of constitutional matters was unsound, nor was he at home in military history. He approached his subject rather as a rhetorician than as a historian, and as a literary work his history takes rank among the great histories of the world. His style was prolix. Ancient critics observed that he used more words than were necessary, and his abundance, lactea ubertas, was contrasted with the conciseness of Sallust. Pompeius Trogus wrote a universal history in forty-four books, beginning with the Assyrian Ninus, and ending with his own time. It was entitled Historiae Philippicae, the original work has not come down to us, but in a later age it was abbreviated by a certain Justinus, and this abridgment is extant. Other historians of the Augustan period were L. Aruntius, who wrote an account of the Punic War in the style of Sallust, and Fenestella, an antiquarian, who, in his Annales, paid special attention to social and constitutional history. C. Julius Hyginus, a freedman of Augustus, and a librarian of the Palatine Library, was an interesting figure in the literary history of his time. He may be regarded as the successor of Varro, as an antiquarian and polymath. He wrote on the cities of Italy, De situ urbium italicarum, on illustrious Romans, De viris claris, on agriculture, also a commentary on Virgil. All these books are lost, but a mythological fabulae and an astronomical work have come down under his name, and perhaps are really his. Of other antiquarians, many of whose names we know, must be mentioned M. Varius Flaccus, who wrote a book on the calendar, Fasti, and an important lexicographical work entitled De Verborum Significatu. Most valuable, as the only work of the kind that has been preserved, is the treatise of Vitruvius Pollio, De Architectura, in ten books. It was dedicated to Augustus and finished before 13 B.C. 
of the many philosophers, rhetors, and orators who talked and wrote at this period, there is none of any interest to posterity. Among philosophical writers may be mentioned Q. Sextius Niger, and his son of the same name. Among the rhetors, M. Porcius Latro, of whose declamations some extracts are preserved, and among orators, the fluent Haterius, the rabid Lebienus, the biting Cassius Severus. The two great jurists of the Augustan age were M. Antistius Labeo, 59 B.C. to 12 A.D., and his younger rival, C. Ateus Capito, 34 B.C. to 22 A.D., who founded schools afterwards, known as the Proculian and Sabinian, respectively. Section 3. Greek Literature From the year 146 B.C. forward, Greek literature begins to hold a place in Roman history along with the advance of Roman sway over the Greek world. By the time of Augustus, nearly all the Greeks of Europe, Asia, and Egypt have become either immediate or federate subjects of Rome. Their literature, therefore, on this grounds, claims the attention of the student of Roman history, but still more because many Greek writers busied themselves with the history and antiquities of their new mistress. Polybius is the first and most famous example of a Greek writing Roman history, but under the empire Greek books on Roman subjects are numerous. Dionysus of Halicarnassus came to Rome soon after the Battle of Actium, and lived there for more than twenty years, studying Latin literature and writing in his own language on Latin subjects. While he was at Rome he associated with men of the senatorial class, and his writings are animated with republican sentiments. He continued the work of Polybius in endeavoring to reconcile his countrymen to Roman sway. Polybius had expounded the role which Rome was destined to play in history. Dionysius is concerned to show that she was worthy to play it. In his work on Roman archaeology, which he finished in 8 B.C., he seems to prove, by tracing out mythical connection between Rome and Greece, that the Romans were not really barbarians. It was a mark of gratitude for the kind treatment which he experienced at Rome. This work consisted of twenty books, but only the first eleven are preserved entire. The style is wordy and rhetorical, very unlike that of Polybius. He used good sources, but he has no appreciation of the meaning or methods of history. He even puts long rhetorical speeches into the mouths of legendary persons. He defines history as philosophy by examples. In questions of literary criticism, however, he is quite at home, and his various literary treatises, in which he shows thorough appreciation of the old masters, are of considerable value. More interesting in some ways than the literary treatise of Dionysius is that of a certain Longinus, of whom personally nothing is known. On the sublime, or more correctly, on loftiness of style, which seems to have been written in the early years of the first century A.D., it contains much enlightened and suggestive criticism. The author had some acquaintance with the Hebrew scriptures. Nicolaus of Damascus, born about 64 B.C., was a great friend of King Herod, whom he assisted in his work of Hellenism. He had been the teacher of the children of Antony and Cleopatra. He was a very prolific author, and wrote on philosophical, rhetorical, and historical subjects. His greatest work was a universal history, planned on a very large scale, which Herod stimulated him to compose. Of it we have only fragments, but his panegyrical life of Caesar, Augustus, a declamatory rather than historical work, has come down to us complete. The long Geographica of Strabo, 63 B.C. to 23 A.D., in seventeen books, is of great historical importance as giving a picture of some of the subject lands of Rome in the Augustan age. Strabo was of a good Cappadocian family, a native of Amazea, and lived at Alexandria. He came to Rome about the same time as Dionysius, but soon left it. He describes the whole known world, but in many cases his information was mainly derived from older books, and cannot be taken as representing the condition of things which prevailed in his own time. Books 1 and 2 deal with physical geography. Books 3 to 10 describe Europe. Books 11 to 16, Asia. Book 17, Africa. 
His accounts of Asia Minor and Egypt are especially valuable, as he knew these lands himself, and mentions many of his own experiences. His description of Spain is also valuable, for though he had not been there, he had evidently received recent information about it, probably at Rome. From Strabo's work we get a very distinct impression of the blessings of the Pax Augusta, and the safety which travellers now enjoyed both by sea and land. He also wrote a work entitled Historical Memoirs, in over forty books, but it has not been preserved. End of chapter 11, section 3 Recording by Kalinda, in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 4, 2009Recording by Julie von Mulligan. The Student's Roman Empire, Part One, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter Twelve, The Principate of Tiberius, Sections One to Two, Section One, Accession of Tiberius. It was generally regarded as a matter of course that Tiberius should step into the place of Augustus. The Roman world did not dream of a revolution, and it was felt that a monarchy naturally fell to him, who stood in the same relation to the now divine Augustus as Augustus himself to the divine Julius. Men universally acquiesced in the succession of Tiberius as the heir, the adopted son, the chosen cohort of the deceased emperor. But though such feelings moved men's minds, constitutionally, the empire was elective, not hereditary, and the senate and the people could, without infringing the constitution, have conferred the principate on someone wholly unconnected with the Julian family. Augustus had himself named three nobles who might possibly compete with Tiberius. Lepidus, who was equal to the position but despised it, Asinius Gallus, who might desire it, but was unequal to it, and Arantius, who was not unworthy of it, and would dare to seek it if a chance were offered. But even from Arantius, Tiberius had nothing to fear. The only possible rival seemed to be his own kinsman, his nephew Germanicus, who was absent in Gaul, and Agrippa Posthumus, who was still pined in the island to which his grandfather had banished him. The unlucky Agrippa was slain by his gauler immediately after the death of Augustus, and there can be no doubt that the order for his execution was given either by Tiberius or by Livia. When the death of Augustus was announced, Tiberius, by virtue of the tribunitian power which he had received in the preceding year for an indefinite period, convoked the Senate. He had already given the watchword to the Praetorian cohorts, and sent dispatches to the legions as if he were formerly emperor. It is not quite clear whether this was formally an act of usurpation, for it might have been held that the proconsular imperium, which Tiberius possessed before the death of Augustus, having been bestowed by a decree of the Senate, and not being merely derived from the imperium of the princeps, did not cease on the death of the princeps. In any case, the act seemed an anticipation of his election to the principate, and Tiberius afterwards made a sort of apology for it to the Senate. But senate and people, consuls and prefects, took an oath of obedience to him without a sign of hesitation. The proconsular imperium was renewed or confirmed, and the various rights which had been granted to Augustus by separate enactments were conferred upon him, doubtless by single comprehensive law, lex de imperio. Tiberius, indeed, Adopting the maxims of statecraft which he had learned from his predecessor, feigned reluctance to assume the immense task of directing such a vast empire, and suggested that the functions of government should be divided among more than one ruler. But it was easily seen that the suggestion was not intended seriously. 
It was part of the transparent comedy which was played henceforward between the Senate and the Princeps. It is important to observe that the practice adopted by Augustus of assuming the empire for a defined period of years was now abandoned. On the other hand, Tiberius would not assume it for life. No term was fixed, but he intimated his intention of resigning the principate when the state no longer needed him. Here again no one took his words and seriously meant. The first care of Tiberius was the funeral and deification of Augustus. The dead body was borne by senators to the Campus Martius, where it was burned and the ashes were bestowed in the imperial mausoleum. Funeral orations were pronounced both by Tiberius and by his son Drusus. The senate decreed temples and priests to the divus Augustus, who was thus raised to place beside his father, the divus Julius. His will, which had been deposited in the charge of the vessel virgins, was read before the senate and thus published abroad. It bequeathed two-thirds of his fortune to Tiberius, and the remainder to Livia, who was to be adopted into the Julian family and bear the name Augusta. If these heirs failed, one-third of the property was to descend to Drusus, the son of Tiberius, and the remainder to Germanicus and his three sons. But these legacies were considerably diminished by the large donations which were left to the citizens and to the praetorian and legionary soldiers. Along with his fortune, the old emperor bequeathed, in his Brivarium Imperi, some councils of government. He deprecated the admission of provincials to the privileged position of Roman citizens. He condemned the further extension of the frontiers of Roman dominion, and he advised that as many men of ability as possible should be engaged in the administration of public affairs. It seems probable that the second of these councils specially regarded the conquest of Transrhenan in Germany, and we shall see how Tiberius acted on it. Section 2. Germanicus on the Rhine the first weeks of the reign of Tiberius were disturbed by mutinies in the Rhine and Danube armies. Discontent had long been smouldering, and had only been hindered from bursting forth by respect for the old emperor. The soldiers who defended the German frontiers contrasted the hardships which they were obliged to endure in harsh climates and remote regions, the small pay which they received, the unduly long term of service, and the inadequate provision awaiting them at its expiration, with the easy life and the higher pay of the Praetorian guards, who could look forward to gifts of land in Italy itself. On the news of the death of Augustus, mutinies broke out simultaneously on the Danube and on the Rhine. The Pannonian army, consisting of three legions, under the command of Julius Blasius, threw off the authority of their general, and demanded that a term of service should be reduced from twenty to sixteen years, and that the veterans should receive their pensions in money. Blasius was forced to send a son to Rome, to bear these demands to the new emperor, and in the meantime the troops vented their pent-up wrath on the centurions, whom they most detested, and refused to perform their military duties. Tiberius dispatched some Praetorian cohorts under his son Drusus to treat with the mutineers and restore order, but sent no definite message of concession. The soldiers were enraged when they discovered that Drusus was instructed to evade rather than comply with their demands, and the young prince was with difficulty rescued from their fury. But an eclipse of the moon opportunely took place. The superstitious soldiers were alarmed, and, seized with a fit of remorse, they listened to the indefinite promises of Drusus, and returned to their allegiance. 
the ringleaders were given up and put to death. The revolt of the Rhine legions was a more serious danger. In Pannonia there was no question of setting up a rival emperor, but this danger existed on the Rhine. Germanicus Caesar, governor of Gaul and general of the Eight Legions stationed on the German frontier, was marked out as the successor of Tiberius, his adoptive father, and the troops of Lower Germany conceived the design of hastening his reign. They not only demanded shorter service, higher pay, and lighter labor, but proclaimed their intention of carrying Germanicus to Rome, and making him emperor. Germanicus was at the time absent in Lugodunum, occupied with the census of Gaul. Aulus Sicina, an experienced officer, was in command of the legions of the lower province, while Upper Germany had been assigned to Sicilius. When the news reached Germanicus, he hastened to his camp on the Lower Rhine, which lay in the land of the Ubi, and appeared in the presence of the mutineers. An exciting scene then took place, the soldiers beseeching their popular commander to right their wrongs, showing him the marks of their wounds and stripes, finally urging him to march to Rome and seize the sovereign power. Germanicus expostulating and praising the virtues of Tiberius, the excitement reached such a pitch that it was necessary to withdraw the general from the presence of the troops. It was a critical moment. The mutineers talked of destroying the town of the Ubi, Obidum Obiorum, and plundering the cities of Gaul. The German foes beyond the Rhine would not fail to take advantage speedily of the broken discipline of the army. To restore order, Germanicus was forced to concede, in the name of Tiberius, the demands of the troops. He promised that the terms of service should be shortened, and that large donatives should be distributed. The legions then returned to their winter quarters, two under Germanicus to Opidum Ubiorum, the other two under the legatus Aulus Secina to Castra Vetra. But at this moment messengers arrived from Rome for the purpose of investigating the causes of the discontent, and when the soldiers saw that concessions might fail to be ratified, the mutiny broke out more furiously than ever. Germanicus decided that his wife and children should leave the camp. It does not appear that he apprehended any serious danger on their account, for no measures were taken to conceal their flight. They departed in broad daylight, and in view of the whole camp. The side of Agrippina carrying in her arms the little boy Gaius, who had been born and reared in the camp, and whom they had nicknamed Caligula, Boots, from the Caligule or military boots which they made him wear in sport, moved their hearts to remorse. The memory of her father Agrippa, her grandfather Augustus, her father-in-law Drusus, stirred their pride, and when they learned that her destination was the city of the Treveri, jealousy prompted them to make peace with their general. Germanicus seized on the propitious moment to work on their softened feelings, and recalled him to their duty. They fell on their knees before him, begged for forgiveness, and zealously delivered their ringleaders to punishment. It seems likely that this scene was expressly devised by Germanicus, as a last resource for appealing to the noble sentiment of the insurgents. Thus was the danger averted in the Ubing camp. In Castra Vetra, the skillful management of the experienced Seikina restored discipline, while at Mugontiacum, the agitators who tried to stir to rebellion the army of the upper province seemed to have totally failed. The only peril which threatened the succession of Tiberius was thus hindered, and for this he had to thank the unshaken fidelity of his nephew. Germanicus had refused to listen when the troops tempted him to disloyalty. He declined to take the flood of the tide, 
which might have led him to fortune. If he had marched to Rome at the head of the Germanic legions, he would have plunged the state once more in civil war. But it is not certain that he would have been the survivor. Germanicus was a man of considerable ability, and his affable manners and urbanity won him friends everywhere. In the camp he associated freely with the soldiers, and they idolized him. He had his father's gift of making himself popular, but he had not his father's genius. It was his dream, however, to restore the work which Drusus had so brilliantly begun, and carry the eagles of Rome once more to the Albus. Immediately after the suppression of the mutiny, the young Caesar decided to employ the discontented legions, who were themselves anxious for active service. Hostilities against the Germans had been slumbering for the past few years, but no treaty had been made since the defeat of Varus, so that in making a sudden incursion the Romans were formally justified. It had been questioned why Sir Germanicus was not exceeding his powers in taking the offence without the express permission of the emperor. But as he had been entrusted by Augustus with his large command for the purpose of conducting the war and defending the frontier against the Germans, it must clearly have been left to his discretion when he might advance and when he should retire. In the late autumn, 14 A.D., the legions and cohorts of the lower province crossed the Rhine, cut their way through the Silver Caesar, and through the rampart which Tiberius had constructed after the Varian disaster as the limes of Roman territory. Thus they reached the land of Damasi, who dwelt between the rivers which are now called Lippi and Ruhr. Zekina advanced in front with some light cohorts to reconnoitre and clear the way. It was discovered that the Marti were to spend the night in solemn festivities, and when the Romans approached their villages after sunset, the inhabitants, unsuspicious and inebriated, offered an easy prey. The legions were divided into four wedges cunei, which devastated the country for fifty miles with fire and sword, sparing neither sex nor rage. The holy places of the Marci, especially the sacred precinct of the deity Tamphana, were levelled with the ground. The fate of the Marci roused to arms neighbouring tribes, the Bructuri, who lived northward, the Tubantes, who dwelt on the Rura, Rur, and the Eusepetes between the Lapia and the Manus. They stationed themselves in the woods through which the Romans had to return, but the zeal of the legions and the skill of the commander shook off the enemy, and the winter quarters were safely reached. The revolt on the lower Rhine had caused serious anxiety at Rome, and especially to Tiberius, coming as it did in conjunction with the mutiny in Pannonia. The Pannonic army was nearer Italy. On the other hand, the Germanic army was far larger, and the emperor, uncertain in which of the camps his presence was more needful, and afraid of giving the preference to either, ended by remaining in Rome and watching the issue of events. The news that Germanicus had quelled the mutiny was a great relief, but it was suspected that the military success which he gained in his brief campaign was not so agreeable to Tiberius. If so, the emperor dissembled his jealousy, praised the achievement of his nephew in the presence of the senate, and granted him the honour of a triumph. The following year was marked by two distinct invasions of Germany, which, however, hung closely together and were parts of a common design. Of all the German tribes, the Cherusci, the tribe of Arminius, was the most formidable and the most hostile. They had been the leaders in the fight for freedom, which ended in the Varian disaster. Against them, above all others, policy and revenge excited the spirit of Germanicus. 
His plan was to prevent his neighboring peoples from assisting them, and then attack them alone. Their most powerful neighbors were the Keti, and the first expedition was directed against them. 1. In the spring the four legions of the Lower Rhine crossed the river from Castra Vetra, under the command of Seikina, who was to prevent the tribes in that quarter, especially the Marsi and the Karaski, from marching to aid the Keti. Seikina's army was augmented by bands of the cis nine German tribes, Batavians, Ubi, Sugambri. Meanwhile, Germanicus himself, at the head of the four legions of the Upper Rhine, advanced into the territory of Mount Taunus, and attacked the Catti so suddenly that no serious resistance could be made. Their fortress Matium was destroyed. By this means, the Catti were prevented from making common cause with the Karaski. That people was distracted at this time by domestic discords. The Gestes, was invoking the help of the Romans against his enemy and son-in-law Arminius, the hero of the Teutoburg forest. The messengers of Segestes reached Germanicus as he was returning to the Rhine, and besought him to relieve their master, who was blockaded by his enemies. The Roman army retraced their steps, entered the borders of the Kiroski, and delivered their rally, who was able in return, to restore some of the spoils of Pharaohs, and hand over some important hostages, among Caesar's daughter, Ciselda, the wife of Arminius. That warrior, infuriated at the capture of his wife, left nothing undone to stir up the passions of his nation, and he succeeded in winning over in Guoma, an influential noble who had hitherto sided with the Romans. 2. Germanicus and Sekina, who had signally defeated the Marsi, having returned to the Rhine, prepared for a grand expedition against the enemy, conceived on the same plan which Drusus had formerly adopted with success. The army was divided in three parts. Sekina led his legions through the land of the Bructory to the banks of the upper Armisia, Germanicus and the four legions of the upper province embark to coast along the shore of the North Sea, and enter the river at its mouth, while the cavalry under Peter Albinovinus, the poet, march to the same goal through the land of the Frisii. Successfully united, the combined army laid waste far and wide the land between the Armisia and the Lepia. Here they were near the Saltus Tentobergiensis, where the remains of Varus and his legions lay unburied, and Germanicus could not resist the desire of visiting the spot, erecting a mound over the white bones, and honouring with funeral rites the slaughtered Romans. The lowly and melancholy scene produced a deep impression on the legions, but they were soon required to extricate themselves from a trip similar to that which had ensnared the Varian army. Arminius had hidden his forces in the forest, and the Romans had not secured themselves sufficiently against surprise. But Germanicus and Sekina were more skilful than Varus, and though he did not defeat the enemy, he retreated to Amidia with some difficulty. The return to his Rhine was not easy. The cavalry of Pedo reached their quarters without mischance. But the country through which the way of Sikina lay was heavy and marshy, and the Germans of Arminius and Inguima sought to surround him as they had surrounded Pharaohs. The experienced Sikina was cool and collected in these perils, and knew how to maintain discipline but he might have failed to extricate his army, but for a false move of the foe. The Germans had made a successful attack on the cavalry and baggage of the Romans, and, elated by their luck, proceeded, contrary to the counsels of Arminius, to assault the Roman camp. Waiting until they had reached the rampart, Sikina suddenly threw open the gates, and poured out his troops on the besiegers. The Germans suffered a decisive defeat. Inguima was severely wounded, 
and the Romans were able to proceed on their way. A false rumour of their destruction had gone before them to Castrovetra, and it was proposed to there to break down the Rhine Bridge, but the humanity and courage of Agrippina saved the means of retreat for the fugitive army. She stood at the head of the bridge, and would not move until the remnant should reach it, and she was repaid by seeing the arrival of the four legions, safe and whole. The return of Germanicus himself was attended with ill luck and serious losses. He found it necessary to light in his ships amid the shallow waters of the Phrygian coast, and disembarked two legions, directing them to march along the shore. The treacherous equinoctial tides swept away a large number of the soldiers and much of their baggage. On the whole, the campaign could hardly be regarded as a success. The dangers and losses of the return march threw a cloud over the expedition, and Tiberius had some reason to murmur at the little results obtained at such expense. The advantages won by Germanicus were only momentary, for he had done nothing to effect a permanent occupation of the country which he had laid waste. He had built no fort, and established no lines of communication. His wisdom in visiting the battlefield of Paris was open to question. Tiberius, naturally distrustful, nourished some jealousy and perhaps fear of his popular nephew and there were enemies of Germanicus at Rome who were eager to encourage such feelings. But the emperor had not yet decided to interfere with the plans of Germanicus for the subjugation of Germany, and he professed to regard the achievements of the year as worthy of a triumph. He seems not to have fully made up his mind yet whether the conquest of Germany was really desirable or its permanent occupation possible. The next and last campaign of Germanicus, 16 A.D., was planned on a larger scale. This time he hoped to reach the Albis and break the last resistance of the Karaski. A fleet of one thousand ships was collected, where the Rhine broadens and branches into the Verhalis, and the whole army embarked and sailed down the Fossa Drusiana, while Germanicus invoked the spirit and recalled the memory of his father. Before starting, he had taken the precaution to send his lecitus, C. Silius, to make a demonstration against the Catti, and had himself, with six legions, marched up the valley of Lupia, to secure strongholds and make provisions for the return of his army. The fleet reached the mouth of Amidia safely, and, leaving the ships anchored and guarded, the Romans advanced in a south-eastern direction to the banks of the Visurgis, where the Germans, prepared for their coming, had concentrated their forces under the leadership of the indefatigable Arminius. Here, at length, the Roman invader and the champion of German freedom were to fairly try their strength in a field of battle. The reserved historian Tacitus rises to the occasion as he describes the campaign which decided both the destinies of Germany and the fortunes of his hero Germanicus. He embellishes his Germaniad with tales which have a ring of legend and throw over the young general a halo of romance which his deeds hardly deserved. The colloquy of Arminius and his renegade brother Flavius standing on the opposite banks of the Visurgis, is, if not true, well imagined. Flavius had lost an eye in the service of the Romans, and Arminius, when he had inquired and learned the cause of the disfigurement, asked, What was I reward? I received, said Flavius, increase of pay, a gold chain and crown, and other military distinctions, vile badges of slavery, sneered his brother. Flavius continued to praise the greatness of Rome and the emperor, while Arminius appealed to ancestral freedom and the national gods of Germany. At length such bitter words were bandied, and the wrath of the brothers rose so high 
that they were about to plunge into the stream and grip each other in mortal struggle. But the Romans intervened and dragged flavors from the bank. The night adventure of Germanicus has the same epic flavor as the converse of the German brethren. The Romans crossed the Visurgis in the face of the enemy, who had retreated into the recesses of a sacred wood, and news was brought that Arminius contemplated a night attack on the Roman camp. Tacitus tells us how Germanicus, like our own Henry V, was seized with the desire to ascertain the spirit of his soldiers, and how for this purpose he disguised himself, and with his skin over his shoulders, attended by one companion, he went round to camp and listened to near the tents. He was pleased to hear his own praises loudly sung, and to observe that the men were eager to punish the perfidious foe. As he traversed the camp, a German horseman rode up to the rampart, and in the Latin tongue invited deserters in the name of Arminius, with promises of lands, wives, and a daily sum of money. Scornful was the answer, Let the day break, let battle begin, we will ourselves seize your wives and lands. The battle was fought in the plain of Edistaviso, which probably lies to the south of the port of Westphalica on the right bank of the Visurgis. The Germans had occupied the lower slopes of the mountains, and were protected in the rear by wood, unencumbered with brushwood, and thus offering an easy retreat. The Karaski placed themselves on the higher hills, intending to rush down upon the Romans in the midst of the battle. While the legions and auxiliaries advanced to attack the German position in the open plain, Germanicus sent a body of cavalry round to outflank the enemy and fall on their rear. This movement was completely successful. The German forces, which were stationed in the wood, were driven out of their cover into the plain, while at the same time the ranks which were drawn up in the plain were beaten back before the onset of the legions into the wood. The confusion was increased by the Karaski, who were forced by the attack of the cavalry, to descend from the hills into the midst of the battle. Arminius essayed bravely to sustain the fight, but he and his fellows were surrounded by the Roman forces, and their doom seemed sealed. Arminius, however, and Ingurma managed to escape, perhaps owing to the treachery of some German auxiliaries. The rest were slain. This decisive victory was gained by the Romans without any serious loss. The soldier saluted Tiberius as Imperator, and directed the trophy of the arms of the enemy, subscribing the names of the conquered nations. The defeated and dejected Germans were, it is said, preparing to cross the Albus and leave their country to the victor, but this trophy excited their rage and decided them to make another desperate attempt. It may be suspected, however, that the battle of Edisaviso was less decisive than it has been represented. In any case, the enemy once more collected large forces, and occupied a place protected by woods and a deep swamp, and on one side by an old rampart. But Germanicus discovered their position, and did not fall into the trap. He attacked them on the side of the earthwork, and forced his way into the small space in which they were thickly packed together. Their position was desperate. They retreated, and they must perish in the march, and with a long sword they could sustain no equal combat with the legions at such close quarters. Germanicus, it is said, was in the thickest of the fray, crying that the Germans must be exterminated. But the barbarians fought it well. Armenians escaped, and the cavalry engagement was indecisive. At nightfall, the Romans returned to their camp, victorious indeed, but without having exterminated or routed the foe. The angry Vari were the only tribe who sued for peace. Germanicus erected a second trophy, which it told how the army of Tiberius Caesar, 
having subdued all the nations between the Rhine and the Albus, dedicated this monument to Mars, and Jupiter, and Augustus. It was now the middle of summer, and Germanicus, notwithstanding his successes, resolved to retrace his steps. Some of the legions returned by land, others by sea on the ships which awaited them at the mouth of the Amisia. The voyage was disastrous, owing to the violent gales which agitate the North Sea in the autumn season. The fleet was scattered, and Germanicus himself wrecked on the shore of the Corsi. The losses, however, were not so great as was at first thought, and on his return to the Rhine, some successes gained against the Marsi and the Catti partly restored the spirit of the troops, which the sea disaster had damped and the loss of the captured eagles of Ares were recovered. Germanicus deemed that he was now near the goal of his ambition. One more campaign would suffice, he thought, for the complete subjugation of Germany. But destiny decreed, and Tiberius judged otherwise. It is clear enough that the victories of the last campaign were far less important and complete than Tacitus has tried to make some out. Their results were only temporary, and the emperor, perhaps wisely, decided that no abiding result was likely to be achieved by Germanicus. There was indeed reason for disappointment. Nothing had been accomplished in proportion to the magnitude of the expeditions. Accordingly, Tiberius offered the consulship to his nephew, and this was equivalent to a recall. How far the sovereign was influenced by a lurking jealousy of the popular general, how far he deemed it inexpedient that a close connection between Germanicus and the Rhine army should continue, we cannot say. But it is only fair to point out that the recall of Germanicus can be completely explained by political considerations without taking into account any personal motives. Tiberius may have come to the conclusion that annual invasions of Germany were too slow and costly a method of winning the new province, even though it were certain that this method must ultimately succeed. A different policy was suggested by the intestine feuds of the barbarians. If the Romans retired from the field, a deadly contest must soon take place between the Saxon and the Swavian tribes, and when the enemy had enfeebled themselves in domestic war, the Romans might step in and take possession of their country. This was a plausible policy, and was perhaps seriously entertained by Tiberius. But it is possible that he had really come to regard the advance to the Albus as a visionary idea which it would not be expedient to realize. If the Rhine troops changed their station to the banks of the Albus, would not another army be required to watch Gaul, and would the state be able to support another army? These were the questions which a statesman had to consider, and they may have decided Tiberius, as they seem to have decided Augustus, that the Rhine was roughly the limit. In any case, financial considerations had probably much to do with the disappointment of the dreams of Germanicus. From the year 17 A.D. forward, we never find one man uniting under his single authority both the government of the Gallic provinces and the command of the Germanic armies. Henceforward, the three provinces of Gaul are administered by three Praetorian governors, and the two frontier districts, Upper and Lower Germany, are kept strictly separate under two consular legati, who are always up to the time of Hadrian, strictly military commanders, the Gadi Exercitus Inferioris et Superioris, not Ligadi Provinciae, though often loosely spoken of as such. The financial administration of these military districts was at first combined with that of Belgica, like that of Numidia with Africa. It is to be observed that for many years yet the province of Lower Germany extended beyond the Rhine and as far as the Lower Amisia. The young general celebrated a brilliant triumph. 
26th of May, 17 A.D., over the conquered nations between the Rhine and Albus. The Snelta, the wife of Arminius, with her infant son Semelicus, whom she had borne in captivity, was among the captives who adorned the procession. It is said that in the midst of the festivities people felt a gloomy presentiment, comparing the young Caesar with his father Drusus and his uncle Marcellus, who, like him, had been so popular, but had died so early. Brave and unlucky, they said, have been the loves of the Roman people. After his triumph, Germanicus was appointed to an honourable mission in the east. At the same time, his cousin Drusus was sent to Illyricum to observe the course of affairs in northern Europe. Arminius and his Kiroski, with their Saxon federates, having no longer to oppose the invasions of the Romans, hastened to deal with the Swaven state in the south, over which Maribodius held sway with the title of king. It will be remembered that this chief had refused to join Arminius after the defeat of Varus. He was an admirer of Roman civilization, having spent part of his youth in Rome, and he tried to introduce Roman manners and government among his countrymen. Throughout the struggle for freedom, he had remained persistently neutral. The centre of his power and his palace lay in Boyohaemon, but he was recognised as the head of a large and loose wavy confederacy. Of these tribes, the Semnones and Langobardi deserted his cause on the first attack of the Karaski. On the other hand, the Karaskan in Guiomir went over to Maribodius. A decisive battle was fought, in which the Swavians were defeated, and many more of his allies deserted the Swavi king, who then applied for aid to his Roman emperor. Tiberius immediately sent Drusus to confirm peace, perhaps really to effect the downfall of Maribodius. The unlucky king was finally overthrown, and driven from his realm by Catuelda, chief of the Gadones, a people who lived on the lower Vistula. They invaded the land of the Marcomanni, and stormed the town and stronghold of Maribodius, who was forced to flee to the refuge of the empire and throw himself on the emperor's mercy. Ravenna was assigned to him as a dwelling-place, where Tilsnelda and her son had been also doomed to live. It was a curious historical coincidence that the city of the marshes, which was destined five centuries later to be the capital of the great German hero, the Ostrogothic King Theodoric, should have been selected as the habitation of Maribodius, his predecessor, in attempting to spread Roman ideas among his countrymen. Maribodius lived eighteen years at Ravenna, vainly expecting to be restored to power, he had the satisfaction to see Catuelda overthrown, and like himself seeking a refuge from the Romans. He had the satisfaction to see his younger rival Arminius succumb to the guile of a domestic enemy, 21 A.D. After the defeat of the Swavians, the hero of Germany had been false himself to the freedom for which he had fought, and tried to establish a monarchical power. He was undoubtedly, says the Roman historian, the deliverer of Germany, and not one of those who attacked the Roman people at the beginning of its power, but when it was at the height of its prosperity. He lost battles, but in war he was unconquered. He died at the age of thirty-seven in the twelfth year of his power, and he is still sung among the barbarians, although to the annals of the Greeks he is unknown and among the Romans, not as celebrated as he deserves. End of chapter 12, section 1 to 2Chapter 12, Section 3 to 4. Section 3 Germanicus in the East, 
His Death and the Trial of Piso In the East several affairs demanded the attention of the government, but not so imperatively as to require an extraordinary command like that which Tiberius assigned to Germanicus after his triumph. The dependent principalities of Cappadocia, Comagene, and Cilicia Aspera had to be transformed into provinces. For Archelaus of Cappadocia had been recalled to Rome, and informed that he had ceased to reign, while the peoples of Comagene and Cilicia had, on the death of their princes, begged for a direct Roman government. The inhabitants of Judea and Syria were murmuring loudly at the heavy taxation, and demanding a reduction. New difficulties had also arisen with the Parthian kingdom. Vonones, the son of Phraates IV, who had been kept by Augustus as a hostage and brought up at Rome, was elected to the throne by the Parthians after the death of their king. He did not, however, reign long. His Roman manners gave offense, and he was forced to surrender his throne to Artabanus of Media and fly to Seleucia. The Armenian throne was at this moment vacant, and the people accepted the fugitive Vonones as their sovereign. But Artabanus, who could not endure the rule of his rival in a neighboring kingdom, called upon them to surrender him. Meanwhile, Salanus, legatus of Syria, got possession of the person of Vonones and detained him in Syria. All these affairs might have been arranged by ordinary imperial legati, but Tiberius may have had a good reason for sending a near kinsman and a Caesar invested with special powers and representing the imperial majesty, to deal with the eastern countries, where pomp always produces its effect. Such a plan had been successful before, when Gaius Caesar received a like mission from Augustus. The sphere of the command of Germanicus was all the provinces beyond the Hellespont. He traveled thither at leisurely speed, visiting Nicopolis, Athens, and Lesbos on his way, and lingering in the cities of the Hellespont. The affairs of Armenia he arranged without difficulty, and established friendly relations with the Parthian king. The favor of the Armenians inclined to Zeno, son of Polemo, former king of Pontus, who had been brought up as an Armenian from his infancy, and was popular by his excellence as a huntsman and a trencherman. Germanicus visited the city of Artaxia, and solemnly crowned Zeno there under the royal name of Artaxes. This arrangement also satisfied Artabanus, who regarded Venones as the Roman candidate, and had put forward his own son, Orodes, as the Parthian candidate. The election of Artaxes was a satisfactory compromise, and Artabanus sent a courteous message to the Roman general, proposing a personal meeting on the Euphrates, and only requiring him to remove Venones from Syria so as to prevent communications with the disaffected party in Persia. Germanicus readily acceded to the request, and Venones was removed to Pompeiopolis in Cilicia. Thus, excellent relations were established between the Roman and the Parthian powers, and continued to exist during the lifetime of our taxis, until the last years of the reign of Tiberius. Cappadocia and Comagene were at the same time incorporated in the provincial system, and thus the direct rule of Rome extended now to the Euphrates. Germanicus had speedily and satisfactorily accomplished the main object of his mission, but he had other difficulties to contend with. It was not the intention of Tiberius that the ample authority of the young Caesar should be as completely unchecked in the east as it had been in the north. Consequently, Salanus, who was a personal friend of Germanicus, was replaced as proconsul of Syria by C. Calpurnius Piso, a proud, self-asserting nobleman, who would not hesitate to hold his own against his superior. The position of Pisa was strengthened, and his independent spirit, encouraged by the bonds of intimacy which existed between his wife Plancina and the emperor's mother Livia. The dissensions of Piso and Germanicus were doubtless embittered by the rivalry of Plancina and Agrippina. Piso had been instructed to lead or send a portion of the Syrian army to join Germanicus in Armenia. He disobeyed this command, and the ill feeling between the Caesar and the legatus became very bitter. It is not clear why Germanicus did not invoke the intervention of the emperor, but instead of asserting his authority in Syria, he made an excursion to Egypt, not for any political purpose, but from a curiosity to visit the antiquities of the land. This expedition was imprudent in two ways. 
for it left the field clear to Piso, and it violated the law of Augustus, that no senator should set foot on Egyptian soil without the express permission of the emperor. On returning to Syria, Germanicus found that Piso had disregarded and overthrown his own regulations. This discovery roused him into asserting his authority, and Piso prepared to leave the province. Suddenly, Germanicus fell ill at Antioch, and Piso postponed his departure. The attendants of Germanicus suspected and circulated their suspicions that poison had been administered to him by Piso or his wife. Messages inquiring after the health of the prince arrived from Piso, who was lingering at Seleucia. But Germanicus, distrustful of their genuineness, wrote a letter to the governor, renouncing his friendship and commanding him, perhaps, to leave the province. Piso sailed to Cos, and there received the news of his rival's death, 19 A.D., Germanicus himself believed that he was the victim of foul play, for on his deathbed he charged his friends to prosecute Piso and Plancina, and his friends determined that he should be avenged. Agrippina, with her children and the ashes of her husband, immediately set sail for Rome. The staff of the dead prince chose C. Sentius Saturninus to take charge of Syria until a new governor should be appointed. Piso, however, determined to make a bold attempt to resume his command in that province, and for this purpose collected some troops in Cilicia. But Sentius was victorious in an engagement, and besieged Piso in the Cilician fortress of Selenderis. The ex-governor was finally forced to submit and take ship for Rome, where an unpleasant reception awaited him. The feelings of sympathy awakened by the death of Germanicus were intense, both in the provinces and at Rome. Triumphal arches were erected in his honor, and his statues were set up in cities. Inscriptions recorded that he had died for the Republic. Correspondingly bitter was the rage felt against Piso and Plancina, who were generally believed to have been guilty. Nor were there wanting hints and murmurs that Tiberius himself and Livia were privy to the supposed crime of Piso and Plancina. It was thought that Tiberius regarded his nephew with jealousy and hatred, and rejoiced at his death, and it was apparently this idea that encouraged Piso to act as he had done. The reserve of Tiberius in regard to the funeral ceremonies of Germanicus, at which he and Livia were not present, was interpreted in the same way and the emperor even went so far as to show displeasure at the excess of the public lamentations. He issued a characteristic edict, enjoining on the people to observe some moderation in their sorrow. Princes are mortal, the republic is eternal. Resume your business, resume your pleasures, he added, for the Megalesian games approached. By this contempt for popular sentiment, Tiberius, it has been remarked, was sowing the seeds of a long and deep misunderstanding between himself and his people. Men contrasted the behavior of Augustus on the death of Drusus. But the emperor had no intention of protecting Piso, who had been guilty of the serious offense of trying to recover a province from which he had been dismissed by a superior in authority. The friends of Germanicus vied in undertaking the prosecution, but it was hard to find advocates to plead the cause of Piso. His friends wished the accused to come before the tribunal of the emperor, but Tiberius did not like to undertake the decision of such a delicate case, and he referred the judgment of it to the Senate. He opened the proceedings in the Senate House in a very impartial speech. The charges of political misconduct were clearly proven but the charge of having made attempts on the life of Germanicus by magic and poison broke down. The senators, however, who in general sympathized with Germanicus, felt convinced that the prince's death had been due to foul play, while the political offenses of the culprit weighed with Tiberius. At the close of the second day of the trial, Piso saw in the cold look of the emperor that his doom was fixed. His conclusion was confirmed by the behavior of his wife Plancina, who had pleaded for him with the Empress Livia, but, as his chance of escape seemed to grow less, tried to sever her own cause from his. He anticipated the sentence by piercing his throat with his sword. The Senate expunged his name from the Fasti and banished his eldest son for ten years, but Tiberius interfered to mitigate the sentence of the Senate, and conceded Piso's property to his son. The influence of Livia shielded Plancina from prosecution. 
Thus ended a domestic tragedy. It must be observed that even if it were certain that Germanicus was the victim of foul play, there is not the smallest reason to suspect that the emperor was in any way concerned, as malicious rumors hinted. But there is no proof, and there can be no certainty, that the death of Germanicus was brought about by unfair practices of Piso or his wife. Another malicious report which gained belief was that Piso had not died by his own hand, but had been assassinated by the orders of the emperor. The qualities of Germanicus have been painted in such bright colors by the great Roman historian, who has recorded his career, that we cannot help feeling deeply prepossessed in his favor. He appears as one of the ideal heroes who die young. But it is not clear that he would have become a great man if he had lived. His exploits have been exaggerated by the enthusiasm of his admirers. Tacitus, with more regard to art than truth, has selected him as the brilliant hero to set beside the dark figure of Tiberius. Germanicus is generous and virtuous, Tiberius suspicious and stained with crime. The uncle is the ideal tyrant, the nephew is the magnanimous prince. This picture of Tacitus in some measure reflects the general feeling which seems to have prevailed on the death of the popular Germanicus. Tiberius was misunderstood and maligned. The virtues of the son of Drusus were exaggerated. In the year 16 A.D. a plot was detected, which, though not of a formidable nature, attracted considerable attention. It shows that there was dissatisfaction in patrician circles, and illustrates the character of Tiberius. A young man named Libo Drusus, of the Scribonian family, was accused of revolutionary projects. Scribonia, the second wife of Augustus, was his great-aunt, Livia was his aunt, and he was the grandson of Sextus Pompeius through his mother. These connections with the imperial house seem to have turned his brain and suggested perilous ideas, which were encouraged by a senator named Fermius Catus, who was his intimate friend. Catus induced him to consult Chaldean astrologers and dabble in magic rites, practices which were then very dangerous, as they were regarded as a presumption of treasonable designs. He also treacherously led Drusus into extravagance and debt. Having collected sufficient proofs of guilt, Catus sent a messenger to the emperor, craving an audience and mentioning the name of the accused. Tiberius refused the request, saying that any further communications might be conveyed to him in the same way. Meanwhile, he distinguished his cousin Libo by conferring the praetorship on him, and often inviting him to table, showing no unfriendliness either in word or look, but he kept himself carefully informed of the daily conduct of the suspected man. At length, a certain Junius, whom Libo had tampered with for the purpose of invoking the dead by incantations, gave information to a noted informer, Fulcinius Trio, who immediately went to the consuls and demanded an investigation before the Senate. Libo, meanwhile, knowing his peril, arrayed himself in mourning, and accompanied by some ladies of high rank, went round the houses of his relatives entreating their intervention. But all refused on various pretexts. When the Senate met, Tiberius read out the indictment and the accusers' names with such calmness as to seem neither to soften nor to aggravate the charges. Some of them were of a ridiculous nature, for example, he was accused of having considered whether he would ever have wealth enough to cover the Appian Road as far as Brundusium with money. But there was one paper in which the names of Caesars and Senators occurred with mysterious and therefore suspicious signs annexed. Libo denied the handwriting, and the slaves who professed to recognize it were examined by torture. As an old decree of the Senate forbade the evidence of slaves to be taken in cases affecting their master's life, Tiberius evaded the law by ordering the slaves to be sold singly to the actor publicus, or agent of the errarium, so that Libo might be tried on their testimony. The accused begged for an adjournment till the following day. On going home he committed suicide, seeing that his case was hopeless. Tiberius said that he would have interceded for him, guilty though he was, if he had not destroyed himself. Libo's property was divided among the accusers, and some of the senators proposed decrees of reflecting on his memory, for example, that no Scribonian should bear the name of Drusus, in order to please Tiberius. Days of public thanksgiving were appointed, and it was decreed that the day on which Libo killed himself should be observed as a festival. 
such sycophancy on the part of the Senate became in later times a matter of course. Section 4. Rebellions in the Provinces and Dependencies We must glance at the troublesome, though unimportant, war, which was waged at this time on the southern borders of the empire, and at the career of Tacfarinus, who played in Africa the same part which the more famous Arminius played in the north. This Numidian had served in the Roman army, and had thus gained a knowledge of Roman discipline and military science. He then deserted, placed himself at the head of a band of robbers, and was finally elected as their leader by the Musulami, who dwelt on the southern side of Mount Orasius. The insurrection was not confined to these peoples of Numidia. It spread westward into Mauritania and eastward to the Garamantes. The discipline and drill which Tacfarinus enforced rendered the rising formidable, for his organized bands were able to give battle and attempt sieges. The commanders whom the Senate elected by lot were incompetent to deal with the insurgents, and the resulting war was protracted for seven years, 17 to 24 A.D. The single legion which protected Africa was reinforced by a second from Pannonia, and by the emperor's intervention an able proconsul, Q. Junius Blesses, was at length appointed. Tacfarinus had demanded from Tiberius a grant of territory for himself and his rebel army. Tiberius haughtily refused, and instructed Blasus to hold out to other chiefs who supported Tacfarinus the prospect of a free pardon if they laid down their arms. Many surrendered, and then Blasus attempted to meet Tacfarinus by tactics similar to his own. He divided his army into three columns, one of which he dispatched eastward under Cornelius Scipio to act against the Garamantes and protect Leptis. In the west, the son of Blesus commanded a second column and defended the territory of Sirta, while in the center Blesus himself established a number of fortified positions and thus embarrassed the enemy, who found wherever he turned Roman soldiers in his face or on his flank or in his rear. When summer was over, Blesus continued hostilities, and by a skillful combination of forts and flying detachments of picked men, who were acquainted with the desert, he drove Tacfarinus back, step by step, and finally captured his brother and occupied the district of the Musulami, 22 A.D. Tiberius permitted the triumphal ornaments to be awarded to Blasus, and also granted him the distinction of being greeted imperator by the troops, the last occasion on which this honor was granted to a private person. But even the success of Blasus was not the end of the insurrection. There were three laureled statues at Rome for victories over the Musulamian chief, those of Camillus, Apronius, and Blasus, and yet he was still ravaging Africa, supported on the one hand by the king of the Garamantes, on the other by the Moors. His boldness was increased by the circumstance that after the campaign of Blasus, the Ninth Legion had been recalled from Africa. In 24 A.D. he laid siege to Thubersicum, a Numidian town lying a little to the north of Mount Orasius. The proconsul of the year, Publius Dolabella, immediately collected all his troops and raised the siege. Knowing by the experience of previous campaigns that it was useless to concentrate his heavy troops against an enemy which practiced such desultory warfare as Tacfarinus, Dolabella adopted the plan of Blesses and divided his forces into four columns. He also obtained reinforcements from Ptolemy, king of the Mauritanians. Presently he was informed that the Numidian marauders had taken up a position close to Ozea, Omale, a dilapidated fort surrounded by vast forests. Some light-armed infantry and squadrons of horse were immediately hurried to the place, without being told whither they were going. At daybreak they fell upon the drowsy barbarians who had no means of flight, as their horses were tethered or pasturing at a distance. The dispositions of the Romans were so complete that the enemies were slaughtered or captured without difficulty. The general was anxious to capture Tacfarinus, but that chieftain, driven to bay, escaped captivity by rushing on the weapons of his assailants. His death ended this tedious war. During this period there were also grave disturbances in Gaul and Thrace. In Gaul, the fiscal exactions had led to heavy accumulations of debt among the provincials, and the creditors pressed for payment. The provincials resorted to counsels of despair. 
a conspiracy was formed to organize a rebellion throughout the whole land and throw off the Roman yoke. The leaders were Julius Florus and Julius Sacrovir, two Romanized provincials. Florus undertook to gain over the Belgae and Treveri, while Sacrovir, who perhaps held some priestly office, intrigued among the Edui and other tribes. The secret was well kept, and the revolt broke out in western Gaul in the consulship of Tiberius and Drusus, 21 A.D., but the first rising was premature. The Andecavi and the Tyrones, whose names still live in Anjou and Tours, moved too soon, and were crushed by the garrison of Lugudunum, under Asilius Aviola, the legatus of Lugudunensis. This false move put the Romans on their guard, and the subsequent risings of the Treveri were easily foiled by the governors of the two Germanic provinces. Florus slew himself to escape capture. The Adui had seized the important city of Augustodunum, Autun, but they too were easily defeated by C. Silius, legatus of Upper Germany, at the twelfth milestone from that town. Sacrever escaped from the field to a neighboring villa, where he fell by his own hand, and his faithful comrades slew one another, having first set fire to the house. A triumphal arch was erected at Orasio, Orange, to commemorate the defeat of Sacrever. The dependent kingdom of Thrace, after the death of Rometalces, who had loyally stood by the Romans in the Dalmatian revolt, was divided between his brother Rascaporis and his son Cotus. Their jealousies and feuds, which ended in the murder of Cotus, led to Roman interference and the execution of his uncle, 19 A.D. Two years later, a formidable insurrection of the western tribes broke out. The rebels besieged Philippopolis, but were defeated by P. Vileus, the governor of Moesia. They rebelled again in 25 A.D., and of this rising we have more details. The mountaineers refused to submit to levies and to supply their bravest men to the armies of Rome. A rumor had spread that they were to be dragged from their own land to distant provinces, so that mixed with other nations they might lose their own nationality. They sent envoys to the governor of Achaea and Macedonia, Papaeus Sabinus, assuring him of their fidelity, if no fresh burden were laid upon them. Otherwise they gave him to understand that they would fight for their freedom. He gave mild answers until he had completed his preparations, but when he had concentrated his forces and was joined by a legion from Moesia and reinforcements from Rembantalces, son of Rascaporis, he advanced on the rebels who had taken up a position in some wooded defiles in the mountains, in the neighborhood of a strong fortress. Sabinus fortified a camp and occupied with a strong detachment a long, narrow mountain ridge which stretched as far as the enemy's fortress, which it was his object to capture. After some skirmishing in front of the stronghold, Sabinus moved his camp nearer, but left his Thracian allies in the former entrenchments, with strict injunctions to pass the night vigilantly within the camp, while they might harry and plunder as much as they wished in the daytime. Having observed this command for some time, they began to neglect their watches, and gave themselves up to the enjoyment of wine and sleep. Learning this, the insurgents formed two bands, of which one was to surprise the pillagers, the other to attack the Roman camp, in order to distract the attention of the soldiers. The plan was successful, and the Thracian auxiliaries were massacred. Sabinus then laid regular siege to the stronghold, and connected his positions with a ditch and a rampart. The besieged suffered terribly from thirst, and their cattle were dying for want of fodder. The air of the place was polluted with the stench of the rotting carcasses of those who had perished by wounds or thirst. In this situation, many followed the advice and example of an old man named Dimis, who surrendered himself with his wife and children to the Romans. But two young chieftains named Tarsa and Tarissus had determined to die for their freedom. Tarsa plunged his sword in his heart, and a few others did likewise. But Tarissus and his followers decided to prolong the struggle, and planned a night attack on the camp during a storm. Sabinus was prepared, and the brave barbarians were beaten back and compelled to surrender. The triumphal ornaments were decreed to Sabinus, 26 A.D. Against a revolt of tributaries on the northern boundary of the empire, the arms of Rome were not so successful. The Frisians, who had been subdued by Drusus in 12 B.C., had for forty years paid the tribute which he imposed on them. 
This tribute consisted in ox hides, which were required for military purposes, and officers who levied it never examined too curiously the size or thickness of the skins, until in 28 A.D. Olenius, a primipillar centurion who was appointed to exact the tribute, chose the hides of wild bulls as the standard. As the domestic cattle of the Germans were of small size, the Frisians found this innovation hard. In order to meet the demands of Alenius, they were forced to give up first their cattle, then their lands, finally to surrender their wives and children as pledges. As their complaints led to no redress, they rose in revolt. The soldiers who were collecting the tribute were impaled on gibbets, and Alenius himself was obliged to flee to the fortress of Flavum, probably in the island of the same name, now Fleeland, near the Texel, which was a Roman coast guard station. When the news reached L. Apronius, the governor of Lower Germany, he summoned some veteran legionaries and chose auxiliaries from the upper province to reinforce his own legions, with which he sailed down the Rhine and relieved Flavum, which the Frisians were besieging. He then constructed roads and bridges over the adjoining estuaries in order to transport his legionaries into the heart of the Frisian territory, and in the meantime sent some auxiliary cavalry and infantry across by a ford to take the enemy in the rear. The Frisians beat these forces back. More cohorts and squadrons were sent to the rescue, but these too were repulsed, and soon all the auxiliary forces were engaged. The legions were at length able to intervene and just save the cohorts and cavalry, who were completely exhausted. A large number of officers had fallen, but Apronius did not attempt to take vengeance or even to bury the dead. Two other disasters completed the ill luck of the Romans. Nine hundred soldiers were destroyed by the enemy in the wood of Baduhenna, and another body of four hundred, who had taken possession of a country house, perished by mutual slaughter to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy. No further steps seem to have been taken against the Frisians. These events probably confirmed Tiberius in his determination to regard the Rhine as the limit of the Roman Empire, and he thought it a good opportunity to abandon the last relic of the conquests of his brother beyond that river. The reign of Tiberius was very nearly being marked by a slave war in southern Italy, but by a lucky accident the movement was crushed in its very beginning, 24 A.D., the organizer of the rebellion was Titus Curtisius, who had once been a Praetorian soldier. He held secret meetings at Brundusium and other towns in the neighborhood, then posted up placards, and incited the slave population in Calabria and Apulia to assert their liberty. Three vessels happened to come to land just then, and from them the quaestor Curtius Lupus, who had charge of the saltus, or forests and pastures in those parts, obtained a force of marines, and crushed the conspiracy. Cortisius and his chief accomplices were sent prisoners to Rome, where, says Tacitus, men already felt alarm at the enormous number of the slave population, which was ever increasing, while the freeborn population grew less every day. The great marvel is that combinations among the slaves were not more common, and that it was not thought necessary to keep considerable garrisons in the towns of Italy to meet such emergencies. End of chapter 12, section 4. Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 21, 2009. Visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 13. The Principate of Tiberius. Continued, 14 to 37 A.D. Section 1 Civil Government of Tiberius As the reign of Tiberius was singularly exempt from wars, the emperor was able to devote his undivided attention to domestic government and the welfare of his subjects. His policy was distinguished by a conservative spirit, the chief principle of his administration was to follow the lines marked out by his predecessor. By abandoning the practice which Augustus had adopted of receiving an investiture of supreme power for a limited period only, he made a step nearer undisguised monarchy. The decanalia, 
or feast in honour of the decennial renewal of the tribunician power of the emperor, survived as a mere custom, without any political meaning. In two important matters he went beyond Augustus in emphasising the diarchy and excluding the people from the government. 1. The functions which Augustus had left to the Comitia of the people in electing magistrates were taken away by Tiberius and transferred to the Senate soon after his accession. The only part left to the people was to acclaim those whom the Senate chose. Tiberius preserved the imperial rights of nomination and commendation of candidates within the limits marked out by his father. 2. The people did not formally lose its sovereign right of legislation, but since the time of Tiberius it actually ceased to legislate. For the emperor and the magistrates ceased to bring leges before the comitia. There are only two instances of such leges in the reign of Tiberius while there are numerous Thanatus Consulta. The later emperors, Claudius and Nerva, temporarily revived the old practice, but with these exceptions it may be said that, from Tiberius forward, legislation consisted of the consulta of the Senate and the rescripts of the emperor. The only legislative purpose for which the people had any longer to meet in Comitia was to transfer the tribunician power on a new princeps. Another important matter in which Tiberius carried further an idea originated by Augustus was the establishment of a permanent prefecture of the city of Rome. We have seen that this office had been instituted as a temporary provision for the care of the city during absences of the emperor, and Lucius Calpurnius Piso had been appointed prefect when Augustus left Rome in 14 AD. Tiberius made the office a permanent post of great dignity, only open to senators of consular rank. He placed the three cohortes urbanis at the disposal of the prefect, and thus deprived the senate of the police control of the city. The prefect had a criminal court, in which he administered summary justice in the case of slaves and roughs. Piso held the office for nearly twenty years, till his death in 32 AD. Tiberius also instituted a new official of consular rank to look after the banks of the Tiber, Cura Riparum et Alvii Tiberis, in addition to the Cura Aquarum, which had been founded by Augustus. Tiberius concerned himself for the improvement of the civil service. One great defect of the prevalent system was that offices were filled by inexperienced young men who held them for only a brief time. Tiberius tried to remedy this by extending the period of tenure, and men began to complain that they grew old in the discharge of the same duties. He did not attempt to introduce this innovation in the case of the magistrates appointed by the Senate, and this was a sign that he was in earnest with the maintaining of the imperial system of Augustus, by which the Senate had its sphere of activity independent of the emperor. And when the proposal came from that body, in 22 AD, that the emperor should test the qualifications of senatorial magistrates, Tiberius rejected it. He always behaved with studied politeness to senators, and he was accustomed to refer to the senate matters which might more naturally have come before himself. Like Augustus, he employed a concilium, which consisted of his personal advisers and twenty illustrious members of the senatorial and equestrian orders, but it does not appear that this cabinet council had any real influence in political affairs. Tiberius was curiously reserved in avoiding the assertion of his sovereign power by titles and outward forms. In affecting to disguise his imperial position, he went much further than Augustus. He never bore the praenomen imperator, and called himself Augustus only when he was corresponding with foreign princes. He refused the title pater patriae, and forbade all, except his slaves, to address him as Dominus. He did not permit temples or statues to be erected to himself, and he rejected the proposal to consecrate his mother, Livia Augusta. In the army he maintained strict discipline. He declined to fulfil the promises of higher Pav, which had been made to the mutineers in Illyricum and on the Rhine after his accession, and instead of shortening the period of service, he actually lengthened it. 
These facts indicate the strength of his authority with the troops. He took away from victorious generals the privilege of bearing the title imperator, and reserved it for members of the imperial family. In regard to the Praetorian guards, he made an innovation, which has an important bearing on the future course of Roman history. Augustus had allowed only three cohorts to be quartered within the city, the other six being dispersed in the neighborhood of Rome. Tiberius caused a permanent camp to be built in front of the port of Viminalis, 23 AD, and henceforward all the nine cohorts were stationed there together. Thus united, they were conscious of their numbers and felt their power, and at many a crisis they disposed of the empire and elected emperors. This step also increased considerably the political power of the Praetorian prefect. In fact, the idea seems to have emanated from the favorite council of Tiberius, L. Aelius Sejanus, whom he had appointed Praetorian prefect, and who saw how his own position would be strengthened by a concentration of the forces under his command. The financial policy of Tiberius was careful and successful. The expenses of supplying Rome with corn and feeding the populace grew larger in his reign than they had been under Augustus. But in spite of this, Tiberius was so economical that he was always able to act liberally in special emergencies. He did not waste the funds of the state in donatives or costly buildings. The only public edifices built by his command were the Temple of Augustus and the Theatre of Pompeii. But when many of the famous cities of Asia were laid in ruins by an earthquake, Tiberius succored them with the princely gift of ten million sesterces, eighty thousand pounds, and caused the Senate to remit to the inhabitants the payment of their tribute for five years. He had himself to supply the deficiency in the aerarium. We find him, in 33 AD, bestowing on that treasury a hundred million sesterces, 800,000 pounds, and in 36 AD he gave the same sum for the relief of the sufferers in a great conflagration on the Aventine Hill. He never raised the rate of taxation. When Cappadocia became a province, on the strength of the addition which thus accrued to the revenue, he reduced the tax of 1%, on the sale of goods, to half percent. The liberality of Tiberius in coming to the relief of the provinces in the case of disasters, introduced a new principle into Roman statesmanship. Men were beginning to see that Rome, the mistress, had duties towards her subject lands. This policy of Tiberius is, as has been observed, one of the first signs of the reaction of the provinces upon Rome. It was indeed in the exercise of his proconsular functions that Tiberius most conspicuously showed himself as a wise and large-minded statesman. If he was hated at Rome, he was loved in the provinces. There is ample testimony to prove that his reign was, to the subjects, a period of unusual happiness. The discipline of the troops was strictly maintained, and the control exercised over the conduct of the governors was efficient and severe. The means of obtaining justice against oppression were facilitated, and under no reign were there so many prosecutions of governors and procurators for extortion. Besides this, the burdens were never increased, and the new principle of keeping the same governor at his post for a long time seems to have worked satisfactorily. See Pompoeus Sabinus, legatus of Macedonia and Achaia, which Tiberius had united in a single imperial province, 15 AD, held that office throughout almost the whole reign. The imperial provinces were, as a rule, more equitably ruled than the senatorial. This is shown clearly under Tiberius by the number of cases in which proconsuls were condemned for maladministration. The subjects themselves considered it a piece of good fortune to be transferred from the government of the senate to that of the emperor. Tiberius expressed his provincial policy in saying that it is the part of a good shepherd to shear his sheep, not to flay them. The especial regulation which made the governors responsible for acts of rapacity on the part of their wives deserves notice. If he cared for the provinces, Tiberius did not neglect to help and guide the Senate in promoting the welfare of Italy. 
He provided for the public safety and the security of travellers against robbers by stationing troops in various parts of the country, and all disturbances were promptly suppressed. He also concerned himself for the revival of agriculture, which had been slowly and surely declining in Italy during the past century, owing to the disappearance of the population of free labourers, so that the peninsula was dependent on foreign supplies for her maintenance. A serious economic crisis occurred in 33 AD, and the emperor was obliged to interpose in order to save credit. The professional accusers, delatores, made an attack upon the money-lending capitalists, who had been systematically acting in defiance of two laws of Julius Caesar. One of these laws forbade any one to have more than 60,000 sesterces, 480 pounds, of ready money in hand. The rest of each man's property was to be invested in lands and houses in Italy. The other regulated the relations between the lenders and borrowers, and the amount of interest. The matter came before the city praetor Gracchus, who thought it necessary to refer the question to the Senate, as so many people were concerned. But the senators themselves were all guilty of transgressing the law, and so they appealed to the emperor. He granted a year and six months, within which term everyone was to arrange his accounts in conformity with the law. The usurers immediately called in their loans, and a large number of the debtors, in order to meet their obligations, were obliged to sell their estates. It was foreseen that this would lead to a scarcity of money, and, in order to keep specie in circulation, a senator's consultum in the spirit of Caesar's law was passed, that every creditor should have at least two-thirds of his capital invested in estates in Italy. But the remedy proved only an aggravation of the evil for the creditors hoarded up their money to buy land cheap, and the value of estates fell so much that the debtors could not pay their debts. Many families were ruined. But at length Tiberius came to their rescue, and advanced a hundred million sesterces as a loan fund, from which any debtor might borrow for three years without interest, on giving security to the state for double the amount. By this means credit was restored, and the remaining debtors were enabled to save their estates or get the legitimate value for them. Tiberius paid special and minute attention to the administration of justice. He introduced a new and salutary regulation that nine days should intervene between the sentence and its execution in the case of culprits condemned by the Senate. That body became, in his reign, the High Court of Criminal Justice. But the emperor exercised paramount control over its decisions, and in all cases which affected his own interest, the senate merely expressed what they knew to be his will. In legislation, Tiberius was also active. The Lex Junia Norbana, 19 AD, was a measure to protect such freedmen as had not been strictly emancipated, but were released from slavery by their masters. This law rendered them independent of their masters for life and gave them commercium without connubium, or, as it was called, juniana latinitus. They could neither bequeath property by will, nor receive bequests from others. The equestrian class was also limited by a senatus consultum, which excluded those whose grandfathers were not freeborn, and who did not possess a fortune of 400,000 sesterces, 32,000 pounds. In his endeavours to reform abuses and suppress nuisances in Rome and Italy, the emperor increased and confirmed his unpopularity. He limited the number of gladiators in the arena, and on the occasion of a riot in the theatre, he expelled the players from the city. He made a vain attempt to banish soothsayers from Italy. He tried to suppress the oriental rites which were making themselves a home in Rome, he forbade especially the worship of Isis, and cast her statue into the river. He also adopted severe measures against Jews, who possessed Roman citizenship in Italy. They had attempted to evade military service, and on this ground were regarded as bad subjects, and their rights were forbidden. Four thousand Jew freedmen were transported to Sardinia, and set the task of reducing the robbers who infested that unhealthy island. The limitation of the right of asylum may also be mentioned here, 
though it chiefly affected the eastern part of the empire, where many places of refuge had been established for the protection of criminals. These religious refuges secured immunity to crime, and they had become public nuisances. Tiberius could do little to combat the prevailing luxury and dissipation among the higher classes. Frugal and moderate himself, he deeply disapproved of the extravagance of the aristocracy, and the absurd sums which were spent on furniture and the luxuries of the table. But he saw clearly that sumptuary laws were futile, and he said publicly that the time was not fit for a censorship. He was careful to keep up the state religion which Augustus had revived. His mother Livia sat in public among the Vestal Virgins, and the priests of the newly founded college of the Sodales Augustales, who were to preserve the worship of the divine Augustus, consisted of the leading senators. The part of the policy of Tiberius which perhaps did the most to render him disliked by both contemporaries and posterity was the new interpretation which he gave to Maestas. This crime was properly an offence against the abstract majesty of the commonwealth, and it came to include anything tending to bring the state into contempt. A Lex Julia of Caesar had defined strictly the various forms which the Maestas might assume, and had been extended by Augustus, who, however, had made little use of it. But Tiberius seized on the law of Maestas as a means for his own security, and under him treason became an offence against the person of the emperor, who thus comes to be regarded as the state. Any insult offered to the princeps in either speech or writing was brought under the head of Maestas. Tiberius did not deem himself safe against treachery, and he decided to resort to this engine, which could not fail to be abused and bring odium upon him. It was an instrument, by the fear of which he hoped to control the senators, and prevent them from expressing a dissentient view, lest it should be constructed as treason. The case of Lutorius Priscus shows how outrageously his safeguard could be abused. Priscus was a knight who had written verses on the death of Germanicus, and had received from Tiberius a gift as a reward. Some time later Drusus fell ill, and Priscus, encouraged by his former success, composed a poem on Drusus to be published in case the prince should not recover. But though Drusus did not die, the poet could not resist the pleasure of reading his composition to an audience, and the consequence was that the matter became known, and he was accused before the Senate. The Senate found him guilty of counting on the death of a Caesar. Only two senators proposed that he should be leniently dealt with, as his act was due to thoughtlessness, not to evil intent. But he was condemned to death, and the sentence was forthwith carried out. Tiberius was absent from Rome when this happened, and when he returned he regretted the occurrence, and praised the view of the small minority. The affair of Priscus led to the regulation already mentioned, that a delay should intervene between the sentence and the infliction of punishment. The evils of this unhappy extension of the scope of Maestas were aggravated by the encouragement which was given by Tiberius to the delatores. Originally the delator was one who apprised the officers of the exchequer of debts that were due to the senate. The name was extended to those who informed in the cases of offences which were subject to fines. Augustus encouraged delation by offering rewards to those who lodged information against the violators of his marriage laws. Delation soon became a regular profession, and as there was no public prosecutor, it was very convenient to the government to have prosecutions conducted by private delators. When Tiberius came to the throne, he regarded delation as an admirable instrument for securing the administration and enforcement of justice, and therefore encouraged it. But when he discovered how terribly it was abused and how odious it was to his subjects, he concluded that it was too dangerous a remedy, and set himself to check it, for he was honestly anxious to administer justice purely and strictly. The citizens lived in fear and terror of the unscrupulous informers, and Tiberius tried to hinder the distortion of the laws by instituting a tribunal of fifteen senators. But he relapsed afterwards into countenancing the practice of delation, owing to the influences of the Praetorian prefect Sejanus, and as the law of treason became more comprehensive and extravagant, 
the delators became more terrible. End of chapter 13, section 1or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 13. The Principate of Tiberius, Continued. Section 2 and 3. Section 2. Rise of Sejanus, Death of Drusus. The death of Germanicus removed difficulties from the path of Tiberius in regard to the succession. It had been difficult for him to hold the balance evenly between Germanicus and his own son. How precisely he endeavoured to make no distinction between them is shown by a coin of Sardis, where Drusus comes first in the inscription, but Germanicus sits on the right hand in the picture. Drusus was morally and intellectually inferior to his cousin but was deeply attached to him, and after his death, acted as a father to his children. The attitude of Tiberius to Germanicus seems to have been much like that of Augustus to Tiberius himself. From a feeling of duty to the state, he might acquiesce in the designation of his nephew as his successor, but his affection prompted him to prefer Drusus, though the father and son were not always on the best of terms. After the mysterious death of Germanicus, he set himself to secure the succession of Drusus, to the exclusion of his nephew's children. Ovations had been decreed to both the young Caesars for the successful discharge of their tasks in Armenia and Illyricum. The pacifier of Armenia never returned to Rome, but Drusus celebrated his ovation in 20 AD, and in the following year held the consulship for the second time. In 22 AD, his father raised him to the position of an imperial consort by causing the Senate and the people to confer upon him the tribunician power. But though the emperor seemed to have cause to regard his nephew's death as a piece of good luck, his hopes for his son were destined to be frustrated. Drusus had married the sister of Germanicus, the younger Livia, generally called the villa to distinguish her from the wife of Augustus. She was beautiful, ambitious, and unscrupulous, and seems to have had an ally in her namesake, the Augusta. She was seduced into an intrigue with Sejanus, the handsome and powerful prefect of the guards, who pretended to be in love with her and flattered her ambitious hopes with promises of marriage and the imperial throne, if the hindrance which stood in their way were once removed. Sejanus was a native of Volsinii in Etruria, and belonged to the equestrian class. In his youth he had served on the staff of Gaius Caesar. By his address and tact he had worked himself into the confidence of Tiberius, and had at length become indispensable as an adviser and semi-official minister. The emperor did not dream how high the ambition of his favourite soared, for Sir Janus was not content with being the right hand of his master. He longed to occupy himself the highest position in the state but Tiberius was thoroughly blinded by his useful and servile instrument, and used to throw off his habitual reserve in his intercourse with Sejanus. He even went so far as to call the prefect, not only in private conversation, but in his addresses to the senate and people, the associate of my labours, and allowed his busts to be placed in the theatres and fora. But these marks of favour were given freely, just because it never entered the thought of Tiberius that a man of the origin and position of Sejanus could possibly be dangerous. Drusus saw more deeply into the character of his father's favourite, and murmured at the influence which an alien hand had acquired at the expense of a son. On one occasion he raised his hand to strike the hated prefect. Sejanus, who had already begun to pave his way to the throne by arranging an alliance between his own daughter and the son of Claudius, the brother of Germanicus, determined to sweep Drusus from his path. Suddenly Drusus died, 23 AD, seemingly of an accidental illness, but eight years after it was discovered that poison had been administered to him by the machinations of his wife Livilla and her paramour Sejanus. It was a heavy blow to Tiberius. The children of his son were still too young to be designated as his successors, 
and nothing was left but to adopt Nero and Drusus, the eldest sons of Germanicus. He led the youths before the Senate and recommended them as the future rulers of the state. Sejanus, who had divorced his wife Apicata, proposed to marry Livilla, but Tiberius forbade the union, which could only lead to new candidates for power. The prefect was driven to frame new plans. He resolved to destroy the family of Germanicus. Tiberius was now surrounded by four imperial widows, who made his court a scene of perpetual jealousy and intrigue. These were his mother Livia and his daughter-in-law Livilla, his sister-in-law Antonia and Agrippina. The will of Augustus had left Livia a share in the supreme power, and she desired to exert it. Her name appeared with that of her son on the imperial rescripts. Tiberius was unable to shake off her influence, while he deprecated her interference in public affairs, and she had a strong party of adherents in the Senate, who proposed to call her Mater Patriae. The ambition of the strong-minded Agrippina had been disappointed by the death of her husband, but she hoped to rise again through her children. Her chastity and fertility made her an ideal Roman matron, but she had a violent temper and an unbridled tongue. She regarded the emperor as her natural enemy, and the leniency which was shown to her rival Plancina filled her with resentment. Nor was she satisfied even when her sons, Nero and Drusus, were marked out as the successors of Tiberius. The fulfilment of her ambitious dreams seemed still too far away. After the death of Drusus, Tiberius leaned more and more on Sejanus, and from this period the Romans remarked a degeneration in the home government. The prefect worked on the emperor's fears by pretending to discover conspiracies against him, and many acts of cruelty were committed. But it must be noted that this change for the worse affected only the circles of nobles and officials, and did not involve any deterioration in the general prosperity of the empire. Many victims in high positions were sacrificed unjustly to suspicion and intrigue, but the Roman world as a whole was well governed. The key to the tyranny which marked the second half of the principate of Tiberius is probably to be found in his knowledge that Agrippina had a large party of sympathizers in the Senate, who, after the death of Drusus, joyfully looked forward to the succession of her children. This party he and Sejanus determined to crush out. The first victim attacked by Sejanus was C. Silius, whom we have seen doing good work on the northern frontiers, and whose wife was a friend of Agrippina. He was accused of having connived at the rebellion of Sacrovir and of extortion, and the charges pressed him so hard that he committed suicide before sentence was passed. His wife was banished, and his possessions, said to have been wrung from the provincials of Gaul, were confiscated. It is doubtful whether Cremutius Cordus, a Stoic philosopher, and author of Annals of the Republic during the period of the civil wars, was also a partisan of Agrippina. In his work he had called Cassius the last of the Romans, and although Augustus had read the book and found no fault in it, this expression was now, 25 AD, made a cause of accusation against him. It was said that his work was an attempt to excite a rebellion. Cremutius, thinking that his case was prejudged, delivered a bitter speech in the Senate, and returning home, starved himself to death. All that could then be done was to burn his books. In the following year, 26 AD, the Dolators attacked Agrippina through her cousin Claudia Pulchra. They charged this lady with the crime of adultery and also with having made attempts on the emperor's life by poison and magic. Thereupon Agrippina sought the presence of Tiberius and found him sacrificing to the divinity of his father. The same man, she cried, cannot offer victims to the divine Augustus and persecute his posterity. Stung by the reproaches which he heaped upon him, Tiberius quoted a Greek verse to this effect. My daughter, have I done you wrong because you are not a queen? On the news of the condemnation of her cousin, Agrippina fell dangerously ill. When Tiberius visited her, she besought him to permit her to take a second husband. To such a step there were the same objections which he had, which he had opposed to the union of Libilla and Sejanus. 
but Tiberius deemed it more prudent not to urge them then, and he left the room abruptly. This anecdote was told in the memoirs of Agrippina's daughter, the mother of Nero. Such scenes as these were calculated to widen the breach between Agrippina and Tiberius, and suspicions of her kinsmen were artfully distilled by the contrivance of Sejanus into the mind of the princess. She became possessed of the idea that the emperor was planning to poison her, and when she was invited to sup with him, she absolutely refused to partake of any of the food that was presented to her. This undisguised declaration of her suspicions alienated the emperor still more. Section 3. Tiberius at Caprii. Influence of Sejanus and his fall. Hitherto Tiberius had resided continually at Rome and devoted himself assiduously to the conduct of affairs. He had constantly talked of visiting the provinces, and even made the preliminary arrangements for the journey, but when it came to the point he had always found a pretext for not going. He never went further from the city than Antium. But as he grew older, in 26 AD he had reached the age of 67, his reserve his distrust of his fellow creatures, his dislike to the pomp of public life, seemed to have increased. He had always been reserved, sensitive, and shy. His temper had been soured by disappointments, both in his early life and in his recent years. His unpopularity in Rome, of which he was fully conscious, may have irritated him more as he became older, and his domestic life was full of worry with Livia and Libilla on one side and Agrippina on the other. All this might be enough to explain the motives which led him to take the momentous step of abandoning Rome and living permanently elsewhere. But if such motives operated, their effect was supported by the persuasions of the favourite Sejanus, who desired nothing better than to remove the emperor to a distance, so as to have a free scene for his own plans. It is possible, however, that Tiberius may have been decided by a political motive. He may have wished to give Nero, the eldest son of Germanicus, an opportunity of gradually undertaking an active part in the government, and assisting him somewhat as he had himself assisted Augustus. Silly and malicious stories were circulated by the emperor's enemies. It was said that he sought a place of concealment for the practice of licentiousness, or that he wished to hide from the public view a face and figure deformed by old age. He left Rome, 26 AD, on the pretext of consecrating a temple of Jupiter at Capua, and a temple of Augustus at Nola, recently built. His attendants were one senator, Cocceius Nerva, two knights, Sejanus and another, and some men of science and astrologers. During the emperor's progress in Campania, an accident happened, which increased his confidence in Sejanus. The imperial party were dining at a country house called the Cave, Spelunca, formed of a natural grotto between the Gulf of Amiclai and the hills of Fundi. The rocks at the entrance suddenly fell in and crushed some of the servants, and the guests fled in panic. Sejanus placed himself in front of the emperor and received the falling stones. The instant convinced Tiberius that his prefect was a man who had no care for himself. Having dedicated the temples, he proceeded to the little island of Caprii, which Augustus, struck by its salubrious climate, had purchased from the people of Neapolis. Lonely and difficult to approach by its precipitous lime cliffs, yet near enough to the mainland, this island, about eleven miles in circuit and rising at either end to higher points of vantage, was an attractive retreat for the wearied statesman. Twelve villas were built in Tiberius in various parts of the island, which was vigilantly guarded from intrusion. But while his subjects thought that he had entirely relinquished the conduct of affairs to the Praetorian prefect, and was spending his days in consultation with his astrologers or in foul debauchery, Tiberius still bestowed constant attention to the details of public business. But he no longer troubled himself to suppress the civility of the Senate, or to check the abuses of delation. Many innocent men were betrayed by the indefatigable informers, and the senators lived in fear and peril of their lives. 
The case of Titius Sabinus, a Roman knight who was tried and put to death in 28 AD, was an episode in the struggle between Sejanus and the party of Agrippina, to which Sabinus belonged. Sabinus, who had been a friend of Germanicus, had made himself conspicuous by the attention which he paid to the wife and children of that prince after his death. Four ex praetors who wished to obtain the consulship and sought for that purpose to ingratiate themselves with Sejanus, conceived the idea that the destruction of Sabinus would be an effectual means of winning the favourite's favour. Accordingly, they laid a plot. One of them, named Latinius Latiaris, who was slightly acquainted with Sabinus, entered one day into conversation with him, praised him for not having abandoned the house of Germanicus in the hour of adversity, and spoke in compassionate terms of Agrippina. Sabinus, who was of a soft nature, took Latiaris completely into his confidence, burst into invectives against the cruelty of Sejanus, and did not spare Tiberius himself. Several treasonable conversations took place, but as it was necessary to have more witnesses, and as Sabinus would not have spoken freely in the presence of others, the three accomplices hid themselves between the ceiling and the roof in a room in the house of Latiaris, who induced Sabinus to visit him there on the plea of making a disclosure. The utterances of the entrapped knight on this occasion were quite sufficient for his condemnation, and the conspirators immediately dispatched a letter to the emperor informing him of the treason of Sabinus. Tiberius, in his letter to the senate on January the 1st, 28 AD, mentioned the treasonable designs of Sabinus and suggested that it might be well to punish him. The senate condemned him to death without hesitation, and received a letter of thanks from Tiberius, hinting, however, that he still apprehended treachery, but without mentioning names. He was supposed to allude to Agrippina and her son Nero. The year 29 AD was marked by the death of Livia, or, as she was publicly called, Julia Augusta, at the age of 86. Her funeral oration was pronounced by Gaius, the third son of Agrippina, then in his seventeenth year. Tiberius did not regret his imperious mother. The funeral was marked by little ceremony. The senate was forbidden to decree her divine honours. Her will remained long unexecuted. The memory of Livia has been much wronged by history. The consort of Augustus is forgotten in the mother of Tiberius, and it is only remembered that she had done much to raise to the throne an unpopular ruler whom the Romans cursed as a tyrant. There is no reason to suppose, however, that her influence, exerted in the interest of clemency, sometimes thwarted Sejanus, and it is worthy of notice that he did not carry out his design against Agrippina until after the death of Livia. It has ever been said that her death was a turning point in the reign, her friends, who, under her powerful protection, had ventured to speak somewhat boldly against the emperor, were persecuted when she died. Conspicuous among these was the husband of the emperor's divorced wife Vipsania, Asinius Gallus, who was confined in prison for three years and then put to death. The body of Livia had not been long bestowed in the mausoleum of Augustus, when the senate received a letter from Tiberius, containing charges against Agrippina and Nero. The son was charged with gross licentiousness, the mother with insolence and a contumacious spirit. There was no hint of disloyalty or treason, and the emperor did not signify what he wished the senate to do. The people assembled outside the doors of the senate house, and cried that the letter was a forgery, hinting that it was the work of Sejanus, and bearing aloft the images of Agrippina and Nero. A second message soon came from Capriae, rebuking the citizens for their rebellious behaviour, and urging the Senate to take definite action on the charges against the accused. The servile senators found them guilty, and they were banished to barren islands, Agrippina to Pandateria, and Nero to Pontia. Agrippina's second son, Drusus, still remained, but his fall, too, was speedily contrived by Sejanus. Just as he had seduced the villa to compass the death of the elder Drusus, so now he seduced Lepida, the wife of the younger Drusus, and suborned her to calumniate her husband to Tiberius. Drusus, who with his younger brother Gaius lived at Caprii, was sent to Rome as a mark of disgrace, and the Senate hastened to declare him a public enemy. For the right of declaring an individual a public enemy, as of declaring war, still belonged to the Senate. He was then arrested and imprisoned in the palace. 
the power of Sejanus had now reached its highest point. He was regarded with greater awe than the emperor himself. He seemed to be the true sovereign and Tiberius the mere lord of an island, Nesiarch. Altars were raised and sacrifices offered before his statues, games were voted in his honour, but his fall was at hand. Tiberius had become jealous and suspicious of the designs of his minister, and the graver his suspicions became, the more assiduously did he seek to disguise them until the time should come for the final blow. He loaded the prefect with honours. He betrothed him to his granddaughter Julia, the widow of Nero, who had died in exile at Pontia, and he conferred on him the honour of being his colleague in the consulship. This honour also furnished him with a pretext of ridding himself of the prefect's presence at Caprii. Sejanus was sent to Rome and to perform the functions of the consuls on behalf of both himself and Tiberius, and he was received with abject flattery by the senate and people. The senate decreed the consulate to him along with Tiberius for five years, and he was disappointed when Tiberius insisted on resigning it in the fifth month, 31 AD. The messages, which from time to time arrived from Caprii, were uncertain and puzzling. Tiberius intended to keep Sejanus in a state of restless uncertainty. He conferred upon him the proconsular power and raised him to the dignity of a priest, but at the same time he mentioned his nephew Gaius Caesar with great favour and conferred a priesthood on him also. Sejanus felt uneasy and besought Tiberius to allow him to return to Caprii to see his betrothed bride who was ill. The request was refused on the ground that the emperor and his family were about to visit Rome. In a letter to the Senate which arrived soon after, Sejanus was mentioned without the addition of his titles, and it was forbidden to yield divine honours to a mortal. Besides this, the enemies of the prefect were treated with favour. These things seemed to forebode disgrace, and Sejanus resolved to forestall his fall by overthrowing his master. A conspiracy was formed to kill Tiberius when he came to Rome, but Satrius Secundus, one of the conspirators, betrayed the plot to Antonia, and she hastened to reveal it to her brother-in-law. It would hardly have been safe to denounce openly the treason of Sejanus. To strike down the prefect of the Praetorian guards required caution and cunning. Tiberius selected a trusted officer, Sertorius Macro, to succeed Sejanus as prefect, and instructed him how he was to proceed. When Macro reached Rome, October the 17th, it was midnight. He immediately sought the house of the consul Memmius Regulus, and, having revealed the purpose of his coming, caused him to summon a meeting of the Senate, early in the morning, in the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine. This place of meeting was perhaps chosen in order that, if a disturbance should arise, Drusus, who was a captive in the adjoining palace, might readily be produced. Macro then visited Gracchinus Laco, the commander of the Cohortes Vigilum, and arranged with him that the approaches to the temple should be guarded. In the morning, as Sejanus was proceeding to the Senate, attended by an armed retinue, Macro met him and disarmed his suspicions by informing him that the business of the meeting would be to confer the tribunician power on Sejanus himself. This power was the only thing wanting to his association in the empire, and Sejanus thought that his highest ambition was about to be fulfilled. When Sejanus had entered the temple, Macro informed the Praetorians that he had been appointed their new prefect, and returned with them to their camp as soon as he had given the emperor's letter to the consuls. This great wordy epistle from Caprii, which sounded the doom of Sejanus, began with some remarks on general matters, and then proceeded to a slight rebuke of Sejanus, then passed to some indifferent matters again, and finally demanded the punishment of Sejanus himself and some of his intimate friends. During the long recital of the letter, the suspense of the audience was intense, for none knew how it would end. Then the senators, who had been heaping Sejanus with congratulations, left his side. The consul ordered the lictors to seize him, and he was hurried off to prison. The people showed how much they rejoiced in the fall of the hated tyrant by hurling down his statues. 
The Senate, when they saw the temper of the populace, and as the Praetorian guards did not intervene, met at a later hour of the same day in the Temple of Concord and sentenced Sejanus to death. He was immediately strangled in the prison, and his corpse was dragged by the executioner's hook to the Scale Germoniae, according to the usual custom in the reign of Tiberius. His death was followed by the execution of his family and friends. The Senate decreed that a statue of liberty should be set up in the Forum, and that the anniversary of the traitor's fall should be solemnly kept as a day of deliverance. Tiberius had in the meantime been agitated with fear and suspense. He had a fleet in waiting, ready to bear him to the east, in case Macro failed in the enterprise, and he posted himself on the highest cliff of the island to watch for the appointed signal of success or failure. The fall of Sejanus was a relief to him, but it was soon followed by a horrible revelation. Apicata, the divorced wife of the fallen prefect, sent to Tiberius a full account of the details of the death of Drusus, showing how it had been compassed by Sejanus and Livilla, and having revealed this long-kept secret, she put an end to her life. The revelation was confirmed by the testimony of the slaves concerned in the affair, and the guilty Livilla was punished with death. The overthrow of Sejanus brought no alleviation to the miseries of Agrippina in her island or her son Drusus in his prison. It is not clear why the emperor determined to destroy Drusus. Perhaps he thought that one so deeply injured would be dangerous if released. He allowed him to perish by starvation, and then wrote a letter to the senate, describing minutely the manner of his death, even the curses which in his last moments he had vented against Tiberius himself. The object of the strange communication, which excited the horror of the senators, is not evident. Perhaps it was intended to show beyond doubt that Drusus was really dead, for an impostor, pretending to be Drusus, had recently created some disturbances in Greece and Asia. The death of Agrippina by voluntary abstinence from food soon followed that of her son. The senate, at the emperor's wish, decreed that her birthday should be ill-omened, and remarked that her death took place on the anniversary of the execution of Sejanus, 18th October, 33 AD. The bodies of her children were not admitted to the mausoleum of the family until the reign of Gaius, who exhumed them from the lowly tombs in which they had been thrown. The prosecutions of those who were supposed to have been connected with the conspiracy of Sejanus were protracted over a year, but at length, in 33 AD, the emperor, Weary of the proceedings, issued an order for the summary execution of all who were still detained in prison, whether men, women, or children. A certain Marcus Terentius, who was impeached in the Senate on the ground of friendship with Sejanus, is reported to have made a bold speech. Others had repudiated their friendly relations with the fallen prefect, but he candidly acknowledged that he was the friend of Sejanus, had eagerly sought to be such, and was delighted when he succeeded. Do not think, fathers, he said, only of the last day of Sejanus, but of his sixteen years of power. To be known even to his freedmen and hall porters was regarded as a distinction. Let plots against the state, conspiracies for the murder of the emperor, be punished. But as to friendship, the same issue of our friendship to Sejanus must absolve alike you, Caesar, and us. Terentius was saved by his boldness and his accusers were condemned to banishment or death, according to the nature of their previous offences. But if a rare senator spoke out boldly, most of the order made the fall of the minister an occasion for obsequiousness. Some went so far in their proposals that they drew upon themselves the ridicule or severe censure of Tiberius. Thus Togonius Gallus begged the emperor to choose a number of senators of whom twenty should be selected by lot as a bodyguard whenever he entered the Curia. This man had actually taken seriously a letter of the emperor asking for the protection of a consul from Caprii to Rome. Tiberius, who had a fashion of combining jest and seriousness, thanked the senators for their kindness, but suggested several difficulties. Who were to be chosen? Were they to be always the same? Were they to be men who had held office or youths? And would it not be strange to see persons taking up swords on the threshold of the Senate House? 
But if he knew how to answer a fool according to his folly, he could also sharply rebuke an impertinence. Junius Gallio proposed that the Praetorian soldiers, having served their allotted time, should have the right of sitting among the knights in the fourteen rows of the theatre. Tiberius asked what he had to do with the Praetorian guards, who received their commands and their rewards only from the Imperator, and suggested that Gallio was one of the satellites of Sejanus, seeking to tamper with the soldiery. Gallio was then, in return for his flattery, expelled from the Senate and banished from Italy. Recent experiences had aggravated the Emperor's suspicious nature. He became more difficult to access, and committed many acts of cruelty. His faithful adviser, Cocceius Nerva, who was his companion at Caprii, weary, it is said, of seeing the harshness of his sovereign, put himself to death, in spite of the prayers and remonstrances of Tiberius. Of the twenty members of the imperial concilium, there soon remained only two or three. The others had been the victims of delation. Public report ascribed to Tiberius a life of bestial debauchery in the inaccessible island, and the Parthian king actually addressed to him an impertinent rebuke for his licentious habits, and called upon him to satisfy public opinion by committing suicide. There is little doubt that Tiberius lived licentiously, like most of the Roman nobles of those days, but there is no doubt also that his dissipations have been foully exaggerated. The circumstance that his life was prolonged to nearly fourscore years without medical aid is enough to make us hesitate to accept the stories which were circulated about the orgies at Caprii. End of chapter 13, sections 2 and 3volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by morgan scorpion the students roman empire part 1 by john bagnall bury chapter 13 the principate of tiberius section 4 to 5 section 4 parthia and the eastern question among other slanders, it was said that Tiberius in his island retreat was indifferent to the government of the empire. The rumour seems to have reached the Parthian court and encouraged the Parthian king Artabanus to assume a hostile attitude. The peace with Parthia was undisturbed until the death of Artaxes, king of Armenia, about 34 AD. Artabanus, elated by a long and successful reign, and thinking that the old Tiberius would not be likely to undertake an eastern war, seized the opportunity to transfer Armenia from dependence on Rome to dependence on Parthia. He induced the Armenians to elect his son Arsaces as successor to Artaxes. He even seemed to court a war with Rome, and addressed insulting letters to the emperor, demanding the inheritance of his own rival Vononis, who had died in Cilicia insisting on the old boundaries of Macedonia and Persia, and threatening that he would seize the territories possessed long ago by Cyrus and afterwards by Alexander the Great. Tiberius was an equal to the emergency. He conferred upon Lucius Vitellius, an able and resolute officer, the same powers which he had before conferred upon his nephew Germanicus, and sent him to the east, with orders to cross the Euphrates at the head of the Syrian legions, if it should prove needful. At the same time he set up a rival to Arsaces in the person of Mithridates, brother of Pharasmanes, king of the Iberians, and stirred up both the Iberians and Albanians to support his claim by an invasion of Armenia. Mithridates gained possession of the Armenian capital, Artaxata, and his rival Arsaces was removed by poison. King Artabanus then sent another of his sons, Orodes, to take the place of Arsaces and recover Armenia, but the Parthian cavalry proved no match for the Caucasian infantry and the Sarmatian mounted archers, which supported Pharasmanes and Mithridates. A lively description of the warfare has come down to us. Pharasmanes challenged Orodes to battle, taunted him when he refused, rode up to the Parthian camp, and harassed their foraging parties. 
the Parthians at length became impatient and called upon their prince to lead them to battle. In the fight which ensued, every variety of warfare was to be witnessed. The Parthians, accustomed to pursue or fly with equal skill, deployed their cavalry and sought scope for the discharge of their missiles. The Sarmatians, throwing aside their bows, which at a shorter range are effective, rushed on with pikes and swords. There were alternate advances and retreats, then close fighting, in which, breast to breast with the clash of arms, they drove back the foe or were themselves repulsed. The Albanians and Iberians seized the Parthian riders and hurled them from their horses. The Parthians were thus pressed on one side by the cavalry on the heights, on the other by the infantry in close quarters. The leaders, Pharos Manes and Orodes, were conspicuous, encouraging the brave, succouring those who wavered, and at length recognising each other they rushed to the combat on galloping charges and with poised javelins. The force of Pharos Manes was greater, he pierced the helmet of the foe. But he was hurried onward by his horse, and before he could repeat the blow with deadlier effect, Orodes was protected by his guards. But the rumour spread among the Parthians that their general was slain, and they yielded. After the ill success of both his sons, Artabanus took the field himself. It was now the moment for Vitellius to intervene. He set his troops in motion, and threatened to invade Mesopotamia. This was the signal for the outbreak of an insurrection which had been long brewing in Parthia, and had been fermented by Roman intrigues. The Parthian nobles, dissatisfied with the rule of the Scythian Artabanus, clamoured for the restoration of a true Arsacid. There was still a surviving son of Phraates at Rome, and a section of the disaffected Parthians sent a secret embassy to Tiberius, requesting that this representative of the house of Arsaces should be sent to the east as a claimant to the Parthian throne. This suited the views of Tiberius, and he acceded to the request. But the candidate for sovereignty died in Syria, and Tiberius then chose Tiridates, a grandson of Phraates, to take his place. The appearance of Vitellius and Tiridates in the Parthian dominions was attended at first with complete success. Sinarches, a man of good family and great wealth, and his father Abdagases, were the leaders of the party hostile to Artabanus, which was largely increased after the disasters in Armenia. Artabanus had soon found himself deserted except by a few foreigners, and was compelled, in order to save his life, to flee into exile among the Scythians. Tiridates then, under the protection of Vitellius and the Roman legions, crossed the Euphrates on a bridge of boats. The first Parthian to enter the camp was Ornospades, formerly a Parthian exile, who had been made a Roman citizen in recognition of aid which he had given to Tiberius in the Dalmatian War, and subsequently returning to Parthia had been received into favour and appointed governor of Mesopotamia. Sinarchis and Abdagises arrived soon afterwards with the royal treasure. Then Vitellius, having thus given Tiridates a start and displayed the Roman eagles beyond the Euphrates, returned with his army to Syria. Nicephorium, Anthemusius, and other towns of Greek foundation gladly received the new king, expecting him to be a good ruler from his Roman training. The enthusiasm shown by the powerful city of Seleucia which had preserved intact its Greek character under Parthian domination, was especially encouraging. But Tiridates made a fatal mistake in losing time. Instead of pressing forward into the interior of the country, he delayed over the siege of a fortress in which Artabanus had stored away his treasures and his concubines. In the meantime quarrels broke out among his adherents, some of whom, jealous of the influence of Abdagises, and regarding Tiridates as a Roman dependent, decided to restore Artabanus. They found the exiled monarch in Hyrcania, covered with dirt and sustaining life by his bow. At first he thought that they intended treachery, but when he was assured that they desired his restoration, he hastily raised some auxiliaries in Scythia and marched against Seleucia with a large force. 
in order to excite sympathy he retained the miserable dress which he had worn in his exile. The party of Tiridates retreated into Mesopotamia and soon dispersed, Tiridates himself returning to Syria, 36 AD, and leaving Artabanus master of the realm, except Seleucia, which was strong enough to hold out. Vitellius again threatened Mesopotamia, but the restored monarch hastened to yield to the Roman demands, and a peace was concluded. Artabanus recognized Mithridates as king of Armenia, while the Romans undertook not to support the pretensions of Tiridates. The Parthian king also did homage to the image of the Roman emperor, and gave up his son Darius as a hostage. Section 5. Last Days and Death of Tiberius Tiberius was not indifferent to the selection of a successor, though he is reported to have once said, quoting the verse of a Greek poet, When I am dead, let earth be wrapped in flame. There were three male representatives of his house on whom his choice might fall. There was his nephew Tiberius Claudius Drusus, the youngest son of the elder Drusus, but he was considered out of the question as being of weak intellect. There was his grand-nephew Gaius, born in 12 AD, the youngest son of Germanicus, and there was his grandson Tiberius Gemellus, born 19 AD, son of Drusus and Livilla. Between these two the choice was practically to be made. The emperor had for a long time slighted Gaius, as being a son of Agrippina, and had not permitted him to assume the toga virilis until his nineteenth year. But Gaius began to rise when Sejanus began to decline in favour. He carefully dissembled any emotions he may have felt at the fate of his mother and brothers, and the people looked forward with satisfaction to a son of Germanicus on the throne. On the other hand, Tiberius may have secretly wished for the succession of his grandson. In 35 AD he made a will leaving Gaius and Gemellus joint heirs of his private fortune and this was equivalent to an expression of his wish that they should be joint heirs of the empire. But there is reason to believe that he regarded Gaius as his successor. The four daughters of Germanicus had been married to men of note. Agrippina, of whom we shall hear more, to Cien Domitius, Drusilla, to Cassius Longinus, Julia, to Vinicius, the patron of Valeus Paterculus, the historian, and a fourth of unknown name to the son of Quintilius Varus. His own granddaughter Julia, the widow of Nero, and the betrothed of Sejanus, he married to Rubelius Blandus, a knight of obscure origin. The praetorian prefect Macro, who now partly occupied the place which Sejanus had formerly held at Caprii, saw that Gaius was probably destined to succeed and sought to obtain an ascendancy over him. Gaius had lost his wife, the daughter of M. Junius Silanus, in the third year of their marriage, and Macro engaged his own wife, Enia, to enthrall the young man by her arts and charms. The sharp old emperor observed the policy of the prefect, and said to him, You leave the setting sun to court the rising. In the seventy-eighth year of his age, in the first months of thirty-seven A.D., Tiberius quitted his island, never to return. He travelled slowly towards Rome and advanced along the Appian Way within seven miles of the city. He gazed for the last time at the tops of the distant buildings, but frightened by some evil omen, turned back and retraced his steps southward. He was fading fast. At Kirkei, in order to hide his weakness, he presided at military exercises and in consequence of the over-exertion became worse. He tried till the last to conceal his condition from those who were with him, and his physician, Caracles, had to resort to an artifice to feel his pulse. He breathed his last in the villa of Lucullus at Mycenaeum on March the 16th, 37 AD. It was whispered that his end was hastened by Macro, who, seeing him suddenly revive, stifled him. In estimating Tiberius, we must take into account the circumstances of his life, and also the character of the witnesses who have recorded his reign. A Claudium, 
both on his father's and on his mother's side, descended from the Nero's to whom, as Horace sang, Rome owed so much, he had all the pride of his patrician house. He was strong, tall, well-made and healthy, with a fair complexion and long hair profuse at the back of his head, a characteristic of the Claudii. He had unusually large eyes and a serious expression. In youth he was called the old man, so thoughtful was he and slow to speak. He had a strong sense of duty and a profound contempt for the multitude. The spirit of his ancestress, the Claudia who uttered the wish that her brother were alive again, to lose another fleet and make the streets of Rome less crowded, had in some measure descended upon Tiberius. He was, as the originally Sabine name Nero signified, brave and vigorous, and had a conspicuous aptitude for the conduct of affairs. But he was too critical to have implicit confidence in himself, and he was suspicious of others. His self-distrust was increased by the circumstances of his early manhood. His reserved manner, unlike the geniality of his brother Drusus, could not win the affection of his stepfather Augustus, who regarded his peculiarities as faults. And indeed, when he was young enough to have ambition, he was made use of indeed, but he never enjoyed imperial favour. Kept, when possible, in the second place, he was always meeting rebuffs. He was forced to divorce Vipsania and marry Julia, who brought him nothing but shame. Thus the circumstances of his life and his relations to his stepfather were calculated to deepen his reserve, to embitter his feelings, and to produce a habit of dissimulation so that there is little wonder that a man of his cold, diffident nature, coming to the throne at the age of fifty-five, should not have won the affections of subjects whom he did not deign to conciliate. All his experiences tended to develop in Tiberius that hard spirit, rigor animi, so clearly stamped on his features in the large sitting statue which has been preserved. On the other hand, his diffidence made him dependent on others, first on Livia, and then on Sejanus, who proved his evil genius. In regard to the darker side of his policy as a ruler, we must remember that he had undertaken a task which necessarily involved inconsistencies. He undertook to maintain the republican disguise under which Augustus had veiled the monarchy. The wearing of a mask well suited his reserved and crafty nature, but the success of this pretense depended far more upon personal qualities than Tiberius realized. It had been a success with Augustus because he was popular and genial. It was a failure with Tiberius because he was just the opposite. After Tiberius, the mask was dropped. The system of delation and the law of Maestas were provided by Tiberius as a substitute for the popularity which had shielded his predecessor from conspiracy. Owing to the spread of delation, the reign of Tiberius was to some extent a reign of terror. Hardly any important works of literature were produced, for men did not care to write when they could not write freely. We have already seen the fate of the historian Cremutius Cordus. Two other historians, whose works have come down to us, escaped censure by flattery. In the case of one, the flattery was probably sincere. Velius Paterculus, whose short Roman history in two books was published in 30 AD, had served under Tiberius in the Pamonian War, and had afterwards risen to the rank of Chrysler, and then of Praetor. He had conceived a deep admiration and affection for his general, and lords him with extravagant superlatives. He also speaks in very high terms of Sejanus, who had not yet fallen. Valerius Maximus was more clearly a time-server. In his Nine Books of Memorable Deeds and Words, a collection of anecdotes of Roman history, written in a tasteless, pretentious style, he is servile to the emperor. But as the work appeared after the fall of Sejanus, a vehement declamation against that minister is introduced. The Spaniard, Aeneas Seneca of Corduba, not to be confounded with his more famous son, was active under Tiberius as well as under Augustus. He wrote a history extending from the beginning of the civil wars almost to the day of his death, about 39 AD, unfortunately not preserved, 
but his works on rhetorical subjects are partly extant. The terror of delation did not affect jurists like Masurius Sabinus, men of science like Celsus, or gastronomists like Apicus, owing to the politically indifferent nature of their subjects. It is not easy to see how it affected poetry, but Virgil and Horace had no immediate successors. The only poetical writer of the reign was the freedman Phaedrus, and he tells us that he was persecuted. He was the author of five books of Aesopian fables in iambic trimeters. Pomponius Secundus wrote tragedies, but perhaps did not publish them till after the death of Tiberius. The emperor was himself imbued with letters. He wrote a lyric poem on the death of Lucius Caesar and Greek verses in the style of the Alexandrine school. He also wrote memoirs of his own life. He was a strict purist in language and resolutely refused to use words borrowed from Greek. This negative testimony of literature shows that delation was a very real danger and that the government of Tiberius was in some respects tyrannical. But he was not such a tyrant as he had been painted by the later writers Tacitus and Suetonius. Over against the dark picture of Tacitus we must set the opposite picture of the inferior artist Velaeus, and we must allow for the bias of both authors. We must remember that Velaeus had seen Tiberius at his best, in the camp conducting a campaign, that he received promotion from him and was prejudiced in his favour. In addition to this, he was writing in the emperor's lifetime. On the other hand, Tacitus wrote under the influence of a reaction against the imperial system, and he lays himself out to blacken the character of all the emperors prior to Nerva. The dark character of Tiberius, and a certain mystery which surrounded his acts and motives, lent themselves well to the design of the skilful historian, who gathered up and did not disdain to record all sorts of popular rumours and stories imputing crime to the exile of Caprii. Apart from the measures which he adopted for his own safety, or at the instigation of Sejanus, and which mainly concerned his own family and nobles connected with them, apart from the consequences of the system of delation, which were felt almost exclusively at Rome, there can be no question that the rule of Tiberius was wise and maintained the general prosperity of the empire. Augustus was not deceived when, in adopting his stepson into the Julian family, he said, I do it for the public welfare. Nor, on the other hand, was he mistaken when he prophetically pitied the fate of the people of Rome, which he was committing to be masticated in the slow jaws of his adopted son. End of chapter 13, sections 4 to 5. Volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury Chapter 14 The Principate of Gaius, Caligula, 37-41 to A.D. Section 1 1. Claims of Gaius to the Principate He is accepted by the Senate. The acts of Tiberius are not confirmed. His will is annulled and he is not deified. 2. Funeral of Tiberius. Reaction against his policy. Gaius shows respect for the Senate and piety to his family. 3. Munificence of Gaius. His speech in the Senate. 4. Early life and character of Gaius. He is under the influence of Agrippa. 5. Illness of Gaius. Sympathy of his subjects. Philo quoted. Death of Tiberius Gemellus. 6. Pleasures of Gaius. He degrades his dignity in the circus. 7. Sisters and wives of Gaius. His oriental ideas. He demands divine worship and professes to be a god. 8. His architectural extravagances. The bridge of ships at Puteoli. His jealousy of great names. 9. Financial difficulties drive him to plunder his subjects. 10. His expedition to Gaul. Conspiracy of Lentulus Gitalicus. Exile of the Emperor's sisters. Acts of Gaius at Lugdunum. 11. 
Britannic Expedition, His Return to Rome. 12. The Reign of Terror. 13. Increased Taxation, Conspiracy of Korea, and Murder of Gaius. 14. Policy of Gaius in the Provinces Reactionary. He restores client kingdoms in the east, but annexes the kingdom of Mauritania. 15. Refusal of the Jews to pay him divine worship. Embassies from Alexandria. Section 1. Popular Beginnings of the Reign of Gaius We have seen that Tiberius had made Gaius and Gemellus co-partners in the inheritance of his private fortune, thus recommending them to the Senate and people as co-partners in the Principate. He seems to have intended for them a joint rule like that which Augustus intended for his grandchildren Gaius and Lucius Caesar. Perhaps he did not believe that such a rule was possible, but he left the decision to fate. The power and the initiative naturally devolved on Gaius, who was older than his cousin by seven years and had already entered on public life. He was supported by the favour of the populace and the strength of the Praetorians, with Macro at their head so that his succession seemed certain. But it is to be observed that from a constitutional point of view, Gaius did not occupy a stronger position on the death of Tiberius as Tiberius had occupied on the death of Augustus. Tiberius had been already invested with the tribunician power and the most important of the imperial prerogatives during the lifetime of Augustus. But since the death of his son Drusus, Tiberius had not moved the Senate to confer the tribunician power on anyone, and Sejanus, who had received proconsular power, no longer lived. Gaius was not in any sense a consors imperii. Hence, on the death of Tiberius, it was open to the Senate to elect as the new princeps whomsoever they wished. But though the inheriting of the empire was not recognized by the constitution, it was generally felt that the heir of the emperor had the best claim to succeed him in the government as well as in his private property. Hence the election of Gaius was taken for granted both by himself and by others. The emperor's death was finally announced to the senate in a letter from Gaius, conveyed by the hand of Macro, who also brought the testament of Tiberius in which Gaius and Gemellus were appointed co-heirs. Gaius asked the fathers to decree to the late emperor a public funeral, deification, and the other honours which had been decreed to Augustus, also to confirm his acts. But at the same time he demanded that the testament should be annulled. Such a document might prove inconvenient, for though legally it only concerned the private estate of Tiberius, it might be used to give his grandson a claim to participation in the imperial power. The Senate accorded to the wishes of the candidate for the Empire, whom it did not hesitate to elect. The tribunician power and all the functions of the Empire were conferred on Gaius Caesar, March the 18th. A public funeral, but not deification, was decreed to Tiberius, and his will was annulled. But in return some concessions were required from Gaius. He adopted his cousin Tiberius Gemellus and named him Princeps Inventutis, and he gave up his demand that the acts of his predecessor should be confirmed by the Senate. Tiberius was not added to the gods, and in this way his memory was condemned. The accession of the young emperor was hailed by the people with wild delight as the beginning of a new age. They had received the news of the death of Tiberius with a savage outburst of hatred, it is said that they wished to drag his corpse to the river, and cried, Tiberium in Tiberium, Tiberius to the Tiber. After years of fear, sullenness, and gloom, they looked forward to an age of merriment and pleasure, a return to the Augustan era. The procession conveying the body of the dead emperor was conducted by his successor from Mycenaeum to Rome, and the people poured forth to meet it forgetting their hatred of the dead tyrant in their joy at welcoming the new sovereign. They allowed the funeral solemnities to pass over quietly, and when Gaius had spoken a funeral oration, the corpse was cremated in the Campus Martius and the ashes placed in the mausoleum. The new reign was inaugurated by a reaction against the policy of the preceding. The most odious delators were banished from Italy, 
All prisoners were released, all exiles recalled. The extension of the law of Maestas to words written or spoken was done away with. The writings of the Cremotius Cordus and others which had been suppressed were permitted to circulate again, the emperor declaring that the writing and reading of history conduced to the interests of every good prince. Gaius also annulled the right of appeal to himself from the tribunals in Rome, Italy, and the senatorial provinces. He endeavoured to make a strict division between the functions of senate and princeps, and he followed the example of Augustus, neglected by Tiberius, in publishing the accounts of the state. He restored to the comitia the election of the magistrates, and thus showed that he desired to maintain the outward form of a republic. But this change was soon discovered to be useless, for as the number of candidates seldom exceeded the number of vacant places, there was no room for suffrage, and the comitia, when it assembled, found that it had nothing to do. Hence, after two years, the system of Tiberius was restored. Gaius assisted the administration of justice by creating a fifth decuria of jurymen, for the existing number was found to be unequal to the work they had to do. It was composed of men of the same qualification as those who filled the fourth decuria, created by Augustus. Gaius also converted the equus publicus on a large number of persons because the equestrian order had been greatly reduced in number in the reign of Tiberius, who had neglected to replenish it by new nominations. The son of Germanicus distinguished himself by piety to his family no less than by respect to the Senate. When he had appeared in the presence of the fathers, and won their good will by a plausible and submissive speech, he hurried in person to the islands where his mother and brother had been banished, and conveyed their ashes back to Rome, to be deposited in the mausoleum of the Caesars. He caused the Senate to decree to his grandmother Astonia the titles and honours which had been formerly decreed to Livia. He changed the name of the month September to Germanicus, so that the name of his father might rank in the calendar beside Julius and Augustus. He called upon his uncle Tiberius Claudius, whose existence no one ever seemed to remember, and who hitherto, although he was forty-six years of age, held only equestrian rank, to be his colleague in the consulship, on which he entered on July the 1st, 37 A.D. His sisters Julia Livilla, Agrippina, and Drusilla received the honours of Vestal Virgins. Gaius himself modestly refused the title Pater Patriae, which the Senate offered him. How popular the new reign was with the multitude is shown by the immense number of victims, 160,000, which were offered in thanksgiving to the gods. The citizens and the soldiers were delighted with the unbounded munificence of the successor of the frugal Tiberius. All the legacies and donations ordered in the will of Tiberius were paid, although that deed was otherwise annulled, and the testament of Livia, which Tiberius had neglected, was now executed. Besides this, Gaius distributed to the plebs the donation which should have been given when he assumed the toga virilis. The immense sum which lay in his treasury, heaped together by the saving policy of Tiberius, enabled him to defray these expenses and to enter upon a course of reckless profusion, which the rabble greeted with applause. At the same time he reduced his revenue by abolishing the small tax of half per cent on sales in Italy. When Gaius assumed the consulship, he made a speech to the Senate, criticizing severely the acts of Tiberius and making fair promises for his own future government. The fathers were so pleased, and yet were so afraid that he would alter his views, that they decreed that his speech should be read aloud every year. His exemplary devotion to his duties during the two following months seemed to augur well for the future. But on the last day of August, which was his birthday, he threw aside business and gave magnificent entertainment, such as had not been witnessed for many years. On this occasion he consecrated the temple of Augustus, which was at length completed. From this time Gaius showed the world a new side of his character, which few perhaps had suspected. He plunged into a mad course of shameless dissipation and extravagance. When his subjects saluted their new emperor, they were quite ignorant what manner of man he was. In his personal appearance there was nothing to attract. His figure was ill-proportioned, his eyes set deep in his head, his features pale, 
and his scowling expression still displeases us in his bust. His constitution was weak, and his intellectual capacity was small, and whatever intellect he possessed had never been trained except in rhetorical exercise. Want of training in his youth may partly account for the vagaries of his manhood, but there is no doubt that his brain was affected. He was subject to epileptic fits, and he suffered from sleeplessness. His early childhood was spent in a camp on the Rhine. His next experience was the distressing circumstances of his father's death. Afterwards he was detained under the watchful eye of Tiberius in the lonely island, where he learned to dissemble, flatter, and deceive. It is said that Tiberius penetrated the real character of the crafty boy, and made the remark that Gaius lived for the perdition of himself and all men. All the tastes of this degenerate grandson of Drusus were vulgar and vile. He cared only for the company of gladiators and dancers. He took delight in the sight of torture and death. He seems to have been always thoroughly unsound in mind, and when the unlimited power of the sovereign of the Roman Empire was placed in his hands, his head was completely turned. He had fallen under the influence of Herod Agrippa, who instilled into his mind oriental ideas as to the divine nature of monarchy, and filled his head with dreams of the grandeur of eastern kings. This Agrippa, son of Aristobulus, was grandson of Herod the Great and had come to Rome along with his mother Berenice and his sister Herodias after the death of his father. Rome was at that time an asylum for the members of eastern royal families, who in their own country would probably have perished by the hand of their reigning kinsmen. Antonia, whose father had been a friend of Herod, became the protectress of his grandson, and the young Agrippa was brought up in the company of Claudius, who was of his own age. When his uncle Herod Antipas, the Herod of the Gospels, B.C. 4 to A.D. 39, who married Herodias, obtained the kingdom of Samaria, Agrippa was invested with the governorship of the city of Tiberias. But this did not satisfy his ambition. He returned to Rome in the last years of Tiberias to watch for an opportunity to better his position. He attached himself to the young Gaius, whose prospects seemed to be bright, and obtained a great influence over him. Agrippa was a shrewd and energetic man, who had seen a great deal of the world, very dissipated and unprincipled, and always in want of money. His descriptions of oriental magnificence, his pictures of the omnipotence which even the smallest monarchs in the East possessed, over the life and property of their subjects, his lessons perhaps in the voluptuousness of Asia, produced a deep and dangerous effect on the diseased mind and sensual nature of the future emperor. Rome had been threatened with the introduction of Oriental theories by Antonius. She was destined to experience them at the caprice of his great-grandson. After the celebration of his birthday, the emperor did not resume his political duties, but gave himself up to dissipation and enjoyment. And from this time to the end of his reign his only occupation was the pursuit of pleasure and excitement. Under the first wild outburst of sensuality, his weak constitution gave way and he became dangerously ill. The general distress which was then felt both in Rome and in the provinces show how popular he was. Philo, a Jew of Alexandria, describes the prosperity of the empire at the beginning of his reign and the sympathy which was felt at his illness. The passage deserves to be quoted. Who was not amazed and delighted at beholding Gaius assume the government of the empire? tranquil and well-ordered as it was, fitted and compact in all its parts, north and south, east and west, Greek and barbarian, soldier and civilian, all combined together in the enjoyment of a common peace and prosperity. It abounded everywhere in accumulated treasures of gold and silver, coin and plate. It boasted a vast force of both horse and foot, by land and by sea, and its resources flowed, as it were, from a perennial fountain. Nothing was to be seen throughout our cities but altars and sacrifices, priests clad in white and garlanded, the joyous ministers of the general mirth, festivals and assemblies, musical contests and horse races, nocturnal revels, amusements, recreations, pleasures of every kind and addressed to every sense. The rich no longer lauded it over the poor, the strong upon the weak, masters upon servants, or creditors on their debtors. The distinction of classes were levelled by the occasion. 
so that the Saturnian age of the poets might no longer be regarded as a fiction, so nearly was it revived in the life of that happy era. The provinces were happy for seven months. Then the news arrived that the emperor, having abandoned himself to sensuality, had fallen grievously sick, and was in great danger. When the sad news was spread among the nations, every government was at once cast aside, every city and house was clouded with sorrow and dejection, in proportion to its recent hilarity. All parts of the world sickened with Gaius, and were more sick than he, for his was the sickness of the body only, theirs of the soul. All men reflected on the evils of anarchy, its wars, famines and devastations, from which they foresaw no protection but in the emperor's recovery. But as soon as the disease began to abate, the rumour swiftly reached every corner of the empire, and universal were the excitement and anxiety to hear it from day to day confirmed. The safety of the prince was regarded by every land and island as identical with its own. Nor was a single country ever so interested before in the health of any one man as the whole world then was in the health of Gaius. This instructive passage of an Alexandrine writer of that day shows how important an emperor's life was then felt to be for the welfare of the state. Gaius recovered, but he did not mend his ways. The solicitude of the citizens and the provincials impressed him with a deeper sense than ever of his own importance. His first act was to remove from his path his cousin Gamellus, who had a rival claim to the throne. About November 37 A.D., the feeble grandson of Tiberius was compelled to kill himself. As he is called the son of Drusus, his adoption by Gaius was apparently annulled on his death. Macro, the Praetorian prefect, had laid Gaius under such great obligations in helping him to secure the throne that he ventured on the indiscretion of sometimes reminding the emperor of his duties. At the same time Enya pressed her lover to keep his promise of marrying her. But Gaius was weary of the wife and impatient of the husband, and he resolved to destroy them both. Macro received a command to put himself to death. About the same time, Gaius recalled from M. Salanus, the father of his first wife, who was then proconsul of Africa, and caused him to be executed. These acts may be regarded as the turning point of his reign. End of chapter 14, section 1Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury Chapter 14 The Principate of Gaius, Caligula, 37-41 to 41 A.D. Section 2-3 to 3. Extravagance and Tyranny of Gaius, His Murder Feeling himself superior to both law and custom, Gaius did not hesitate to parade his degraded tastes before the public, and to prostitute the imperial dignity in a way which would have seemed simply inconceivable to Augustus or Tiberius. He took a keen delight in the sports of the circus and in gladiatorial shows, and is said to have himself sung and danced in public, and even descended into the arena. Knights and senators were compelled to take part in the chariot races. Charioteering became a sort of political institution in this reign, and continued to be so until the latest days of the empire. There were four rival parties, distinguished by colours, the green, blue, red, and white. Gaius favoured the green faction and built a special place of exercise for it. But the gladiatorial shows were the special delight of the emperor. He removed the limitations which Augustus had set on the number of gladiators, and the amphitheatre of Taurus and the sceptre in the campus martius were constantly filled with the rabble and the court witnessing not only pairs of gladiators, but the battles of armed bands. Nobles and knights were forced to fight, as well as slaves, for all his fellow citizens were his slaves in the eyes of this princeps. Combats with wild beasts were also a frequent amusement. One wonders that the higher classes tolerated this juvenile tyranny and such shameless degradation of the imperial dignity. 
but they seem to have felt it as a change for the better after the parsimony and austerity of the preceding reign, and they saw that the new fashion of things was popular with the rabble. Gaius is said to have lived in incestuous connection with his three sisters, and though this charge is uncertain in regard to Agrippina and Julia, there can be no doubt about Drusilla, of whom he was very fond. He had separated her from her husband, and lived openly with her, after the manner of the Ptolemies and other Oriental potentates. When she died, July 38 AD, he was inconsolable. The Senate decreed her the honours of Livia, her statues were placed in the Curia and in the Temple of Venus, and she was deified under the title of Panthea. All the cities of the empire were commanded to worship her. During his principate, Gaius was married three times, and in all cases, to married women whom he snatched from their husbands. The first, Oristilla, wife of Cian Piso, was soon repudiated for the sake of Lollia Paulina, the wife of Memmius Regulus, the same who had assisted in the arrest of Sejanus. She was a very rich lady, and her wealth was probably her chief attraction for the emperor. She was then divorced on the ground of barrenness, and was succeeded by Melonia Caesonia, to whom, though she was a woman of plain features, the emperor seems to have been really attached. As time went on and Gaius found no resistance offered to his sovereign will, as he saw the world at his feet and men of all classes content to be his slaves, he was seized with the idea of his own godhead and exacted divine worship. The oriental notions which he learned from Agrippa and the deification of Julius and Augustus suggested to him this extravagance. He believed that nothing was impossible for him to execute, and his great passion was to make it manifest that he was controlled by no law and not subject to ordinary human affections. He exulted in looking on suffering without blenching. He regretted that his reign was not marked by some striking disaster such as the defeat of the Varian legions. He used to dress himself like Bacchus or Hercules or Venus, and play the part of these deities in the temples before an admiring crowd. He pretended to converse with Jupiter in the temple on the Capitol, and for this purpose, in order to have speedier access to his divine kinsman, he caused a flying bridge to be thrown across the Velabrum, reaching from the Palatine Close to the newly dedicated Temple of Augustus to the Capitoline. Among the gods, as among men, he claimed to be preeminent. He declared that he was the Latian Jupiter, and he challenged with a Homeric verse, Jupiter Capitolinus to combat. He endeavoured to manifest his divine nature by architectural constructions of colossal and fantastic designs. He connected the imperial palace with the temple of Castor in the Forum, perhaps by a series of corridors supported on a bridge, and thus made the temple the vestibule of the palace. This construction has disappeared without leaving a trace. His most useful work was the aqueduct conveying to Rome the waters of the Aqua Claudia and the Anio Novus. But this he was unable to complete. He planned a work which has been often designed but never executed the making of a canal through the Isthmus of Corinth. His most daring construction was the bridge across the Gulf of Baiae, 39 AD, which was clearly not intended to be permanent. A soothsayer, it said, had prophesied that Gaius would never become emperor any more than he would drive a chariot across the Gulf of Baiae. Gaius determined to drive across it, attended by a whole army. Having collected all the ships that were to be found in all the havens far and wide, thus impeding the regular course of commerce and causing serious inconvenience, he drew them up in a double line from Baulai to Puteoli. On this bridge of ships was placed a great floor of timber, which was covered all over with earth and paved like a high road. A new and unheard of spectacle was devised to be exhibited on this structure before it was demolished and the whole shore from Mycenaeum to Puteoli was crowded with spectators. The emperor, dressed in armour which had been worn by Alexander the Great, rode at the head of a band of soldiers, across the bridge and entered Puteoli as a conqueror. Next morning he drove back in a triumphal chariot, but dressed as a charioteer of the Green Party. He halted at the centre of the bridge and made a speech. A banquet followed, 
which lasted till late in the night, and the whole scene was illuminated with torches on the bridge and on the coast. Intoxication prevailed, and many spectators were drowned. If he was zealous for his own fame, Gaius was jealous of the fame of others. He caused the statues of the distinguished men of the Republic, which Augustus had set up in the campus, to be broken in pieces. He forbade the last descendant of the Pompeys to bear the name Magnus. He commanded the works of Virgil and Livy to be removed from the libraries, on the ground that Virgil had no genius, and that Livy was careless. He would not permit the image of his own ancestor Agrippa to be placed beside that of Augustus. He even repudiated his grandfather, and gave out that he was the grandson of Augustus and Julia, living in incest like the gods. The extravagances of Gaius at last plunged him into financial difficulties. He exhausted the large treasures accumulated by Tiberius, and in order to refill his empty purse he began to persecute the nobles and confiscate the property of the rich. Hitherto he had steadfastly and vehemently denounced all the works of Tiberius, but, pressed by want of gold, he did not hesitate to revive the law of treason and the system of delation in order to plunder his fellow citizens. Appearing in the Senate, he openly praised the policy of his predecessor, and announced the revival of the laws of Maestas. The Senate thanked the Emperor for his clemency in permitting them to live, and decreed him special honours. Many rich senators were sacrificed to appease the Emperor's cupidity. L. Aeneas Seneca only escaped because his declining age promised that his wealth would soon fall into the imperial coffers without prosecuting him. The nobles exiled in the islands were put to death, and their fortunes confiscated. But Gaius ultimately alienated not only the Senate, but the people, by imposing new taxes which affected Italy and Rome, and the soldiers, by rescinding their wills. But before he went so far as to tax the citizens of Rome, 41 AD, he had plundered Gaul. In September 39 AD, he announced that hostilities of the Germans required his presence on the Rhine, and proceeded thither with a retinue of dancers and gladiators. Lentulus Gaetulicus, a son-in-law of Sejanus, had been now for ten years the commander of the legions of the Upper Rhine. Before the death of Tiberius, he had been accused of having relaxed the discipline of the camp in order to win the favour of his soldiers. When he was threatened by disgrace, he boldly defied the emperor to remove him from the governorship of Upper Germany, and Tiberius had left him where he was. Perhaps the purpose of the expedition of Gaius was to assert the imperial authority over this independent legatus, and restore military discipline. It is certain that the barbarians beyond the limes were at this time troublesome, and the victory which Gaius announced to the Senate may have been warranted by a real repulse inflicted on some band of Germans attempting to invade Gaul. At this time a conspiracy was formed, in which Lentulus Gertulicus was implicated. The object of the plot was to slay Gaius and place M. Aemilius Lepidus on the throne. Lepidus had been a favourite of the emperor and a companion of all his pleasures. Gaius had given him in marriage his favourite sister, the unfortunate Drusilla, and had intended to designate him as successor to the empire. The surviving sisters of Gaius, Agrippina and Julia, intrigued with Lepidus and took part in this treasonable plot, which was discovered in October 39 AD. Gaetulicus and Lepidus were executed, and the two women were banished. Gaius sent a full account of their adultery and treason to the Senate, and asked the fathers to confer no distinctions on his kinfolk for the future. He also sent three swords, destined for his assassination, to be dedicated as votive offerings to Mars' altar. To fill the place of Beatulicus, he appointed Lucius Galba, afterwards emperor, who enforced and restored discipline among the demoralized legions. The emperor spent the winter at Lugdunum, where he practiced every device for extorting money from the inhabitants of Gaul. Prosecutions and executions were the order of the day. Auctions were held, at which the people were forced to buy at extravagant prices. It is said that furniture of the imperial palace was conveyed from Rome to the banks of the Rhone, and that the emperor himself played the auctioneer, recommending each article and encouraging the bidding. This was my father's, he said. This my great-grandfather's. This was a trophy of Augustus, 
this an Egyptian rarity of Antony. By such means the imperial coffers were enriched. Lugdunum also witnessed the great grandson of Augustus mocking the celebration of the ceremony at his altar, which represented the union of the Gallic provinces. Among the contests which were instituted in his honour were competitions in rhetoric and verse. Gaius compelled the unsuccessful candidates to wipe out what they had written with their tongues, under penalty of being cast into the river. On January 1, 40 AD, he assumed the consulship for the third time, but resigned it on the twelfth day. As his destined colleague had died before the end of the year, and the Senate was afraid to nominate anyone in his place without the imperial sanction, the Emperor was sole consul during the short period of his office. In spring, he advanced northward from Lugdunum to the shores of the ocean, in order to achieve the work which his greater namesake had attempted, the conquest of Britain. This project was suggested to him by Adminius, a fugitive prince of that island, who had sought refuge with the Romans. The large army which Gaius had connected reached the Bononia, the northern Bononia is now Boulogne, as the southern Bononia is Bologna, of the north, otherwise called Gesoriacum, expecting to take ship there. But one day they were ordered to form in line along the shore, in full battle array, and Gaius, who reviewed his troops from a trireme, suddenly issued a command to pile arms and pick shells. The soldiers filled their helmets with the shells which were regarded as spoils of the sea, and sent to Rome in token of the great victory won by the emperor over the ocean and the island of the ocean. It is quite conceivable that this extraordinary caricature of a British expedition was actually enacted by the eccentric emperor, but it is also possible that the story may be a fictitious parody of a genuine expedition which came to nothing. Before he returned to Rome in order to celebrate there with unheard of magnificence a triumph for his warlike exploits, Gaius visited Castra Vetera and Oppidum Ubiorum on the Lower Rhine, and report said that he conceived the monstrous idea of decimating those troops who, twenty-five years ago, had by their mutiny caused the flight of his mother Agrippina when he was an infant in her arms. The tale probably rests on some jest which the emperor let fall in his bantering manner and which was taken up as serious. His entry into Rome, August 31, 40 AD, took the form of an ovation, not a triumph as he proposed. For the Senate, uncertain what his real wishes were, had not ventured to decree him a triumph until the last moment and Gaius, filled with resentment, refused their tardy offer. I am coming, he said, but not for the Senate. I am coming for the knights and people, who alone deserve my presence. For the Senate, I will be neither prince nor citizen, but an imperator and a conqueror. From the moment of his return the emperor threw off all the remaining disguises which cloaked the monarchy, and all the fictions of liberty. He appeared in the undisguised character of an Eastern autocrat. Instead of entering Rome as a citizen, he entered in the garb of an imperator, and it is said that he would have assumed the diadem if he had not thought himself superior to the kings of the East who wore it. The cruelties and excesses of the new tyranny, which exceeded what had been hitherto experienced, necessarily led to conspiracies. A plot, in which Anicius Curialis, who will meet us again in a subsequent principate, took part, was detected, and the Senate decreed that the Emperor should occupy a seat in the Curia, elevated so high that no conspirator could reach him. Fear of his life made Gaius doubly cruel, and yet the nobles, instead of striking a blow for their freedom, tried to save themselves by civility to the worthless favourites and delators. Such was the freedman Protogenes who carried about with him two tablets, called sword and dagger, on which the names were inscribed of those who were marked out for death by execution or assassination. To what a pass the spirit of the Senate had descended is illustrated by the fate of Scribonius Proculus. One day, when Protogenes entered the Curia, and the Senators pressed forward to shake hands with him, he cried to Proculus, who was among them, What, darest thou, the enemy of Caesar, to salute me? The word was hardly spoken when the fathers fell upon their brother senator, and stabbed him to death with their styles. From such men the tyrant thought he had little to fear. 
Financial difficulties drove the emperor at length into imposing a number of new taxes on Italy and Rome, and these measures deprived him of any vestige of popularity that he still enjoyed with the populace on account of the shows with which he amused them. In January 41 AD, he imposed a tax on imports at the Italian harbours and at the gates of the Italian cities, including Rome. He ordained a fee of two and a half per cent for persons suing in the courts of law. He established an income tax which was levied even on prostitutes. He seems also to have resorted to the device of debasing the currency. A feeling of hostility grew up between the people and their ruler, and it is said that Gaius, disgusted at the symptoms of his unpopularity, expressed the wish, Would that the Roman people had only one neck! But from these new imposts men had not long to suffer. A conspiracy was formed among the Praetorian officers, in which Cassius Caria, who owed a personal grudge to the emperor, and Sabinus, both tribunes of the Praetorian guards, took the most active part. L. Annius Vinicianus and some of the imperial freedmen were also implicated. The blow was struck on the 24th of January, 41 AD, just as Gaius was making preparations for a campaign of extortion in the rich province of Egypt. The assassination was accomplished by Correa and his fellows in the vaulted corridor which connected the palace with the Circus Maximus, through which Gaius was passing to see the horse races. The conspirators succeeded in escaping from the swords of the German bodyguards, and the corpse of Gaius was hastily interred in the Lamian gardens. At a later period it was exhumed and cremated by the sisters whom he had banished. At his death Gaius was only thirty years old. Section 3. Provincial Government, the Jews If the Principate of Gaius was a reaction on that of Tiberius in domestic policy, so too in provincial affairs he aimed at altering the arrangements of his predecessor. Tiberius had deposed Antiochus of Comagene and made that district a province. Gaius restored it to the deposed king's son, Antiochus IV. Epiphanes Magnus increased it by the Cilician coast and restored one hundred million sesterces, the confiscated property of his father. Agrippa, whom Tiberius had imprisoned, received the tetrarchy of his uncle, Philip II, who had recently died, and in addition Abilene. Two years later he induced the emperor to depose Antipas and his wife Herodias, the rulers of Samaria, and send them into exile on the ground of treason. Samaria was given to Agrippa, who thus united under his sceptre the lands which had formed the kingdom of Herod the Great, with the exception of the province Judea. In Thrace a Roman officer had governed the inheritance of Cotis since 19 AD. Gaius restored it to Romatelkis, son of Cotis, and increased the realm by the rest of Thrace, which had belonged to another Romatelkis, the son of Rascuporis. The younger brothers of the restored Romatalkis had been brought up with Gaius himself in Italy, and were related through their mother Antonia Trophania with his own grandmother Antonia. He therefore provided them also with kingdoms. To Polemo he gave Pontus Polemoniacus, and to Cotis Lesser Armenia. Another appointment made by Gaius at the same time, 38 AD, was that of the Arabian Scamus to the throne of Iturea. But while he restored dependent kingdoms in the east, he pulled down a dependent kingdom in the west. Ptolemy, king of Mauritania, was summoned to Rome and executed, in order that his treasures might replenish the emperor's coffers. It was contemplated to divide Mauritania into two provinces, Caesariensis and Tingitana, and this arrangement was afterwards carried out. Gaius also made an administrative change in the neighbouring provinces of Africa and Numidia. Africa was the only senatorial province in which a legion was stationed under the command of the governor. Gaius removed this anomaly by consigning the legion to an imperial legatus, who was also entrusted with civil functions in Numidia, while the powers of the proconsul were confined to the administration of civil affairs in Africa Vetus. The claim of the emperor to receive adoration as a god led to disturbances among the Jews, both in Judea and at Alexandria. In 38 BC, Herod Agrippa visited Alexandria on the way to his new kingdom. 
His appearance in the streets, in royal state, led to an anti-Jewish demonstration among the non-Jewish population, and the prefect of Egypt, Avilius Flaccus, with a zeal which proved unlucky for himself, seized the opportunity to require that the Jews, whom they detested, should set up statues of the emperor in their synagogues. When the Jews refused to submit to such an abomination, their fellow citizens drove them into one quarter of the town, and destroyed their dwellings throughout the rest. Many of them were slain in the tumult. But Flaccus, who had also issued an edict forbidding the Jews to keep the Sabbath, paid the penalty of his wrongdoing. He was immediately superseded, and sent as a prisoner to Rome by Bassus, who succeeded him. The Jews, however, had only a short respite. When Gaius began to claim divine worship from all his subjects, he would not brook the solitary refusal of the Jews. It was expected that a decree would go forth, ordaining that the imperial image should be set up in all synagogues, and with a view to avert, if possible, such a calamity. The Jews of Alexandria sent an embassy to appeal directly to the emperor, 40 A.D. The details of this embassy have come down to us from the pen of the most distinguished of the ambassadors, the learned philosopher Philo. At the same time, the Alexandrians sent a counter-embassy to thwart the Jews. When they arrived on the coast of Campania, the tidings met them that orders had just been issued to Petronius, the governor of Judea, to set up a colossal statue of the emperor in the Holy of Holies at Jerusalem. Gaius was at this time engaged in transforming the house and gardens of the Lamias into a royal residence, and the rival embassies from Alexandria were summoned thither. They found him hurrying about from room to room, surrounded by architects and workmen, to whom he was giving directions, and they were compelled to follow in his train. Stopping to address the Jews, he asked, Are you the God-haters who deny my divinity, which all the world acknowledges? The Alexandrian envoys hastened to put in their word. Lord and Master, these Jews alone have refused to sacrifice for your safety. Nay, Lord Gaius, said the Jews, it is a slander. We sacrificed for you not once but thrice, first when you assumed the empire, then when you recovered from your sickness, and again for your success against the Germans. Yes, observed Gaius, you sacrificed for me, not to me. And thereupon he hurried to another room. The Jews trembling and their rivals jeering, as in a play. The next remark he addressed to them was, Pray, why do ye not eat pork? Finally he dismissed them with the observation, Men who deem me no god are after all more unlucky than guilty. The embassy of Philo and his fellows was a failure. Gaius was resolved to impose his worship on the Jews, and his orders to Petronius were confirmed. The rebellion of Judea seemed inevitable, when the death of the mad tyrant averted the sacrilege from the temple of Jerusalem. End of chapter 14, sections 2 and 3
As soon as the assassination became known, the consuls Centius, Saturninus, and Pomponius Secundus ordered the urban cohorts to post themselves in various parts of the city, and immediately called together the Senate to deliberate on what was to be done. The fathers met in the temple of Capitola and Jupiter, and not as usual in the Curia Julia, as though in his building they would have been under their influence of the Julian name. They were unanimous in denouncing the tyrannical rule of Gaius, in abolishing his unpopular taxes, and in promising a donative to the soldiers. But they were divided on the more momentous question as to the future of the state. Some held that the free republic should be restored, and the constitution of the Caesars abolished. Others voted that the principate should continue, but in another family, and there were not wanting candidates for the supreme place. They could come to no agreement, but before they separated a decree was passed in honor of Cassius Caera and the other conspirators, and the watchword given by the councils to the city cohorts was Libertas. Caera then sent an officer to put to death the Empress Caesonia and her infant daughter. But the solution of the difficulty did not rest with the Senate. The Praetorian guards had already determined that the empire was not to be abolished, and who the next emperor was to be. In the confusion which followed the assassination, some of these soldiers had rushed into the palace in search of plunder, and had discovered, hidden behind a curtain, in fear of his life, Claudius, the son of Drusus and brother of Germanicus. They greeted him with the title Imperator, and carried him off to the Praetorian camp. The restoration of the Republic would have meant the dissolution of the guards, and they were naturally resolved to hinder it. Claudius wavered before accepting the dignity which was thus thrust upon him, and of which he had perhaps never dreamed. But the insistence of the soldiers, the voice of the people who gathered round the Senate on the following morning, and the counsels of Herod Agrippa, who went to and fro between the Senate and the camp, determined him to yield, and he promised the guards, when they took the oath of allegiance, a donative of fifteen thousand sesterces, hundred and twenty pounds each. He was the first of the Caesars who bought the fidelity of the soldiers by a donative. It would have been useless for the Senate to attempt to struggle against the will of the Praetorians, even if the Arban cohorts had continued to support it. But these went over to the other side. Claudius was then conducted to the palace by the Praetorians, and he ordered the Senate to come to him there. The senators did not dare to refuse. Only the conspirators Caerea and Sabinus held out and protested against the replacement of a madman by an idiot. The usual decrees were passed conferring the imperial powers upon Claudius, the first, but by no means the last, Roman emperor, who was elected by the will of the Praetorian guards. Caerea and others of the conspirators were immediately executed. Sabinus was pardoned, but killed himself by falling on his sword, having declared that he could not survive the accession of another Caesar. For all the other acts of the short interregnum, a general pardon was proclaimed. But the assassination of his nephew had made a deep impression on Claudius, and he adopted the practice of keeping guards continually posted round his person, even when he sat at table. All persons who were admitted to the imperial apartments were searched before they entered. The new emperor, Tiberius Claudius Nero Germanicus, was born at Lugodunum on the day on which the temple of Augustus and Rome was dedicated there by his father, 10 B.C. 
He was thus about fifty years of age when he came to the throne. He had always been regarded and treated by his family as half an imbecile, but his defects seemed to have been physical rather than mental. His constitution was weak, his hands trembled, he halted on one leg, and his speech was thick. Laboring under these disadvantages, he was neglected by his mother, who described him as a monster and left to the care of servants. His grandmother Livia ignored him. Augustus indeed recognized that he was not such a fool as he seemed, but slighted him, deeming him worthy of no higher dignity than an augurate, and leaving him only a very small bequest in his will. Tiberius treated him with undisguised contempt, and seeing no hope of a public career, Claudius retired to the country, devoted himself to literature, and amused himself with the society of low people. Under his nephew Gaius, he was promoted to the dignity of the consulship, and thereby entered the senatorial rank. But his wanton kinsmen forced him to submit to all kinds of indignities and insults. He was slighted in the curia, and at the court, was the butt of the emperor's rollicking companions. The senate selected him as the head of a deputation to Gaius in Gaul, and on that occasion he was ducked in the river Rhone. He was created priest to Gaius as Jupiter Latiaris, and ruined by the enormous expenses which devolved upon him in that capacity. Yet as Gaius had no children, the more far-sighted like Herod Agrippa, saw that Claudius might one day be a candidate for empire, and took care to maintain friendly relations with him. He wrote three large historical works, a history of the Etruscans in twenty books, a history of the Carthaginians in eight books, and a history of the Roman state since the Battle of Actium in forty-one books. He also wrote his own biography in eight books, a defense of Cicero against the censures of Asinius Gallus, a treatise on dice playing, and a Greek comedy. The Etruscan and Carthaginian histories were also written in Greek. He studied grammar and attempted to enrich the Latin alphabet by three new letters, which, however, did not survive his reign. But though he was erammed, antiquarian lore, he had little judgment in applying it, and the circumstances of his early life did not tend to make him practical. Yet it was a gross misrepresentation to say that he was half-witted. When he came to the throne, he surprised all by showing considerable talent for administration, as well as a genuine anxiety for the welfare of the state. He was a weak-minded pedant, and lived under the influence of his wives and his freedmen, but he was far from being an imbecile. He and James I of England, to whom he was aptly being compared, are the two notorious examples of pedants on the throne. They were alike also in their ungainly figures, coarse manners, and want of personal dignity. The face of Claudius, as represented in his busts, was handsome, and has a look of pain or weariness which gives it a certain interest. Claudius did not belong, strictly speaking, to the house of the Caesars. He had not been transferred into the Julian Gens, like his uncle Tiberius and his brother Germanicus. When therefore he adopted the name Caesar, it was in strictness no longer a family name, but an imperial title. Yet Claudius had been so closely associated with the family of the Caesars, that his assumption of the Julian cognomen may have hardly seemed an innovation. The Claudius and Julians had been so closely connected since the marriage of Augustus and Livia, that they were almost regarded as a single house. It was the policy of Claudius to emphasize his connection with Augustus. He caused the divine honors, which Tiberius had refused, to be granted 
to his grandmother Livia Augusta. His position was perhaps further strengthened by his marriage with Valeria Messalina, who was a descendant of Octavia, the sister of Augustus. Their daughter Octavia was intended to be the bride of Junius Silanus, who was a great-great-grandson of Augustus, and his other daughter, Antonia, by a former wife, was affianced to Centurion Pompeius Magnus, who was connected through his parents with several distinguished families. The reign of Claudius was marked by a reaction against that of Gaius, as that of Gaius had been marked by a reaction against that of Tiberius. The new emperor showed himself clement and moderate. The acts of Gaius were annulled. The estates which he had confiscated were restored to their owners, and the statues of which he had robbed the temples of Greece and Asia were sent back to their homes. Exiles and prisoners who were suffering under the charge of treason were pardoned, and Julia and Agrippina, the nieces of the emperor, were recalled from the banishment to which they had been condemned by their brother. The New Year's presents, which Gaius had demanded from his subjects, were forbidden, and the emperor accepted the inheritance of no man who had relatives. But the aristocrats were not at first contented with the rule of one whom they had been taught to regard with a pitying contempt. The fate of Gaius showed how easy it was to overthrow an emperor, and there were not wanting aspirants to the supreme power. A conspiracy was formed to strike down Claudius, and set in his place Annius Vinicianus, a prominent senator. The movement was supported by Furius Camillus Scribonianus, governor of Dalmatia, who undertook to march into Italy at the head of the two legions under his command, and sent a message of insolent defiance to Claudius, who was so terrified that he thought of resigning the empire. But the soldiers refused to follow their commander when he announced his intention, and he was forced to fly to one of the islands off the coast to escape their anger. The legions, the seventh and the eleventh, were rewarded for their loyalty, and the decree of the senate conferred upon each the titles of Claudian, pious, faithful. The chief conspirators were punished by death or committed suicide. End of chapter 15, section 1「The Student's Roman Empire by John Bagnall Bury」Chapter 15, Section 2 and 3 Section 2 Administration of Claudius Claudius endeavoured to model his statesmanship on that of Augustus. He set himself to restore the relations of cordiality which had subsisted between Senate and Princeps under the first emperor. The division of power between them was strictly maintained, and Claudius was prompted by his passion for antiquity to preserve the dignity of the Senate. He reserved for members of the ancient order special seats in the Circus Maximus. The influence of the Senate was also increased by the rivalry which existed between the freedmen and the wives of the Emperor, each party seeking a support in the authority of the Senate. The list of the order had not been revised since the reign of Augustus, and Claudius undertook the unpopular task, which his two predecessors had admitted. The task was necessary, but like most things which Claudius did, he performed it in a manner which excited ridicule. Instead of simply assuming censorial power, he revived the office of censor, a title which Augustus had avoided, and held a lustrum. His colleague in the office was L. Vitellius. The act was harmless, but it seemed to savour of the antiquarian on the throne. And when the zealous censor issued fifty edicts in one day, there was matter for jest in Rome. 
but useful business was done. Many new members were admitted into the Senate, and the equestrian order was also revised. Claudius showed that he had not forgotten the land of his birth, by paying the way for extending the honorium to the three Gauls. So far as they already possessed the civitas sine suffragio, Natives of Gallia Narbonensis, of Spain and Africa, had already been admitted to the Senate and the magistracies. Claudius extended the privilege to the Edui, who, as the first Gallic allies of Rome, were called the Brothers of the Roman People. This mark of favour came fitly from the son of Drusus, the brother of Germanicus, and the conqueror of Britain. The speech which Claudius pronounced on this occasion before the Senate was characteristic of the man. Two considerable fragments of it have been preserved on bronze tablets, which were dug up at Lyon, and we can judge from these remains that the oration was long and rambling, displaying knowledge of the ancient history of Rome, which bore very little on the matter in hand, and illustrating that want of sense of proportion, which made even the best acts of Claudius seem a little absurd. After a long and tedious historical disquisition, he suddenly breaks out in an address to himself which is simply grotesque. But it is high time for thee, Tiberius Caesar Germanicus, to unfold to the conscript fathers the aim of thy discourse. Like Augustus, Claudius was specially empowered by the Senate, in the year of his censorship, to increase the number of patrician families, which were gradually dwindling, with a view to the conservation of religious ceremonies. This was a work thoroughly congenial to the spirit of the antiquarian sovereign. He also received powers to enlarge the Pomoarium, so as to include the Aventine Hill, which had hitherto lain outside the limits of the city in its narrower sense. As an imitator of Augustus and a student of Etruscan archaeology, he naturally made the maintenance of religion a special care, and did away with the Oriental rites which had come into practice at the court in the reign of Gaius. The Jews were tolerated in Rome until their seditions caused him to expel them again, as they had been expelled by Tiberius. In the 800th year of the city, which fell in this reign, 47 AD, Claudius as Pontifex Maximus celebrated the Ludi Seculares, though they had been celebrated 63 years before by Augustus. He founded a college of 60 pieces for the official maintenance of Etruscan auguries but in his zeal for religion he did not neglect the dictates of worldly wisdom, and limited the number of holidays which interfered with the course of business. Claudius also imitated his great model in devoting himself assiduously to the administration of justice. He used to sit patiently, hour after hour, through tedious judicial investigations in the open forum or in the Basilica Julia. But while we may recognize his good intentions, it is doubtful whether such personal activity of a sovereign in administering justice is not more harmful than beneficial. He annulled the laws of treason, suppressed the practice of delation, and promised that no Roman citizen should be submitted to the pain of torture. He did away with the innovation introduced by Gaius, that slaves might give evidence against their masters. In connection with these measures, which were designed to preserve the dignity of the Roman citizen, it may be mentioned that he meted out strict punishment to those who claimed the franchise on false pretenses. He also regulated marriages between free women and slaves, and defined the legal position of their children as servile. Some important administrative changes were made in the reign of Claudius. Judicial authority was committed to the procurators, who managed the affairs of the fiscus in the provinces. Thus, suits concerning fiscal debts were withdrawn from the ordinary tribunals, but those who were not satisfied with the award of the imperial procurator could appeal to the emperor. Claudius also made new arrangements for the administration of the agrarium. It will be remembered that Augustus had transferred this treasury from the urban quaestors to two praetores erarii, Claudius restored it to the quaestors, but with a modification of the old arrangement. The two treasurers were selected from the quaestors, not by lot, but by the choice of the emperor, and they held office for three years, under the title of Quaestores Aerarii Saturni, 44 AD. 
The tendency to return to old constitutional forms was also manifested in the revival of the legislative power of the Comitia of the People. Some of the laws of Claudius took the form of plebiscita, but it was the unpractical experiment of an antiquarian, and all his important legislation took the form of senatus consulta. His reign was distinguished by the execution of works of public utility. He completed the aqueduct which had been begun by Gaius and left unfinished, and from him it derived the name of Aqua Claudia. A much greater work was the construction of the Portus Romanus. When Claudius came to the throne, the public granaries were empty, and Rome was threatened with a famine. The immediate necessity was relieved by extending privileges to private trade in corn, but the scarcity continued, and one of the chief and abiding causes was the want of a good haven close to Rome. The mouth of the Tiber was silted up with sand, and the corn ships from Egypt were obliged to anchor at Puteoli. Claudius supplied this great want by making a new haven, a little above the well-nigh deserted port of Ostia, and connected with the river by an artificial channel. This haven was formed by two immense moulds built out into the sea, and a lighthouse was erected at the entrance. This undertaking involved a large outlay, but it was of great and permanent utility. A still faster enterprise was the draining of the Fucine Lake in the land of the Marsi, but the cost and the labour were not recompensed by the results. The agriculture of the Marsians suffered constantly from the swelling of the waters of the lake, and Claudius undertook to hinder this calamity by constructing a tunnel three miles in length through Monte Solviano to carry away the overflow into the river Lyris. The work of thirty thousand men for eleven years, forty-one to fifty-one A.D., was spent on this design, but the tunnel did not prove permanently efficient, like that which drained the Alban lake. Claudius celebrated the completion of the work by a mimic naval battle on the lake, like one which Augustus had exhibited in an artificial basin in the trans-Tibertine suburb of Rome, but on a much larger scale. Claudius equipped vessels of three and four banks of oars, with nineteen thousand men. He lined the shores of the lake with a continuous platform of rafts to prevent the galley slaves from escaping, but full space was left for the operations of a sea fight. Divisions of Praetorian cohorts and cavalry were posted on the rafts, with the breastwork in front of them, from which they could direct missiles against any of the naval gladiators who tried to escape. An immense multitude of people, both from Rome and the neighbouring towns, had gathered, both to see the wondrous spectacle and to show their respect for the emperor, and the banks, the slopes, and the hilltops were crowned with spectators, so that the scene resembled a vast theatre. The emperor dressed in a splendid military cloak, paludamentum, and his wife Agrippina, also wearing a military cloak, presided. Though the combatants were condemned criminals, they fought bravely, and when much blood had been shed, they were allowed to separate. The story is told that when they saluted Claudius with the words, Ave Imperator, Moratore te salutant, Hail Emperor, men doomed to die greet thee, he answered with out non, or not, doomed to die, and they taking the words as a pardon, refused to fight. Claudius at first thought of having them all massacred, but afterwards, going round in person, induced them to fight by threats and exhortations. Section 3. The Provinces under Claudius The gradual elevation of the provinces to a political equality with Italy is one of the features of the imperial period. The extension of the Jus Honorum to Gaul, which has been already mentioned, was an important step in this direction, and the reign of Claudius was marked by a tendency to bestow the Roman citizenship on provincial communities. He was ridiculed, in a humorous satire written after his death by the philosopher Seneca, for having resolved to see all the Greeks, Gauls, Spaniards, and Britons dressed in the Roman toga. He introduced many changes in the administration of the subject lands, both the provinces and the dependent kingdoms. In the north, the empire gained a new province by the conquest of Britain, which will be recounted in another chapter, and this led to an increase of the army by two new legions. The Praetorian cohorts were also increased in this reign from nine to twelve. 
Mauritania had to be conquered anew at the other extremity of the empire. The inhabitants had rushed to arms after the execution of their king Ptolemy, under the leadership of Edmon, one of his freedmen. The governor, Publius Gavinius, was not equal to coping with the rebellion, but his successor, C. Suetonius Paulinus, who became famous afterwards by his campaign in Britain, crossed Mount Atlas and went as far south as the river Gear, reducing the Maurusian tribes, 42 A.D. This expedition, however, was not decisive, and the struggle seems to have lasted until 45 A.D., when Lucius Galba, who was afterwards emperor, became proconsul of Africa, and Cien Hosidius Gator commanded in Numidia. When order was restored, chiefly through the energy of Gator, Mauritania was divided into two provinces, separated by the river Matua. The western was distinguished as Tingitana, from the town Tingi, the eastern as Caesariensis, from the town Jol Caesarea. Each was governed by a procurator, but in case of necessity they were united under the authority of a legatus. Another change in the western half of the empire was the enlargement of the little prefecture of the Cotian Alps, and the elevation of its prefect, Julius Cotius, to the rank of king. Claudius conquered Britain, but he did not essay the other enterprise which had once seemed expedient for the protection of Gaul. He did not try to repeat the conquest of Germany, which had busied his father Drusus and his brother Germanicus. There was, however, in his reign, some fighting beyond the Rhine. Domitius Corbulo, an able soldier, the rival of Suetonius Paulinus, was appointed legatus of Lower Germany. He was the half-brother of Caesonia, the wife of Gaius, in whose reign he had been entrusted with the task of inspecting the condition of the roads in Italy. On reaching the Rhine, he set himself to check the piracy which had been practised in recent years by the German peoples along the coast of the North Sea. He punished the Frisians, who had refused to pay the stipulated tribute, and made an expedition against the Chorki, 47 A.D., who had dared to make incursions into the lower province. But as he was about to establish a fortress in the land of that people, he received orders from the emperor to desist from his undertaking, and leave the Chorsi to themselves. The enemies of Corbulo had represented that he was only seeking his own glory. But in any case, it was the policy of the government at this time to keep the Germans in order by diplomacy rather than by arms. Thus the Cheruski, who were degenerated since the days of Arminius, besought the emperor to provide them with a chief. Claudius sent Italicus, the son of Flavus, and the nephew of Arminius. For a time the youth was popular, but he soon became suspected and disliked on account of his Roman manners, and had great difficulty in maintaining his position. This was just what Rome desired. It was her policy to promote discord and dissension among the Germans. Corbulo returned to his province disgusted and disappointed. How happy were the Roman commanders in old days, he is reported to have murmured when he received the imperial command. As the soldiers were not to fight, he employed them in the task of cutting a great canal, connecting the Musa, Mars, with the northern branch of the Rhine, parallel to the coast. This supplied the place of a road, and has lasted till the present day, running from Rotterdam to Leyden. The reign of Claudius was also distinguished in the history of the Rhine lands by the elevation of the Oppidum Ubiorum to the rank of a military colony, 50 A.D., Colonia Claudia Agrippinensis, called after his fourth wife, the Empress Agrippina, who was born there. Colonia, as it was simply called, and is still called so in the form of Cologne or Colne, became an important centre of Roman civilization. It is possible that another illustrious Roman colony, Augusta Treverorum, Trier, on the Mosul, was also founded under the auspices of Claudius. One work which had been begun by his father it devolved upon him to complete. This was the great road connecting Italy with the upper Danube, passing over the Brenner Alps, the Via Claudia Augusta. There were also hostilities in the upper province during the reign of Claudius. It was found necessary to make an expedition against the Chatti, and the last of the three eagles lost by Varus was on this occasion recovered. 
Some years later, 50 AD, predatory bands of Chatti invaded the province, which was then governed by Publius Pomponius Secundus. He ordered the Bangiones and the Nemetes, tribes which dwelled on the left bank of the Rhine about Borbetomagus, Worms, and Nubiomagus, Speyer, along with the auxiliary cavalry, to intercept the retreat of the invaders and attack them while they were dispersed. The troops were divided into two columns. One of these cut off the plunderers on their return, when after a carouse they were heavy with sleep, and some survivors of the disaster of Varus were delivered from captivity. The other column inflicted greater loss on the foe in a regular battle, and returned laden with spoil to Mount Taunus, where Pomponius was waiting with his legions. The triumphal ornaments were decreed to Pomponius, who, however, was more celebrated for his poems than for his military achievements. On the Pannonian frontier, Claudius was called upon to intervene in the affairs of the Suevi. After the overthrow of Malobodius, Vanius had been recognized as king of the Suevic realm, which included Bohemia in the land of the Marcomanni, and also the modern Moravia in the land of the Quadi. For about thirty years Vanius reigned in great prosperity, popular with his countrymen, whom he enriched by plunder and the tribute of subject tribes. But long possession made him a tyrant, and domestic hatred, combined with the enmity of neighbouring peoples, proved his ruin. In 50 AD a plot was formed for his overthrow by his nephews Vangio and Sido, who were supported by Vibilius, king of the Hermann Duri, a people who lived west of Bohemia. Claudius declined to send Roman troops to protect his vassal, and would only promise a safe refuge to Vanius in case he were expelled. But he instructed Palpelius Hister, the legatus of Pannonia, to have his legions with some chosen auxiliaries posted along the banks of the Danube, as a rule their station was on the drive, to be a support to Vanius if he were conquered, and a terror to the conquerors. The enemies of Vanius were supported by an immense force of Lugii, a Suevic tribe which probably dwelt in modern Silesia. To oppose this large force, Vanius had obtained some cavalry from the Yazigis, a Sarmatian race who lived between the Danube and the Thais, to support his own infantry. He wished to protract the war by maintaining himself in fortresses, but the Yazigis, who could not endure a siege, brought on an engagement. Vanius was compelled to come down from his forts, and was defeated. He then fled to the Roman fleet on the Danube, and grants of land in Pannonia were assigned to him and his followers. Vangio and Sido divided his kingdom, and remained loyal to Rome. In the east, the list of provinces was augmented by the conversion of the kingdom of Thrace into a province governed by a procurator, 46 A.D., the free confederation of the cities of Lycia was also abolished, and that country united to the province of Pamphylia, 43 AD. This measure led to the complete Hellenization of Lycia. Macedonia and Achaea, which Tiberius had placed under the common control of an imperial legatus, were restored by Claudius to the Senate, and again governed by Praetorian proconsuls. Now that Moesia was separately administered, they were girt round by a chain of frontier provinces which secured them against hostile inroads, so that they could be safely entrusted to the Senate. The affairs of the small dependent kingdoms in the east were ordered anew. Antiochus IV was restored to the throne of Comagini, which Gaius had given him and then capriciously taken away. Special attention was attracted to the kingdom of Bosporus and the northeastern shores of the Exuni. The history of these regions is so little known that the glimpse of them which we get now is welcome. In 41 AD, Claudius transferred the kingdom of Bosporus, which Gaius had bestowed on Polemo, to a certain Mithridates, who claimed to be descended from the great opponent of Rome, and Polemo received some districts in Cilicia as a compensation. But a few years later, 45 AD, he was deposed for what reason is unknown, and his brother, a youth named Cotis, was set up in his stead and at first supported by a considerable Roman force under Aulus Didius Gallus, who was probably governor of Moesia. When the Romans departed, leaving only a few cohorts under a knight named Julius Aquila, 
Mithridates saw his opportunity. Collecting a band of men who were exiles like himself, he overthrew the king of the Dandaridae, a people which dwelled under the Hippanis, the Cuban, and established himself as ruler over them. Cotis and Aquila were alarmed at the prospect of an invasion by Mithridates at the head of the Dandarids, especially as the Siraki, another obscure people of those regions, had assumed a hostile attitude. Accordingly they sought the alliance of Eunones, king of the Aorsi, another race whose exact home is uncertain. It was resolved to anticipate the designs of the dethroned king of Bosporus by attacking him in his new Dandarid realm. The army of Cotis consisted of the Roman cohorts, native Bosporan troops, and cavalry supplied by Eunones. Mithridates, having no adequate forces to oppose to this attack, was defeated, and Sosa, the town of Dandarica, was occupied by the invaders. The victors then proceeded against the Siraki and laid siege to their town, named Uspi, which was built on high ground and also fortified by art. The place was easily taken, and the inhabitants, although they had offered submission, were massacred. After the fall of Uspi, the king of the Siraki deserted the cause of Mithridates and prostrated himself before the image of the emperor. The Romans were very proud of this expedition. They had advanced within three days' journey to the banks of the Tanais, which in their geography was regarded as one of the limits of the known world. But as they returned by sea, some ships were wrecked on the shores of the Tauri, and the barbarians slew one of the prefects and some of the soldiers. For Mithridates it only remained to throw himself on the mercy of some protector. Not trusting his brother Cotis, and there being no Roman officer of influence on the spot, he gave himself up to Eunones, king of the Aorsi. Eunones undertook his cause, and sent envoys to Claudius, begging mercy for the captive. After some hesitation, the emperor decided on exercising clemency. Mithridates once conducted to Rome, and is said to have spoken bold words in the imperial presence. I have returned to you of my own free will. If you do not believe it, let me go, and look for me. The fate of Mithridates is uncertain, but he was probably kept, like Maraboduus, in some Italian city. But the most important change was the restoration of the kingdom of Herod. Judea, which since his death had been governed by a Roman procurator, was given along with Samaria to his grandson Agrippa, who had played a prominent part in securing the accession of Claudius. This change was at least as much a matter of policy as a reward to Agrippa. It was intended to soothe the bad feeling against the Roman government which had been stirred up among the Jews under the reign of Gaius. Two edicts were issued, according, first to the Jews of Alexandria, and then to the Jews of the whole empire, the free exercise of their worship. Agrippa was very popular with the Jews, and he was also popular with the Greeks. At Jerusalem he was a Jew, at Caesarea he was a Gentile. On two occasions the governor of Syria, Bibius Marsus, was obliged to interfere with his policy. In 42 AD, to prevent him from fortifying the new town of Jerusalem, and in the following year, to put a stop to a suspicious congress of kings, Antiochus of Comagene, Cotis of Little Armenia, Sampsigurum of Emesa, Paleno of Pontus, who had assembled at Tiberias to meet Agrippa. But the restored kingdom of Judea was of short duration. Agrippa died, eaten up of worms, in 44 AD, and his son, who was kept as a hostage at Rome, was not deemed competent to succeed him. Judea was placed again under the government of a procurator, but to assuage the discontent of the Jews and prevent disturbances, the nomination of the high priest and the administration of the treasure of the temple were not assigned to him, but to King Herod of the Syrian Chalcis, a brother of Agrippa. At this time Judea was much disturbed by brigands as well as by the fanatical hatred of the Jews against the pagans, and the constant interference of the governor of Syria was required. The administration of Judea was one of the most difficult problems that the Romans had to deal with and they committed the error of not stationing sufficiently large military forces in that province. In 53 AD, Claudius granted immunity from tribute to the island of Cos, 
as a personal favour to his physician Xenophon, who belonged to the Asclepidae, a family of medical priests who lived in that island. The emperor made one of his characteristic speeches in the senate, going into the ancient history of the Coans, and then letting out the true motive of his proposal by mentioning Xenophon, their distinguished countryman. About the same time, tribute was remitted for five years to Byzantium, which had suffered severely from the Bosporan War and from disturbances in Thrace for when that country was made a province. The history of the war in Armenia must be reserved for another chapter. It may be asked how far the administration of the empire was guided by the mind of Claudius, and how far the measures of his reign were due to his advisers. On this it is impossible to speak with certainty. There is a curious contrast between his rather ridiculous personality and the not inconsiderable positive results of his reign. However much he owed to his able counsellors, it is certain that he impressed many of his measures with his personal stamp. If he was weak-minded, easily influenced by women and freedmen, immoderate in sensual indulgence, and fond of wine and gambling, it must not be forgotten that he was well educated. Nor is it fair to blame him for the prominent part which the freedmen of his household played in the administration of the state. It must be remembered that the emperor had neither official ministers nor a regular civil service at his disposal. He was supposed to be his own secretary of state, and his own treasurer, and he was therefore obliged to have recourse to the services of his freedmen for carrying on the business of the state. Augustus himself had depended on freedmen after the death of his advisers Agrippa and Massinus. Tiberius and Gaius also employed them, but did not admit them to their confidence. They occupied, however, such a position that their influence over weak-minded princeps was almost a matter of course. This happened in the case of Claudius. He needed counsellors to lean upon, and the freedmen were there at his hand. His most trusted advisers were Narcissus, who held the post of Ab Epistolis, or secretary, Pallas, who was the Arrationibus, or steward and accountant, Callistus, the, the Alabellis, who received all petitions preferred to the emperor, and Polybius, who assisted his master in his studies, and had himself won a place in literature by translating Homer into Latin and Virgil into Greek. These Greeks were well-educated men, capable and versatile, and it would be an error of prejudice to ridicule the government of Claudius as being conducted by a company of menials. They were doubtless far more competent to perform the duties of their offices and to advise the emperor than the officials of equestrian and senatorian rank. But in consequence of their position they were overbearing and avaricious. Having no social position, they sought a compensation in amassing wealth, and their administration was consequently marked by the grossest corruption. They sold appointments to the highest bidders. They compassed the confiscation of the estates of nobles on false or frivolous charges. They extorted bribes by threats. End of chapter 15 Sections 2 and 3Recording by Julie von Mulligem. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 15 The Principate for Claudius, 41 to 54 AD, Section 4. Messalina. In these small practices, the freedmen were aided and bettered by the Empress Messalina. In his youth, Claudius had been betrothed to Emilia Lepida, daughter of the younger Julia, but the marriage was broken off on account of her mother's misconduct. He lost a second bride, Livia Camilla, through her death on the wedding day, and finally married Plotia Ergolanilla, daughter of Plotius Silvanus, who had distinguished himself in Illyricum. Plotia was repudiated on account of an intrigue with a freedman, and Claudius then married Elia Paetina, by whom he had one daughter. Elia was also divorced, but for no serious cause, and about 38 A.D., Claudius took a third wife, as has been already mentioned, 
Valeria Messalina. This remarkable woman was descended on the father's side from the race of the orator Massala Corvinus, but by her mother, Domitia Lepida, she was connected with family of the Caesars. Claudius and Lepida were cousins, being both the grandchildren of Antonius the Triumvir and Octavia the sister of Augustus. The name of Masalina has become proverbial for unblushing sensuality. The tales that have been preserved for vices and orgies bear on them the marks of exaggeration. But there can be no doubt that her conduct was dissolute, and that she exercised an evil influence on the women of Rome. She is said to have carried on criminal intrigues with the emperor's freedom, and especially with the Narcissus. It seems certain that she and they combined to hoodwink Claudius. They concealed her love affairs with others, and she concealed their peculations. While Messalina indulged her amorous caprices, Narcissus and Pallas built up such great fortunes that when Claudius once complained of want of money, he was told that he would be rich enough if those two freedmen took him into partnership. The position of Messalina seemed secured by the circumstance that she had borne her husband a son, Tiberius Claudius Germanicus, who afterwards received the name Britannicus in memory of the conquest of Britain. He was born in February, shortly after his father's accession, and this was the first case of a son born to a reigning Caesar. But Claudius declined the proposal to confer either upon his son the title Augustus, or upon the empress that of Augusta. But although Messalina was not raised to the rank which had been held by Livia, she received conspicuous honour by the decree which permitted her to write in the Carpentum, the use of which was still generally restricted to persons holding priestly offices at solemn festivals. A like permission had been already granted to the Empress mother, Antonia. It has been already stated that Claudius recalled his nieces Julia and Agrippina from exile. Agrippina's husband, Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, was dead, and some time after her return she married Crispus Passianus. Julia was a spouse to Marcus Vinicius. Both ladies were young and attractive, and as the daughters of Germanicus and sisters of Gaius, they both exercised influence and awakened suspicion at the court of Claudius. Agrippina avoided the dangers which surrounded her, but Julia's marked attentions to her uncle excited the jealousy of Messalina. She was driven again into banishment and died of starvation. The philosopher Seneca, noted for his wealth as well as for his writings, was banished at the same time to Corsica as a lover of Julia. But, strange to say, his estates were not confiscated. In the following year, 42 A.D., a far more glaring act of injustice was committed to satisfy the vengeance of Messalina. A distinguished nobleman, Appius Silanus, of the Junian Gens, had rejected the licentious advances of the empress, and she determined to destroy him, although he had been recently married to her mother Domitia Lepida. As there was no possible ground of charge against him, Messalina and her accomplice Narcissus devised a curious plot. Narcissus entered the empress's chamber early one morning, and told in accents of alarm that he had drummed the previous night that Claudius was murdered by Silanus. Messalina then said that she had been visited by the same dream. Claudius, weak and superstitious, was terrified by the startling coincidence, and before he had time to recover from his fright, Silanus himself appeared, according to an appointment which the emperor had made with him. But Claudius, in his bewilderment, forgot the appointment, and saw in the sudden appearance of Silanus a confirmation of the suspicions which had been aroused by the dreams. Messalina and Narcissus pressed their advantage, 
and easily persuaded the deceived emperor to issue an order for the immediate execution of Selenus. If this tale can be trusted, it shows how unscrupulous the empress and freedmen were in compassing their ends, and how completely the emperor was dominated by their influence. Many other conspicuous victims were sacrificed to the jealousy or covetousness of Messalina. Among them was Poppaea Sabina, said to be the most beautiful woman of the day, the wife of Lucius Cornelius Scipio. A real offence was that she tried to fascinate Menesta, a dancer with whom Messalina was in love. But the charge preferred against her was it that she committed adultery with Valerius Asiaticus, a nobleman of wealth and influence, who was one of the consuls of the year, 47 A.D. He was brought into the trial, because Messalina coveted the gardens of Lucullus on the Pinchon Hill, which he had inherited. At the same time, he was accused of treasonable designs, and was given no opportunity to defend himself before the Senate. The trial took place privately in the palace, sentence was passed on the accused, and he was allowed to choose his own death. He adopted the manner of suicide, which was then in fashion, and after bathing and supping, cut open his veins and let himself bleed to death. Poppaea put an end to her own life, before the trial was concluded. So far the plans of Messalina and those of the freedmen had not clashed. The interests of the latter were not threatened by an intrigue with the dance of Nesta, or by the confiscation of the gardens of Asiaticus. But when she engaged in an intrigue with a Roman noble, Gaius Silius, the case was very different, for such a connection was clearly a menace to the throne. A man in the position of Silius would hardly have suffered himself to be drawn into an intrigue with a woman of Messalina's evil reputation, if he had not been urged by motives of ambition. But the interests of the freedmen were bound up in their master's life, and his overthrown would have almost certainly meant their ruin. They determined that Gaius Silius should not attain to the principate, and as Messalina refused to listen to their warnings, they brought about her fall, 48 A.D., the empress, infatuated with her new lover, induced him to divorce his wife, and promised to wed him after the death of Claudius, whose weak constitution might not be expected to hold out much longer. But at length, Silius, weary of his ambiguous and dangerous position, and apprehensive, perhaps, of the constancy of his paramour, urged her to consent to the bold step of removing Claudius. He undertook to adopt Britannicus, and promised to reign in his name and as his guardian. Messalina, however, was not anxious to gratify his wishes. She feared that when Silius reached the goal of his ambition, he might spurn her from him on account of her licentiousness. Nevertheless, she felt such pleasure in trampling upon public opinion and outraging morality that she consented to celebrate a former marriage with her lover. Claudius was just then about to set forth for Ostia, but before he started, he was assured by Divinus that some evil was destined to befall the husband of Messalina. To avert evil from his own head, he was induced to sanction a pretended marriage between his wife and another. Gaius Silius was chosen to be the sham bridegroom. The betrothal took place in the emperor's presence, and he himself signed the marriage contract. He then started for Ostia, but Messalina remained behind on a plea of indisposition, and, incredible as it may seem, celebrated her marriage with Silius with all the customary festivities. It was an anxious moment for the freedmen, Narcissus, Pallas, and Callistus. The destruction of Gaius Silius must at all hazards be effected, and it was necessary to set cautiously to work. 
the influence which Messalina still possessed had been recently shown by the sentence of death Parson Polybius, who had attempted to interfere between her and her lover. So Narcissus laid a plan to take her unawares, and ensure her fall before she could obtain an interview with her husband. He suborned two women, who were intimate with Claudius, to awaken him to the knowledge of his strange situation. Narcissus was then, according to the prearranged plot, summoned to the Empress's presence, and confirmed the strange tale of the marriage of Messalina. Did Claudius, he asked, know that he had been divorced by his own wife, that the people, the senate, the soldiers had witnessed the marriage of Silius? Was he still unaware that, unless he acted promptly, the city was in the hands of the husband of Messalina? The emperor could hardly believe the story, but others of the household bore testimony to its truth, and he was urged to hurry back to Rome with all speed and secure himself in the Praetorian camp. Utterly bewildered and frightened, Claudius let his counsellors do with him what they would, and on his way back to Rome he kept continually asking, Am I the emperor? Is Silly as a private citizen? Narcissus distrusted Lucius Gatta, one of the two prefects of the Praetorian Guards, as a friend of Messalina. He therefore induced Claudius to commit to himself the command of the guards for a single day. On obtaining the consent of the emperor, he sent orders to Rome that the house of Silius should be occupied, and all who were present arrested. He obtained a seat in the carriage of the emperor, lest the two companions of Claudius, Vitalius and Largus, should weaken his resolution. Lucius Vitalius, who had gained distinction in the East under Tiberius, and had worked himself into the favour of Gaius by unscrupulous flattery, carefully abstained from committing himself to an opinion. To the complaint of Claudius he merely said, How scandalous! How horrible! Leaving the freedman to bear all the responsibility. Meanwhile, in the house of Silius, the empress was celebrating a vintage festival. The grape-juice flowed in streams from the wine-presses, and women, arrayed as backhands, with skins flung over their shoulders, performed wild dances, Messalina herself brandishing a thyrsus, and Silius, crowned with ivy at her side, stowed about in buskins. A note of discord suddenly broke upon the dissolute scene. A physician, one Vatius Valens, had climbed up a high tree, and when they asked him what he saw, he replied in jest, or by some kind of provision, a terrible storm coming from Ostia. Presently the news came that Claudius was indeed coming from Ostia, and coming to avenge. The riotous company was instantly scattered. Silius rushed to the forum to hide his fear under the appearance of business. Messalina fled to the gardens of Lucullus. They were hardly gone when the officers sent by Narcissus arrived, and some of the guests, who were slow in making their escape, were arrested. Messalina had no fear that all was lost. She trusted in her power over her husband. She made arrangements that her children, Britannicus and Octavia, should meet their father, and silently plead their mother's cause. And she prayed Virbidia, the eldest of the Vestal Virgins, to implore the Pontifex Maximus for pardon. Then, having passed through the city on foot, she set forth on the road to Ostia, and was able to find no better conveyance than a cart which was used to carry garden refuse. But all her endeavours failed. Narcissus prevented Claudius from listening to her cries, and the vestal, when she met the carriage on its entry into Rome, was dismissed with an assurance that the empress would have an opportunity of defending herself. Claudius visited the house of Silius, and saw in the hall the statue of the culprit's father, which the senate had ordered to be overthrown, and other sites, calculated to increase his indignation. He then proceeded to the camp of the Praetorians, and the senate to the tribunal. 
Silius would not defend himself and merely asked for a speedy death. He was immediately executed. The same fate befell Vettius Valens and several others who were charged with abetting Silius in his crime. The dancer Nestor was also put to death on account of his intrigue with Messalina, and likewise a young knight named Sextus Montanus, who had been her lover for only one day. In the meantime Messalina had returned to the Lucullan gardens, and did not yet despair. Her mother, Domitia Lapida, who had stood aloof in the days of her prosperity, came to her in the hour of her distress. She urged her daughter to anticipate the stroke of the executioner by a voluntary death. "'Life is over,' she said. "'Nothing remains but an honourable end.' But Marcelina was fond of life, and she knew the nature of her husband. Claudius, exhausted by his work of retribution, had retired to the palace to dine, and after dinner he sent a message to the poor woman, bidding her come next day and plead her cause. But Narcissus was determined that she should have no chance of pleading, so he immediately ordered a tribune and some centurions to go and slay the criminal, saying, Such are the emperor's orders. Messalina, having in vain attempted to pierce herself with the sword, was killed by a blow of the tribune, and the corpse was left to her mother. Claudius, meanwhile, under the influence of wine, had forgotten the events which had just passed, and began to ask why the lady tarried. When they told him that she was dead, he merely called for another cup, and never mentioned her again. The senate decreed that her name should be effaced from all monuments, and Narcissus received as a reward for his services the insignia of the quaestorship. Such it seems to be the least improbable version of the strange history of the crowning insolence of Messalina and her sudden fall. But the episode of her public marriage with Silius will always remain a perplexing riddle unless some totally new evidence be discovered. End of chapter 15, section 4Recording by Julie Vermolligan. The Student Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 15. The Principate of Claudius, 41 to 54 AD. Section 5. Agrippina, Death of Claudius. Messalina had fallen, and the question was, who was to be her successor? On this, the freedmen were not unanimous. Narcissus urged that Claudius should take back his second wife, Aelia Paetina, whom he had divorced. Callistus worked in behalf of Lollia Paulina, the divorced wife of the Emperor Gaius. Pallas espoused the cause of Agrippina, the Emperor's niece. This remarkable woman, who inherited the ambition without the morality of her mother, had long been scheming to establish an influence over Claudius, who was very susceptible to female fascinations. She aimed at securing the empire for her son Lucius Domitius, and winning for herself such a position as had been held by Livia. It is impossible to know how far she may have been involved in the intrigues connected with the fall of Marcelina, but it is probable that she has influenced the verdict of history on the career of her rival. For Agrippina published personal memoirs, in which she revealed the secret history of the palace, and it was almost certainly from these memoirs that the historian Tacitus drew his account of Messalina's wickedness. It may easily be believed that Agrippina highly coloured the story and distorted the truth. The death of her husband, Persianus, had left her free and wealthy, and she determined to marry her uncle, in spite of the Roman prejudice against such a union. Her charms, 
supported by the persuasions of Pallas, subdued the weak emperor, and in a few weeks after the death of Messalina, Agrippina exerted over Claudius all the influence of a wife. Before the end of the year, 48 A.D., she took the first step in the direction of elevating her son to the throne. He was then eleven years old, but she resolved that, when he came of age, he should marry Octavia, the daughter of Claudius. For this purpose it was necessary to break off the betrothal which existed between Octavia and Lucius Silanus, a great-great-grandson of Augustus. In accomplishing this, Agrippina was assisted by Vitalius, the emperor's colleague in the censorship, who bore a grudge against Silanus and was ready to ruin him. He informed Claudius that Silanus had committed incest with his sister, and the horrified emperor immediately broke off the engagement of his daughter. Silanus, who was a praetor that year, was ordered to lay down his office, and Vitalius, although no longer censor, presumed on his recent tenure of that office to remove the name of Silanus from the list of senators. When this obstacle to the future marriage of Domitius and Octavia was removed, it remained for Recrepina to smooth the way for her own union with Claudius. No precedent in Roman history could be found for marrying a brother's daughter. Such an alliance was regarded as incestuous, and in all matters of religion, Claudius was punctiliously scrupulous. The censor who had just expressed his horror at the alleged incest of Silanus shrank from incurring the charge of a similar offence. But here again Vitalius came to the aid of Agrippina. He appeared in the Senate and delivered a specious harangue in favour of the proposed marriage. The senators tumultuously applauded, and Claudius, then appearing in the Curia, caused a decree to be passed that henceforward marriages with the daughters of brothers should be valid. The fourth marriage of Claudius took place in the early days of 49 A.D., and on the wedding day, as it were to bring a curse on the event, Silanus, the betrothed of Octavia, killed himself. Another victim, who had come across the path of Agrippina, was Lollia Paulina, who had aspired to the hand of Claudius. She was accused of having consulted Chaldean astrologers concerning the imperial marriage, and the emperor himself spoke against her in the senate. She was banished from Italy, but Agrippina is said to have dispatched a tribune after her to put her to death. While Messalina cared only for sensuality, Agrippina was enamoured of power. She was not content with being the emperor's wife, but wished to be his colleague. This position was designated by the title Augusta, which was conferred upon her in 50 A.D. She was the third woman who bore this title, but it meant for her, as it had meant for Livia, a share in political power, and was not merely, as it had been for Antonia, an honourable title. But Agrippina enjoyed a mark of distinction which had not been granted even to the consort of Augustus. She was the first Roman empress whose image was permitted to appear on coins during her lifetime by degree of the Senate. When Claudius gave audiences to his friends, or to foreign envoys, his wife sat on a throne beside him. We have seen that she gave her name to the new colony of veterans established in the town of Diubi as Colonia Agrippinensis. In order to secure her influence with the freedman palace, she is said to have engaged in an intrigue with him, but the court, under her rule, seems to have been distinguished by outward propriety and certainly by stricter etiquette. Her schemes for her son's advancement rendered her a cruel stepmother to Britannicus. On the 25th of February, 50 A.D., Lucius Domitius was adopted into the Claudian gens under the name of Nero Claudius Caesar Drusus Germanicus. This was the first instance of an adoption of a son by a patrician Claudius, 
and the emperor was disinclined to take this step, not only on this account, but lest the prospect of Britannicus should be injured. He was overcome, however, by the example of Augustus. The advancement of Nero progressed rapidly. In the following year, he was permitted to assume the toga of manhood, and by a decree of the Senate, he was made princeps juventutis, designated to hold the consulship at the age of twenty, and he received proconsular power. These honours were sufficient to mark him out as the successor of Claudius to the Principate. But Agrippina went even further, and caused her son to be elected supranumerum into the four chief priestly colleges, the pontiffs, the augurs, the quindicum viri, and the septum viri. This was a distinction which the youthful grandsons of Augustus, Gaius and Lucius, had not received. Nero had already been betrothed to his cousin Octavia, and his adoption, whereby he became legally her brother, was not allowed to hinder the celebration of the marriage, which took place in 53 A.D. In the meantime, Britannicus, who was only a little younger than Nero, was regarded and treated as a child. Misunderstandings and estrangements were treacherously brought about between him and his father. On one occasion, when the two young princes met, and Nero saluted Britannicus by name, Britannicus saluted him as Domitius. Agrippina complained of this to the emperor, as implying contempt of Nero's adoption, and the decree of the senate. Claudius was moved by her representations to punish one of the instructors of his son by death, and others by banishment, and place him under the charge of the creatures of her stepmother. By her machinations, also, the two prefects of the Praetorian Guard, who had been adherents of Messalina, and were anxious to secure the succession of her son, were deposed and replaced by Ephraeus Boris, who was devoted to the interests of his patroness. All the officers who were attached to the cause of Britannicus was then removed. But the son of Messalina had not only a strong party in the Senate, but a powerful supporter in the imperial household. This was the freedman Narcissus, who exerted all his energy and influence to weaken the power of Agrippina and keep Nero from the throne. After the marriage of Octavia, the struggle between the two parties became keener. Vitalius, who had shown his devotion to the Augusta, was threatened with a criminal prosecution. The condemnation of Tarcisius Priscus also showed the uncertainty of her position. She coveted the house and gardens of Statilius Taurus, a man of noble ancestry and great wealth, who had been governor of Africa. Priscus brought against him charges of extortion in his administration of that province and of practising magic. Taurus disdained to reply, and chose to die by a voluntary death. But the senate expelled the accuser from their body, although Agrippina exerted all her power to protect him. There were other signs, too, which might alarm the empress. Claudius showed himself inclined to reinstate his son Britannicus in his proper position, and spoke of allowing him to assume the toga virilis. An ominous remark is said to have dropped from his lips, that it was his fate first to endure the offences of his wives, and afterwards to punish them. It looked as if the influence of Narcissus were likely once more to get the upper hand. Agrippina made an attempt to ruin Narcissus by ascribing to his mismanagement the failure of the tunnel of Lake Fucinus. She failed but she soon enjoyed a triumph in the ruin of her most formidable female rival, Domitia Lepida. This lady, as a daughter of the elder Antonia and Lucius Domitius, was a grand-niece of Augustus, as a mother of Messalina, was a grandmother of Britannicus, and as a sister of Gnaeus Domitius, was a sister-in-law of Agrippina. In beauty, age, and wealth, there was not much difference between them 
both were immodest, infamous, and violent. They were rivals in their vices no less than in the gifts which fortune had given them. During the exile of Agrippina, Lepida had given home to the child Nero, and ever since had endeavoured to secure his affections by flattery and liberality, which contrasted with his mother's sternness and impatience. Lepida was charged with making attempts against the life of the empress by means of magical incantations, and with being a disturber of the public peace by maintaining gangs of turbulent slaves on the Calabrian estates. The indictment seems to have been brought before the emperor, and it was a trial of strength between Agrippina and Narcissus, who did all he could to save Lepida. But Agrippina triumphed. Lepida was sentenced to death. Yet notwithstanding this victory, and notwithstanding the fact that Claudius had been induced to make a will favourable to her son, the empress did not feel sure of her ground, and dreaded a reaction. Under these circumstances, the greatest luck that could befall her was the death of Claudius, and Claudius died October 13th, 54 A.D. It is generally believed that he was poisoned by his wife, and though we cannot say that her guilt is proved, it seems highly probable. Claudius was in his sixty-fourth year, and in declining health. His death took place when Narcissus was absent at Sinuessa for the sake of the medicinal waters, and this coincidence supports the traditional account that there was foul play, for Narcissus suspected the designs of Agrippina. According to the received story, she employed the services of a woman named Locusta, notorious for the preparation of subtle poisons, who, according to the historian Testus, was long regarded as one of the instruments of monarchy. She compounded a curious drug which had the property of disturbing the mind without causing instant death, and it was administered to Claudius in a dish of mushrooms. But for some reason the poison failed to work, and Agrippina, fearful lest a crime should be discovered, called in her confidential physician Xenophon, who did not hesitate to pass a poisoned feather into the emperor's throat, on the plea of helping him to vomit. The position of Nero at the death of Claudius was far stronger than that of Gaius at the death of Tiberius. Nero had to fear a declaration in favour of Britannicus, as Gaius had to fear the rivalry of the son of Drusus. But Nero possessed a proconsular power, as well as other dignities, which had not been conferred on Gaius. He had also the support of his mother's influence, and above all, Burrus, the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, was devoted to his interest. Seeing that the accession of Gaius had proceeded so smoothly, there seemed no reason for doubt in the case of Nero. But Agrippina took every precaution for securing success. She concealed the emperor's death for some hours, and made pretexts to detain his children in the palace until her own son had been proclaimed emperor by the guards. About midday, the doors of the palace were suddenly thrown open, and Nero issued forth, accompanied by Burrus, into the presence of the cohort, which was then on duty. The prefect gave a sign, and the soldiers received him with acclamations. It was said that some hesitated and asked for Britannicus, but his demurring was only for a moment— Nero was then carried in a litter to the Praetorian camp, where he spoke a few suitable words, and was saluted Imperator. This was the second occasion on which the Praetorians created an emperor, and following the example of his father Claudius, Nero promised them a donative. The Senate did not hesitate to accept the will of the guards, and on the same day, October 13th, the Dies Imperii of Nero, decreed to him the proconsular power in its higher unlimited form, 
and the prerogatives embodied in the Lex de Imperio and the name Augustus. The tribunician power, which was necessary to complete the prerogatives of the princeps, was conferred upon him by Comitia on the 4th of December. The legions in the provinces received the news of the new principate without a murmur of dissent. According to custom, the Senate met to consider the acts of Claudius. He was fortunate enough to receive the honours which had fallen to the lot of the model Augustus, and which his two predecessors had missed. He was judged worthy to enter into the number of the guards, and flamens were appointed for his worship. All his acts were decreed to be valid. His funeral was ordered after the precedent of that of Augustus, and Agrippina emulated the magnificence of her great-grandmother Livia. But the will of the deceased sovereign was not read in public. It was feared that the preference shown to the stepson over Britannicus would cause unpleasant remarks. Nero pronounced the funeral oration, composed by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, over the dead emperor. One of Agrippina's first acts after her marriage with Claudius had been to recall Seneca from his exile in Corsica, and entrust to him the completion of his son's education. During his banishment he had attempted, by the arts of flattery, to get this sentence repealed, and had addressed a treatise to the freedman Polybius, into which he wrought an extravagant panegyric of the emperor. But Claudius had paid no heed, and Seneca was resolved to have his revenge. He assailed the memory of the emperor soon after his death, in an unsparing and remarkably clever satire, entitled The Apocalyptosis, Pumpkinification, a play on apotheosis, or otherwise the Ludus de Morte Claudii Caesaris. The arrival of Claudius in heaven, the surprise of the gods at seeing his strange shaking figure and hearing his indistinct babble, are described with many jests. The gods deliberate whether they should admit him, and are inclined to vote in his favour, when the divine Augustus arises and tells all the crimes and iniquities which have stained the reign of his grand-nephew. The gods agree that he deserves to be ejected from Olympus. Mercury immediately seizes him by the neck, and drags him to the place whence none return. Iluc unde negant ridire quenquam. On the way to the shades, he passes through the Via Sacra, where he witnesses his own funeral, and sees the Roman people walking about as if they were free from a tyrant. When he reaches the low regions, he is greeted with a shout, Claudius will come. He is surrounded by a large company, consisting of the victims who had perished during his reign, senators, knights, freedmen, kinsfolk. I meet friends everywhere, said Claudius. How came you hither? Do you ask, most cruel man? was the reply. Who else but thou sent us hither, murderer of all thy friends? He was then led before the tribunal of Aeacus, and prosecuted on the basis of the Lex Cornelia de Sicaris. He is condemned to play forever with a bottomless dice-box. This satire of Seneca reflects the general derision which was cast upon the deification of Claudius. The addition of this emperor's ridiculous figure to the number of the celestials effectually dispelled that halo of divinity with which Augustus had sought to invest the Principate. End of chapter 15, section 5